On December 29th, two days before the Emperor's Declaration of Humanity, the same unit reported that, Informed sources claim that many people have reached a state where it is almost immaterial to them whether the Emperor is retained or not. Four days after the New Year's Day rescript, they observed that, Generally, the people are grasping the idea that the Emperor is simply a human being. Reports are being received that the better-educated younger generation are not regarding him with the same degree of dignity as formerly, and that he has even become the point of many jokes in the past three months. Shortly after this, the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey conducted a survey asking Japanese what their feelings had been when they heard Japan had given up in the war. In a striking demonstration of the extent to which ordinary people had become bystanders where the emperor was concerned, only 4% checked off, worry about emperor, shame for emperor, sorrow for him. Jokes about the emperor and flippancy in speaking of him were another small sign that awe toward the sovereign was not so great as the royalists or fellers and MacArthur insisted. After the famous photograph of the general and the emperor appeared, Hirohito even emerged as the butt of the most salacious riddle of the occupation period. This rested on a hitherto unmentionable pun. The fact that the imperial we, pronounced chin, was a homonym to a slang word for penis, or prick. Why was General MacArthur the belly button, eso, of Japan? Because, the rude joke went, he was above the prick, emperor. Other developments at the popular level also indicated that the emperor might be less than irreplaceable. In February, for instance, SCAP's local intelligence people reported a rumor current in the Shimonoseki area to the effect that the emperor's ancestors came from India, and that he therefore was not Japanese. As a result of this revelation, which was said to be verifiable by records in a temple in Shimane Prefecture, some Shimonoseki residents have expressed their preference for a Japanese president rather than an emperor of Indian ancestry. This was entertaining or unsettling, depending on where one stood, as was true also of one of the more widely publicized developments of the period. The emergence of a dozen or more individuals, each of whom claimed to be the legitimate heir to the throne or a genuine descendant or incarnation of the sun goddess Amaterasu. Contemplating this parade of imperial pretenders and daughters of heaven became one of the small amusements by which people lightened the hardships of these times, and they had a motley assortment of would-be royals and goddesses to contemplate. Emperor Sakamoto surfaced in Okayama, Emperor Nagahama in Kagoshima, Emperor Sado in Niigata, and Emperor Yokokura in Kochi. Aichi Prefecture produced not one but two pretenders, Emperor Tobura and Emperor Miura. The most intriguing claimant to the chrysanthemum throne first brought his case to GHQ in September 1945 and saw it emerge as a topic of public interest in January. He was a 56-year-old variety store proprietor from Nagano named Kumazawa Hiromichi, who attracted particular interest because his claim rested on a genuine genealogical dispute tracing back to the early 14th century, when the imperial line had split into fiercely contentious northern and southern courts. Hirohito belonged to the northern line, but there were serious grounds for arguing that the southern line, from which Kumazawa claimed descent, was the more legitimate and should have carried on the imperial tradition. The fact that three of Kumazawa Hiromichi's relatives each soon claimed that he was the true family head gave this challenge added zest, and the very durability of the story in the media seemed to reveal one more way in which Hirohito's authority was eroding. Kumazawa Hiromichi toured the country, gathering a small number of supporters and a considerable amount of curiosity. His celebrity status, coupled with his spirited public statements, certainly suggested that some Japanese at least were less enamored of the current occupant of the throne than were the victors ensconced in the Daiichi building. I consider Hirohito a war criminal, the pretender was quoted as saying, to which he immediately added, whether as shrewd politician or true believer is unclear, MacArthur is heaven's messenger to Japan, among other things, Kumazawa's claim cast serious doubt on the vaunted ideology of Bansei Ike, ten thousand generations in a single line, by which the modern imperial institution claimed unbroken descent from time immemorial. This myth of an unbroken imperial line tracing back to the sun goddess, around which many of the emperor's unique sacerdotal activities revolved, was soon challenged at the grassroots in other ways. 
The directive disestablishing Shinto as the state religion opened the door to a resurgence of popular religions. Some that had been repressed under the pre-war peace preservation law, often on the specific grounds of Lee's majesty, re-emerged as vigorous centers of spiritual attraction. Soka Kyoiku Gakkai was re-established as Soka Gakkai, Omotekyo as Aizenen, Tenri Hondo as Honmichi. In one form or another, various Shinto-affiliated organizations that had been marginalized also resumed independent activity. Among them, Risho Kosekai, which split off from the pre-war Reyukai, and Seicho Noie. Dynamic as many of these revived religions were, they paled in terms of immediate media appeal before two post-war religions founded by women who claimed special connection to the sun goddess and promised their devotees this worldly benefits. The Jiu religion was established by Nagaoka Yoshiko, who called herself Jikoson, claimed to be the reincarnation of Amaterasu, and predicted that a series of natural calamities would occur to correct a world in disarray. Jikoson tapped a traditional strain of world-renewing millennialism and numbered among her devotees Futabayama, a near-legendary former sumo grand champion, and Go Segen, a celebrated master of the board game Go. Her new religion became a journalist's delight in 1947 when the police raided its facilities on the grounds that illegal foodstuffs were stored there and were tossed around by Futabayama. The second of these new religions, called Amaterasu Kotai Jingukyo, religion of the great shrine of Amaterasu, was founded three days before the war ended by Kitamura Sayo, a housewife in a farming family in Yamaguchi Prefecture. Claiming that something had entered her body in 1944 and placed her in receipt of direct messages from the sun goddess, Kitamura preached through songs and promoted an ecstatic, selfless dance. She spoke harshly of all authorities, including the emperor, and attracted upward of 300,000 followers within a few years. In Japanese parlance, this efflorescence of post-surrender religions eventually became known as the Rush Hour of the Gods. The royalists continued to insist that the throne was the unshakable center of the national belief system, but countless numbers of people were finding spiritual solace elsewhere. Becoming Human The campaign to dress Emperor Hirohito in new clothes and turn him into a symbol of peace and democracy was conducted on several fronts. Immense care was taken to exempt him from indictment in the impending showcase war crimes trials in Tokyo. Although his formal exoneration from war responsibility did not actually come until June 1946, well before that date the emperor cast aside his commander-in-chief's uniform, donned a western suit, and embarked on a series of tours that eventually would take him to almost every prefecture in the country. Suggestions that the emperor abdicate, some of them emanating from court circles, were quickly suppressed. The emperor's constitutional status was drastically revised, depriving him of formal power, and in a single deft declaration he managed to satisfy many of his foreign critics that he no longer claimed divinity. The last of these acts was accomplished in the form of a rescript to promote the national destiny, printed in newspapers nationwide on New Year's Day. This was the emperor's first formal address to his subjects since August 15th, but its greatest impact was among foreigners. Popularly known as his Declaration of Humanity, Ningen Sengen, it was immediately hailed by the Americans and the British as the Emperor's renunciation of divinity, a clear sign that he had sincerely repudiated the pretense to divine descent that had constituted the core of pre-war Emperor worship and ultranationalism. The idea for the declaration came not from among the Emperor's top-level advisors or SCAP's high planners, as might have been expected, but from an expatriate British esthete and a middle-level American officer. As a communication in the Japanese language, moreover, it fell considerably short of the sweeping renunciation of divinity Westerners wishfully imagined it to be. Through the use of esoteric language, Emperor Hirohito adroitly managed to descend only part way from heaven. Largely thanks to his personal intervention in the drafting process, the rescript seized the initiative for the throne by identifying it with a democracy rooted neither in the reformist policies of the victors nor in popular initiatives from below, but in governmental pronouncements dating back to the beginning of the reign of Hirohito's grandfather, the Meiji Emperor. The New Year's Day declaration offered an excellent preview of what a many-colored raiment the Emperor's new clothes would prove to be. 
How he would be seen depended largely on the eye of the beholder. To Westerners, Christians in particular, the notion of emperor worship was blasphemous. To speak of the emperor as the son of heaven, as he was commonly termed in English, seemed perilously close to equating him with Christ, the son of God. Americans devoted a great deal of attention to this issue. The prolific missionary writer Willis Lamott discussed the need for the emperor to renounce his divinity as early as 1944 in his popular book Nippon, The Crime and Punishment of Japan. Analysts in the U.S. Office of War Information came to a similar conclusion before the war ended. Experts consulted in a Columbia University poll likewise concluded that emperor worship somehow had to be eliminated. In November 1945, Otis Carey, a young Japanese-speaking officer with a missionary background in the country, met the emperor's brother Prince Takamatsu on a social visit and boldly offered his personal suggestion that the emperor publicly deny he was a god. In mid-December, another young specialist from a missionary family prepared a memorandum in the State Department devoted to this same theme. Edwin O. Reischauer, later a distinguished Japan scholar and ambassador to Japan, recommended that the Supreme Commander should exert every effort to influence the Emperor voluntarily to demonstrate by word and deed to his people that he is an ordinary human being, not different from other Japanese or from foreigners, that he himself does not believe in the divine origin of the imperial line or the mystical superiority of Japan over other lands, and that there is no such thing as the imperial will as distinct from government policy. Issues of church and state, sacredness and authority were in the air in other ways as well. Scap's directive prohibiting the propagation of Shinto as a state religion referred explicitly to the perversion of Shinto theory and beliefs into militaristic and ultranationalistic propaganda designed to delude the Japanese people and lead them into wars of aggression. Such pernicious ideology included the belief that, because of ancestry, descent, or special origin, the emperor was superior to the heads of other states, just as the people of Japan were superior to the people of other lands. Although the Shinto directive struck at the heart of ultranationalistic emperor ideology, it provoked no criticism, and indeed no great interest, among the populace. Court circles naturally were more keenly attentive to its implications. On December 22nd, the emperor and a small number of intimate associates listened to a presentation by a Japanese scholar who informed them that using this worldly words to try to talk about the other world, as the directive did, was like cutting smoke with scissors. This helped to persuade the emperor that issuing a statement diffusing the question of imperial divinity would be useful for foreign consumption. A small group of individuals had already been at work for weeks on such a statement, a project that had its beginnings in a casual conversation between Lieutenant Colonel Harold Henderson an American special advisor to the Civil Information and Education, CI&E, section, and Dr. Reginald E. Blythe, a British citizen. Both men were Japan specialists with a scholarly interest in literature and culture. Henderson, born in 1889, had lived in Japan in the 1930s, studying its language and art. He had taught Japanese at Columbia University, published a well-regarded introduction to haiku poetry, The Bamboo Broom, administered a Japanese language program for the government in the war years, and participated in the preparation of propaganda leaflets urging Japanese soldiers to surrender in the New Guinea and Philippine campaigns. Nine years younger, Blythe had spent two years in prison as a conscientious objector during World War I. He first became involved with things Japanese in 1926, when he took a teaching position at the Japanese Colonial University in Seoul, Korea. Fluent in Japanese, he had divorced his British wife and married a Japanese woman, published a highly original comparative literary study, Zen in English literature and Oriental classics, and spent the war years in detainment in Japan. In his 1941 book, Blythe had referred to Henderson's haiku anthology as a little masterpiece. The two men obviously had a great deal in common. In October, Blythe appeared at CI&E to explore the possibility of working as an interpreter or translator. Soon, however, he found a more interesting niche as a teacher at Tokyo's prestigious Gakushuin, or Peers School, and also as a liaison between court circles and GHQ. Japanese officials relied heavily on informal contacts with GHQ personnel to ascertain which way the occupation winds were blowing. 
This was as true for the imperial household as it was for other agencies and ministries, and CI&E, which dealt with the democratization of ideology and ideas, was a major focus of the court's intelligence gathering and lobbying. Sometimes the line between exchanging views and obtaining American support through lavish entertainment and valuable presents became blurred. Much of this interaction was above board, however, and no individual proved more valuable to court circles in this capacity than Blythe. It was Blythe's practice to visit CI&D once or twice a week, always driven in a government car. Henderson was one of Blythe's regular contacts and apparently unwittingly initiated a fateful conversation late in November when he shared his thoughts concerning the 1890 Imperial Rescript on Education, which had been turned into a prop of emperor-centered militarism in the 1930s. Before peace and democracy could grow, he observed, it was necessary to eliminate false notions of national superiority and imperial divinity. Perhaps, he mused, this could be accomplished by a new imperial rescript. The following week, Blythe returned to CI&D with the unexpected announcement that he had conveyed this proposal to his contacts and had received word that the emperor was anxious to comply. These contacts, however, desired further advice on exactly what it might be appropriate to say. Brigadier General Ken R. Dyke, the head of CI&D, was absent at the time, and at Blythe's insistence, Henderson agreed to draft a sample statement himself. This he did during his lunch break in his room at the Daiichi Hotel. Lying on a bed with a pad and pencil, imagining that he was the Emperor of Japan renouncing his divinity. There were no witnesses to this creative moment, but the wonderful American presumption and casualness of it all rings true. Henderson and Blythe both regarded this hasty lunch break text as an entirely unofficial suggestion. To Henderson's astonishment, however, Blythe returned a day or two later with both a silly request and a bombshell. First, at the request of the head of the Imperial Household Ministry, Henderson and Blythe burned Henderson's draft. Then Blythe produced a draft of his own, which followed Henderson's quite closely on key points, and asked Henderson to show this draft to his superiors. Henderson took it to General Dyke, who immediately brought it to MacArthur. Both generals expressed surprise and pleasure that court officials were contemplating such a statement, and Blythe hastened back to convey their favorable response to his contacts. For all practical purposes, Henderson and Blythe had become the Emperor's ghostwriters, but a great deal more was to come. Blythe's draft was translated into plain vernacular Japanese by his peers' school contacts, and this became the basis for secret Japanese deliberations on an imperial Declaration of Humanity. Until the end of the year, when the entire cabinet was convened to comment on the proposed rescript, no more than a dozen people, ranging from the head of the peers' school to the emperor himself, were involved. Their sense of secrecy, prompted by fear of violent ultranationalistic protests, was acute. At one point, in a moment even sillier than the burning of the Henderson memo, then Foreign Minister Yoshida Shigeru clandestinely received a copy of the working draft of the declaration in the men's room reserved for members of the cabinet. No one seems to have questioned the appropriateness of such a locale for an exchange involving the emperor's divinity. The imperial rescript released on January 1st was a distinctly Japanized rendering of the Blythe draft. It retained the essence of what Henderson and Blythe had proposed, but in a submerged, sublimated, adroitly altered form. The subtlety of the final statement becomes apparent when it is set against initial versions based on the Blythe draft. Blythe's text began with hopes for a new world with new ideals, with humanity above nationality as the great goal. In its second paragraph, it renounced the emperor's divinity in a passage apparently taken almost verbatim from Henderson's draft. The ties between us and the nation, it stated, do not depend only upon myths and legends, and do not depend at all upon the mistaken idea that the Japanese are of divine descent, superior to other peoples, and destined to rule them. They are the bond of trust, of affection, forged by centuries of devotion and love. In its third paragraph, Blythe's draft emphasized that loyalty within family and nation always has been the great characteristic of our nation in all our religious and political belief. It then went on, Just as our loyalty to the nation has been greater than that to the family, so let our loyalty to humanity surpass our loyalty to the nation. A fourth paragraph acknowledged present-day hardships and looked forward to Japan's reconstruction as a free nation that would make a 
unique contribution to the happiness and welfare of mankind. In conclusion, Blythe's text stated unequivocally that His Majesty disavows entirely any deification or mythologizing of his own person. It is easy to see why this text by the two foreigners was received positively in court circles. The affirmation of centuries of devotion and love existing between sovereign and subjects differed scarcely at all from imperial myths popularized in the 1930s. Until the latter part of the 19th century, ordinary Japanese had little or no awareness of the throne, and the imperial house was comparably indifferent to, if not utterly contemptuous of, ordinary people. Blythe's praise of loyalty as the supreme and eternal Japanese virtue was similarly fallacious historically, although it is easy to see why he chose to emphasize loyalty as a means of calling for a loyalty to humanity that would transcend mere nationalism. While court circles could hardly have hoped for a more encouraging signal of Scap's goodwill at a time when the emperor's status was officially still undecided, this did not prevent them from revising the Blythe draft in substantial ways. The final version retained Blythe's references to traditional loyalty to family and nation, and went on to speak of the necessity of extending this spirit to a love of mankind. In this way, much of the sentiment of the English text was retained, but with a subtle reservation. Loyalty to the nation was no longer explicitly subordinated to an obligation to humanity. In addition, the draft was revised to warn against falling prey to what had only recently been called dangerous thought, but now went under the rubric of confusion of thought, Shiso Konran. The emperor came down strongly on this. The protracted war having ended in defeat, our people are liable to become restive or to fall into despondency. The extremist tendencies appear to be gradually spreading, and the sense of morality is markedly losing its hold on the people. In effect, there are signs of confusion of thought, and the existing situation causes me deep concern. This was not in the Blythe draft, but it was uppermost in the minds of the royalists. In the most dramatic revision, the New Year's Day rescript opened by quoting in its entirety the five-article Charter Oath proclaimed by the youthful Meiji Emperor at the beginning of his reign in 1868. This, Meiji's grandson now declared, would be the basis for discarding old abuses and creating a new Japan devoted to the pursuit of peace and the attainment of an enriched culture. There was no mention of democracy in the rescript. For many conservatives, this was the very heart and soul of the New Year's Day proclamation. The Charter Oath would become a touchstone, a talisman, a comforting historical and psychological anchor by which they could claim that the new Japan was firmly grounded in the past. It was at the Emperor's personal instigation that the entire focus of the statement was shifted from renouncing divinity to emphasizing the Meiji-era oath. By this simple revision he accomplished many things. He obscured the autocratic, theocratic, and imperialistic nature of the Meiji state. He gave the emerging post-war system a peculiarly Japanese, and mid-nineteenth century, patina. He ignored, apart from a vague mention of old abuses, the repression and virulent emperor-centered indoctrination, rooted in his grandfather's time, that had characterized his own reign. He aligned himself publicly with the moderates and old liberals of the school represented by Shidehara, Shigemitsu, and Yoshida, just as he had once publicly aligned himself with the militarists. Most important, he undercut the ostensible purpose of the rescript, the renunciation of divinity. In the process, the emperor made himself a champion of the Charter Oath, which, for the preceding two decades of his reign, he had rarely mentioned and certainly never had exalted as a touchstone of the national polity. In the emperor's later words, this affirmation of the ideals of the Charter Oath was the primary object of his declaration, and the issue of divinity only a secondary matter. His emphasis was not only endorsed, but made stronger by MacArthur. As Hirohito told the story, it was his intention simply to begin the rescript by alluding to the oath, which was familiar to all educated Japanese. When MacArthur was shown a draft to this effect, however, Hirohito was informed that the general had not only praised the Meiji Emperor, fourteen years old when the oath was promulgated, for having done such a splendid thing, but also urged that the five-article oath be reproduced in its entirety. Cutting Smoke with Scissors 
With the Charter Oath now at the beginning of the rescript, the Declaration of Humanity was buried in the text. With the Emperor's intimate involvement, the text was also reworked to eliminate language in the early vernacular translation of the Blythe Draft that referred unequivocally to the deification Shinkakuka, of the Emperor, as well as language that clearly repudiated the belief that both the Emperor and the Japanese people were descendants of the deities, Kami no Shison in the initial draft, Kami no Sue in interim drafts. The formerly key paragraph was, in the final statement, tucked three-quarters of the way through and read as follows in the official English version. I stand by my people. I am ever ready to share in their joys and sorrows. The ties between me and my people have always been formed by mutual trust and affection. They do not depend upon mere legends or myths. Nor are they predicated on the false conception that the Emperor is divine, and that the Japanese are superior to other races and destined to rule the world. The Emperor minimized the importance of this renunciation of divinity because, he said, it essentially amounted to little more than a semantic game necessary to mollify the Westerners. He was never a god in the Western sense of omnipotence and omniscience, he argued when the issue arose late in 1945. Nor was he ever a kami or deity, as Japanese understood this admittedly ambiguous concept. Yet he had certainly never before taken issue with being treated as divine. Tailors never touched his august body, for example, nor did ungloved physicians or anyone else except, presumably, his consort. He had literally been a man devoid of ordinary human contact, Virtually every daily act had signaled his transcendence. Typically, the emperor now chose to discuss this with his advisors only in the most oblique of ways. He turned to second-hand anecdotes, especially the case of an early 17th-century emperor, Go Mizuno. It was a simple, bordering on simplistic tale he had heard from the scholar who offered him advice on the Shinto directive. Go Mizuno contracted chickenpox, but as a reigning manifest deity, Akitsumi Kami, he was not permitted to be treated with moxibustion, a popular remedy that involved cauterizing the skin with tiny points of burning substance, and so he abdicated. One of many comparable anecdotes in the imperial canon involved an emperor who abdicated so that he could indulge his taste for soba, or buckwheat noodles, instead of subsisting primarily on the sacred white rice ruling monarchs were required to eat. Hirohito apparently repeated the Gomizuno story to both Prime Minister Shidahara and Education Minister Maeda Tamon in justifying his endorsement of the Henderson-Blythe initiative. It was appropriate, he opined, to put such absurdities to rest. What all this meant was, of course, more complicated than poxes and noodles. In practical terms, however, the issue was not terribly arcane. The Emperor was willing to deny that he had ever been a god in the Western sense, or even in the more ambiguous Japanese sense. But he was unwilling to deny that he was a descendant of the sun goddess, as the ancient 8th century mytho-histories had set forth, as the Meiji Emperor's own constitution had proclaimed, as the entire cycle of rituals he performed as a Shinto high priest had indicated, and as 20th century ideologues had reiterated ad nauseum. This issue came to a head two days before the New Year's Day declaration had to be submitted to the press. In addition to recommending inclusion of the full text of the Charter Oath, MacArthur made a single, precise editorial change in the English language draft shown him, which contained reference to the mistaken idea that the Japanese are of divine descent. The reference here, the Supreme Commander said, should be not to the Japanese, but to the Emperor. Now, at virtually zero hour, those around the Emperor had to consider the vocabulary by which this should be expressed. More cutting smoke with scissors, as it turned out, was required. To this point, revisions of the Blythe Draft had retained rather straightforward language, denying that the Emperor and Japanese were descendants of the gods, Kami no Shison, Kami no Sue. To Kinoshita Michio, the Emperor's vice-chamberlain, however, this was intolerable. On December 29th, he persuaded the Emperor that, although it might be acceptable to deny that the people were descendants of the Kami, it was absolutely unacceptable to say that imperial descent from these deities was a false conception. To get around this, he proposed that they resort to more esoteric language and deny that the emperor was a manifest deity, or kami in human form, Akitsumi Kami. The emperor agreed wholeheartedly to this revision. 
The more literal descendant of the gods language that had survived earlier drafts was now deleted. The final version simply denied that the Japanese were superior to other peoples, nor that the emperor was an Akitsumi Kami or manifest deity. Akitsumi Kami was not an entirely obscure term, but neither was it an everyday word. It was certainly more esoteric than the plain word divine that was used in the official English translation. Wartime ideologues had used this archaic compound. The three ideographs literally mean visible exalted deity, and the phonetic reading is totally idiosyncratic. To deify the emperor, but even well educated people had difficulty identifying the term when confronted with it in writing, or explaining it if asked to do so. Kinoshita's lively diary, for example, contains an indignant entry in which Foreign Minister Yoshida is dismissed as an imbecile for failing to know what Akitsumi Kami meant. The Vice Chamberlain also observed with dismay that when the near final version of the rescript was submitted to the Cabinet on December 30th, a phonetic reading, Furigana, was written alongside the ideographs for Akitsumi Kami so that the ministers would be able to grasp the reference. In Japanese, in short, the renunciation of divinity was far more obscure than was apparent in the official translation, or than had been the case in earlier drafts. Neither on this occasion nor later did the emperor unequivocally repudiate his alleged descent from the gods. He could not do so, for his entire universe rested on this mythological genealogy. The emperor did not broadcast the New Year's Day rescript. It appeared in the press accompanied by a commentary by Prime Minister Shidehara. While the text was intelligible to educated readers, the final version had typically been worked over by a scholar of classical language and was couched in the stiff and formal prose reserved for imperial pronouncements. The Prime Minister's gloss, on the other hand, was in the vernacular, and, following the usual practice, was regarded as the official interpretation of the Emperor's words. It too was an example of cutting smoke with scissors, for the Prime Minister dwelled exclusively on the prior existence of democracy in Meiji Japan. Upholding the imperial message, he concluded, we can construct a new nation of thoroughgoing democracy, pacifism, and rationalism, and thus hope to ease the emperor's mind. His emphasis was a familiar one. Until now, the people had failed to live up to the sovereign's expectations. The prime minister did not make even passing reference to the emperor's divinity or renunciation thereof. American responses to the January 1st declaration were extremely positive. The New York Times editorialized that with this rescript, Emperor Hirohito made himself one of the great reformers in Japanese history, and in the process dealt the jungle religion of Shinto a blow from which it can scarcely recover. General MacArthur was equally extravagant. He informed the world that by this declaration the Emperor undertakes a leading part in the democratization of his people. He squarely takes his stand for the future along liberal lines. In a single stroke, the Supreme Commander had identified Hirohito as a leader of democratization and indicated that he would continue to be so for the future. Privately, some loyal subjects who had sincerely believed what they were told during the war were shocked by the Emperor's new clothes and felt betrayed. There was not, however, a single instance of the right wing violence that the drafters had feared. Education Minister Maedo was astonished to personally hear only one complaint. From an elderly man who came to see him. By and large, most people seem to take the Declaration of Humanity in stride as a matter of less than momentous interest. The media were now free to comment on the sovereign's personality in a manner hitherto impermissible, and in this way Hirohito did indeed become accessible to the public in more intimate and human ways. Many readers probably found more meaning in the Emperor's New Year poem than they did in his New Year's Day rescript. In heralding the advent of each new year, the court customarily assigned a thematic topic on which members of the imperial household as well as ordinary people would compose 31 syllable waka, with commoners invited to submit their verses for evaluation by experts assembled by the court. Early in the new year, the best poems would be published alongside waka by the emperor and other eminent figures, a high honor indeed for an amateur poet. In October of that year of bitter defeat, it was announced that the theme for the coming year's poem would be Snow on the Pine, a classic image of beautiful endurance. The Emperor's own poem, widely disseminated in the media on January 22nd, was as follows Courageous Pine, enduring the snow that is piling up, color unchanging. Let people be like this. 
This was an exquisite expression of defiance, and few who read it could have missed its meaning. When all was said and done, the sovereign had not changed his color. Neither should his subjects. Chapter 11 Imperial Democracy Evading Responsibility while the Emperor was descending part way from heaven, the machinery for Allied war crimes trials of top leaders was slowly being assembled. Accusations and arrests came in unpredictable waves. The first arrests were announced on September 11th, followed by an ominous lull until a second such announcement on November 19th. In the first week of December, scores of high-ranking officers and officials were added to the list of prospective Class A defendants, including Prince Konoe, the former Prime Minister, and Kido Koichi, who had been the Emperor's closest advisor as Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal. Joseph Keenan, President Truman's appointee as Chief Prosecutor, arrived in Tokyo with 40 aides on December 6th, and MacArthur established the International Prosecution Section, IPS, for the impending trials two days later, by the Japanese calendar on the fourth anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The International Military Tribunal for the Far East was formally inaugurated by the Supreme Commander on January 19, 1946, but the designation of who among those arrested would be brought to trial immediately was not announced until March 11th. The trials themselves began on May 3rd. Until then, SCAP and the IPS might still, in theory, have accused Emperor Hirohito of war crimes. Confronting Abdication in court circles, the very idea of the emperor's being guilty of crimes was naturally inconceivable, but the notion that he should somehow assume responsibility for the war and defeat was taken quite seriously. Before Scap revealed itself to be so adamantly opposed to any policy other than using Hirohito, the emperor himself gave thought to this. On August 29th, the day before the victors set foot on the sacred soil, he spoke to Kido about abdication as a way of possibly absolving his faithful ministers, generals, and admirals of responsibility for the war. Kido told him this was not desirable. In mid-September, the cabinet headed by Prince Higashikuni, Hirohito's uncle by marriage, secretly discussed abdication with the emperor's knowledge. Whereas some ministers emphasized that the emperor had no constitutional responsibility for the war, others stressed that he bore moral responsibility to the nation— to the dead, and to his bereaved subjects for the defeat. In the first week of October, Prime Minister Higashikuni met privately with his nephew and recommended that he step down. Higashikuni offered to give up his own status as a member of the imperial family. His suggestion reportedly was turned down on the grounds that the time is not yet right. A few weeks later, Hirohito matter-of-factly informed his vice-chamberlain that, if he had to renounce the throne, he wished to find a good researcher to assist him in his studies of marine biology, an area of academic inquiry chosen years earlier to help establish his bona fides as a modern man. On January 4th, as public discussion of war crimes grew and a wide-ranging, categorical purge of individuals deemed to have held positions that abetted militarism and ultranationalism began, the emperor asked Fujita Hisanori, Kido's successor as privy seal, to investigate whether GHQ now wished him to abdicate. Fujita demurred at making such an inquiry. Ever keen on the study of imperial precedent, in late January the emperor had a scholar lecture to him on the abdication of Emperor Uda, who had reigned from 887 to 897, and then stepped down from the throne at the age of 31. He also had his officials brief him on the practice of abdication in the British monarchy, which he had often looked to as a model of regal propriety in the modern world. The abdication issue quickly spilled over into the media. Late in October 1945, Prince Konoe had caused a commotion by publicly raising the prospect of abdication and then amending his statements under pressure from the cabinet. Konoe was unusually outspoken in his belief that the emperor bore grave personal responsibility both for failing to prevent the war with the United States and for failing to end it sooner. On February 27th, the issue was again catapulted into the public realm when the Yomiuri Hochi newspaper reported that Prince Higashikuni, the former Prime Minister, had informed an Associated Press correspondent that abdication was being seriously discussed at the highest levels, and would have the support of the entire imperial family if Hirohito himself chose this path. 
A few days later, Higashikuni told the Japanese media directly that he had personally urged his nephew to consider three timely opportunities to abdicate. Although the first of these had already passed without action, being when the surrender was signed, the other two appropriate moments still lay ahead. As Higashikuni saw it, Hirohito should consider stepping down either when the constitution had been revised or when a peace treaty ending the occupation had been signed. Speculation in the press ran to the emperor's brother, Prince Takamatsu, as the most probable regent until the crown prince came of age. The publication of the sensational Yomiuri Hochi story coincided with the tense meeting of the Privy Council in the Imperial Household Ministry quarters, at which the emperor's thirty-one-year-old youngest brother, Prince Mikasa, indirectly urged the emperor to take responsibility for defeat. The government and the imperial family as a whole, Mikasa argued, had to transcend old thinking and take bold action now. Welfare Minister and later Prime Minister Ashida Hitoshi, who was present, recorded in his diary that everyone seemed to ponder Mikasa's words and that His Majesty's face was never so pale with anxiety. Anxious as he may have been, it was at about this time that the Emperor evidently resolved not to step down. He told Vice Chamberlain Kinoshita Michio that he was not confident anyone was qualified to take his place. Of his three brothers, Prince Takamatsu had been too openly pro-war, Prince Chichibu was too frail physically, and Prince Mikasa was too young and inexperienced. Mikasa, at thirty-one, was eleven years older than Hirohito had been when he became regent in 1921. He regretted his uncle's careless words to the press, the emperor told Kinoshita. Well-known public figures across the political and ideological spectrum were beginning to speak up in favor of abdication. Nanbara Shigeru, a liberal Christian educator recently appointed president of Tokyo Imperial University, spoke warmly of the imperial institution in general, but argued that Hirohito should abdicate on moral grounds. Sasaki Soichi, a conservative constitutional scholar who had assisted Konoe in drafting a proposed revision of the Meiji Constitution, also advanced moral reasons for abdication. Tanabe Hajime, an austere conservative philosopher deeply engaged in elaborating a Buddhist-oriented concept of repentance for Japan, hoped the emperor would retire and become a symbol of poverty and emptiness. He also recommended that the resources of the imperial household be turned over for the relief of impoverished people. The most sensational public call for Hirohito's abdication came in an essay by Miyoshi Tatsuji, a well-known poet. Titled, The Emperor Should Abdicate Quickly, this essay appeared in the June 1946 issue of the popular magazine Shinsho. Miyoshi made it clear that he was not concerned with war responsibility in the sense that supporters of the Tokyo war crimes trials used the term, that is, direct, policy-making responsibility for aggression and atrocity, but neither did he accept the benign image of a peace-loving but helpless monarch that the royalists were promoting. What was at issue, he emphasized, was not simply responsibility for defeat in war. Rather, in unusually strong language, Miyoshi accused the emperor of being extremely negligent in the performance of his duties and responsible for betraying the loyal soldiers who laid down their lives in battle for him. The emperor had presented himself as commander-in-chief, Miyoshi declared, but had failed to curb the violence of the military. He spoke paternalistically of his subjects as his children, but then urged them to obey to the death an army and navy he knew to be out of control. As head of state, he should now set a moral example by taking responsibility for the disaster. He had been incompetent in his wartime leadership, in appraising and responding to situations, in choosing personnel, in his perception of the people's sentiments, and in his judgments about when and how to end the war. Having announced he was not a manifest deity, he should now act as an ordinary mortal and follow the dictates of reason by abdicating. Had the occupation authorities chosen to encourage Hirohito's abdication, it seems clear that there would have been no insurmountable obstacles to such an act. The emperor's entourage acknowledged this. However, sadly, the public would surely have accepted an imperial announcement of abdication as easily as they had accepted defeat itself. Conservatives would have rationalized the abdication as a reaffirmation of the moral integrity of the imperial institution. 
Imperial democracy could still have been promoted under a new sovereign, but Hirohito's disastrous Showa era, so mockingly ironic in its nomenclature, since the two ideographs for Showa meant radiance and peace, would have been closed and the issue of responsibility would have been cast in a sharper light. MacArthur and his aides appraised the situation very differently, of course, and made their position clear to the Japanese side. On November 26th, when the former admiral and prime minister Yonai Mitsumasa, who remained a close imperial confidant, solicited MacArthur's views on abdication, the supreme commander replied that this would not be necessary. A month later, one of the court's Japanese contacts with GHQ reported that General Dyke, the head of CI&E, had suggested that the emperor might remove himself from the limelight by leaving Tokyo and re-establishing his court in Kyoto, which had been the traditional seat of the imperial household prior to the mid-nineteenth century. One day later, three Japanese intermediaries who had relations with CI&E brought Vice Chamberlain Kinoshita a remarkable long memorandum that summarized General Dyke's views on the problem of the imperial house. It began with the flat assertion that maintenance of the emperor was absolutely essential to constructing a democratic Japan. Early in March 1946, the vice chamberlain was informed that General Fellers was worried about funny people around the emperor who seemed to be giving him bad advice, a reference presumably not only to such imperial heretics as Prince Higashikuni and Prince Mikasa, but also to the court advisers who had arranged the lectures on Emperor Uda's abdication and British-style royal departures. Fellers, who often emerged as the deus ex machina in MacArthur's imperial intrigues, could be unusually blunt in telling his Japanese opposites that they could maintain the throne and should keep Hirohito on it. Thus, at one point, the general informed former Admiral Yonai that the emperor was the best ally for the occupation authorities and... The emperor's system should continue so long as the occupation does. Fellers rationalized this policy as essential to thwart Soviet-led communization of the entire world, and told Yonai that un-American thought was on the rise even at high levels in the United States, where influential voices still called for arresting Hirohito as a war criminal. According to the Japanese record of the conversation, Fellers then urged Yonai to ensure Emperor Hirohito's survival by fixing testimony by defendants in the impending war crimes trials. It would be most convenient, Fellers is recorded as having said, if the Japanese side could prove to us that the emperor is completely blameless. I think the forthcoming trials offer the best opportunity to do that. Tojo in particular should be made to bear all responsibility at his trial. In other words, I want you to have Tojo say as follows, at the Imperial Conference prior to the start of the war, I had already decided to push for war even if His Majesty the Emperor was against going to war with the United States. The Class A defendants led by Tojo were to be asked, quite literally, to die to protect their sovereign in the halls of justice rather than on the battlefield. Yonai readily agreed to pass on this message. On March 20th, Fellers invited Terasaki Hidenari, Terasaki's wife and Fellers' cousin, Gwen, and their young daughter to dinner. Afterwards, the court aide bluntly asked what MacArthur thought about the emperor abdicating. Taking care to point out that he could not presume to speak for his commander, Fellers then emphasized that MacArthur was the emperor's true friend. The general, he told Terasaki, had recently informed Washington that, were the emperor to be indicted, Japan would be plunged into chaos and a significantly larger occupation force would be required. He had taken this position even though the emperor bore technical responsibility for the war. Insofar as abdication was concerned, it might also cause chaos by posing various problems of succession. For this reason, Fellers believed MacArthur did not desire Hirohito's abdication. Terasaki asked if the Supreme Commander could publicly express his opposition to abdication to put a stop to the disrespectful so-called abdication discussion in the press thus enabling the Japanese people to feel that dark clouds had been dispelled and they were again beholding the sun. This, Fellers responded, would be extremely difficult. What Fellers was disclosing to the Emperor's aide was the gist of a secret cable from MacArthur to General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Army Chief of Staff. 
In this response to Washington's call for an investigation of the emperor's war responsibility, MacArthur pulled out all the stops in defending him. Investigation has been conducted, the Supreme Commander had informed Eisenhower on January 25th, and no evidence had been found that connected Hirohito to political decisions during the past decade. MacArthur characterized the emperor as a symbol which united all Japanese, and warned that if he were indicted, the nation would experience a tremendous convulsion, disintegrate, initiate a vendetta for revenge whose cycle may well not be complete for centuries, if ever. Government agencies would break down. Civilized practices will largely cease. Guerrilla warfare could be expected. All hopes of introducing modern democracy would disappear. And once the occupation forces left, some form of intense regimentation probably along communistic lines would arise from the mutilated masses. This was not pleasant to contemplate, and to maintain order in the midst of such chaos, MacArthur declared, he would need at least a million troops, in addition to an imported civil service of several hundred thousand, for an indefinite number of years. If this passionate cable amounted to a reprise of the memorandum Fellers had submitted to his commander on October 2nd, the doomsday rhetoric was inimitably MacArthur's. Although it was not until over four months later that the International Prosecution Section, IPS, of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East publicly exonerated the Emperor from war crimes, MacArthur's cable essentially marked the end of the issue as a topic of serious internal consideration. Before the war crimes trials actually convened, SCAP, the IPS, and Japanese officials worked behind the scenes not only to prevent Emperor Hirohito from being indicted, but also to slant the testimony of the defendants to ensure that no one implicated him. Former Admiral and Prime Minister Yonai, following Fellers' advice, apparently did caution Tojo to take care not to incriminate the Emperor in any way. The collaborative campaign to shape the nature of the trials went considerably beyond this, however. High officials in court circles and the government collaborated with GHQ in compiling lists of prospective war criminals, while the hundred or so prominent individuals eventually arrested as Class A suspects and incarcerated in Sugamo prison for the duration of the trial, of whom only twenty-eight were indicted, solemnly vowed on their own to protect their sovereign against any possible taint of war responsibility. The sustained intensity of this campaign to protect the Emperor was revealed when, in testifying before the tribunal on December 31, 1947, Tojo momentarily strayed from the agreed-on line concerning imperial innocence and referred to the Emperor's ultimate authority. The American-led prosecution immediately arranged that he be secretly coached to recant this testimony. The counterpoint to this act of tampering involved the simplest of tactics, non-action. Despite the charge to do so, neither SCAP nor the IPS ever conducted a serious investigation of the Emperor's involvement in promoting aggression. No close, impartial textual analysis of the documentary evidence was undertaken that focused on the Emperor's political, military, and ideological role from the beginning of his reign. No one seriously questioned the claim of the Emperor's apologists that his acts were constrained by his strict sense of being a constitutional monarch, when in fact under Meiji-era stipulations concerning the military's rights of supreme command, much of Japan's aggression was formulated outside the cabinet in conferences involving only the military and its commander-in-chief. Serious interrogation of former high officials concerning the emperor was taboo, although GHQ's door always was open to the sovereign's defenders. When Prince Konoe, the least beguiled participant in inner court circles, spoke critically of the Emperor's responsibility, the Americans recoiled in horror. One of the American generals who was interviewed Konoe several times, a British official reported, described him to me as a rat who was quite prepared to sell anyone to save himself and even went so far as to call his master, the Emperor, the major war criminal. With the full support of MacArthur's headquarters, the prosecution functioned, in effect, as a defense team for the Emperor. These endeavors to insulate Hirohito from any taint of war responsibility, which went beyond the Emperor's own expectations, resulted in a lost opportunity to use him to help clarify the historical record. As the formal commencement of the Class A trials drew closer, the Emperor apparently assumed that he would eventually be called on to give his own version of the wartime decision-making process. 
Whatever his motivation, between March 18th and April 8th, he spent a total of eight hours dictating a monologue about the major policy decisions of his reign to his aides. By no means did these recollections amount to an acknowledgment of personal responsibility. On the contrary, he used the occasion to lay the onus for disastrous policies on his subordinates. At the same time, however, this unprecedented recitation offered a window into his exceptionally detailed knowledge of personalities, procedures, and concrete decisions at the highest levels. At the time, every top Japanese leader apart from the emperor was being subjected to interrogation by the IPS. It seemed natural to assume that the victors also would wish to tap the emperor's unparalleled inside knowledge, and the monologue essentially amounted to an imperial dress rehearsal for such anticipated questioning. As it transpired, Chief Prosecutor Joseph Keenan had already informed his international staff that the emperor was off limits and, if they couldn't agree with this, they should, by all means, go home immediately. Both Fellers and General Charles Willoughby, MacArthur's chief of counterintelligence, appear simply to have buried materials related to the Emperor's presentation that were provided to them by court sources. This successful campaign to absolve the Emperor of war responsibility knew no bounds. Hirohito was not merely presented as being innocent of any formal acts that might make him culpable to indictment as a war criminal. He was turned into an almost saintly figure who did not even bear moral responsibility for the war. For cynical practitioners of real politic, this was an easy and natural undertaking. Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe, an intelligence specialist who was assigned responsibility for both ensuring the Emperor's physical security and compiling initial lists of probable war criminals, looked back on his activities with bemusement. He was all in favor of keeping Emperor Hirohito on the throne, he recalled, because otherwise we would have had nothing but chaos. The religion was gone, the government was gone, and he was the only symbol of control. Now I know he had his hand in the cookie jar, and he wasn't any innocent little child. But he was of great use to us, and that was the basis on which I recommended to the old man, MacArthur, that we keep him. For more thoughtful insiders, such pragmatism was more agonizing. In a long report to President Truman early in 1946, for example, George Atchison, the State Department's representative in Tokyo, frankly stated his belief that the Emperor is a war criminal— and that the emperor's system must disappear if Japan is ever to be really democratic. Nonetheless, in the present circumstances, Atchison too believed that chaos could be averted, and democracy best served, if the imperial system were maintained and Hirohito exempted from charges of war responsibility. Abdication, he ventured, was a potentially attractive future course, but best postponed until constitutional revision could be effected. Atchison was killed in a plane crash shortly afterward, and so did not live to witness how the abdication issue unfolded. Although the government formally announced in September 1946 that the emperor had no present intention of stepping down, the possibility of his doing so resurfaced on two occasions. In 1948, as the Tokyo trial approached judgment, the issue of the emperor's moral responsibility was rekindled, Long before sentences were announced, it was obvious that Hirohito's loyal servants would be condemned to death or imprisonment. How should the emperor respond? In a discussion published in a mass circulation magazine, Mibuchi Tadahiko, the chief justice of Japan's Supreme Court, joined the constitutional scholar Sasaki Soichi and the liberal critic Hasegawa Nyozekan in a frank exchange in which Mibuchi and Sasaki agreed that it would have been appropriate for the emperor to have taken the blame for the war upon himself as soon as hostilities ended. A poll conducted in Osaka found over a quarter of respondents in favor of Hirohito abdicating right away or at an opportune moment. Other sources speculated that if a vote were actually taken, popular support for abdication would probably run around 50 percent, and much higher if the emperor personally stated it to be his wish to step down. It was known that these matters were being discussed at high levels, and rumored that Hirohito himself was torn by conflicting feelings. As usual, the Americans weighed in to squelch any such prospects. Although Fellers had retired and left Japan over a year previously, in July 1948 he hastened to write a personal letter to Terasaki expressing his alarm at the frequent mention of the sire's abdication in the American press. Such an act, he declared, 
would be a victory for all communists and especially the Russians, who hold it is naive to claim that Japan can be democratized so long as the emperor remains on the throne. It would be a blow to the MacArthur occupation as the general's success has made the very best use of the emperor's prestige and personal leadership. By stepping down, moreover, Hirohito would unravel the whole mystique of imperial innocence that had been so carefully nurtured to that point. His abdication, especially if it coincided with the announcement of war crimes punishments, would, in the eyes of the world, identify the sire as one of the military clique. This, of course, is absolutely untrue. It would reverse public opinion in this country, the United States, which is beginning to turn to the impression that the emperor was not responsible for the war. Abdication would fix the sire's place in history as one who sympathized with the war criminals and, as a gesture of his sympathy for them, gave up his throne. Today Japan is absorbing the terrific impact of Western civilization. She needs, in fact Japan must have, the stabilizing influence which only the sire can give. He is part and parcel of the new Japan which is surely emerging. He must help Japan's re-entry into the family of nations. No Japanese royalist could have surpassed such homage to the sire, but Fellers was not alone among Americans in his passionate feelings about this issue. In the closing days of October, former Prime Minister Ashida Hitoshi informed William Siebold, Atchison's replacement as the State Department representative in Tokyo, that the Emperor did indeed seem to be thinking about abdicating. Siebold immediately brought this to MacArthur's attention, and in a personal and top-secret letter to his superior in Washington, conveyed the startling information that MacArthur feared that, under the strain of the impending military tribunal judgments, Hirohito might consider not merely abdicating, but even committing suicide. The two men agreed, in any case, that abdication would play directly into the hands of communists and chaos in Japan, and MacArthur declared that as soon as he saw the emperor, he would tell him that any thought of abdication is not only ridiculous and preposterous, but that it would result in a major disservice to the Japanese people. Siebold, on his part, hastened to convey the same message to Terasaki, stating that he believed this to be the position of Washington, as well as of the Supreme Commander. The notion that the Emperor might commit suicide when the Tokyo Tribunal handed down its judgments was a strange reading of Emperor Hirohito's personality. Siebold concurred that this was a possibility, especially as the Emperor is both Oriental and Japanese. Be that as it may, in an ultra-secret personal message on November 12th, the Emperor set MacArthur's mind at ease. With renewed resolution, he told the Supreme Commander, he intended to work together with his people for the reconstruction of Japan and the promotion of world peace. When the occupation ended three and a half long years later, the Emperor faced the moment for which his old confidant Kido had told him to prepare when bidding farewell as he left for prison in December 1945. The honor of the Imperial House, Kido had then emphasized, demanded that he take responsibility for losing the war, but the proper moment to do that would only be when the occupation ended and a peace treaty was signed restoring sovereignty to Japan. In October 1951, still imprisoned under the sentence meted out to him by the Tokyo Tribunal, Kido recorded in his diary that he had sent a message to the Emperor reiterating these sentiments. Abdication, he counseled, would be an act of compliance with the truth. It would console the bereaved, including the families of condemned war criminals, and make a very important contribution to national unity centered on the imperial house. Should the emperor fail to seize this opportunity, he observed, the end result will be that the imperial family alone will have failed to take responsibility, and an unclear mood will remain which, I fear, might leave an eternal scar. Kido's conception of the emperor's responsibility, like that of most Japanese, was inner-directed. The emperor should assume responsibility for defeat. He should clear the historical record by apologizing to his subjects who had suffered, died, or been bereaved in a war waged in his name. In this manner he would cleanse the throne of the bloody stain of the most terrible interlude in Japanese history. But the moment came and went, and this time there was no MacArthur serving as Hirohito's alter ego. In November, word filtered back to Kido that the Emperor was giving serious thought to abdicating and once again was being encouraged in this direction by some of his most intimate advisers. Nothing came of this. 
the rescript with which the emperor greeted the long-awaited restoration of sovereignty, announced his intention to remain on the throne and contained no mention whatsoever of personal responsibility, although earlier drafts had included the expression, I deeply apologize to the nation for my responsibility for the defeat. Why was the apology finally deleted? Because, the story is told, the emperor was persuaded by the rhetorical query of one of his advisers. Why now is it necessary for his majesty to apologize in such strong terms? Imperial Tours and the Manifest Human While these intrigues were unfolding, the conservative elites collaborated with GHQ on a massive public relations campaign designed to transform the emperor into, to coin a phrase, a manifest human. The sovereign, it was agreed, should literally descend to the level of his subjects by touring the country and mingling with the poor, hungry, and wretched. These tours, known in plain Japanese as Junko, inevitably carried the special aura of being Gyoko, or August Imperial Visits. They also marked the beginning of what became known as the Mass Communications Emperor System, the transformation of the monarch into a celebrity. These costly imperial processions continued through the occupation period and eventually brought Hirohito into every prefecture except Okinawa. The sovereign whom millions had known almost exclusively as a manifest deity and bemedaled commander astride his famous white horse, now suddenly appeared standing alongside them, awkwardly trying to make conversation with kinds of people he had never spoken to before, shuffling awkwardly in his new clothes, a soft felt hat and a western coat and tie. By the time the tours ended in August 1954, they had consumed a total of 165 days and covered some 33,000 kilometers. Much of the planning behind them was shrewd. Hardly by chance the Emperor descended on Hiroshima on the sixth anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, presumably offsetting one act with the other in a little game of binary symbolism. Later he also appeared at the Nagasaki bedside of Nagai Takashi, the best-selling author who lay dying of radiation sickness. The tours represented an extraordinary undertaking for the painfully formal Hirohito, and, in ways both planned and unplanned, they contributed greatly to the creation of his new persona. The vaunted identity of sovereign and subject never seemed more viable than in those hard-scrabble years when the emperor left pomp behind, dressed like an accountant or a small-town school principal, and tried to talk to his subjects. That, of course, was the purpose of the tours, to drive the wedge, meld emperor and people, and secularize popular veneration of the throne. At the same time, Emperor Hirohito carried out these engagements with such stolid, uncomplaining discomfort that, in unanticipated ways, he actually became an intimate symbol of the suffering and victimization of his people. As often as not, they felt sorry for him. Although the precise genesis of the tours is obscure, high court officials such as Irie Sukemasa later indicated that Hirohito personally thought of going out among his subjects shortly after the surrender. On December 8th of that year, some ordinary subjects volunteered to help clean the grounds of the imperial palace, and much was subsequently made of the fact that the emperor exchanged a few words with them. On January 1st, in its coverage of the emperor's rescript, the Asahi described the sovereign as a gentle gentleman and broached the need for more effective public relations. Two days later, the same newspaper published an article on the British Royal House and its effective interaction with the public. Hirohito had been deeply impressed by the British royal style ever since his visit to Great Britain as Crown Prince in 1921, and around the end of 1945 his advisers provided him with an illustrated English-language book about the British royal family. This included photographs of the king mingling with the public and even descending into coal mines to observe miners at work. The book was introduced to the Imperial Household Ministry by Yamanashi Katsunoshin, the head of the Peer's School who was also Reginald Blythe's point of entree to court circles. Whether the book came from that avid British Zen royalist is unclear, but he soon emerged as a major catalyst in the campaign to have the Emperor demonstrate, and not merely proclaim, his humanity. The English expatriate wrote a memorandum, translated and shown to the Emperor on January 13th, stating that the time was ripe for him to offer positive suggestions to MacArthur about his future course of action. The emperor must reign, not rule, Blythe emphasized. 
He must show himself really interested in the people, not only by words, but by coordinated action and speeches, appealing to their pride, their love of country. More specifically, the emperor should travel around the country, visiting coal mines, the power of picture books, and farming districts, listening to the people, talking to them, asking questions. He should uncork some feeling, pull out the Vox Humana stop, and appeal to the Japanese to share their stocks of food. He should tell the Japanese that they are still a great people, potentially, and have their unique contribution to make to world culture, particularly in the fields of literature and religion and mode of life. The Japanese had a saying that you can gaze upon the lords, but looking at the shogun will make you blind, and the emperor cannot be seen at all. To startier court officials, it was inelegant to contemplate the sovereign literally descending to mingle with ordinary people, not to mention the terrifying thought that he might be assassinated by communists. But the emperor responded positively to Blythe's proposal, and General MacArthur threw his enthusiastic support behind the tours. Again, the Meiji period provided a precedent. Between 1872 and 1885, the Meiji emperor had made six royal tours to different parts of the country to help mobilize popular support behind the emerging emperor centered modern state. There was one especially striking similarity between the public excursions of the two sovereigns. Each set of tours was undertaken at a time of domestic confusion and instability, when radical ideologies were being trumpeted and support for the imperial system seemed precarious. Whatever precedent Hirohito may have seen in his grandfather's processionals, such excursions were unprecedented in his own reign, not to speak of the fact that they ran against the grain of his introverted personality and the rigidly aloof style he had cultivated until then. The Emperor's very unpreparedness for mingling with ordinary people proved to be an immense public relations advantage. His attempts at conversation were so stumbling and ill at ease that they provoked a wave of popular sympathy for so sheltered and vulnerable a soul. This almost disconcerting awkwardness also reinforced an impression of him as someone uniquely pure and innocent. That the Emperor was willing and even eager to undertake these tours, despite his obvious discomfort, strengthened the argument that this was a sovereign truly devoted to his subjects. His social ineptitude made him seem all too human. And simultaneously unworldly, an essentially spiritual essence after all. The imperial discomfort also tapped a strain of guilt in the populace. Up to the war's end, Japanese had been indoctrinated to apologize to the emperor for each and every failure to advance the nation's cause. In their peculiar way, the imperial tours revitalized and refocused this mass psychology of self criticism and apology. Obviously, the emperor was undertaking these excursions for the people's sake. Just as obviously, this was not a natural or an easy thing for him to do. A feeling emerged that one should, as in the past, apologize for embarrassing and inconveniencing His Majesty. Here was imperial veneration transmogrified, although whether it had anything at all to do with democracy was another matter entirely. By coming down from above the clouds, as the hoary trope had it, To walk on the same burned earth his subjects trod, the emperor also came to personalize the plight of a once proud nation brought low. Somehow he managed, almost in spite of himself, to touch a sad and subdued chord of nationalism, or at least national regret, even as he remained the one clear figure of Japanese authority amid an overwhelmingly Caucasian army of occupation. Jaundiced Western journalists did not share much of this sentiment. They were more taken by the contrast between the transcendent former Son of Heaven and this remarkably ordinary physical specimen. As Russell Brines of the Associated Press described it, the Emperor's subject suddenly learned that he was short, slight, and round shouldered, that his coordination was so poor he seemed constantly on the verge of toppling over. He was weak chinned. His conversation consisted of inanities in a high pitched voice. His face was covered with moles, a Japanese omen of good luck. Apart from a stubbly mustache, his beard was straggly and he often needed a shave. Thick, horn rimmed glasses shielded his weak eyes. His clothes were unkempt and his shoes scuffed. He was sorely in need of an alert valet. The emperor responded to cheering crowds, Brines noted, by constantly hoisting his fedora and bobbing his head, as though afraid to face silence again. 
The emperor's awkwardness was apparent from the first moments of his very first tour. On February 19, 1946, he visited a factory and black market in Yokohama. The black market, he said, was interesting. The next day he appeared at a camp for repatriated people, where he asked an official two questions. The first was, what sort of feelings do these military and civilian repatriates have when they return to Japan? The second concerned what was being done so that former Formosan and Korean colonial subjects could return home with true gratification. These conversations, recorded by NHK Public Radio, were broadcast on February 22nd and included the emperor's characteristic response, then and afterwards, to any answer he was given. Ah, so? Oh, is that so? As the NHK commentators put it, he was as stiff in actions and words as if he had just come out of a box. The emperor attracted large crowds. People gawked and on rare occasions wept. They sent emotional letters and poems to newspapers. They grew rapturous about the sun appearing from behind dark clouds. They saved the emperor's bath water in bottles and picked up pebbles where he had walked. Even ostensible communists found themselves waving illegal rising sun flags. Although it was said that as time passed, his discomfort with ordinary people eased and his comments became more articulate, this was not always readily apparent. His response to Hiroshima, almost two years after the tours began, was, There seems to have been considerable damage here. The throngs that engulfed the emperor were not exclusively Japanese. Foreign journalists and American servicemen were prominent among them. This pattern was established on the initial visit to Yokohama, when G.I.s surrounded the emperor's car, climbed on the hood, and jostled to shake his hand. Proximity to the throne proved as infectious for the Americans as it was for the Japanese. If the underlying sentiments differed, as surely they did, there was still a common denominator of awe in the presence of royalty, intoxication in the presence of celebrity. Even more striking was the formal, almost feudal role the Americans came to play in the ritual choreography of the tours. Wherever the emperor went, he was protected by G.I.s, including military policemen, who usually preceded him like an honor guard. This protection had been requested by the government, ever fearful of attacks by left-wing or right-wing radicals that never materialized. In complying, SCAP provided far more than simple physical security, however. It demonstrated, in the most concrete manner, American support for the throne and for the emperor personally, all this beginning when abdication was a live issue and the emperor in theory still indictable for war crimes. A composition by a third grader captured this particular dimension of the imperial visits. People packed both sides of the street, the youngster wrote, and the first thing that appeared was a jeep, followed by American MPs with rifles on their shoulders, and then the emperor. On occasions when the crowds became confused, the emperor's American guardians cleared the way by driving their jeeps into the melee or shooting blank cartridges into the air. Amid all the wonder and excitement, the imperial visits also provoked a healthy quota of irreverence. Emperor Ah So became a ubiquitous tagline, while the tours themselves became known as one of the three world-renewing kos, Yono Shisanko, a joke that rested on the appearance of the phonetic syllable ko in three lively media events of the time, the ecstatic new religion of Jiko Son, the hoarded goods scandal that had been first exposed by a Diet member named Seiko Koichi, and the tours, Junko, themselves. A slapstick addition to the emperor's retinue materialized in Nagoya in October 1946, when an uninvited auto appeared at the tail end of the imperial motorcade. Its passenger was none other than the would-be Emperor Kumazawa, the local pretender who claimed to represent the true imperial line. The element of carnival was always lurking just beneath the surface. Through his tours, the emperor became known as the Broom, and was depicted in a few left-wing cartoons with bristles for a head, because every place he was scheduled to visit got cleaned up. While the emperor persuaded himself that he was seeing how his subjects lived, he was, of course, only taken to clean, well-lighted places. Roads were repaired and buildings rebuilt where he was to pass. Streams were cleared out. He lodged in immaculate dwellings. Paths were covered with matting and platforms erected near the rice fields he was to observe. In the words of a GHQ report, 
Pillars, columns, and arches, usually covered with flowers and branches, were erected along the course of the royal procession. Enormous sums were spent to ensure that the emperor did not really encounter reality, to the point of sometimes devastating the budgets of local governments. As the tours became routinized, local politicians began to solicit imperial visits to enhance their personal prestige. At the other end of the procession, as many as one hundred court officials sometimes accompanied the new symbol of democracy, and corrupt members of the imperial entourage used the local visits to requisition black market rice or other gifts for their personal use. Even blue bloods felt the food shortage. Partly due to such excess and turpitude, the tours were suspended at the beginning of 1948, by which time the emperor had beyond question become a different figure than the manifest deity of the war years, although still possessed of certain extraordinary qualities. This was conveyed in an article headlined "Emperor Hirohito: He Holds Japan Together" in the English language Nippon Times, which applauded the fact that. The emperor's present attempt at humanizing himself, fortunately, has not been marred by any mishaps. Enumerating the many talents of the human emperor, the paper pointed out that it isn't everybody who can take a fan between his toes and fan himself. Not only can Emperor Hirohito perform this stunt, but he is able to do so while swimming. He can also swim in the rain, holding an open umbrella in one hand. The imperial tours were resumed in the spring of 1949. Even then, all was not unalloyed imperial charisma, as Kojima Ken, a court physician, discovered when he accompanied the emperor to the southern island of Shikoku. In the city of Uwajima, the imperial entourage lodged at an inn that had been virtually rebuilt in anticipation of this sublime visit, but the emperor had a slight cold and so chose not to bathe. In such cases, it was customary for people accompanying the sovereign to use the bath that had been prepared for him. So Kojima and a fellow doctor took to the tub. While they were soaking, the water suddenly drained out, leaving the two men shivering in an empty ofuro. The explanation for this bizarre happening, it turned out, lay in the fact that the inn had tried to recoup some of its reconstruction expenses by selling bath space to dignitaries such as the mayor and the head of the local assembly, all of whom were anticipating soaking in the same hot water the emperor had used. When the emperor failed to perform his ablutions, the local dignitaries, hovering in eager anticipation outside, were so infuriated that they pulled the plug. Kojima caught cold and ran a fever for several days. Less amusing was the emperor's visit to Kyoto in November 1951, when the occupation was nearing an end and fierce debates raged over rearmament and alignment with the United States in the Cold War. Radical students at Kyoto University prepared an open letter filled with hostile questions to be presented to the emperor, and sang a peace song instead of the national anthem in his presence. This was the first open act of protest against the imperial tours. The university refused to present the students' petition to the emperor, and indefinitely suspended eight students for lack of proper decorum. To anyone who recalled the suppression of dangerous thought a scant decade or two earlier. The new imperial democracy did indeed seem rooted in the past. One man's shattered god. In 1983, shattered god Kurakare Takami, a unique and incisive critique of the emperor's abrupt transformation from god to mortal, from supreme symbol of a holy war to ambiguous symbol of democracy, was published. Its author, Watanabe Kiyoshi. Had been an ex-serviceman with little formal education when he wrote this journal diary covering the period from September 1945 to April 1946. Watanabe turned 20 years old that November, but it would be erroneous to say that he celebrated his birthday. He was a man consumed by rage at having been betrayed by his sovereign. Watanabe had enlisted in the navy at the age of 15 and served in the decisive losing battles in the Marianas in 1942. When the tide of war turned against Japan, almost miraculously, he survived the sinking of the great battleship Musashi, in which most of his comrades perished. He was among the earliest group of servicemen demobilized, arriving back at his home village in Kanagawa Prefecture about two weeks after the emperor's broadcast. Unlike others, he returned empty-handed with no looted military supplies, for which his mother berated him, comparing him unfavorably with the more practical demobilized sons of her neighbors. 
As a young fighting man, Watanabe had revered the emperor as ardently and unreservedly as any emperor worshipper who ever appeared in the behavioral profiles prepared by MacArthur's psychological warfare experts. He believed every word the emperor said about the holy war and expected to die fighting. When defeat came, it was rumored on his battleship and then later in his village that the emperor would be executed. Watanabe assumed he would commit suicide. To him, this seemed the natural way to take responsibility for the defeat and avoid being demeaned by the enemy. When this did not happen, he wondered if the emperor were staying on so as not to make the confusion of defeat worse. Perhaps he intended to abdicate once most of his soldiers and sailors had been demobilized. It was inconceivable that he would not in some way demonstrate responsibility for and to those who had died following his orders. Watanabe's journal began on September 2nd, the day of the surrender ceremony in Tokyo Bay. Seeing even Japanese vessels flying the enemy's flag tore him apart. There could be no greater humiliation, he wrote. For days after returning home, he hardly moved. He even ate his meals apart from his family. When Allied troops poured into Tokyo, he felt as if muddy military boots were trampling on his heart. Tojo's botched suicide attempt disgusted him and the Emperor's first visit to MacArthur shocked him beyond belief. Seeing the famous photograph of the two leaders standing side by side like friends made him want to vomit. It also impressed on him the finality of the fact that, together with the Emperor, we truly lost. His sense of despair went beyond the norm, for he simply could not comprehend why the Emperor showed no sense of shame. The Emperor threw away his divinity and authority by himself and bowed his head like a dog, Watanabe wrote. And so, for him, the emperor died on this day. In the months that followed, he was a man obsessed, tormented by a sense of betrayal, frightened by his own anger. He found it no longer possible to trust anything or anyone, including himself. If the emperor truly did not want the war, then why had he signed the declaration of war? Why did he seem to be trying to pass responsibility for Pearl Harbor on to Tojo? Why could he not simply say this was done by his order? The press, too, appalled him. Newspapers that only yesterday had been trumpeting every slogan of the Holy War were now talking about a conspiracy by the militarists, bureaucrats, and Zaibatsu. Someone, Watanabe noted with approval, said that the only truth in the press was to be found in the obituaries. The sudden vogue of media praise for American-style democracy and yesterday's enemy becoming today's friend struck him as fatuous. If friendship was so important, why had they gone to war in the first place? Why had he risked his life? What, here in early October, was one supposed to make of the repentance of the hundred million that the government was promoting? For every Japanese to express repentance for defeat was meaningless. On the other hand, it might make sense for those directly responsible for starting the war, including the emperor, to express repentance to the people. A female acquaintance told him that he was simply wrong. The emperor had been a robot, not responsible for what was done in his name. The photograph with MacArthur was just a performance. However, for Watanabe, who, like many poorly educated teenage soldiers and sailors, had never doubted that the emperor was a kind of divinity, a supreme value in whom one could place absolute trust, it was all too real. By mid-October he was so consumed with rage that he began to fantasize about burning down the imperial palace, hanging the emperor upside down from a pine tree by the palace moat, and beating him with an oaken stick, as was done to sailors in the imperial navy. He even imagined dragging the emperor to the bottom of the ocean to make him view the thousands of corpses lying there as a result of the war his orders had begun. He saw himself seizing the emperor by the hair and banging his head against the rocks on the ocean floor. He believed he was going crazy. In the latter part of October, he mused about putting the imperial system to a popular referendum. Most Japanese, he conceded, would support the emperor. Watanabe absolutely opposed arresting him, for this would only involve a vengeful trial by the victors. In his village, people already were beginning to speak of MacArthur as the new emperor, or a new king who stood over the emperor. Their fickleness sickened him. His fellow Japanese simply snuggled up to whomever was most powerful at the moment. Times change, people kept saying, but Watanabe wanted no part of such shallow pragmatism. 
On November 7th, Watanabe recorded his disgust at the saccharine apple song that had caught everyone's fancy. Several days later, he noted that the emperor had been outfitted with a new uniform that made him look like a railroad employee. This indicated, he thought, that the imperial house felt confident the emperor would neither be arrested nor abdicate. But what were his thoughts, he wondered. In mid-month he listened to a village dignitary lecturing about how the Holy War had actually been a war of aggression, and recalled how the same man had given speeches supporting the war. When GHQ began arresting prominent figures for war crimes, Watanabe recorded his opposition. The Japanese should conduct such trials on their own. In late November, upon hearing that the emperor had visited Yasukuni Shrine, dedicated to those who died in war for the imperial cause, he wondered how the souls of the dead greeted the sovereign, and then concluded that there could be no such souls, for if there had been, they would already have slain the emperor with their curses. A few days later he heard that a new photograph of the emperor was to be distributed to the schools. This led him to remember the day the Musashi sank, when he had watched an officer clutching the emperor's heavy, enclosed, sacred photo in his arms as he leapt into the ocean. The weight of it must have carried the man to his death. When Watanabe saw a communist poster calling for the overthrow of the emperor's system, he found himself laughing at the vagaries of language. During the war it had been common to speak of loyalty to the emperor as Sekishin, literally Red Heart. Now he found himself agreeing with the poster. He realized that he had come to possess a Red Heart of an entirely different nature. Early in December he resolved to judge everything for himself, never again accepting without question what others said. On December 15th, the day the directive disestablishing state Shinto was issued, Watanabe was severely beaten up by five gangsters who belittled him as an ex-soldier. Lying in bed with his bruises, he imagined himself back on the Musashi, aiming its 46-centimeter shells at random all over Japan. He wrote this curse. What is the emperor? What is Japan? What is love of country? What is democracy? What is country of culture? All this, all of this eats shit. I spit on it. On December 21st, an acquaintance from Yokosuka visited Watanabe and asked him about his own responsibility for having believed so blindly in the emperor. The man left him two books by the Marxist humanist Kawakami Hajime, a history of modern economic thought and a copy of his old classic Bimbo Monogatari, A Tale of Poverty. He also gave Watanabe three packs of Lucky Strike cigarettes. Watanabe threw the American cigarettes in the river, but the books provided him an entree into a new world. On the last day of 1945, Watanabe recorded that SCAP had issued a progress report on Japanese democratization, claiming that the Shinto directive had destroyed the last evil elements supporting the emperor system and that feudalistic elements were being eliminated one by one. This was a lie, Watanabe observed, so long as the emperor remained. The SCAP pronouncement reminded him of comparable pronunciamentos by the wartime military high command. On January 1st, the day of the emperor's Declaration of Humanity, he finished reading Kawakami's History of Economic Thought. He found the chapter on Marx especially illuminating. When he read the emperor's New Year's Day rescript, which he had assumed would be an abdication announcement, Watanabe's rage again became physical. He felt dizzy. Cold blood rushed up from his feet. He felt like vomiting his anger. He was particularly incensed by the emperor's denial that he had ever been a manifest deity. It was as if Hirohito were playing games with the people, as if it were merely a contest of foxes and badgers, trickster figures in Japanese folklore. The rescript's warning against radical tendencies and declining morality also outraged him. Who, if not the emperor, was responsible for causing such conditions? How could he even speak about the people's declining morality when he himself had not yet taken responsibility for the war? Feudal lords, Watanabe observed, took responsibility when their castles fell. Captains bore responsibility for the loss of their ships. Then it struck him. Neither the August 15th nor the January 1st rescripts contained a single line saying, I was to blame, I apologize. When the press published MacArthur's praise of the emperor for playing a leading role in the democratization of Japan, Watanabe dismissed this as a contradiction, like sugar that is not sweet. True democratization, Minshuka, 
could only be created by the people, Min. That was why democracy was rendered Min Shushugi. The four ideographs literally mean people sovereignism. For a recently devoted emperor worshipper with only eight years of formal education, Watanabe had traveled a long way, driven by his rage. In the wake of the Declaration of Humanity, Watanabe began to ponder more deeply his own responsibility for having believed in the emperor. He expressed disappointment in the Communist Party's abandonment of opposition to the emperor and the emperor system. At the same time, he was disgusted to hear a neighbor tell his father that Japan should become the 49th state of the United States. The same man, he recalled, had run around urging people to fight the devilish Anglo Americans. Formal announcement of the war crimes trials in late January troubled him, for although it seemed appropriate for Chinese and Southeast Asians to judge the Japanese, the situation was not so clear cut where the Americans were concerned. He agreed Pearl Harbor had been wrong, but wondered how people who had dropped atomic bombs could speak so easily of Japan as the enemy of peace and morality. Late in January, Watanabe finished reading Kawakami's Tale of Poverty. He admired it greatly, but took issue with a passing point. Kawakami had written critically about a store selling expensive cosmetics to the poor daughters of tenant farmers, using this as an example of the exploitation of the poor. To Watanabe, himself a rural boy, it was entirely appropriate for poor country girls to wish to become pretty like any other young women. On February 1st, he recorded his shock on hearing of Kawakami's death. The old scholar was a true teacher and had opened his eyes to the way he had blindly followed along. Ignorance, Watanabe wrote, is the most terrifying thing. Early in February, Watanabe was shocked by GHQ's revelation of the immense assets of the imperial family. He had never connected the emperor with money and goods, another indication, he felt, of his own ignorance. Watanabe continued to wrestle with the question of his own war responsibility. He came to accept the fact that the war had been one of aggression. Although he had not realized this at the time, his ignorance did not, he felt sure, erase his responsibility. It had taken millions of deaths, blood sacrifices, and then defeat to bring him to this realization. He now thought not only about the comrades who had died around him, but also about the countless shells he had fired to kill Americans. When in mid February a relative encouraged him to return to school, He expressed cynicism about this. Scholarship, art, culture, all seemed meaningless since they had not succeeded in preventing such a war. On February 22nd, Watanabe read or heard an account of the Emperor's conversation with a soldier repatriated from Saipan. Was the war severe? asked the Emperor. Yes, it was severe, the man replied. You really worked hard, it was a lot of trouble, the Emperor added in response. Keep on working hard. Advance along a fine path as a human being. Once again, Watanabe was plunged into despair. Perhaps he thought the emperor simply lacked the normal sense of responsibility other people possessed. Could he not at least have said, I am sorry to have caused you so much difficulty? It puzzled Watanabe that people accepted the emperor's hat waving tours so easily. And he placed some of the blame for this on the failure of the media to face the emperor's war responsibility squarely. The fashion was to blame militarists and big capitalists for the war and present the emperor as their victim, a poor robot or a true pacifist. Since the media had kowtowed to the military themselves, he speculated, perhaps this was part of their tactic for absolving themselves of responsibility. He continued to wonder about the psychological influence the emperor's behavior was having on the people as a whole. If the entire nation followed the emperor, Watanabe feared, they would end up with only one guiding rule. Even the emperor gets away without taking responsibility, so there is no need for us to take responsibility no matter what we did. On March 8th, Watanabe, recording his thoughts on the newly announced draft constitution, Marveled at the emperor's ability to change forms from god to human to symbol so rapidly. He bitterly exclaimed that a sardine's head might be a better symbol. A few days later, he had a conversation with some veterans from the China Theater, much older than he, and was shocked to hear about the atrocities one of them committed there, apparently without a bit of remorse. Was that man's irresponsibility a reflection of the emperor's? Might he himself have casually engaged in such acts had he been sent to China? 
In mid-March, Watanabe got into a brawl with a GI walking with a Japanese woman who was wearing bright lipstick and a red dress. Refusing to step aside, Watanabe bumped the woman's arm, whereupon the GI kicked him and they traded punches. A crowd gathered and four Japanese policemen eventually broke up the fight. Watanabe was brought to the police station for a lecture. He had never been so close to the enemy before. The American smelled like an animal, and he concluded that the term hairy barbarian was well chosen. The next day, still boiling with anger, he thought of Filipino women who had refused to go with Japanese men. Some even shot Japanese soldiers. He found them impressive. The vogue for English language terms, thank you, hello, goodbye, okay, I love you, disgusted him. In early April, Watanabe's former elementary school teacher told him that, although it was sad Japan had been defeated, in a way it was better to have lost the war. Otherwise, the Japanese would not have dreamed of democracy. This same teacher had once exhorted his young charges to join that war, and Watanabe naturally wondered if he thought about this. A few days later, he recorded an incident. A soldier, long given up for dead, had returned home to find his wife seven months pregnant by his younger brother. Tears and violence followed, and the man ran away to stay with relatives. On April 20th, Watanabe left his village to take a job in Tokyo. He had heard that anyone could write a letter to the emperor now, and he did so before leaving. He used the familiar you, Anata, unthinkable before the surrender, in addressing him. He had fought hard for the emperor in accordance with his orders, Watanabe wrote, but since the defeat he had lost all trust and hope in him. As a result, he wished to sever their relationship. He then offered an accounting of all the salary that he had been paid by the Imperial Navy and every article he could remember having received in his years of service. A long list indeed, itemizing food as well as clothing and other goods. The total, as he calculated it, came to 4,281 yen and five sen. With his letter, he enclosed a check for 4,282 yen. Thus, the letter concluded, I owe you nothing. Chapter 12 Constitutional Democracy GHQ Writes a New National Charter Early in 1946, virtually on the spur of the moment, General MacArthur initiated what he later called probably the single most important accomplishment of the occupation, nothing less than the replacing of the Meiji Constitution of 1890 with a new national charter. The Americans had long looked askance at the Meiji Charter, deeming it incompatible with the healthy development of responsible democratic government. This critique was developed in a number of confidential internal studies and policy papers. It was also expressed unusually vividly in a guide to Japan that was prepared for U.S. forces around the time of the surrender. Readers of the guide, after being informed that the early Meiji government was dominated by powerful former samurai associated with the former feudal domains of Satsuma and Shoshu, were told that these oligarchs had looked west for a constitutional model and emerged with an unholy hybrid. The new Japanese constitution with Prussian tyranny as its father and British representative government as its mother, and attended at its birth by Satcho, Satsuma and Shoshu, midwives, the guide declared, was a hermaphroditic creature. Regendering this hermaphroditic creature in 1946 involved casting aside the authoritarian German legal model on which it was based, and in which most Japanese legal specialists continued to be trained, and replacing it with a charter rooted in basic ideals from the Anglo-American legal tradition. On March 6, 1946, a draft outline of a new constitution was presented to the public as the government's own handiwork, and subsequently submitted to the Diet for deliberation and adoption. In actuality, it had originally been written in English by members of GHQ's government section in a secret week-long session in the Daiichi building in Tokyo. The Americans who participated in this extraordinary undertaking called it their Constitutional Convention. They had scooped the old Meiji Constitution hollow. Only its structure, headings, were left, as an internal GHQ memo put it. The old shell was then refilled with Anglo-American and European democratic ideals, and more. Under the new charter, Japan also renounced belligerency as a sovereign right of the state. No modern nation ever has rested on a more alien constitution, 
or a more unique wedding of monarchism, democratic idealism, and pacifism. And few, if any, alien documents have ever been as thoroughly internalized and vigorously defended as this national charter would come to be. Although it bore the unmistakable imprint of the conqueror and shocked Japan's conservative elites, indeed, although it was hermaphroditic in its own manner, it tapped into popular aspirations for peace and democracy in quite remarkable ways. Regendering a Hermaphroditic Creature The rationale for constitutional revision lay in several ambiguous sections of the Potsdam Declaration. Section 6 declared, There must be eliminated for all time the authority and influence of those who have deceived and misled the people of Japan into embarking on world conquest. Primarily, this provided justification for war crimes trials and an extensive purge of individuals associated with militaristic and ultranationalistic activities and organizations. It could, however, also be interpreted as requiring the establishment of constitutional protections against future abuses of authority. Section 10 required that the Japanese government shall remove all obstacles to the revival and strengthening of democratic tendencies among the Japanese people. Freedom of speech, of religion and of thought as well as respect for fundamental human rights, shall be established. Also pertinent was Section 12, which promised that the occupying forces of the Allies shall be withdrawn from Japan as soon as these objectives have been accomplished and there has been established in accordance with the freely expressed will of the Japanese people a peacefully inclined and responsible government. On the basis of these statements, reinforced by later directives from Washington that reiterated the general objective of modifying the feudal and authoritarian tendencies of the government, MacArthur and his staff in Tokyo concluded that their mission could not be accomplished without fundamental changes in the nation's constitutional structure. Policymakers in Washington submitted their indictment of that structure to MacArthur in a top-secret cable early in January 1946, calling for changes in the governmental system to create genuinely representative suffrage, popular control over the executive branch, a strengthened elective legislature, guarantees of fundamental civil rights, and greater local autonomy. In one significant way, Washington's critique was more radical than prevailing sentiment within SCAP. The cable went on to recommend that the Japanese should be encouraged to abolish the emperor institution or to reform it along more democratic lines. Although the Americans in Tokyo were clear on the need for constitutional revision, initially it was MacArthur's policy that any amendments to the old constitution should come from the government. Even here, the usual incongruities were apparent. The Americans were ordering the Japanese to adopt democracy by their freely expressed will through constitutional revision. They were acting, moreover, as if the post-surrender conservative cabinets actually represented the will of the people, which no one, including SCAP, the populace, and the rapidly revolving governments themselves, believed for a moment. Still, SCAP initially did as much as could be expected under the circumstances. By October 1945, it had conveyed privately and publicly to the other side that constitutional revision was expected. In the months that followed, no obtrusive attempts were made to interfere while occupation officials awaited the Japanese response. As it turned out, the public grasped the American intent quite quickly. Both private groups and political parties took the initiative to draft and publicize constitutional proposals, several of which were impressively liberal. The media followed these activities with interest, and GHQ, in turn, followed the media closely. The government, in contrast, moved like a tortoise and remained tone-deaf to the Potsdam language, even when the Americans reiterated it to them. Of all revisions proposed by Japanese, the governments were among the last to appear and the most transparently cosmetic in content. The public greeted the proposals drafted by the Cabinet's Revision Committee with derision, and GHQ seized the moment to convene its own audacious, secret convention. Where constitutional revision was concerned, the conservative old guard dug its own grave. At the official level, the Americans actually set two separate constitutional inquiries in train, one of which became a tragedy of sorts, the other a farce. The tragedy began on October 4th, when MacArthur personally encouraged Prince Konoe, then serving as minister without portfolio in the Higashikuni cabinet, to look into the problem of constitutional revision. Several days later, George Acheson discussed this project with Konoe in greater detail. 
Although the Higashikuni cabinet resigned on the day after Konoe met MacArthur, Konoe continued to regard himself as the anointed patron of constitutional matters. With the warm approval of Atchison and the Supreme Commander, he discussed the issue of revision with the Emperor, moved his activities under the aegis of the Imperial Household, and assembled a small group of constitutional experts to assist him. Konoe took his new responsibilities seriously. With the panache of the comfortable nobleman, he even rented at his own expense the entire third floor of an inn in Hakone, where his team could work without disturbance. To all public appearances, constitutional revision now had become an imperial enterprise. The media presented it as the emperor's own initiative. Despite the vagueness of his official position, Konoe was a man of exceptional influence and personal charisma. He had served as prime minister on two separate occasions in the critical period between 1936 and 1941, which enhanced his prestige immensely but ultimately was to prove his undoing. It was during Konoe's premiership in 1937 that Japan launched its War of Annihilation against China. He also was prime minister in 1938 when Japan declared a new order in East Asia, and it was his government that brought Japan into the Axis Pact with Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy in 1940. The wonder was not that he was identified as a war crime suspect before the year was out, but rather that both MacArthur and Atchison, the top American military and civilian representatives in Japan, initially deemed him an appropriate person through whom to promote constitutional democratization. MacArthur's headquarters publicly dissociated itself from Konoe's project on November 1st. It had practical reasons for doing so, but these did not lessen the sting of betrayal. Konoe had become a liability, for it was increasingly clear that he would be indicted as a war criminal. Secret memoranda, as well as mounting media criticism, made this apparent. In addition, the Shidehara cabinet grew more restive and resentful as the weeks passed, criticizing the fact that an undertaking as important as constitutional revision was being pursued outside its purview. It was the prince's own flair for publicity and self promotion that brought things to a head. And revealed in the process the intricacy of imperial politics. In late October, in the provocative interview in which he suggested that the emperor might abdicate, Konoe also referred to his conversation with MacArthur and revealed that the supreme commander had stated the necessity for a liberal constitution in a very stern tone and suggested I take the leadership in this movement. Scap had welcomed the impression that the initiative for constitutional revision had come from the emperor. Konoe's frank disclosure upset this pretense. Despite this misstep, Konoe carried on with his inquiries. On November 22nd, he presented the Emperor with an outline itemizing 22 specific constitutional problems or concerns. His primary focus was on clarifying the Emperor's authority while offering ways to prevent abuses of power in the name of the throne, but his recommendations also revealed that he had listened carefully to many of the specific concerns conveyed to his aides and informants by the Americans. His very first point stipulated, The emperor shall be the superintendent of sovereignty and shall be the exerciser of it, but it shall be made especially clear that its exercise shall be dependent on the support of the people. Since the misfortune of today, derived primarily from abuses by the armed services, in Konoe's view, care also had to be taken to clarify the military's subordination to the cabinet and diet, and thus to the will of the people. Concerning human rights, Konoe showed himself receptive to the criticism that under the existing constitution these rights were always hedged by the phrase, unless otherwise stipulated by law. It should, he recommended, be made clear that the freedom of the people take precedence over the law. Konoe went further on this score, proposing the abolition of prerogatives by which people's rights could be suspended in time of emergency. Ministers of state, hitherto responsible only to the emperor, would be made responsible to the diet as well, and fixed procedures would be established for the selection of the prime minister. The prince also proposed abolishing the elite extra parliamentary privy council. For all practical purposes, this was the end of the Kanoe initiative. No official text of his outline was ever released, although the Mainichi newspaper printed an accurate version a month later. The Konoe project seems to have made no lasting impression upon SCAP officials. Still, notwithstanding his provocative comments about abdication, the prince had performed a subtle service for the throne. His well publicized activities helped refurbish the emperor's image as a monarch devoted to peaceful rather than military concerns. 
that SCAP actively acquiesced in Konoe's initiative for a while reinforced the impression that the Americans would be amenable to modest constitutional revisions aimed at creating some sort of balance between imperial prerogatives and electoral politics. This impression was misleading. Subsequent officials charged with proposing revisions paid a heavy price for failing to recognize that SCAP desired more radical change than Kanoe envisioned. The prince himself did not live to see the game played out. On December 6th, his name appeared on an official list with those of eight others as an accused Class A war criminal. Ten days later, on the night he was to go to jail, he killed himself by taking poison. Conundrums for the Men of Meiji The more farcical government venture in constitutional revision began on October 25th, when the cabinet established its own constitutional problem investigation committee. Matsumoto Joji, a supremely self-confident legal scholar with extensive political and administrative experience, was appointed its chair. A specialist in commercial rather than constitutional law, he was nominated at the urging of Foreign Minister Yoshida. Although Matsumoto's righteousness remained intact in the turbulent months to come, his self-assurance was to be subjected to undreamed-of tribulations. To establishment figures such as Shidehara, Matsumoto, and Yoshida, constitutional revision was a frivolous notion, one more bee in the American bonnet, and initially they did not take MacArthur's statements about it very seriously. Privately, Shidehara told both Konoe and Kido Koichi that revision was neither necessary nor desirable. In his view, it would be sufficient to simply develop a more democratic interpretation of the Meiji Charter. Publicly, the Prime Minister said much the same thing. Following an October 11th meeting with the Supreme Commander, he blithely told the press that constitutional amendment was not necessary. The name of Matsumoto's Constitutional Problem Investigation Committee was deliberately worked to avoid mention of revision or amendment, and he took care to make sure no one missed the innuendo. The committee does not necessarily aim at the revision of the Constitution, he announced. The purpose of its investigation is to determine whether any amendment may be necessary, and if so, what are the points to be amended? This was not mere bravado. A few years after these events had played their course, Matsumoto ruefully confided that, We thought we could handle the matter as we pleased. We even thought it might be all right to leave the existing Constitution as it was. After all, had not the Potsdam Declaration proclaimed that Japan would be allowed to choose its future form of government in accordance with the freely expressed will of the Japanese people? The naivete of such thinking would soon become painfully apparent, but at the time it was an entirely natural response for men of this class and temperament. Like Konoe, they were privileged men born in the Meiji period. For them, the essence of the Meiji constitution— the centering of sovereignty in an inviolable emperor, was sacrosanct. For a decade or so beginning around World War I, moreover, this old guard had seen parliamentary politics and Taisho democracy flourish under that same constitution without any amendment whatsoever. From this perspective, the existing constitution seemed an adequately flexible document. Although the militarists had abused it, Civilian anti-militarists could certainly put things straight again without tampering with fundamental principles. Indeed, they were not entirely wrong. Before a new constitution actually came into effect, an extensive range of reformist policies including land reform, woman suffrage, pro-labor legislation, and economic democratization had been put into practice under the existing national charter. But here was the nub of the problem. What really made democratization possible was neither the old constitution nor the moderate old civilian elites, but their new reformist overlords, the alien Americans. And in their view, there were no constitutional protections to prevent the system from clamping shut again once they left town. This was what the Japanese conservatives utterly failed to comprehend. Their skepticism about revision notwithstanding, Shidehara and Matsumoto assembled a distinguished committee of seventeen members, including many famous legal scholars. Although the imperious Matsumoto tended to carry by far the greatest burden, often working in seclusion, the committee held 22 confidential meetings between October 27th and February 2nd. For such an eminent group of authorities, it had astonishing collective shortcomings. Prime Minister Shidehara apparently gave his advisory committee no serious instructions concerning either basic principles or simple political considerations, and the committee members themselves seemed impervious to the plain power realities of military occupation. 
They completely failed to grasp the larger legal and philosophical principles that lay behind American constitutional thought, and refused to even ask. Despite the Potsdam Declaration and the terms of surrender, they also failed to take into consideration what the numerous countries in the victorious Allied camp thought of Japan and might demand from it before they would consider restoring sovereignty. Most telling, these learned men revealed themselves to be utterly out of touch with what millions of ordinary Japanese were coming to understand democracy to be and what they desired or would tolerate. Virtually their sole reference for revision was the Meiji Constitution itself. Not only did they ignore other constitutional models, but they did not even condescend to examine the recommendations that non-official groups were making public at the time. The naivete and elitism of the Matsumoto Committee proved to be from its own perspective, a disaster. The committee left its name to history as a woeful example of insular complacency and myopic expertise. In mid-February 1946, after he had belatedly come to realize the folly of this casual attitude and was vainly struggling to regain the initiative in constitutional revision, Matsumoto attempted to persuade occupation authorities that fundamental differences between East and West were at issue here. A juridical system is very much like certain kinds of plants, which, transplanted from their native soil, degenerate or even die, he wrote in a memorandum to GHQ. Some of the roses of the West, when cultivated in Japan, lose their fragrance totally. This East is East and West is West improvisation was less red rose than red herring, for far more was involved here than white men's flora ill-suited to Eastern soil, or a simplistic clash between Western and Japanese cultures. The basic conflict lay between two Western systems of legal thinking. Put over simply, these experts, well grounded in German legislative and administrative law and a German-style theory of state structure, were largely indifferent to American concerns about popular sovereignty and human rights. Matsumoto ran his committee with a firm hand. Once he and his colleagues were persuaded that some constitutional revision was inevitable, they adopted as a guideline what became known as Matsumoto's Four Principles. As made public in a speech to the House of Representatives on December 8th, these were, 1. No change in the fundamental principle that the Emperor combined in himself the rights of sovereignty. 2. A broadening of Diet responsibilities and consequent limitation on the Emperor's prerogatives. 3. Assumption of responsibility for affairs of state by cabinet ministers who in turn would be responsible to the Diet and four, strengthened guarantees of the rights and freedoms of the people, with provision for redress of violations of such rights and freedoms. The committee recommended changing only one word in the clauses concerning the emperor. Instead of being sacred and inviolable, the sovereign would be designated supreme and inviolable. Ten additional amendments eventually were included in the so-called Matsumoto draft adopted by the committee, but this minimal word change concerning the emperor large in the minds of the committee members, but tokenistic to others, became a symbol of the extremely conservative nature of these proposed revisions. Concerning fundamental human rights, about which the Potsdam Declaration had been so emphatic, the Matsumoto group merely proposed an amendment declaring that the rights and freedoms of Japanese subjects were inviolate, except as otherwise prescribed by law. As critics within GHQ always had been quick to point out, it was precisely by law that the suppression of human rights and freedom had been carried out in pre-surrender Japan. Unlike Konoe, Matsumoto resolutely refused to inquire about SCAP's expectations. Tagaki Yasaka, a scholar versed in Anglo-American law who was not included on the committee, warned Matsumoto that his proposals would be rejected. When he urged Matsumoto to consult with GHQ, he was abruptly dismissed. Constitutional reform is to be done spontaneously and independently, Matsumoto responded. Therefore, I see no need to find out American intentions or reach preliminary understandings. Prime Minister Shidehara also never ventured to ask MacArthur, to whom he had ready access, exactly what he had in mind. On this most critical of undertakings, Victor and Vanquished simply did not communicate until it was, from the conservative perspective, too late. The inability of these high officials and eminent scholars to imagine what the Americans required was a revealing commentary on the limitations of elite Japanese understanding of the United States prior to 1946. For these were, to all appearances, impressively cosmopolitan men. 
Prime Minister Shidehara was an Anglophile whose facility with English bordered on the legendary. Shakespeare and Milton, it was said, were always within his reach. Yoshida Shigeru, whose last post as a diplomat had been ambassador to London, similarly enjoyed a reputation as an old liberal. Matsumoto also handled English capably and previously had held some of the most prestigious positions in the land, not only in Academ, Tokyo Imperial University, but also in parliamentary politics, the House of Peers, in bureaucratic administration, the South Manchurian Railway and Cabinet Legislation Bureau, and in the Cabinet, Minister of Commerce and Industry. According to one of his admirers, he had even been quite a socialist in his younger days and remained a wholehearted liberal. To be known as an Anglophile or old liberal, however, did not mean that one was also strongly pro-American or deeply knowledgeable about the United States. The few legal experts who actually had studied constitutional law in the United States were not invited to join the committee, and the best-known Japanese reference books associated with liberal constitutional theories as well as the U.S. Constitution gave but passing and superficial attention to the very area that the Potsdam Declaration had singled out for special emphasis, human rights. The writings of the most famous liberal constitutional theorist in pre-surrender Japan, Minobe Tatsukichi, were a good illustration of this blind spot. In the 1930s, Minobe had been attacked by ultranationalists, fired from Tokyo Imperial University, and expelled from his seat in the Diet because his theory that the emperor was an organ of the government, rather than sacred and transcendent, was deemed a perversion of the essence of the national polity. Yet Minobe's writings betrayed scant interest in those human rights issues that American-style liberal thinking deemed critical. The fifth edition of his famous study of the Meiji Constitution, published in 1932, gave a mere 27 pages, out of 626 total pages, to the subject of both the rights and duties of subjects. In an earlier book devoted exclusively to The Origins and Special Characteristics of the U.S. Constitution, Minobe passed over the entire Bill of Rights in eight sketchy pages. There is no need to wonder what the persecuted Minobe would have done had he been given the opportunity to participate in the revision debates, for he had this opportunity. He was a member of the Matsumoto Committee and lost no time in independently making his views public. There was no need to rush to revise the Meiji Constitution, he argued, with ardor as well as bluntness. And in any case, it was inappropriate to do so while the country was under foreign occupation. In his view, the problems of the recent past had occurred not because the Meiji Charter was flawed, but rather because the Charter's true spirit had been warped. He did not regard the status of the Emperor under the Meiji Constitution as a problem at all, pointing out that Western constitutions also referred to holy and inviolable sovereign powers. Popular Initiatives for a New National Charter The Matsumoto Committee ended up in history's dustbin largely because the civilian elites remained autocratic and anti-democratic, whereas a great many ordinary men and women were proving receptive to the sort of democracy the Americans were promoting. Many, for instance, were happy to jettison emperor worship as enshrined in the Meiji Charter. In a survey published just as the Matsumoto Committee was finalizing its recommendations, only 16% of those polled desired to keep the emperor's status unchanged. Denied secure rights and power under the Meiji Constitution, they welcomed the opportunity to better their situation. This became clear in two ways, both carefully noted by officials at GHQ. First, a number of the constitutional revisions being proposed by private organizations and individuals included liberal and progressive proposals. Second, when the Matsumoto Committee's recommendations were made public, by a spectacular journalistic scoop as it happened, the media, with strong public support, denounced them as reactionary. Besides the Konoe and Matsumoto projects, at least a dozen other proposals for constitutional revision were presented between the fall of 1945 and March 1946. Four came from political parties. In order of appearance, the Communists, the Liberals, the Progressives, and the Socialists. The Japan Bar Association contributed to the debate by advocating limiting imperial prerogatives, expanding the powers of the Diet, abolishing the peerage, and adopting a referendum system. Several proposals came from private groups and individuals, the most influential of these being the Kempo Kenkyukai, Constitutional Research Association, 
composed of liberal and left-wing intellectuals, including two distinguished scholars, Oichi Hyoi and Morito Tatsuo, who had been expelled from Tokyo Imperial University for their heretical views during the war. Another private group, the Kempo Kondankai Constitutional Discussion Group, was primarily a vehicle for the ideas of a single individual, Inada Masatsugu, although it included other members, such as the venerable parliamentarian Ozaki Yukio. Certain individuals also contributed to these deliberations, none more influentially than Takano Iwasaburo, a progressive intellectual who had a hand in the socialist and Kempo Kenkyukai drafts. Takano also published an important draft constitution of his own. A hastier and more idiosyncratic contribution came from Matsumoto Jiichiro, a veteran socialist and leader of the severely discriminated against community of outcasts, known as Eta before the surrender and Burakumin afterwards. Matsumoto proposed a union of Japanese republics, in which each republic, such as Kyushu, Kansai, Kanto, and Tohoku, would have its own president and cabinet. Only two of these proposals, the Communist Party's and Takano's, advocated abolishing the emperor system entirely. Even while supporting retention of the throne, however, several of the others drastically reduced the emperor's powers. The Kempo Kenkyukai draft explicitly transferred the locus of sovereignty from the emperor to the people, while limiting the emperor's functions to state ceremonies solely as an agent of the people. The socialists, divided over whether or not to abolish the emperor system, ended up advocating retention of a throne virtually all of whose powers would be ceremonial. Although the party did not publish its proposed constitutional draft until mid-February, the basic notion of a symbolic emperor was present in its deliberations well before the American officials in GHQ adopted the concept. The Kempo Kondankai essentially followed the British notion of the king and parliament by stipulating that the sovereignty of Japan proceeds from the whole body of the people who have the emperor as their head. Conservative groups such as the Bar Association and the Liberal Party, which emphasized preservation of the throne, nonetheless expressed support for limiting imperial prerogatives. Even the inappropriately named progressives, the most right-wing of the major political parties, spoke of the need to broaden and strengthen the powers of the Diet and caused the Diet to participate in the exercise of the imperial prerogative. Several of these unofficial proposals contained liberal provisions concerning human rights. The Communist Party's seven-point outline for a new constitution, made public in November, declared as its fifth point, the people shall have freedom politically, economically, and socially. Furthermore, their right to supervise and criticize the government shall be ensured. The sixth point of the communist outline stipulated that the people's right to live, right to work, and right to be educated shall be assured by concrete facilities. These cryptic provisions were clearly adapted from the 1936 Stalin Constitution of the USSR. Like Takano's personal proposal and the Kempo Kenkyukai draft he helped fashion, the socialists' proposal covered not merely the basic freedoms of speech, assembly, association, press, religion, and communication, but also economic rights such as the protection of livelihood and old age, and gender rights such as the guarantee of equal rights of men and women in marriage. Because of both its early appearance and liberal content, the Kempo Kenkyukai's proposal attracted particular interest at GHQ's government section. It represented, after all, an indigenous viewpoint distinctly more democratic than that of the moderates or old liberals. It was also useful in the way it called attention to the relatively recent and ideologically charged genesis of the Meiji Constitution. There was, the Kempo Kenkyukai's proposal pointed out, no single Japanese history or tradition or culture to draw upon in charting the country's future course. It was possible to read Japan's modern experience in many ways and draw a variety of lessons from it in relation to the creation of an indigenous democracy. What this and other popular initiatives for a new constitution revealed was the possibility of imagining a past, as well as a future, quite different from that which the old guard was so desperately attempting to enshrine. Those who venerated the Meiji Charter naturally tended to present that document as if it were an expression of emperor-centered values that had been cherished for ages eternal. 
In actuality, it was less than 60 years old and represented a decision by a tiny elite to turn to Germany for a constitutional model for their emerging nation-state. The emperor became the vehicle through which German-style authoritarianism was to be Japanized. In choosing this path, the Meiji oligarchs had themselves rejected more liberal constitutional proposals from outside the government, most notably from the Liberty and People's Rights Movement. The Kempo Kenkyukai drew inspiration from that earlier opposition movement and from the more liberal and radical Western traditions it had introduced to Japan. Takano himself was a splendid example of this. Born in 1871, he was 18 before the Meiji Constitution and the modern emperor system came into existence, and he never ceased to regard this new national polity as a tragic development. He made this clear in Imprisoned People, an essay that accompanied the publication of his private draft constitution. In this, Takano dwelled on how the people had become prisoners of the emperor system under the Meiji Charter. He identified the liberty and people's rights movement as a major influence on his thinking, and was not alone in calling attention to this earlier radical tradition. Suzuki Yasuzo, the only participant in the Kempo Kenkyukai who actually could be called a constitutional specialist, found similar inspiration for a more participatory democracy in this early period. After being purged from the economics faculty at Kyoto Imperial University in 1927 because of his radical views, Suzuki had devoted himself to studying the thought of the liberty and people's rights movement. In essence, these individuals were doing what the civilian old guard also did in its pointedly different way, calling attention to an indigenous tradition of democracy in late 19th century Japan. For the occupation authorities, such critical use of history was far more convincing than any roses in alien soil arguments, especially since at least some of these reformers were familiar with such a perspective through the scholarship of the Canadian diplomat E. H. Norman, the pioneer Western historian of Japan's emergence as a modern state. As it happened, Norman, Canada's representative during this critical period, actually met Suzuki in early 1945 and encouraged him to develop his critique of the national polity. Government section's favorable response to the Kempo Kenkyukai draft was spelled out in a confidential memorandum prepared for General Courtney Whitney, the head of the section, by Lieutenant Colonel Milo E. Rowell, later a major participant in the preparation of the new constitution. Rowell observed that certain rights were still neglected in the proposal, including restraints on law enforcement agencies and protection of persons accused of crimes. In general, however, the draft was praised for its outstanding liberal provisions including popular sovereignty, prohibition of discriminations by birth, status, sex, race, and nationality, abolition of the peerage, and a guarantee of extensive workers' benefits. Additional provisions would be required, but what was proposed was democratic and acceptable. It was against this background that, several weeks later, the Matsumoto Committee's proposals made an unexpectedly sensational debut. On the last day of January, Nishiyama Ryuzo, a reporter for the Daily Mainichi, came on a binder containing a draft revised constitution in the room where the Matsumoto Committee held its private meetings. He borrowed it and rushed to the newspaper office, where he and his colleagues broke it into sections and hastily hand-copied it as a team. The document was then reassembled and quietly returned, a nice exercise in formal propriety, since Matsumoto's team no longer needed it. Committee members could now obtain as many copies of the secret draft as they wished by purchasing the February 1st Mainichi. There were some misconceptions at the time about the nature of the Mainichi scoop. Officers in government section believed it was a deliberate government leak, what General Whitney described to MacArthur as Foreign Minister Yoshida's trial balloon. It was also generally and mistakenly assumed that the version pilfered and published by the Mainichi, with some minor copying errors by the journalists, was the committee's final recommendation. This draft, as it turned out, was not so conservative as the one the committee was actually planning to submit to GHQ for its confidential response. Even this version was widely ridiculed as cosmetic, tokenistic, reactionary, and completely out of touch with the temper and needs of the time. The Mainichi's own commentary provided a fair sample of opinion on this issue. Most people, the paper editorialized, surely shared their deep disappointment at the government's draft, which simply seeks to preserve the status quo. The draft resembled 
a document drawn up by law clerks, devoid of the vision, statesmanship, and idealism needed for a new state structure. Revision of the Constitution was not just a legal problem, but rather a supremely political act. Matsumoto and his colleagues simply showed no understanding that Japan is in a revolutionary period. SCAP takes over. The government paid the price for its inflexibility with awesome swiftness. In a quick succession of decisions taken between February 1st and February 3rd, MacArthur and his top aides in government section concluded that the government was incapable of proposing revisions that would meet the Potsdam requirements. SCAP would have to take the lead. This bold decision once again revealed the extraordinary authority MacArthur wielded, not merely vis-à-vis the Japanese, but vis-à-vis his own government. On February 1st, the general staff finalized a memorandum that it had been working on for a week or so that examined the basic surrender documents and concluded that the Supreme Commander possessed unrestricted authority to take any action you deem proper in effecting change in the Japanese constitutional structure. The following day, MacArthur directed government section to prepare a gist or outline of required revisions to guide the government. On February 3rd, he concluded that the stubborn functionaries on the other side would be more appropriately guided by a detailed model constitution. These steps were but prelude to government section's most extraordinary week. On February 4th, Whitney convened his staff and informed them, according to the secret minutes of the meeting, that in the next week the government section will sit as a constitutional convention. General MacArthur has entrusted the government section with the historically significant task of drafting a new constitution for the Japanese people. It would be based on three principles that MacArthur had declared essential. As jotted down in a memo Whitney brought to the meeting, they were as follows. 1. The emperor is at the head of the state. His succession is dynastic. His duties and powers will be exercised in accordance with the Constitution and responsible to the basic will of the people as provided therein. 2. War as a sovereign right of the nation is abolished. Japan renounces it as an instrumentality for settling its disputes and even for preserving its own security. It relies upon the higher ideals which are now stirring the world for its defense and its protection. No Japanese army, navy, or air force will ever be authorized, and no rights of belligerency will ever be conferred upon any Japanese forces. 3. The feudal system of Japan will cease. No rights of peerage except those of the imperial family will extend beyond the lives of those now existent. No patent of nobility will from this time forth embody within itself any national or civic power of government. Pattern budget after British system. And the timetable for turning these sparse guidelines into a model constitution? The draft, Whitney informed his staff, should be completed and ready for approval by General MacArthur by February 12th. No single event in the occupation better exemplified MacArthur's grand style. His aides skillfully parsed the basic Allied and American documents to confirm his sweeping authority. He seized a decisive moment to interpret his instructions in a manner no one else had even dreamed of, for no other person in or close to a position of authority had ever suggested, or even imagined, that the Americans might write a constitution for Japan. The grandiloquent enunciation of principles— Constitutional monarchy, absolute pacifism, abolition of feudalism, also was typical, as was the delegation of the mere details to subordinates. The line between supreme commander and supreme being was always a fine one in MacArthur's mind. In these momentous days of early February, he came close to obliterating the distinction entirely. But why, after months of scrupulously refraining from placing pressure on the government, did MacArthur abruptly decide to move so swiftly and decisively? Why did he not leave the Japanese to hammer out their own democratic form of government, particularly in light of the promising emergence of indigenous democratic voices? On the very same day that MacArthur directed government section to prepare a model constitution, polls indicated that the great majority of Japanese supported revision and wished to elect their own commission to study the problem. If, as the Potsdam Declaration proclaimed, the goal of the occupation was to create a more democratic society in accord with the freely expressed will of the Japanese people, it could be argued that these polls demonstrated promising grassroots developments. 
Why, at this juncture, did Scap take over? The answer, as so often in these months, was to be found in considerations pertaining to the throne. MacArthur was galvanized into action because he believed such an initiative had become essential to protect the Emperor. That is, he was motivated in great part by the same basic concern as the ultra-conservatives against whom he took action. It was not mere happenstance that the status of the Emperor appeared as the first of the Supreme Commander's principles. This was his foremost consideration. The renunciation of war and the abolition of feudalism were secondary, being conditions that MacArthur deemed essential for gaining global support to save the imperial system and the emperor himself. This is not to deny MacArthur's commitment to demilitarization and democratization, for he could be messianic in these areas too. The haste and high drama of constitutional revision, however, were motivated by the perception that the government's ultra-conservatism was imperiling the goal the old guard cherished most. General Whitney made this clear in his February 4th briefing. The reason for the February 12th deadline, he explained, was that Japanese officials were scheduled to meet with him on that day for an off-the-record discussion of their draft of proposed revisions, which had not yet been formally submitted to GHQ. General Whitney expects this draft to be strongly rightist in tone, the minutes of the briefing state. He intends to convince the foreign minister and his group, however, that the only possibility of retaining the emperor and the remnants of their own power is by their acceptance and approval of a constitution that will force a decisive swing to the left. This argument became the leitmotif of many subsequent meetings with the government's representatives. By accepting the basic model of the MacArthur draft, they were repeatedly told, they would be protecting themselves against an even more radical revision that might eliminate the emperor system entirely. At this moment in early 1946, the general believed that the dynasty was seriously threatened from two directions. First, from the Japanese people, whose republican ideas as embodied in the Takano and Communist Party constitutional proposals would only grow stronger with the passage of time. And second, from outside Japan, where those in the victorious Allied camp who still harbored strong anti-emperor feelings might soon be in a position to dictate the terms of any constitutional revisions. Where this external threat was concerned, a timetable had suddenly presented itself with the impending formation of the Multination Far Eastern Commission, FEC. Indeed, on January 30th, members of the preliminary Far Eastern Advisory Commission had interviewed MacArthur in Tokyo and inquired about the progress of constitutional revision. The FEC was scheduled to commence operations sometime in late February, and in an ominous February 1st advisory from his staff, the Supreme Commander was informed that your authority to make policy decisions on constitutional reform continues substantially unimpaired until the Far Eastern Commission promulgates its own policy decisions on this subject. Thereafter, the memorandum continued, MacArthur's directives on constitutional reform also could be vetoed by any member of the Four Nation Allied Council for Japan, which was scheduled to commence operations in Tokyo shortly after the FEC came into being. Suddenly it appeared that countries hostile to the emperor and the imperial institution might be in a position to override MacArthur. In these circumstances, the challenge that suddenly confronted MacArthur was to have a draft constitution under public scrutiny before the FEC actually began operating, one that would meet the Potsdam requirements and yet preserve the throne. After government section had completed its model draft, when Whitney and his aides were attempting to explain the rationale behind this to Matsumoto and his shocked colleagues, preservation of the monarchy remained their major argument. Thus, when the American draft was first presented, Whitney dwelled on this at length. As you may or may not know, he told Matsumoto and a few others, the Supreme Commander has been unyielding in his defense of your Emperor against increasing pressure from the outside to render him subject to war criminal investigation. He has thus far defended the Emperor because he considered that that was the cause of right and justice, and will continue along that course to the extent of his ability. But, gentlemen, the Supreme Commander is not omnipotent. He feels, however, that acceptance of the provisions of this new Constitution would render the Emperor practically unassailable. He feels that it would bring much closer the day of your freedom from control by the Allied powers, and that it would provide your people with the essential freedoms which the Allied powers demand in their behalf. The import of such exchanges eventually came through even to those like Foreign Minister Yoshida, 
whom Whitney and others regarded as the most reactionary element of the cabinet. Yoshida, who became prime minister in May, later took care to explain to his conservative compatriots that in the circumstances of defeat and occupation, constitutional revision was not an ideal issue of law, but a practical political matter of saving the country, preserving the throne, and hastening the day when the occupation would end. GHQ's Constitutional Convention Government Section's Constitutional Convention lost no time in meeting. A ballroom on the sixth floor of the Daiichi building was converted into a collective work area with scattered clusters of desks. Twenty-four individuals, sixteen officers and eight civilians, were assigned the task of expanding MacArthur's three principles into a full-fledged national charter within a week. The working group, which included four women, quickly was divided into a steering committee and seven subcommittees. They worked intensely over the ensuing days, usually beginning around 7 o'clock or 7.30 a.m., and continuing until around midnight. In the words of one participant, the converted ballroom was like a great big bullpen. There was constant movement between the subcommittees and the steering committee. Whitney and through him MacArthur were kept informed of the group's progress into the night. Time was so pressing that no one had the leisure really to contemplate what an audacious undertaking they were involved in. Although many members of the drafting committee were uniformed personnel, none were professional military men or women. They included four lawyers in addition to General Whitney, Colonel Charles L. Cades, Commander Alfred R. Hussey, Jr., Lieutenant Colonel Milo E. Rowell, and Lieutenant Colonel Frank E. Hayes, a former congressman and governor of Puerto Rico, Commander Guy J. Swope, a recent Princeton Ph.D. in public administration, First Lieutenant Milton J. Esman, a newspaper editor and publisher from North Dakota, Navy Lieutenant Osborne Hogg, a Wall Street investor, Major Frank Rizzo, a civilian intelligence specialist, Lieutenant Commander Roy L. Malcolm, a professor of social science and a professor of business, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Roast and Lieutenant Colonel Cecil Tilton, a foreign service officer, Navy Lieutenant Richard Poole, a historian specializing in China, Dr. Cyrus H. Peak and a journalist with pre-war experience in Japan, Harry Emerson Wilds. Political sympathies ran from conservative Republican to New Deal Democrat. Whitney placed himself staunchly among the former. Colonel Charles Cades, the head of the steering committee and true leader of the team, was a proud New Dealer with extensive experience in the Roosevelt administration. A few members of the drafting committee had been trained for military government and had a smattering of Japanese. Apart from Peak and Wilds, however, the only person on the committee with genuine knowledge of or experience in Japan was Beata Sorota, a 22-year-old Jewish woman who had been born in Vienna and come to Japan with her parents as a child when her pianist father took a teaching position at the Imperial Academy of Music. Sorota had attended the German school in Tokyo for six years, until the age of 12, before her parents deemed it too Nazi and transferred her to the American school. When she graduated from high school at the age of 15, she was fluent in Japanese and knew four other foreign languages. By the time she entered the bullpen on the sixth floor of the Daiichi building, she had graduated from Mills College in the United States, held wartime positions in the U.S. Foreign Broadcasting Intelligence Service and the Office of War Information, where she wrote and even delivered Japanese scripts for propaganda broadcasts, and been a Japan specialist for Time magazine. Her parents had spent the war years in straitened circumstances under detention in Karuizawa. Sirota's years of contact with Japanese children and servants, as well as with the women, artists, and intellectuals who regularly visited her parents at their home, had left her keenly aware of the intrusions on personal freedom that had been perpetuated under the existing constitution. Upon returning to Japan after the surrender, she found a position in government section doing research on minor political parties and women in politics. Sirota sat on the subcommittee for civil rights, and her almost serendipitous presence there provided GHQ's constitutional convention with the rare perspective of a young, spirited, idealistic, and remarkably cosmopolitan European Jewish woman who was attuned to both Japanese and American culture and especially sensitive to issues of repression and persecution. Serendipity of a different and more whimsical sort also played a role in the appointment of a young ensign, Richard A. Poole, as one of two persons charged with drafting the new provisions concerning the Emperor. Although Poole had no particular qualifications for doing this, 
He had been born in Yokohama, and his birthday fell on the same day as the emperor's. Matsumoto and his colleagues did not have the slightest inkling of these assignments and activities. Had they been able to peer through a window into that frenetic ballroom, they would have sobbed their hearts out. The civilian backgrounds of the American team contributed to a generally non-hierarchical working atmosphere in which rank was overlooked and opinions were freely expressed. Cades received high praise from virtually everyone who worked under him. By all accounts, he possessed a talent for listening, a gift for drawing the best out of people, and a clear sense of where he was going. He also possessed a New Deal skepticism toward the elitism of the Old Japan Hands. This emerged in a little joke he shared with Poole. Since the latter was only six and a half years old when he left Japan, Cades told him, I suppose you're all right. Such oblique sarcasm revealed a great deal about the outlook that enabled the Americans to be so iconoclastic in promoting radical constitutional revision. As Poole later put it, On the whole, it was healthy to have the occupation run mainly by people who were not steeped in the old Japan, and who had a totally fresh approach, and who perhaps for that reason were unafraid to try very new concepts on Japan. The Sirota was even more adamant in repudiating the argument that GHQ's actions were arrogant. At no point, she recalled, did she ever feel that she was trying to teach the Japanese something by helping to write the Constitution. Rather, she and everyone around her strongly believed they were helping to create the less oppressive society that most Japanese desired but could not obtain from their own leaders. In Sirota's case, this feeling was based on an unusual sense of identity with Japanese women, coupled with personal knowledge of their legal and marital oppression. She also had seen the Thought Police in action, for they had routinely visited her parents' house to extract information about guests from the servants and kitchen help, even collecting from them the dinner place cards that identified their Japanese as well as non-Japanese guests. Although Sirota's personal experience was unusual, her attitude was typical. An idealistic esprit overrode political differences in the sixth-floor bullpen, a humanistic spirit, participants later called it, a common sense of being in an extraordinary position to lift oppression and institutionalize democracy. This spirit was infectious. It made a difference, albeit one we never can measure precisely, that the group's interpretation of its assignment almost always was shaded toward the most generous and liberal construction of what an ideal form of constitutional monarchy might be. At the same time, Government Section's Constitutional Convention was guided, however loosely, by a number of statements and models in addition to the Supreme Commander's three grand points. The Potsdam Declaration was one. SWNCC 228, the official U.S. guideline on reform of the Japanese governmental system, which SCAP received on January 11th, was another. Attention was also given to principles enunciated in conjunction with the creation of the United Nations, as well as the various draft constitutions issued by private groups and individuals. Years later, Cades took care to repudiate the notion that the GHQ draft was a pantagruel emerging full-blown from a gargantuan government section. On the contrary, he insisted, Japanese sources were most useful. In addition, the committee hastily and almost haphazardly assembled all the English-language versions of foreign constitutions it could obtain on short notice. The Sirota requisitioned a jeep and driver to visit university libraries, obtaining a few volumes here and a few there, some ten or twelve in all, taking care not to call attention to herself by borrowing too many from a single place. During this momentous week, MacArthur's imperial style was made manifest in the most subtle way imaginable. He remained completely detached from the day-to-day -day work of his subordinates, yet always aware of what they were doing and he allowed them free reign to interpret and render concrete the basic guidelines he had declared binding. In the process, his three grand principles were reconsidered and refined. Such moments as this, when relatively obscure subordinates undertook to make MacArthur's abstractions concrete, offer a vivid sense of how little-known individuals as well as famous ones may etch their mark on history. It was Cade's team, for example, that turned MacArthur's rather stiff prescription concerning the Emperor into the radically altered first section of the new Constitution following the preamble. The two-person subcommittee, Ensign Poole and another junior officer, First Lieutenant George A. Nelson, Jr., charged with rewriting this section, simply ignored MacArthur's cryptic first sentence, 
emperor is at the head of state. These young men, together with the steering committee, also redefined the emperor in a way never mentioned by the supreme commander. They described him as the symbol of the state and of the unity of the people. Cades and his team then went on to make explicit the idea that sovereignty resided entirely with the people. In the Japanese context, this was a revolutionary concept. In such ways, the government section team not only sharpened the supreme commander's instructions, but also pushed them toward the most liberal interpretation possible. At the same time, they also ended up framing the pivotal issue of the emperor in terms similar to those recommended by the Kempo Kenkyukai. In a similar manner, MacArthur's third principle, vaguely enjoining that the feudal system of Japan will cease, became the basis for detailed provisions guaranteeing representative government and a broad range of civil liberties and human rights. The section enumerating rights and duties of the people was, and remains, one of the most liberal guarantees of human rights in the world. Thanks largely to Beata Sirota, it even affirmed the essential equality of the sexes, a guarantee not explicitly found in the U.S. Constitution. The drafting committee also took the liberty of toning down the language and intent of MacArthur's injunction concerning demilitarization. Cades, who personally assumed responsibility for this provision, regarded the general's categorical renunciation of war as a sovereign right of the nation even for preserving its own security as too sweeping. Any nation, he reasoned, had the right to preserve its own security against internal disruption as well as from threats from outside through the maintenance of some kind of gendarmerie, coast guard, or the like. So Cades took it upon himself to revise the first paragraph of the renunciation of war clause to read simply, War as a sovereign right of the nation is abolished. The threat or use of force is forever renounced as a means for settling disputes with any other nation. The second paragraph of the clause, denying rights of belligerency or the maintenance of an army, navy, or air force, remained essentially as MacArthur had dictated. Cades deliberately left vague the possibility of modest rearmament for preserving its own security, and in so doing planted the seed of decades of controversy. The constitutional renunciation of war was a brilliant example of Scap's wedge tactic, for the sovereign linked only yesterday with war was now formally associated with a radical anti-militarism. More than just adroit political manipulation was involved here, however, for the no-war ideal had great appeal on its own merits, as well as a precise precedent in recent history. It reflected an international vision that had captured attention less than two decades earlier, before the world plunged into catastrophic war, in the form of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, or Pact of Paris, of 1928. Formerly known as the General Treaty for the Renunciation of War, the Kellogg-Briand Pact provided the most obvious model for the renunciation of war language in GHQ's draft. Colonel Cades had long been an admirer of the Kellogg-Briand ideals, and Prime Minister Shidehara and cabinet members such as Ashida Hitoshi and Yoshida Shigeru, all of them former career diplomats, could not fail but to recognize the familiar language. Indeed, this vision was being resurrected all around them. Japan had signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928, and violation of its principles was emerging at that very time as a major charge to be leveled against defendants in the Tokyo war crimes trials. In these circumstances, the Kellogg-Briand language of peace became, rhetorically and legally, a double-edged sword. Used in the new draft constitution to protect the emperor, even as it was being unsheathed to cut down his erstwhile officers and officials. Thinking about idealism and cultural imperialism. Scap's sudden decision to prepare a model constitution amounted to a categorical repudiation and abandonment of the very concept of constitutional revision. Now, abruptly and without internal debate or public announcement, it was declared that the existing constitution was so flawed that its entire contents had to be discarded. Only the rhetoric of revision remained. The new reality was constitutional replacement, an approach almost exactly antithetical to that of the Matsumoto Committee. Whereas the latter worked entirely within the Meiji Constitution, nipping here and tucking there, the government section team was interested in this existing charter only as a negative model, a reminder of what had gone wrong. No time at all was spent studying the existing Constitution article by article. 
The Japan that the Americans reinvented in the Daiichi Building Ballroom was not perceived as being a little replica of the United States, however, and Cades later insisted that the U.S. Constitution was not given much attention as the drafting committee cobbled together its new charter. This was, after all, to be a parliamentary government with a British-style cabinet system wrapped in an imperial dynasty. Nonetheless, the political idealism of American democracy, coupled with allied pronouncements, left a distinctive imprint on the final product. This was especially true for the preamble, which resonated with echoes of the Declaration of Independence, the Gettysburg Address, the U.S. Constitution, and two wartime proclamations, the Atlantic Charter and the Tehran Conference Declaration. It is difficult to imagine a more exhilarating assignment for bright and mostly young people with political ideals. Essentially, the Americans were given a clean slate, albeit already embossed with the imperial chrysanthemum, and the secret record of their day-to-day -day deliberations reveals not only a keen sense of common purpose, but also a high level of technical competence and professional give-and-take. None of the lawyers was a specialist in constitutional law, but this did not deter them any more than it had the commercial law specialist Matsumoto. That they were in no position to tolerate fundamental dissent within their own ranks, however, quickly became apparent. When Lt. Esman, their public administration specialist, began to interrupt the constitution-making process to criticize both the haste and secrecy in which the project was being carried out, he suddenly found himself the recipient of a five-day rest and recreation pass, effective immediately. While his colleagues pushed on at breakneck speed, secretly dismantling feudal vestiges, Esman spent his time exploring the spectacular mausoleum of the founder of the Tokugawa shogunate at Nikko. When he returned, the project was all but finished, although he still had time to make a small personal contribution to the final draft. It was at Esmond's suggestion that the new constitution included legislative controls over the civil service. Esmond's reservations about the constitution-making process were rejected not because they were too conservative, but because they were impractical. No one could disagree that a week was an outrageously short time for the task at hand, but the timetable had come as an order from the Supreme Commander. In criticizing the secrecy of the project, Esmond had in mind the desirability of making this undertaking more genuinely collaborative by actively enlisting the support and expertise of Japanese scholars who were deeply committed to democracy. In this way, he believed, the resulting draft would genuinely reflect democratic sentiments within the populace and be more firmly rooted in Japanese culture and society. Like speed, however, secrecy was what MacArthur had ordered. In the Supreme Commander's grander perspective, the developing constitution was being kept secret not just from the Japanese government, but from just about everybody in the world. The Washington policy-making structure, possible opponents of revision within the occupation command structure, and the many nations in the Allied camp now gathering in the Far Eastern Commission. Although Esmond's departure for Nico expedited concentration on the practical issues of revision, the remaining Americans did raise and answer to their own satisfaction questions that later critics would ask. Were they being ethnocentric? Were they cultural imperialists? Their answer, after some debate, was, In the modern world it had become both appropriate and necessary to affirm that laws of political morality are universal, a phrase that eventually was incorporated into the preamble to the Constitution. To the more specific question of whether it was wise and feasible to try to impose such liberal ideas upon Japan, the answer was that the government, not the people, was resisting such change. If the people did not like what the Americans were proposing, they could always change it later. These arguments emerged at scattered intervals as the steering committee pondered the various proposals brought back by the subcommittee. When someone pointed out the obvious discrepancy between an ideal constitution founded upon American political experience and thinking and the actions and past experiences of the present Japanese government, Cades acknowledged the discrepancy but took the position that no comparable gap existed between American political ideology and the best or most liberal Japanese constitutional thought. At another point, two of the more cautious members of the committee proposed that severe restrictions be placed on amending the Constitution, and that no amendment whatever be permitted until 1955. Their reasoning was that the Japanese people are not ready for a democracy, and that we are caught in the uncomfortable position of writing a liberal Constitution for a people who still think mystically. Cades and his steering committee quickly dismissed this. 
The Constitution was premised on a responsible electorate, they declared, and was intended to be not only a reasonably permanent document, but a flexible one as well, with a simple rather than complicated amendment procedure. There was a certain ambiguity among the drafters concerning what exactly they were preparing. Most, but not all of them, appear to have taken for granted that they were drafting a real constitution for Japan, a model charter in the sense of being ideal, not in the sense of being just a sample or guideline. Yet it was not clear to any of them what changes their draft would undergo before the Diet approved it. At one point, they even voiced fear that the government might reject GHQ's draft in toto. From the outset, virtually every American involved assumed, incorrectly as it turned out, that whatever charter ultimately was adopted by the Diet would be subject to Japanese review and, if deemed desirable, amended as time passed. On February 10th, the sixth day after he had convened his constitutional convention, General Whitney transmitted the draft of a completely new constitution to the Supreme Commander. He pointed out that this draft embodied the considered and collective view of the members of government section, representing nearly every form of American political thought, and that it had been written after taking the historical development of the Japanese constitution into consideration and giving studious attention to American and European constitutional principles. The draft exhibited advanced thinking in constitutional matters, he observed, but at the same time contained nothing without precedent. It established not only political democracy, but economic and social democracy as well, and could be characterized as a strong and sound middle of the road document. As Whitney put the matter, it constitutes a sharp swing from the extreme right in political thinking, yet yields nothing to the radical concept of the extreme left. In a typically grand gesture, MacArthur made but a single change in the draft shown him, eliminating restrictions on amending the Bill of Rights. On February 11th, serendipitously the country's National Foundation Day, he approved GHQ's handiwork for presentation to the completely unsuspecting Japanese government. Chapter 13 Constitutional Democracy Japanizing the American Draft On February 13th, General Whitney and three aides visited the official residence of the foreign minister and presented the GHQ draft to Matsumoto Joji and Yoshida Shigeru, who were accompanied by Yoshida's aide Shirasu Jiro and an official interpreter. The Japanese believed they were meeting to discuss Matsumoto's recommendations, which had finally been submitted on February 8th and were, to say the least, taken aback when Whitney peremptorily brushed those aside. Despite the presence of an interpreter, Matsumoto, Yoshida, and Shirasu understood English well. Whitney chose his words carefully and spoke with deliberate slowness. He was also ill with influenza and running a fever that day, which might have contributed to the peculiar intensity and sharpness with which he evidently expressed himself. The draft of constitutional revision which you submitted to us the other day, he began, is wholly unacceptable to the Supreme Commander as a document of freedom and democracy. He then distributed copies of the government section draft with the explanation that MacArthur had approved this as embodying the principles which in his opinion the situation in Japan demands. A detailed summary of this meeting, jointly written immediately afterwards by Whitney's three aides, notes that the Japanese officials were obviously stunned, and the whole atmosphere at this point was charged with dramatic tenseness. The Americans withdrew to the garden to leave their counterparts to read the English-language text. When Shirasu joined them outside, Whitney serenely observed, We have been enjoying your atomic sunshine, a comment that, in its harshness, provided a shocking reminder of who was the victor and who the vanquished. In his 1956 biography of MacArthur, Whitney recounted this episode with relish, adding that by a happy coincidence a B-29 flew overhead at precisely that moment. The general regarded his remark as an effective psychological shaft and had several more in his quiver. After Matsumoto and Yoshida had perused the document for about half an hour, the two sides came together again and Whitney let fly his next barbs. He pointed out that acceptance of the provisions of the GHQ draft offered the best possible guarantee of rendering the Emperor unassailable. Should the government reject this position, he asserted, SCAP was prepared to bring its draft directly to the Japanese people. 
Although in making this assertion Whitney was exceeding his instructions, MacArthur subsequently endorsed this threat with enthusiasm. As recorded in the minutes written by the American side, Whitney added, General MacArthur feels that this is the last opportunity for the conservative group, considered by many to be reactionary, to remain in power, that this can only be done by a sharp swing to the left, and that if you accept this constitution you can be sure that the Supreme Commander will support your position. I cannot emphasize too strongly that the acceptance of the draft constitution is your only hope of survival, and that the Supreme Commander is determined that the people of Japan shall be free to choose between this constitution and any form of constitution which does not embody these principles. The Japanese, who followed this without using their interpreter, did not conceal their distress. Mr. Shirasu straightened up as if he had sat on something, Whitney recalled. Dr. Matsumoto sucked in his breath. Mr. Yoshida's face was a black cloud. As the bringers of bad tidings prepared to take their leave, Yoshida emerged from his dark cloud long enough to urge that these exchanges be kept completely secret. The Last Opportunity for the Conservative Group Whitney offered the Japanese one last straw to grasp at in the February 13th meeting. It was not essential that the GHQ draft be accepted in its entirety, he stated, although its basic principles were not negotiable. Matsumoto did grasp at this, and it was several days before the hopelessness of his predicament became entirely clear to him. Privately, he initially mocked the amateur quality of the draft, calling attention in particular to the impracticality of GHQ's recommendation that the Diet be made unicameral. This was, as he eventually learned, the one major matter that the Americans were willing to concede as a bargaining chip. Before it became absolutely clear that the government had lost all credibility in Scap's eyes, both Shirasu and Matsumoto made a final effort to persuade Whitney that the conservative elites did indeed share democratic ideals with the Americans. What was at issue, they argued, was simply a matter of differing approaches. As Shirasu put it in a letter to Whitney, the American way was straight and direct, whereas their approach was roundabout, twisted and narrow. He even enclosed a sketch representing the Japanese route between starting point and object as a meandering road through the mountains, while the Americans went directly to the same goal as if by airplane. Whitney, unmoved by this cultural cartography, wrote back to Shirasu that the Supreme Commander would permit minor changes in the draft, but none either in principle or basic form. Matsumoto argued that tyranny and misrule result when constitutions do not accord with national circumstances. The tyranny and misrule of Japan's recent decades apparently did not give him pause on this score. Unbelievably, even when faced with GHQ's ultimatum, he continued to claim that the Japanese people needed a long, slow, careful political tutelage in the ways of democracy, and that his committee's draft had to be understood in this light. Metaphorically speaking, he wrote Whitney, his draft was a tablet sugar-coated for the benefit of the masses. Anything more radical would shock the moderates, provoke the extremists, and precipitate internal upheaval. This was a drearily familiar refrain to government sections personnel. No matter what the Americans proposed in the way of reform, the conservatives invariably responded that it would provoke chaos, confusion, and communism. They evoked the red peril so often, Cades later observed, that we were vaccinated against the threat of communism. Even the staunch Republican Whitney expressed impatience with his doomsday litany. To Matsumoto, he simply conveyed word that if the cabinet did not act on this matter within 48 hours, SCAP would proceed, as promised, to bring its draft directly before the people. This was evidently the excruciating moment when Matsumoto finally realized that, although others might have lost the war, he had just lost the Meiji Constitution. It had been GHQ's expectation that the meeting of February 13th would precipitate immediate cabinet deliberations. To facilitate this, Whitney and his aides had even handed over 15 copies of the draft proposal to be distributed as Matsumoto and Yoshida deemed appropriate. The government, however, did not address critical issues in the decisive, collective manner the Americans considered natural. The cabinet was not even informed about the February 13th exchange until February 19th, when Matsumoto, pale and shaken, made an initial presentation. General Whitney, he informed his colleagues, had found his draft unacceptable 
and presented a GHQ draft in its place. Whitney's position, as Matsumoto summarized it, was that the Americans were not forcing this on the government, but General MacArthur was convinced that this was the only way to protect the Emperor's person, Matsumoto apparently used the English word, from those who opposed him. The immediate response of several ministers was that the American position was simply unacceptable. Prime Minister Shidehara agreed, but Ashida Hitoshi, who later would emerge as a key figure in Diet deliberations, offered a persuasive argument for going along. If the cabinet rejected the GHQ demands and the Americans made their draft public, as they were threatening to do, Ashida warned, then an ominous scenario could unfold. The media, being servile, would support the Americans. The cabinet would have to resign. Proponents of the American draft could be expected to come forward and do well in the impending general elections. The conservatives, in a word, had to beware of being unseated by popular pro-democracy forces. It was agreed that the matter should be given further consideration, and cabinet discussion was resumed on February 22nd, after Shidehara had met for three hours with MacArthur. Printed materials were distributed for the first time in the form of rough translations of the first and second chapters of the GHQ draft, dealing with the emperor and renunciation of war. Stunned and disoriented, the government did not distribute a full translation until February 26th. Shidehara reported that the supreme commander had not been unreasonable. Declaring himself to be working heart and soul for Japan and emphasizing his deep desire to keep the emperor safe at all costs, MacArthur had offered dire intimations on the thinking of such countries as the Soviet Union and Australia. Unpleasant, as Shidehara put it, to a degree beyond your imagination. The Prime Minister also quoted the General as having expressed his belief that Japan should take moral leadership, Shidehara conveyed these words in English, by declaring its renunciation of war. Shidehara still held out hope of revisions of substance in the GHQ draft, but Matsumoto discovered the same day that there was no prospect of salvaging even a few portions of the Meiji Constitution. His American tormentors bluntly informed him that using the existing Constitution as a basis of revision was impossible. When the proud scholar-bureaucrat gritted his teeth and asked, How many of the articles in the new Constitution do you consider basic and unalterable? Whitney responded that, the whole Constitution as written is basic. Put in general, we regard this document as a unit. Lest there be any misunderstanding, Colonel Rowell added, The new Constitution was written as an interwoven unit, one section fitting into another, so there is no one section or chapter that can be cut out. At Matsumoto's request, the Americans did agree to a bicameral diet, with the stipulation that both houses be elected by popular vote. When Emperor Hirohito was briefed about the American draft by Shidehara and a few top officials on February 22nd, the final deadline government section had given for cabinet approval in principle, he reportedly responded decisively. Japanese informants told GHQ that he gave the proposed revision his unreserved approval. On this matter, the emperor was perhaps understandably less hesitant than his ministers. He recognized that his person was being protected and his position made simpler. Unlike his loyal officials, Emperor Hirohito was free to contemplate changes in the Meiji-style emperor system without having to worry about committing Li's majesty. His approval in any case eased the conscience of his ministers and enabled them to comply with GHQ's demands. There was a touch of patriotic astrology associated with these various dates. As General Whitney was pleased to note, GHQ's February 12th deadline for completing its draft had coincided with Abraham Lincoln's birthday. The deadline given the cabinet for accepting the draft fell on George Washington's birthday. Even after the government bowed to this ultimatum, however, government section was informed that the cabinet remained racked by a furious struggle. Narahashi Wataru, a minister without portfolio who simultaneously was serving as chief cabinet secretary, was one of GHQ's major informants on these matters. He described the backstage struggles in dire terms. According to Narahashi, die-hard defenders of the old emperor system remained numerous among bureaucrats, ex-military officers, and zaibatsu leaders. The bureaucrats, whose power derived partly from their elite status as loyal servants of the throne, rather than as civil servants or servants of the people, feared their authority would be severely diminished. 
Narahashi also observed that there was genuine fear among more liberal ministers that terrorism and assassination might occur if the emperor's prerogatives were curtailed. The Translation Marathon These developments coincided with Prince Higashikuni's shocking public suggestion that Emperor Hirohito should abdicate. The emperor's person and the status of the throne suddenly seemed imperiled as never before, and it was in these circumstances that, on March 4th, the cabinet formally presented SCAP with what eventually became known as the First Government Draft for a Revised Constitution. To all outward appearances, this amounted to little more than a Japanese version of the GHQ text. In fact, Matsumoto and his aides had watered down GHQ's recommendations in a variety of ways, including the use of terminology that altered the intent of the draft. Matsumoto and his assistant, Sato Tatsuo, accompanied by two translators, delivered their text to government section at 10 o'clock a.m. on March 4th. In a nice reprise of the February 13th Atomic Sunshine meeting, at which they had been confronted with GHQ's English draft, they handed the Americans a Japanese text without any corresponding translation. There followed a marathon 30-hour session during which the two sides translated the Japanese back into English together, with the Americans constantly consulting their Japanese-English dictionaries and comparing the new English version with their original draft. Throughout this long, sleepless ordeal, they fortified themselves with K-rations and coffee dispensed from five-gallon containers, an unpalatable sort of sustenance for the Japanese that must have seemed, in the circumstances, depressingly symbolic. This was not by any stretch of the imagination a humorous occasion. Nonetheless, it had moments of almost camp theatricality. Matsumoto and Cade soon found themselves engaged in a heated exchange concerning the relative positions of emperor and cabinet. At one point, the beleaguered royalist accused the New Dealer of trying to reinvent not merely the national polity, but the Japanese language as well. Shortly after noon, Matsumoto stormed out in anger, leaving retranslation and revision to Sato and his two interpreters, who had to deal with at least 16 American officers assisted by Nisei translators and interpreters. Sato and Cades then had a tense moment when Cades used his fists, one above the other, to illustrate the importance of clearly placing the cabinet above the emperor. Sato was less impressed by the concept than by the pugilistic intensity of Cades' stance. Cades, in turn, concluded that the Japanese could not conceive of anyone being politically superior to the emperor, an approach he found mystical and contradictory. On the one hand, as Cades saw it, the Japanese were arguing that the emperor had been essentially powerless under the Meiji constitution, a crucial argument in divorcing him from any taint of war responsibility. On the other hand, they insisted that his prerogatives as sovereign ruler must remain inviolate. Beata Sirota, whose bilingual skills gave her influence in these exchanges, found that old-fashioned favors could further the cause of feminism. At various points, the young slip of a girl, as Cades described her, came down in support of Japanese positions. Subsequently, when Sato came to the women's rights clauses Sirota had originally drafted, Cades adroitly and successfully suggested that since she had been nice to them earlier, the Japanese should now be nice to her. Through this friendly reciprocity, one of the strongest equal rights provisions in modern constitutional law survived. In another theatrical moment, Foreign Minister Yoshida's aide, the smooth, British-educated Shirasu Jiro, appeared on the scene and had the pleasure of letting the Americans experience a small psychological shaft. Halfway through the marathon session, well after midnight, he casually produced a rough English version of the Japanese draft which everyone was laboring to translate. He had been carrying it around in his pocket. In the course of this exhausting session, the Americans discovered that the Japanese had slipped a number of substantial changes into their translation. The English advice and consent, for instance, emerged in Japanese as advice and assistance. The government's ostensible translation also dropped the preamble to the GHQ draft, in which the sovereignty of the people's will was emphasized, deleted the provision providing for the elimination of the peerage, proposed a House of Councillors that could have restricted the authority of the House of Representatives, and altered provisions on local autonomy in a manner that facilitated greater control by the central government. In addition, they undercut many of the guarantees of human rights, 
sometimes by reinserting formulaic phrases of the sort associated with the Meiji Constitution. Freedom of speech, writing, press, assembly, and association were now guaranteed only to the extent that they do not conflict with the public peace and order. Similarly, censorship was prohibited, except as specifically provided for by law. The rights of workers to organize, to bargain, and to act collectively were likewise hedged with the phrase, as provided by law. The government draft also deleted or weakened a number of unusually specific rights, including ones related to foreigners, on the grounds that these were more appropriately covered by legislation outside the Constitution. In the end, the stalwart Sato, bleary-eyed and exhausted, succeeded in persuading the Americans that certain rights were better left to enumeration through extra-constitutional legislation. He also succeeded in maintaining highly nuanced renderings of such critical words and concepts as people and sovereignty. On such delicate yet fundamental points, politics, ideology, language, and culture came together in ways that rendered the Japanese draft constitution, almost inevitably, a different text from the American one. This was nowhere more apparent than in the concept of the people, which was central to the Americans' notion of popular sovereignty, with all the evocative historical and cultural connotations of we the people that were embedded in the American experience. The Japanese had no comparable tradition of popular sovereignty. The Meiji Constitution spoke of subjects, shinmin, rather than people as such, and Matsumoto and his aides were faced with the question of what word to use for people in their adaptation. One possibility was jinmin, the term commonly used in translations of the U.S. Constitution or Abraham Lincoln's classic formulation of government of the people, by the people, for the people. In contemporary usage, however, jinmin had socialist and communist connotations and conveyed a sense of the people resisting authority. Although an initial government translation of the GHQ draft prepared by the foreign ministry had rendered people as jinmin, Matsumoto and Sato discarded this in favor of kokumin, an inherently more conservative term. Written with two ideographs denoting country and people, kokumin is an everyday word that carries connotations of the people harmoniously merged in the nation. There is no intimation here of a potentially adversarial relationship between the people and the nation, the state, or the highest authorities, including, of course, the emperor. On the contrary, as the government subsequently took care to explain, the concept of kokumin embraced the emperor himself, thus signifying that the emperor and people were one. During the war years, kokumin had been a familiar word in propagandistic sloganeering, essentially synonymous with the Japanese, or even the Yamato race. Sato Tatsuo was frank in later explaining why kokumin, with its consensual and nationalistic connotations, was chosen for the new constitution. He and his associates, he stated, adopted kokumin because, one, we wanted to emphasize the sense of the people as members of the state, and two, we thought that jinmin would convey a sense of the people in exclusion and opposition to the emperor. Although advisors to government section called attention to the conservative connotations of kokumin, General Whitney and Colonel Cades did not deem the distinction important and allowed the rendering to stand. For sovereignty, the logical term was shuken. With encouragement from Prime Minister Shidehara, however, a different term, shiko, was substituted in the government draft. Unlike shuken, shiko was an obscure and archaic word. The two ideographs with which it was written literally meant supreme height, but the term carried no political weight. Indeed, it is fair to say that it meant little, if anything, to Japanese living in the mid-twentieth century. That was the point, of course. Through such ambiguities, the conservatives desired to blunt and obfuscate the radical thrust inherent in the American notion of popular sovereignty. They were aghast at the thought of postulating a sovereignty equal to or higher than the emperor's. In this first week of March, the survival of those deliberately warped renderings through thirty hours of American hammering was a gratifying victory for the government. In the full course of events, however, this victory proved only half as sweet, for Shiko did not make it into the draft of the Constitution that eventually was adopted by the Diet. Shuken replaced it. The draft that emerged from the marathon session around four o'clock p.m. on March 5th 
differed in roughly a dozen substantial ways from the version the Japanese had submitted the day before. And in almost every instance, these changes brought it back closer to the original GHQ draft. On March 5th, while Sato was staggering toward the end of his ordeal, the government moved toward a denouement of sorts of its own. That morning, Matsumoto, who had never returned to GHQ, addressed the cabinet at length about what had taken place since February 22nd. The ministers recessed for lunch and reconvened at 2 o'clock p.m., at which time a small, symbolic, almost ritualistic event took place. Ten English-language versions of the GHQ draft, apparently some of the copies government section had handed over weeks previously, were presented to the assembled ministers for the first time. There was nothing to be done with these at this eleventh hour, but they now had in their midst a concrete sign of the foreign power that governed their lives. Around 4.30, Shidehara and Matsumoto made their way to the palace to discuss the situation with the emperor and prepare for the release of both the government draft and an imperial rescript the following day. On returning to the cabinet meeting at 8 o'clock p.m., Shidehara summarized the emperor's response as being that, under the present situation it can't be helped. The diary of Kinoshita Michio, the imperial vice-chamberlain, makes clearer what a traumatic, almost chaotic moment this was at the court. The emperor was feeling immense pressure to abdicate, he wrote, and the atmosphere of the world was against the imperial system. MacArthur's headquarters had become frantic. Repeating the phrase that had made such an impression on the cabinet, Kinoshita noted that if the American draft were not accepted, it would not be possible to guarantee the emperor's person. GHQ had demanded that the cabinet decide that day whether it would accept the version agreed on with Sato. With the emperor's approval, the assembled ministers proceeded to do so. Before adjourning a little after nine o'clock p.m., Shidehara made a brief closing statement, which Ashida Hitoshi recounted in his diary. Accepting such a draft constitution is an extremely grave responsibility, the prime minister said, that in all probability will affect our children and grandchildren and later generations. When we announce this draft, some people will applaud and some will remain silent. But deep in their hearts they surely will hold resentment toward us. Looking at things from a broad perspective, however, in the present circumstances there is no other course to take. Hearing this, cabinet members wept while the prime minister himself brushed away tears. Unveiling the Draft Constitution On March 6th, with great fanfare, the new constitution was made known to the public in a manner that gave equal prominence to the emperor and to the ideals of democracy and peace. In the name of the emperor, Prime Minister Shidehara released a detailed outline for constitutional revision accompanying this with a brief but quite eloquent endorsement of the proposed new ideals. Few observers could have guessed that hours earlier the Prime Minister and his cabinet had been in tears. Emperor Hirohito's imperial rescript was released simultaneously, tersely announcing the need to revise drastically the existing national charter and commanding the government to comply with his wishes. On the same day, General MacArthur announced that this Decision of the Emperor and the Government of Japan to submit to the Japanese people a new and enlightened constitution has my full approval. These three rhetorical exercises set the tone for the ensuing debates on creating a new monarchical democracy. Shidehara typically began with effusive homage to the sovereign, who had been pleased to grant to the cabinet an imperial message. In order that our nation may fall in line with other nations in the march toward the attainment of the universal ideal of mankind, Shidehara declared, His Majesty with great decision has commanded that the existing constitution be fundamentally revised so as to establish the foundation upon which a democratic and peaceful Japan is to be built. The Prime Minister then proceeded to speak movingly of the passage of mankind from war to peace, cruelty to mercy, slavery to liberty, tyranny and confusion to order. In a suggestive turn of phrase, he intimated that the pacifistic nature of the proposed charter could establish a vanguard role for Japan in the world. If our people are to occupy a place of honor in the family of nations, we must see to it that our constitution internally establishes the foundation for a democratic government and externally leads the rest of the world for the abolition of war. Namely, we must renounce for all time war as a sovereign right of the state and declare to all the world our determination to settle by peaceful means all disputes with other countries. 
The Prime Minister went on to express his faith that all Japanese would honor the benevolent wish of their sovereign, and concluded by noting that the draft constitution was being made public in close cooperation with the Allied General Headquarters. Emperor Hirohito's rescript read in full, Consequent upon our acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, the ultimate form of Japanese government is to be determined by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. I am fully aware of our nation's strong consciousness of justice, its aspirations to live a peaceful life and promote cultural enlightenment, and its firm resolve to renounce war and to foster friendship with all the countries of the world. It is, therefore, my desire that the constitution of our empire be revised drastically upon the basis of the general will of the people and the principle of respect for the fundamental human rights. I command hereby the competent authorities of my government to put forth in conformity with my wish their best efforts toward the accomplishment of this end. In effect, the emperor was ordering his subjects to support the proposed new constitution, a stance at variance with the idea that he never exercised real authority. From this point forward, the public process of revising the Constitution remained tinged with old-fashioned pronouncements aimed at reinforcing a sense of imperial benevolence in granting a more democratic national charter. Like Shidehara, General MacArthur spoke with a certain grandeur about peace, democracy, and culture. He described the proposed Constitution as throughout responsive to the most advanced concept of human relations, an eclectic instrument, realistically blending the several divergent political philosophies which intellectually honest men advocate. He also chose to emphasize rather than minimize GHQ's close involvement in the drafting process. This instrument has been drafted after painstaking investigation and frequent conference between members of the Japanese government and this headquarters, he stated, following my initial direction to the cabinet five months ago. Typically, this was not entirely truthful. But the point was made that Scap had been closely involved in the drafting process. On the other hand, acknowledging the draft constitution's genesis and government section was taboo. Japanese officials were not permitted to mention the GHQ draft, and the media were not allowed to speculate openly about it. A similar make-believe aura would hang over the Diet proceedings to follow. GHQ kept a close eye on these deliberations from behind the scenes, and made clear at various junctures that basic principles, the revised status of the emperor, renunciation of the right of belligerency and popular sovereignty, as well as the highly idealistic preamble to the constitution, were, much like the emperor under the Meiji constitution, sacred and inviolable. On occasion, GHQ secretly intervened to promote or repress certain Diet proposals. As one American, privy to these activities, put it, government section personnel were still members of a bureaucratic agency that worked behind closed doors. This was, once again, freedom in a box. All Japanese knew the box existed, however, and where the Constitution was concerned, the extent of the American input was an open secret. To begin with, everyone was immediately struck by the night and day difference between the Matsumoto draft that had been more or less laughed to death on February 1st and the progressive new text the government was now claiming as its own. As the daily Yomiuri put it, the reactionary Matsumoto draft had been blown away. No one imagined that the geriatric Shidehara cabinet had undergone a collective conversion experience. It was inconceivable that these two drafts could have a common authorship. Beyond this, the Japanese text had foreign fingerprints all over it, not only in its broad principles, but also in its awkward style. Contorted syntax consorted with odd phraseology. In the upper house, whose appointed members included a number of scholars, some individuals even took to referring to an official English translation that had been provided them. The very fact that an English text was released simultaneously with the Japanese draft was revealing. The upper house member Takaya Nagi Kenzo, a Harvard-trained constitutional law specialist, later observed that the translation was easier to understand than the text of the Japanese original. The task of preventing media discussion of the actual paternity of the new charter fell to GHQ's civil censorship detachment. Criticism of SCAP writing the Constitution actually became a formal category of impermissible expression in the so-called key log that censors used as a guide, and it was explicitly stipulated that this prescribed any reference whatsoever to SCAP's role. 
Journalists did, however, attempt to call attention to the draft's peculiar Japanese and funny language. One blue-penciled line stated baldly, of the Japanese text, The translation is not very good. The overworked censors could not catch everything, however, and even generally supportive publications managed to smuggle sardonic observations into their editorial comments. The Asahi, for example, described the government draft as somewhat ill-fitted, like a borrowed suit of clothes. The Gigi Shimpo compared its initial response to someone who smelled the aroma of Japanese cooking coming from the kitchen and then discovered that Western dishes were being served. It was necessary to put away one's chopsticks and take up fork and knife. In these circumstances, a great deal of cynicism, as well as plain confusion, accompanied public discussion. Still, the proposed constitution held great attraction as a beacon of hope and idealism in a defeated and war-shattered land. The Japanese were told that they were to consider adopting a national charter that embodied the most advanced and enlightened, eclectic thinking of the mid-twentieth century. In going so far as to renounce war as a sovereign right, the nation, as Shidehara put it, might even see itself as leading the rest of the world. To a proud people told they had become a fourth-rate nation, this was a comforting kind of new nationalism to grasp at. Popular reactions to the new proposal in any case offered a sharp contrast to the overwhelmingly negative response that had greeted the Matsumoto draft. Only the Communist Party opposed the draft constitution. The party's position was forthright. Continuation of the emperor system was anti-democratic, and, though within Japan they had suffered the most overt oppression by the militarists, it was unrealistic and discriminatory to deny any nation the right to self-defense. All the other major political parties endorsed the March draft. The socialists even claimed that the government's new position was essentially what they themselves had been advocating. The two conservative parties that formed the backbone of Shidehara's coalition cabinet were in no position to criticize the government's announcement but even here support was expressed with surprising spirit. The liberals singled out for praise the three principles they saw as characterizing the draft. Preservation of the emperor's system, respect for fundamental human rights and democratic principles, and establishing a peaceful country by renouncing war. Even the ultra-conservative Progressive Party did a dramatic volte face and declared that it welcomed the new draft heartily. Historically, the progressives now argued, the emperor had never ruled directly, and so his status under the proposed new charter actually accorded with both history and reality. Stated often enough, such rationalizations easily became a new gospel. Many conservatives clearly voiced their endorsements with heavy hearts, but by mid-March most of them also had come to share General MacArthur's belief in the new charter's necessity to protect the emperor and the imperial house at a critical moment. As the weeks passed, the public gained a clearer understanding of what the proposed new constitution entailed. The detailed outline, released to the cabinet on March 6th, was still written in the ponderous formal Bungotai style. A vernacular or colloquial text replaced the outline on April 17th, a week after the general elections. A final version, known as the Fourth Government Draft, was formally submitted to the Diet on June 21st. Water flows, the river stays. For technical reasons, the new constitution was submitted to the Diet by the Emperor as an amendment to the Meiji constitution. To both MacArthur and the Japanese royalists, this was fortuitous. Constitution-making and emperor-saving became part and parcel of the same undertaking. Consequently, the Emperor was involved at every key stage in the process. On June 20th, in accordance with established procedure, he addressed the opening of the extraordinary Diet session, declaring that he would be submitting a revised constitutional draft along with other bills, and expressing hope that the Diet would deliberate on these in a harmonious spirit. Although the new constitution stipulated that sovereignty resided with the people, it was intimated that this sovereignty actually came as a gift from the Emperor himself. Revolution from above and imperial democracy were fused in the most ceremonial manner conceivable. By the time the draft constitution came before the Diet, the most ultranationalistic and reactionary politicians had already been purged. The newly elected House of Representatives was a diverse group, including women as well as men. The conservatives who still dominated the lower house were, on the whole, more flexible than their predecessors, 
and also numbered among their colleagues a sizable contingent of liberals and socialists. In the House of Peers, seats emptied by the occupation's purge had been filled by the appointment of an unusually learned and cosmopolitan group. It could be argued that the legislature was not representative, since its most vociferously conservative voices had been silenced. But it would also be accurate to say that the Diet reflected new voices more or less in tune with the emergence of genuinely democratic aspirations. To all appearances, the parliamentary deliberations that followed were vigorous and substantial. Discussions in plenary sessions and committee hearings in both houses consumed a total of 114 days. Kanamori Tokujiro, the Minister of State who replaced Matsumoto Joji as the Cabinet's chief spokesman on constitutional issues, responded to around 1,300 formal questions, sometimes at great length. Transcripts of the Diet proceedings in both houses eventually totaled more than 3,500 pages. By far the most compelling issue for Diet members was whether the draft constitution altered the national polity, particularly as it involved the emperor, and if so, how. Of next greatest concern were the implications of the astonishing renunciation of war provisions in Article 9. In due time, however, the legislators turned their attention to every single article. Sato Tatsuo, who had represented the government at the Marathon Translation Session, later conceded that GHQ seemed to have great respect for the Diet as the supreme representative of the people. Deliberations in the legislature left no portion of the draft unprobed, Sato observed, and he estimated that 80 or 90 percent of the changes proposed in the legislature, all of which required SCAP's approval, were allowed to stand. The government's answer to questions about whether the new constitution represented a fundamental change in the kokutai, or national polity, was that it absolutely did not. Both Kanamori and Yoshida Shigeru, the new prime minister, concentrated with an almost vaudevillian energy on this most emotional of issues. Kato Shizue, a near-legendary feminist who had been elected to the Diet, later summarized their act with deft strokes. Yoshida, she said, would loudly exclaim, The Kokotai has been preserved. The minister in charge will explain. And Kanamori would take the podium and gurgle something roundabout and impenetrable. Guru, 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 in Kato's rendering. This was unkind, but where the emperor and the national polity were concerned, Yoshida's and Kanamori's explanations were ruled by an emotional logic rather than any legal precision or historical accuracy. Yoshida typically declared that there is no distinction between the imperial house and the people. Sovereign and subject are one family. The national polity will not be altered in the slightest degree by the new constitution. It is simply that the old spirit and thoughts of Japan are being expressed in different words in the new constitution. Like participants in a renga or linked verse performance, Kanamori, in turn, carried forward the permanence amid change theme by arguing that the water flows but the river stays. In this point lies our basic conception concerning the draft constitution. Although such near-mystical affirmations were only to be expected, they caused some consternation within government section. Whitney informed MacArthur in mid-July that official arguments that the new constitution involved no change in the national polity were undermining the democratic spirit of the new charter and paving the way for a return to authoritarianism, chauvinism, militarism, and the old mystique of Japanese uniqueness and racial superiority. Cades, following up on this, demanded that Kanamori clarify the Constitution's defense of unadulterated popular sovereignty. It was indeed at this point that Shiko was replaced as the term for sovereignty by Shuken. Still, in the eyes of many members of the Parliament, the new Constitution was acceptable only because it retained the throne in its transcendent splendor. The final report of the House of Representatives Subcommittee on the Constitution, headed by Ashida Hitoshi, confirmed and sanctified these sentiments. The first chapter of the revised Constitution expressly provides that the Emperor of one line unbroken through the ages is assured of his position as a monarch who, on the basis of the sovereign will of the people, unifies them coevally with heaven and earth, from eternity to eternity. Thus it has been possible to confirm the solemn fact that the Emperor, while being in the midst of the people, stands outside the pale of actual politics and still maintains his authority as the center of the life of the people and as the source of their spiritual guidance. This accomplishment the absolute majority of the committee have received with the utmost joy and satisfaction. 
The emotionalism and nationalistic defiance of such reverential statements are evident. For many, however, such arguments became vehicles that enabled them, in good conscience, to travel to positions they would not have dreamed of only months earlier. Once thinking the unthinkable became inescapable, it even became possible to argue that in their new imperial democracy the emperor's position had been elevated, in that he was now above politics. Shortly after the new constitution came into effect in 1947, Yoshida wrote a personal letter to his father-in-law, Makino Shinken, a former keeper of the Privy Seal, stating that as a consequence of the emperor's more explicit detachment from politics, his position within, presumably meaning his spiritual role, will become that much more enlarged, and his position will increase in importance and delicacy. Even in the midst of these reverential discussions, however, some ministers and parliamentarians could retain a detached and humorous perspective. Among insiders, for example, the new constitution became known as the Yamabuki Kempo, or Mountain Rose Constitution. The joke here was that under the new charter the emperor now resembled the Yamabuki Flower, Caria Japonica, sometimes translated as Yellow Rose. All beautiful blossom, no fruit. Similarly, two witty poems referring to Kanamori were circulated in the Diet during these ostensibly solemn debates, both punning on the homonym of Kenpo, Constitution, and Kenpo, the way of the sword. What, one poem inquired, was this strange constitutional method, or school of sword fighting, Kanamori was using? It was, the second verse responded, the two-sword national polity school, one sword being change and the other no change. In parrying this, Kanamori proved himself an adept fencer. His way was so skillful, he responded in a poem of his own, that one sword looked like two. Whatever their politics, these were clever and agile men. Japanizing Democracy At one point during the parliamentary deliberations, Colonel Cades, visiting the House of Peers, told members that GHQ was rather sorry that more proposals for amendment have not been made in the Diet. He was sincere in this. The Americans spent a great deal of time encouraging legislators to become actively involved in the revision process, which, after all, was supposed to be an example of democracy in action, the manifestation of the Potsdam Declaration's noble ideal of creating a government that reflected the freely expressed will of the people. The Diet was free to make all the changes it desired, so long as they did not violate GHQ's fundamental principles. What was not so apparent where the Diet deliberations were concerned was the long reach of Scap's invisible hand and the extent to which revisions proposed by Japanese sometimes reflected secret instructions from GHQ, or through GHQ from the Far Eastern Commission, which gave considerable attention to the Constitution that summer. The Americans took great care to camouflage their involvement in the day-to-day -day activities of the two legislative chambers. Instructions were conveyed orally rather than in writing, at Scapp's insistence, the work of the key House of Representatives Subcommittee on Constitutional Revision was conducted in confidential session, so that American instructions could be clarified in camera, and no references to these interventions were permitted in the stenographic record of these secret meetings. Free discussion of the Constitution per se was encouraged, both in the Diet and in the media, but until 1949 all references to Scapp's decisive shaping of the new charter were suppressed. The omnipresence of Scap's unassailable authority was captured in a felicitous phrase after the occupation ended. In the words of the Commission on the Constitution, a prestigious Japanese committee that investigated these matters between 1957 and 1964, even when the Americans did not directly intervene in the parliamentary process, their desires were still surmised by a sort of mental telepathy. One member of the House of Peers, Sawada Ushimaro, a former Home Ministry official resisted this duress with unusual passion. In announcing why he was voting against adoption of the draft constitution, Sawada declared that the proper time for revision was after the nation regained sovereignty. It made no sense at all, he exclaimed, borrowing the Asahi's earlier metaphor, to rush to adopt this new charter, which in fact is no better than a borrowed suit of clothes, patched in too many places, and above all insufferably misfitting. All told, the Diet made approximately 30 revisions to the government's June draft. Many of the most substantial changes, however, came from SCAP or the FEC. 
It was pressure from the FEC via SCAP, for instance, that led the Diet to strengthen important democratic provisions such as those pertaining to universal suffrage, predominance of the legislature, and selection of the Prime Minister and a majority of Cabinet members from among Diet members. At the insistence of the FEC, the Diet also added a clause stipulating that all Cabinet members must be civilians. Major changes initiated by the Japanese were, in the end, relatively few in number. In a surprising vote, the Diet approved a motion from the Socialist Party that eliminated the peerage, apart from the imperial family, immediately, whereas the Americans had merely called for ceasing to grant any future patents of peerage. The Socialists, partly influenced by the Weimar and 1936 Soviet constitutions, also successfully introduced provisions that all people shall have the right to maintain the minimum standards of wholesome and cultured living, and all people shall have the right and the obligation to work with working conditions being regulated by law. In an interesting instance of effective grassroots pressure, a coalition of teachers affiliated with adult education schools and night schools succeeded in persuading the Diet to eliminate wording that would have limited compulsory education to six years of free elementary schooling. Arguing that education should not benefit only the elites, the teachers directed their lobbying activities at the Ministry of Education and GHQ as well as at politicians. The final provision guaranteed all people the right to receive an equal education correspondent to their ability, as provided by law, and became the basis for subsequent legislation establishing the so-called 6-3 system, entailing nine years of compulsory schooling. One of the most truly democratic aspects of the final constitution was also prompted by a grassroots initiative, and affected the very nature of the language in which formal and official texts would be written thereafter. Prior to this time, statutes and documents, including the Constitution, had been written in Bungotai, an archaic, formal style that was more or less inaccessible to ordinary people. After mid-April, the text submitted by the government was written in colloquial Japanese, Kogotai. This was a change of enormous practical as well as symbolic meaning. It signified that the law, and official documents in general, were no longer to be regarded as the domain of a privileged elite. As a consequence, the entire corpus of civil and criminal law subsequently would be converted into Kogotai. The decision to introduce this far-reaching change came entirely from the Japanese side, and had its origins not within the government, but among scholars and intellectuals who were lobbying for language reform. In a reactionary direction, the government and subsequently the Diet succeeded in eliminating equal protection under the law for resident aliens, thus undermining GHQ's original intent. The groundwork for this move was laid by Sato Tatsuo in the hours immediately following the marathon translation session, when he sent a seemingly trivial request to government section requesting permission to delete the article in question on the grounds that it was redundant, given protections guaranteed elsewhere in the draft charter. The Americans approved this, unaware that the language games the Japanese side was playing excluded foreigners from such protective coverage. The key term here was kokumin, the word deliberately chosen to cast constitutional references to the people in a more nationalistic context. Essentially, the conservatives used kokumin not merely to weaken the connotations of popular sovereignty, but also to limit the rights guaranteed by the state to Japanese nationals alone. Whereas the Americans had intended to affirm that all persons are equal before the law, and included language in the GHQ draft that explicitly forbade discrimination on the basis of race or national origin, Sato and his colleagues erased these guarantees through linguistic subterfuge. By interpreting kokumin as referring to all nationals, which was indeed a logical construction of the term, the government succeeded in denying equal civil rights to the hundreds of thousands of resident ex-colonial subjects, including Taiwanese and especially Koreans. The blatantly racist nature of this revision was subsequently reinforced by terminological revisions during the Diet deliberations, and this provided the basis for discriminatory legislation governing nationality passed in 1950. Renouncing War, Perhaps To the world at large, the most striking single feature of the draft constitution was its renunciation of war, mentioned in the preamble and encoded in Article 9. Unsurprisingly, this drew a barrage of questions in the Diet. In the end, the legislatures revised the wording of Article 9 in a way that left no one sure what it really meant. 
A miasma of ambiguity was created that would survive as one of the most perplexing of the occupation's legacies. Did Article 9 permit or prohibit limited armament for the purpose of self-defense? As submitted to the legislature, Article 9 read as follows. War as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force is forever renounced as a means of settling disputes with other nations. The maintenance of land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be authorized. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. Did this mean that Japan was pledging itself to be an unarmed state in an unstable world? Many Diet members voiced concern that it did, and that it thereby placed the nation at peril. Others, attracted by the idea of eventual membership in the United Nations, asked whether that might become impossible if the country were unable to fulfill the UN requirement that all members contribute to collective security. To the direct question, does Article 9 prohibit armament even for self-defense, the government usually answered yes, but sometimes responded no. When these convoluted proceedings were completed, it would be possible to go back over the record and exhume a quotation to bolster whatever position one wished to uphold. On April 4th, before submission to the Diet, Matsumoto Joji addressed a confidential session of the Privy Council and was explicitly asked if renouncing the right of belligerency prohibited a war of self-defense. He answered that it did not. The right of belligerency implies a declared war, Matsumoto stated, but does not purport to prohibit acts of self-defense. In the opening sessions of the Parliament, on the other hand, Prime Minister Yoshida said the opposite. On June 26th, he indicated that Article 9 entailed renunciation of the right of self-defense as well as the right of belligerency. All aggressive wars, including Japan's recent aggression beginning in 1931, he observed, were waged in the name of self-defense. Two days later, the Prime Minister had occasion to elaborate on this when Nosaka Sanzo challenged the wisdom of such a constitutional restraint. It was necessary, the Communist leader declared, to distinguish between just and unjust wars, and when this was kept in mind it became obvious that every nation had the right to self-defense. Yoshida, who prided himself on being a realist, found himself arguing the realism of idealism. It has been suggested that war may be justified by a nation's right of legitimate self-defense, he retorted, but I think that the very recognition of such a thing is harmful. Japan would rely for its future security on an international peace organization. In one form or another, Yoshida reiterated this interpretation of Article 9 for several years thereafter. In the final stages of its deliberations, the House of Representatives adopted a change in the wording of Article 9 proposed by its influential subcommittee on constitutional revision, chaired by Ashida Hitoshi. Approved by the Upper House, this became the final wording in the new Constitution. Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as a means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. As was required with all such proposed changes, Ashida had first cleared the new wording with GHQ, where both Colonel Cades and General Whitney approved it right away. The three men apparently did not discuss the reasoning behind the revision. In subsequent years, the so-called Ashida Amendment was used to argue that, in its final form, Article 9 did not prohibit rearmament for self-defense. The first paragraph, this argument went, established maintenance of international peace as the article's objective. This being the case, the clause that now introduced the second paragraph, in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, indicated that the war potential being renounced referred to maintaining a capacity for aggressive war that would disturb international peace. Ashida himself later claimed that it had been his purpose from the outset to open the door to future armament for self-defense through this change. This never emerged in the Diet discussions, however, and the secret records of Ashida's subcommittee, which remained classified for many decades, reveal that neither he nor his fellow committee members ever explicitly discussed their revision in terms of allowing self-defense, nor was there any evidence of an implicit understanding that this is what was being done. As in much of the discussion that took place in the Diet generally, the air was full of phrases flying in all directions, and often impossible to follow coherently. 
At one point, Ashida actually explained that he was simply trying to make Article 9 a less passive affirmation of Japan's commitment not to maintain war potential. As the final draft headed for a vote, key spokesmen for the government confirmed that Article 9 prohibited maintenance of any war potential whatsoever. When Kanamori, who took part in some of the secret discussions in the lower house, was called on to explain the new wording of the article to the House of Peers Special Committee on the Constitution, he stressed the categorical renunciation of all armaments. The first paragraph of Article 9 does not renounce the right of self-defense, but this right is renounced as a matter of fact under the second paragraph, he told the committee on September 14th. Rephrasing this, he stated that, the practical effect of the second paragraph is that even a defensive war cannot be conducted. Former Prime Minister Shidehara, addressing the same committee, similarly declared without equivocation that, under the second paragraph, it was very clear that Japan cannot possess any war potential to fight a foreign country. At this juncture, the Far Eastern Commission intervened in a way that struck many legislators as bizarre. In July, the FEC had urged General MacArthur to have an article added to the Constitution stipulating that only civilians could hold cabinet positions. The General ignored this request, but on September 21st, the Chinese representative to the FEC, sitting in Washington, took note of the new wording of Article 9 and pointed out that such ambiguous language might indeed leave an opening for some form of future rearmament. Instead of urging that the Article 9 language be tightened, however, the FEC again demanded that cabinet members be constitutionally limited to civilians. MacArthur and GHQ felt that to avoid FEC censure they must comply. This belated change, introduced in the House of Peers on September 26th, caused understandable confusion. For if Article 9 prohibited an army, navy, and air force, then it seemed logical to assume that there could be no professional military establishment from which cabinet members might be drawn. Was it possible, legislators asked, that the proposed stipulation was intended to prevent former military personnel from assuming cabinet positions? That would certainly discriminate against the young men who had served the country in the recent war. An upper house committee set up specifically to look into this request concluded that such a provision was not necessary. MacArthur, in turn, sent word that it was necessary to make the FEC happy. The peers then had no choice but to turn their attention to inventing a new word which would correspond to the English civilian. Some seven or more possibilities were considered before a newly coined compound, pronounced bunmin, was selected. Whatever the FEC may have intended, the strange bunmin provision, which became Article 66 of the new charter, had the unintended effect of weakening the argument that Article 9 prohibited the maintenance of any military potential whatsoever. After all, excluding military personnel from the cabinet assumed their existence as a functioning part of the body politic. This ambiguity was compounded when, in explaining the new draft in confidence to the Privy Council on October 21st, Kanamori offered an interpretation quite different from the one he had given the House of Peers a month earlier. The minutes of this elite body slated to be abolished under the new constitution, recorded the Kanamori, interprets the keeping of arms as being allowed for the maintenance of international peace. In a publication entitled Interpreting the New Constitution, published on November 3rd, the day the new charter was promulgated, Ashida Hitoshi publicly offered this same interpretation for the first time. In reality, he stated, Article 9 is meant to apply to wars of aggression, Therefore, its provisions do not renounce war and the threat or use of force for purposes of self-defense. GHQ did not challenge this view, but neither did it become a clearly held government position. For years afterwards, in fact, Prime Minister Yoshida spoke in a very different voice. In January 1950, he stated unequivocally, The right of self-defense in Japan's case will be the right of self-defense without resorting to force of arms. In an extemporaneous comment to the House of Councillors, which replaced the House of Peers, that same month, Yoshida went so far as to exclaim, If we hold somewhere in the back of our minds the idea of protecting ourselves by armaments, or the idea of protecting ourselves by force of arms in case of war, then we ourselves will impede the security of Japan. True security, the elderly Prime Minister suggested, lay in earning the confidence of other nations. There was certainly an element of grandstanding in such statements, for Yoshida was persuaded that the best way to hasten the end of the occupation and the country's reacceptance in the world community was to emphasize the thoroughgoing nature of its renunciation of militarism. 
At the same time, however, Article 9 also possessed a compelling psychological attraction to a shattered people sick of war and burdened by the knowledge that much of the world reviled them as inherently militaristic and untrustworthy. The renunciation of war, the prospect of becoming a pure embodiment of the Kellogg Bryant ideals, offered a way of retaining a positive sense of uniqueness in defeat. Three and a half decades after these events, Charles Cades looked back on the contradictions in Japanese interpretations of Article 9 and was reminded of the observations of a 15th century English judge. The thought of man shall not be tried, for the devil himself knoweth not the thought of man. Where Article 9 was concerned, confusion initially arose less from Machiavellian subterfuge than from the Article's poor drafting. Under the circumstances of continued occupation, moreover, The issue of self defense was hardly a pressing concern. Until June 1950, that is, when rearmament was initiated in the wake of the outbreak of war in Korea. Then the conservatives and the Americans alike found their loophole in the murky language of the Ashida Amendment, and the opponents of remilitarization rallied around the ideals of disarmed neutrality that they believed to be firmly embedded in their peace constitution. Article 9 became the touchstone for a controversy that would rack the Bali politic for decades to come. Responding to a fait accompli. Diet members were free to vote against the draft constitution, but in the end, very few did so. In the House of Representatives, the vote for adoption was 421 to 8. In the House of Peers, where adoption meant immediate abolition of the peerage itself, The new charter was adopted overwhelmingly by a standing vote. GHQ counted two negative votes out of 300. Most of the Diet votes against adoption came from Communist Party representatives. Cynics would say that this near unanimous embrace of the conqueror's principles merely confirmed what condescending American and British analysts had been arguing all along that the Japanese had an ingrained feudalistic tendency to follow authority. That, as the State Department's George Acheson had put it at the beginning of 1946, this was the dawn of the age of Japan's imitation of things American, not only of American machines, but also American ideas. For some, this may have been the case. Both Japanese skeptics and worried liberals said much the same thing at the time. The political and ideological dynamics of the situation, however, were too complex to be explained away by such simplistic notions of mass psychology. To a substantial degree, the solid vote to adopt the new constitution reflected neither conformist nor feudalistic Japanese values, but rather a familiar feature of democratic party politics everywhere, maintaining party discipline. With the exception of the communists, party leaders across the political spectrum supported the revision, and party members fell into line. Many pragmatic conservative leaders also believed that, although at the moment they had little choice but to go along with the conquerors, At a later date, it would be possible to undo much of what had been done. Adopting a democratic and pacifistic national charter would hasten the day the occupation was terminated, and once independence had been regained, the constitution could be revised. Yoshida Shigeru later ruefully explained that this had been his philosophy regarding the American reformist agenda in general. There was this idea at the back of my mind that whatever needed to be revised after we regained our independence could be revised then. He confided. But once a thing has been decided on, it is not so easy to have it altered. On November 3, 1946, the 94th anniversary of the Meiji Emperor's birthday, Emperor Hirohito announced the promulgation of the new constitution. It was to go into effect six months later. When it came to patriotic dating, the vanquished were as diligent as the victors. Celebratory ceremonies were held nationwide. In Tokyo, 100,000 people gathered in front of the Imperial Palace to commemorate the occasion. As added evidence of Imperial largesse, the Emperor decreed an amnesty terminating the penal sentences of 330,000 individuals. This was his final grand exercise of sovereign authority. One month later, it was announced that Japan would continue to reckon time in accordance with an Emperor centered calendar. On December 5th, in response to a question in the Diet, The government stated that the Gengo system would be maintained, meaning that the years would continue to be numbered in accordance with the era name associated with the reigning emperor, coupled with the year of the emperor's reign. By this way of counting, the constitution was promulgated in the year Showa 
This was a consoling conservative victory and a brilliant everyday way of reiterating that, because of their emperor system, the Japanese were unique and operated in realms not shared by others. Every time anyone looked at the date on a publication, they would be reminded of the imperial presence. May 3, 1947, the day the Constitution came into effect, could be remembered almost any way one chose. A Japanese brass band performing in the plaza before the Imperial Palace celebrated the occasion by playing The Stars and Stripes Forever. Shimizu Toru, the former president of the Privy Council, committed suicide by throwing himself into the ocean. The Privy Council had been the final body to vote approval of the new charter, and Shimizu left behind a note saying there was no other way he could apologize to the Emperor. The Emperor's youngest brother, Prince Mikasa, on the other hand, sent a remarkable commentary to a newspaper put out by Tokyo Imperial University, chastising the Emperor and the government for the undemocratic manner in which they had conducted the day's ceremonies. He had been ill and unable to attend, but several aspects of the ceremony disturbed him. Why was his invitation addressed to him alone and not to his wife as well? And why did it mention only the Emperor and not the Empress? It was no wonder, Prince Mikasa commented, that Japanese women, so recently elected to the Diet for the first time, felt they faced a difficult struggle. He had listened to the ceremonies on the radio, the Emperor's brother added, and was struck by the continued use of the distinctive, honorific language reserved only for the imperial family. If a genuine democratization were to be effected, language too would have to be democratized. And the proper place to begin would be to reform the special language hitherto reserved for the throne. The prince also was struck by the fact that Emperor Hirohito was not present from the outset, but rather made a grand entrance. And he was taken aback by the fact that Prime Minister Yoshida greeted the sovereign's appearance by calling out, Long live the Emperor! Tenno Heika Banzai! Three times in succession! This might be appropriate for something like an enthronement ceremony, Mikasa observed. But it did not seem very suitable to a ceremony in which, presumably, sovereignty was being transferred to the people. This was droll and iconoclastic, and it is no wonder that Emperor Hirohito, when musing on the possibility of abdicating, had dismissed his youngest brother as a possible successor, even as regent for the crown prince. Indeed, Prince Mikasa was not finished with his ruminations. It might have been more appropriate, he ventured. And the reader could easily imagine him chortling here. Had the planners of the ceremony instead arranged to have the emperor lead a cheer along the lines of Long live all the Japanese people! Zen Nihon Kokumin Banzai! Or the prime minister might have led all the people, including the emperor, in such a cheer. Or on behalf of the new peace loving Japan, the emperor might have been asked to lead a banzai for all the peoples of the world. In any case, he concluded, democratizing the imperial household would be the beginning of the true task of democratizing Japan. The adoption of the new constitution propelled both GHQ and the government into a flurry of activity. Civil laws, criminal laws, the code of civil procedure, family law, the laws governing the imperial household, all were subjected to substantial revision and redrafted in more colloquial Japanese. At the same time, a massive educational campaign was launched. On the very day the new constitution came into effect, the government issued 20 million copies of a pocket sized book entitled Atarashi Kempo Akarui Sekatsu New Constitution Bright Life. This astonishing number was supposed to ensure a booklet for every household in Japan. Atarashi Kempo Akarui Sekatsu was only 30 pages long, a one page send off by Ashida Hitoshi. The chairman of the lower house subcommittee on constitutional revision, a radiant thirteen page introduction that included several illustrations, and the full text of the constitution itself. It was issued at the insistence of GHQ, and so, like the constitution itself, was a text written under duress. It also conveyed an idealism embraced by many Japanese. Although revision of the MacArthur Constitution became an ardent nationalistic cause in certain conservative circles even before the occupation ended, the simple optimistic rhetoric of New Constitution, Bright Life retained enough popular appeal to thwart all attempts at revision over the decades that followed. Ashida began his brief preface with a plain but moving statement The old Japan has been cast in the shadows, a new Japan has been born. People would now respect each other on the basis of their human qualities. They would practice democracy. 
relations with other countries would be conducted in the spirit of peace. The Constitution's bold declaration that we will not do war anymore expressed a high ideal for humankind and was the only way for Japan to be reborn. The introductory text itself began by speaking of May 3, 1947 as the birthday of a new Japan, and immediately went on to declare that the greatest gift of the Constitution was democracy, which entailed government by the people, for the people, and of the people. The emperor was no longer a god, but rather a symbol of the unity of the people, much in the same way that Mr. Fuji symbolized the physical beauty of Japan, cherry blossoms the gentleness of Japanese spring. The National Charter was described as being a pledge never to wage war again, a point accompanied by an illustration of a trash can filled with artillery, bombs, tanks, military planes, and warships, along with a dead fish and two buzzing flies. Equality, human dignity, happiness, and the joy of freedom were emphasized. It was important to live in accordance with one's own conscience. Men and women were equal. This point was illustrated by a romantic sketch of a young couple kneeling and holding hands, with overlapping valentine hearts and an exclamation point above their clasped hands. A startled old couple lurked in the background. Officials were now public servants. The diet was the voice of the people. The court was the guardian of the Constitution. The essence of the new Constitution was people's government and international peace. This was without question propaganda demanded by the conquerors and expressed at an extremely simple level, and it struck a popular chord. The full measure of the compelling power of the constitutional fait accompli, however, lay in the fact that even high officials who originally had been staunch supporters of the Meiji Constitution came in time to endorse many of the fundamental principles of the new charter. The former government spokesman Kanamori Tokujiro was a fair example of this ideological sea change. Before GHQ's Constitutional Convention, Kanamori had helped draft the Liberal Party's conservative proposed constitutional revision. As Prime Minister Yoshida's minister in charge of constitutional affairs, he was reluctantly compelled to present the adapted GHQ draft as the government's own handiwork. Two years after these arduous labors were done, Kanamori took it on himself to write a children's book, The Story of the Constitution for Boys and Girls, Shonen to Shoujo no Tame no Kempo no Ohanashi. He still romanticized the emperor, but also wrote with power about the great ideals of peace, popular sovereignty, and fundamental human rights. Amending the Constitution, Kanamori told his young readers, should only be done with extreme care. His concluding words were these, We must without fail respect and defend the Constitution, and though the road is long, let us walk steadily, step by step, toward the light of these ideals. These were not words that he had been compelled to utter. Kanamori's predecessor as minister in charge of constitutional affairs, Matsumoto Joji, did not adjust so graciously to the fait accompli. A decade after his humiliation, by then in his eighties, he defiantly declared that he had never even condescended to read the final version of the new constitution. On the other hand, former Prime Minister Shidehara, who had tearfully told his ministers that they could only expect contempt from subsequent generations, came in later years to claim proudly that he himself had first mentioned the ideal of renouncing war to General MacArthur. This was in all likelihood just the mistaken recollection of an elderly man, but whether fact or fiction, his sincere embrace of the no-war ideal gave credibility to the argument that, when all was said and done, the new constitution had indeed reflected Japanese ideals. Emperor Hirohito's intimate thoughts about the new constitution are unknown, but Colonel Cades and several members of his staff were royally thanked. Each received a small silver cup, embossed in gold with the sixteen-petal imperial chrysanthemum crest, and engraved with a notation that this gift commemorated the introduction of the new constitution. Chapter 14 Censored Democracy, Policing the New Taboos in April 1946, GHQ was informed that an entertainer in Tokyo was singing subversive songs while accompanying himself on the violin. Investigators attended a performance and were shocked. They heard lyrics like, Seducing Japanese women is easy with chocolate and chewing gum. More scandalous yet was this line, Everybody is talking about democracy, but how can we have democracy with two emperors? Democracy, Hirohito and MacArthur lampooned all in a single breath. The Americans banned the show. 
As numerous Japanese outside the music hall circuit could attest, this was not a random act on the part of the occupation authorities, who policed the country's new freedoms with a censorship bureaucracy that extended into every aspect of public expression. In the process, the Japanese quickly learned to identify the new taboos and to practice self censorship accordingly. One simply did not challenge ultimate authority and expect to win. The inviolability of the nation's second emperor, General MacArthur, was brought home to writers and editors in what became known as the Hero Worship Incident of October 1946. Commenting on the adulation the Supreme Commander was receiving, the newspaper Gigi Shimpo offered a tempered editorial warning about the habit of hero worship that has imbued Japanese minds for the past twenty centuries. The editorial was prompted by the publication of a best selling biography of MacArthur that had been accompanied by a flood of adulatory letters in the press in which the general was described in terms only recently reserved for Hirohito himself as a living god and the sun coming out of dark clouds and shining on the world, or even as the reincarnation of Japan's first emperor, Jimmu. The newspaper's response, subsequently published in the English language Nippon Times, read in part as follows. If the conception that government is something imposed upon the people by an outstanding god, great man, or leader is not rectified, democratic government is likely to be wrecked. We fear the day after MacArthur's withdrawal that some living god might be searched out to bring the sort of dictatorship that made the Pacific War. The way to express the gratitude of the Japanese people toward General MacArthur for the wisdom with which he is managing post war Japan, and for his efforts to democratize the nation, is not to worship him as a god, but to cast away the servile spirit and gain the self respect that would not bow its head to anybody. Although this eminently reasonable commentary had been approved by GHQ authorities prior to its publication in Japanese, The English version was immediately seized by the American military police on orders from General Charles Willoughby, head of the Civil Intelligence Section, on the grounds that it was not in good taste and tended to diminish the reputation of the occupation forces and their commander. This was a rare public display of power by the ultra conservative Willoughby. At the same time, however, his heavy handed intervention exposed the everyday regimen of censorship. Signaled a tightening of occupation controls on critical commentary that could be deemed leftist or even remotely critical of American policies, and came to symbolize for many the carefully programmed and controlled nature of the democratization agenda. The Phantom Bureaucracy Censorship was conducted through an elaborate apparatus within GHQ from September 1945 through September 1949. And continued to be imposed in altered forms until Japan regained its sovereignty. In the early stages of the occupation, it was anticipated that such controls would last only until the safety of the foreign forces could be assured and reformist policies successfully implemented. SCAP's first formal directive on freedom of speech and press, issued September 10, 1945. Explicitly declared that there shall be an absolute minimum of restrictions on freedom of speech, so long as such expression adhered to the truth and did not disturb public tranquility. In practice, the censorship apparatus soon took on a life of its own. A sprawling bureaucracy was created under the Civil Censorship Detachment, CCD, within the Civil Information Section, and CCD's censors were closely abetted by the positive propagandists for democracy within the Civil Intelligence and Education, CIND, section. Censorship was extended to every form of media and theatrical expression newspapers, magazines, trade books, as well as textbooks, radio, film, and plays, including the classical repertoire. At its peak, CCD employed over 6,000 individuals nationwide. The great majority of whom were English speaking Japanese nationals who identified and then translated or summarized questionable material before passing it on to their superiors. Until late 1947, many publications, including close to 70 major daily newspapers and all books and magazines, were subject to pre publication censorship. At one point, the monthly volume of material flooding into CCD's central PPB, Press, Pictorial and Broadcast, Section alone was estimated to average 26,000 issues of newspapers, 3,800 news agency publications, 23,000 radio scripts, 5,700 printed bulletins, 4,000 magazine issues, and 1,800 books and pamphlets. Over the course of their four year regime, CCD's examiners also spot checked an astonishing 330 million pieces of mail, 
and monitored some 800,000 private phone conversations. Censored materials included foreign as well as Japanese writings, meaning that the vanquished were not allowed to read everything the victors read. Both Associated Press and United Press wire service dispatches were sometimes vetted before being deemed safe for consumption and translation. Syndicated columnists such as Walter Lippmann encountered similar obstacles crossing the Pacific. The overall censorship operation eventually came to entail extensive checklists for taboo subjects, and in the best Orwellian manner these taboos included any public acknowledgment of the existence of censorship. Editors and publishers all received such confidential notifications as the following as soon as censorship was established. 1. The purpose of this memorandum is to make certain that all publishers in the jurisdiction of this censorship office understand fully that no publicity regarding censorship procedure is desired. 2. While it is assumed that all publishers understand that in the makeup of their publications no physical indication of censorship, such as blackened out print, blank spaces, pasted over areas, incomplete sentences, O's, X's, etc., may appear, there are some points which may not be understood clearly. 3. No write-ups concerning personnel or activities of any censorship group should be printed. This pertains not only to press censorship personnel and activities, but also to those of radio, motion picture, and theatrical censorship. 4. Notations such as passed by censorship, publication permitted by occupation forces, or any other mention or implication of censorship on CCD must not be made. Since censorship was never openly acknowledged to exist, its nominal termination with the dissolution of CCD in late 1949 also took place without public notice. Fittingly, as if it had been but a phantom bureaucracy, CCD passed from the scene under the confidential farewell policy that there will be no press release on the termination of civil censorship. Contrary to early hopes that censorship would taper off fairly quickly, CCD's surveillance became both more stringent and more picayune as the months passed. In this regard, the confiscation of the press edition carrying the Hero Worship editorial signaled a moment, roughly a year after surrender, when GHQ's censorship policies hardened and simultaneously began to depart from their original focus on eliminating militaristic and ultranationalistic ideas. Robert Spaulding, who held several responsible positions in CCD, later observed that Willoughby's action had a triple legacy. It led to an expansion of the CCD staff, fostered a psychology of extreme cautiousness among the censors, and led to the proliferation of cumbersome checking procedures whereby officials throughout GHQ's numerous divisions and branches became more involved in controlling what the media said. Although censorship under the occupation was by no means as pervasive and stunting as that practiced in Japan in the decade and a half prior to surrender, scores of prominent literary figures ranging from Dazai Osamu, the author of The Setting Sun, whose suicide in 1948 caused a sensation, to the future Nobel laureate Kawabata Yasunari experienced the blue pencil. The novelist Tanizaki Junichiro, to his astonishment, had an entire short story suppressed on the grounds that it was militaristic, he was in this regard in honorable company, since the translation of Tolstoy's War and Peace was also vetted by CCD's censors. Still, even such an acerbic literary critic as Nakamura Mitsuo concluded in the immediate wake of the occupation that, although post-war Japanese literature was largely worthless, too much sex in his view, the literary world as a whole had enjoyed incomparably greater freedom than in the past. Journalists who had first-hand experience with pre-surrender and post-surrender variants of censorship were less sanguine about post-war freedom, but usually still acknowledged that the conqueror's hand was the lighter one. Ikejima Shinpei, a former editor of the moderate monthly Bungei Shunju, expressed disgust at being censored by people who didn't even speak his language, but allowed that GHQ's surveillance was a far cry from the situation under the militarists, when a transgression might even imperil one's life. Matsuura Sozo, the author of a well-known book about occupation censorship and a former editor of the left-wing magazine Kaizo, a favorite target of CCD, felt that even in the later period of draconian red purges, America's censorious democracy was nowhere near as oppressive as Imperial Japan's emperor system absolutism had been. At the same time, he looked back on the years from 1948 through 1951 as an era of darkness for progressive and left-wing writers, made all the more bitter by the hopes that the occupation had encouraged. 
Radio show producers sometimes spoke of their long interlude under American supervision as being still an era of unfreedom of speech that was in some ways more troublesome than the wartime restrictions under which they had operated. For at least under their own thought police, they were spared the burden of having to translate scripts into English for the censor's review. SCAP officials were acutely aware that their give-and-take approach to democratization involved a delicate balancing act. From the outset, the censorship policy was set against a positive emphasis on freedom of speech and the dissolution of official government controls over the media. In the wake of SCAP's Civil Rights Directive of October 4th, editors and publishers were summoned to CI&E and encouraged to interpret this Magna Carta aggressively. Contrary to the past, they were told, it was now permissible to criticize the government, debate about the emperor system, and even espouse Marxism. This would be a schizophrenic world, however, for the victor's censorship sometimes replicated the earlier campaigns of the imperial government against dangerous thought in uncanny ways, hamstringing post-war democracy from the start. This was conveyed to writers and publishers at virtually the same moment that they were being granted their Magna Carta, for beginning on the following day, the media were gradually brought under CCD's pre-publication censorship and made concretely aware of the new taboos they were now required to observe. The policy of censoring the existence of censorship itself cast a taint of hypocrisy on the Americans and compared poorly with the old system of the militarists and ultranationalists, who until the late 1930s had allowed excised portions of texts to be marked in publications with X's and O's. At least pre-war readers knew that something had been excised. They could even count the X's and O's and try to guess what. It is not surprising, then, that some writers who experienced censorship under both systems were cynical in their appraisals of Scap's version of free expression. One evoked an old metaphor in describing its modus operandi as like being strangled with silk floss. Another observed, with not a little bitterness, that at least the Japanese censors had served tea. Impermissible Discourse For publishers, broadcasters, journalists, filmmakers, and writers, SCAP's censorship operation possessed an opaque quality that made it challenging to determine how far one could go without offending the new thought police. This came in part from the fact that CCD's censors operated on the basis of secret key logs of prohibited discourse, checklists of forbidden subjects, that were never made available. In other words, the precise criteria for unacceptable expression were not conveyed to those being censored. As a consequence, those who engaged in any form of public communication had to rely on two imprecise guides in deciding what was impermissible. The very general press, radio, and film codes issued by SCAP in the opening months of the occupation. News must adhere strictly to the truth. Nothing shall be printed which might, directly or by inference, disturb the public tranquility. There shall be no false or destructive criticism of the Allied powers, and so on. And imagination shaped by experience, that is, guessing what the censors would allow on the basis of what they had thus far permitted. This was not only disorienting, but could prove financially disastrous if one miscalculated the censors' tolerance. Such circumstances helped foster a climate of disquieting rumors that easily spilled over into a pathology of self-censorship. The classified key logs used as monthly checklists by CCD changed as political winds changed. Early on, they included some three-score prohibited subjects. In June 1946, the categories of deletions and suppressions in CCD's key log were, in full, as follows. Criticism of SCAP. Criticism of military tribunal, that is, of the Tokyo war crimes trials. Criticism of SCAP writing the Constitution, including any reference whatsoever to SCAP's role. References to censorship. Criticism of the United States. Criticism of Russia. Criticism of Great Britain. Criticism of Koreans. Criticism of China. Criticism of other allies. General criticism of allies. Criticism of Japanese treatment in Manchuria, referring to treatment of Japanese POWs or civilians by Russians and Chinese after Japan's capitulation. Criticism of Allies' pre-war policies. Third World War comments. Russia versus Western powers comments. Defense of war propaganda. Described as any propaganda which directly or indirectly defends Japan's conduct of and in the war. Divine dissent nation propaganda. Militaristic propaganda. Nationalistic propaganda. 
Glorification of feudal ideals. Greater East Asia propaganda. General Japanese propaganda. Justification or defense of war criminals. Fraternization, referring in particular to fraternization of allied personnel with Japanese women. Black market activities. Criticism of occupation forces. Overplaying starvation. Incitement to violence or unrest. On actual censored material, this often was phrased as disturbs public tranquility. Untrue statements. Inappropriate reference to SCAP or local units. Premature disclosure. When, say, galley proofs were censored, the offending material was returned to the publisher with blue penciled passages to be altered or deleted, along with a standard form that simply indicated the paragraph or paragraphs of the ten item press code that these impermissible passages violated. In this manner, the concrete nature of what had been excised became the primary means by which Japanese understood what occupation authorities really meant by their vague code commandments. Cases that in retrospect may seem aberrant or even ludicrous censorial excesses sometimes became guideposts by which the censored party decided what the victors construed to be within the boundaries of acceptable expression. As these internal checklists indicate, the realm of impermissible discourse was extensive. No criticism was permitted of the victorious Allied nations, including initially the Soviet Union, nor of SCAP or its policies, which meant that for over six years the supreme authority in the country remained beyond accountability. Sensitive social issues such as fraternization, prostitution involving the occupation forces, or mixed blood children, to say nothing of GI crimes, including rape, could not be discussed. Public commentary about emerging Cold War tensions was, initially, forbidden. Even serious critical analysis of the black market was by and large off limits. Feudal values could not be praised. Any expression of opinion remotely resembling the propaganda of the war years was, of course, taboo. Controlling commentary about the recent war naturally was of utmost importance to the victors at the outset of the occupation. They considered it essential to suppress any rhetorical appeals that might rekindle violent wartime passions and thereby either imperil the security of occupation personnel or undermine their reformist agenda. In a more active rather than reactive direction, the Americans deemed it necessary to educate the general populace about the many aspects of Japanese aggression and atrocity that had been suppressed by their nation's own censorship machinery. This was a reasonable mission, a formidable challenge, and a delicate undertaking, for it posed, and ultimately failed to escape, the danger of simply replacing the propaganda of the vanquished with that of the victors. All prior ways of speaking about the war became incorrect and unacceptable. Any criticism of the pre war policies of the victorious allies was categorically forbidden. All past propaganda became a portmanteau violation, as it were, of the media codes. Even controversial but entirely reasonable statements about the global milieu in which Japan's leaders embarked on war, the shock of the Great Depression, the breakdown of global capitalism, worldwide trends toward protectionism and autarky, the models as well as pressures of European and American imperialism, Western racism, and the countervailing racial and anti colonial ideals of Pan Asianism, could be deemed not merely incitements to unrest, but also transgressions of truth, not to speak of criticism of the occupation's policies and of the victorious powers. What now was true, of course, was the Allied version of the war, which the media had to endorse by acts of commission as well as omission. Publishers and broadcasters were required to present accounts of the war prepared within GHQ. Especially by C, I, and E. Criticism of the war crimes trials was not permitted. This meant, as noted in the key logs, that there could be no public justification or defense of individuals who had been indicted as war criminals. Essentially, whereas the defendants at the Tokyo trials were provided with committed defense counsel, the media were required to uncritically support the prosecution's arguments as well as the tribunal's eventual judgment. SCAP's war guilt campaign played an important role in the psychological demilitarization of the Japanese. The Class A Allied War Crimes Tribunal, in particular, with its voluminous written evidence and oral testimony, revealed a secret history of intrigue and atrocity that could never have been so effectively exposed otherwise. These were critical educational undertakings, but as filtered through the censorship apparatus, they taught the media and general public less positive lessons as well. That the makeup and conduct of the court were not to be questioned, for example, 
and that the accused were to be assumed guilty unless judged innocent. Inside the courtroom, defense attorneys were allowed to argue that Japan's leaders had believed themselves to be defending legitimate national interests, and that Victor's justice had made these proceedings inherently biased. Outside the courtroom, the media were neither allowed to endorse such arguments, nor, in a different direction, to criticize the trials for not casting a wider net by indicting many more top wartime leaders. In a familiar paradox, the Japanese learned a great deal about the war that the censorship and secrecy of their own government had withheld from them, but were not permitted to comment freely on this. Impermissible discourse about the war extended much further, however. It went without saying that the wartime rhetoric of Pan-Asianism and fighting a holy war against Chinese bandits and devilish Anglo-Americans was intolerable as were the peons to Yamato race superiority that commonly accompanied this rhetoric. Coming to terms publicly with death, destruction, and defeat was more problematic. Here, censorship could impede reasonable and therapeutic expressions of grief. Nothing revealed this more graphically than the difficulty of coming to grips publicly with the meaning of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Writing about the atomic bomb experience was not explicitly prescribed, and in the year or so following the surrender, especially in local publications in the Hiroshima area, a number of writers were able to publish prose and poetry on the subject. At the same time, however, survivors such as Nagai Takashi found their early writings suppressed, many bomb-related writings were severely cut, and the most moving English-language publication on the subject— John Hersey's Hiroshima, a sparse portrait of six survivors that made a profound impression when published in The New Yorker in August 1946, though mentioned in the media, could not be published in translation until 1949. As word spread that this was a taboo subject, a combination of outright censorship and widespread self-censorship led to the virtual disappearance of writings about the atomic bomb experience until the end of 1948 when Nagai's books finally signaled the modest emergence of an atomic bomb genre. In these circumstances, survivors of the bombs found it exceedingly difficult to reach out to one another for comfort, or to tell others what nuclear war meant at the human level. Beyond this, overt censorship extended to scientific writings. Many reports concerning the effects of the blasts and ensuing radiation could not be made public until the closing months of the occupation, for over six years, Japanese scientists and doctors, and even some American scientists in Hiroshima and Nagasaki who were conducting research on radiation effects, were denied access to data that might have assisted them in communicating to and helping atomic bomb victims. The visual record of nuclear destruction was even more thoroughly suppressed. Documentary footage filmed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki between August and December 1945 by a team of some 30 Japanese cameramen was confiscated by the Americans in February 1946 and sent to Washington, with orders that not a single copy was to remain in Japan. The first graphic representations of the human effects of the bombs did not appear until 1950, when the married artists Maruki Iri and Maruki Toshi published a small book of drawings of scenes they had witnessed or heard about in Hiroshima, entitled Pika Don, a term specific to the atomic bombs that literally means flash bang. That same year, the Marukis were also permitted to exhibit a stark painting entitled Procession of Ghosts, which became the first of a series of powerful collaborative murals depicting atomic bomb victims. As Maruki Iri later explained, the couple was motivated to do such paintings because they feared that there might otherwise never be an indigenous visual record of the horrors of nuclear destruction. It was not until after the occupation, on the seventh anniversary of the bombings in August 1952, that the public was afforded a serious presentation of photographs from the two stricken cities. The residents of the only country to experience atomic warfare thus spent the early years of the nuclear age more ignorant of the effects of the bombs, and less free to publicly discuss and debate their implications, than people in other nations. In Allied eyes, the Japanese simply had reaped what they had sown. The terror bombing of Japanese cities, culminating in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was seen as an appropriate homecoming for the horrors Japan had visited on others throughout Asia and the Pacific. Early in 1949, when occupation authorities finally relaxed their restraints on the publication of intimate personal accounts of the effects of the atomic bombs, they conveyed this notion of righteous punishment literally. 
At General Willoughby's insistence, the first printing of Nagai Takashi's Nagasaki no Kane, The Bells of Nagasaki, had to include a lengthy American prepared appendix about the sack of Manila by Japanese forces in 1945. Such Victor's logic was obtuse. It easily could be taken as suggesting that Nagasaki and Manila were comparable atrocities, hardly what the Americans intended. To the great majority of ordinary people, it was in any case emotionally impossible to accept the death of family and acquaintances or their own suffering as being deserved retribution. The need to grieve publicly, to mourn and speak well of the dead, in some instances unsurprisingly transgressed what the censors deemed proper and permissible. The most famous such case involved an elegiac prose poem written by a former ensign in the Imperial Navy, Yoshida Mitsuru, who had been drafted out of Tokyo Imperial University to serve on the doomed super battleship Yamato. In mid October 1945, in an intense burst of anguished inspiration, Yoshida wrote down in intimate detail his memory of the sinking of the Yamato en route to Okinawa in April 1945, with a loss of almost 3,000 men. Many emotions drove him. Yoshida wished to expunge the impression of meaningless death from the memory of his comrades, liberate them from shame, memorialize their sincerity and bravery, and mourn those who perished and, as would most Navy men anywhere, the death of a great ship. The twenty three year old Yoshida was also wrestling with why death had not chosen him when it gathered in so many of his comrades. As one of the few survivors of the Yamato, And as someone, moreover, who had witnessed most of the final battle from the bridge, Yoshida essentially took it on himself to write, in a single text, an after action report, an obituary, and a eulogy. His closing lines, as translated in the censor's report, were as follows Over three thousand were the number of the crew, of which the survivors were only two hundred something. Who could surpass their ardent fighting spirit? Who could doubt their excellent training? Glorious be their end in the eyes of all the world. Yoshida's Senkan Yamato no Saigo, the end of the battleship Yamato, now is recognized as one of the few important literary memoirs to emerge from Japan's war. Censors at the time acknowledged its impressive qualities, but also feared that this intimate evocation of the Japanese militaristic spirit might promote feelings of both regret and revenge among readers. As a consequence, it was suppressed in 1946 and again in 1948, published only in abridged form in mid 1949, and not made available in full until after the occupation ended. More modest efforts to grieve publicly or treat the war dead as tragic victims also encountered disapproval. In mid 1948, censors deleted the following line the translation is the censors from a piece by the fiction writer Nagayo Yoshiro. Under the present circumstances, she could not openly weep or express her sorrow for the loss of her only and precious son, who died an honorable death in the Battle of the Solomon Seas. In this instance, the censor's rationale was criticism of occupation. Earlier that same year, the poet Yano Matakichi failed to gain the censor's approval for a number of verses in a collection he had dedicated to his children. Yano had learned belatedly that his married daughter perished of malnutrition in Manchuria after the war. And his son had died in Soviet hands as a prisoner in Siberia. A number of his poems were censored for their anti Soviet sentiment. A haiku in which he spoke of having offered his son's life for victory's sake, never, never for defeat, was deemed rightest propaganda. Another haiku exclaiming that the whips of defeat are too severe, and asking what crimes these young people had committed, was censored as incitement to unrest. A well known poet, Tsuboi Hanji, Provoked a more complex response among the censors, who blue penciled a published collection of his verses. In addition to deleting lines about alienated and starving individuals groaning in the beehive of Japanese capitalism and warriors who had fought and perished under the flag whose color is that of pure blood, the censors also were confronted with a poem titled History, unpunctuated in the original, which they translated as follows. The flag falls to the ground, and from a radio box comes the voice of a god, hollow, trembling, sorrowful. This moment must be recorded in history. Falsely created pages of myth are closed on this day. People's eyes are newly opened and gaze at the reality around them. Appallingly ruined streets, corpses already removed without a trace, 
only resentment remains. Harboring the resentment of those who perished in the conflagration, weeds spread over the ruins. August 15th piles upon August 15th. Between those who destroyed the country and those who would rebuild the country, a year of vehement battle. A history of 365 days pours into tomorrow's time. Let us fill tomorrow's twenty-four hours as historic hours. It is perhaps a token of the censor's own uncertainty, as well as the poet's, that they disapproved only of the third stanza of history, letting stand Suboy's opening reference to the emperor as a god, Kami, as well as the ambiguous implications of his concluding allusion to those who had destroyed the country. The censors had no doubts at all, on the other hand, about the complete unacceptability of Let Us Shake Hands, by the gifted woman poet Kurihara Sadako. Hello, American soldiers, call out little militarists, throwing away their toy guns. They were busy with their game of war until only yesterday. Hello, American soldiers, they call. In their little hearts spring out longings toward people of unfamiliar race. Hello, American soldiers, was it you who fought our fathers until only yesterday? But you smile at us brightly. You are not the beast that grown-ups had made us believe. We want to touch your big hands. We want to shake hands with you. Sometimes the censor's responses to allusions to the war went beyond hypersensitivity and seemed merely dim-witted. A passing reference to the death of a suicide pilot was censored from a story by Kawabata Yasunari. Similarly, a short article by the popular writer Sakaguchi Ango that praised the patriotic passion of those who had volunteered to die for their country and expressed hope that disheartened veterans could now turn that same selfless spirit into a force for peace, was suppressed as militaristic. The censors repressed as nationalistic propaganda this simple, natural statement from a text for learning English. If the war has taught us what peace is worth, those whom today we remember will not have died in vain. The following haiku, evoking a familiar scene in bombed-out urban areas where people cultivated garden plots, was suppressed as criticism of the United States. Small green vegetables are growing in the rain along the burned street. The same rationale lay behind the deletion from a boy's magazine of a story that used seeds sprouting in Nagasaki as a metaphor for young people throwing their energies into constructing a new Japan out of the ruins. This poem, too, was deemed beyond the pale. It seems to be a dream far, far away that we wielded bamboo spears, priced at only one yen and twenty sen, against the big guns and giant ships. An American journalist writing in the Catholic magazine Commonweal in 1947 singled out this particular suppression as a typical example of Scap's censorious oversensitivity, arguing that in fact these modest lines nicely reflected the current preference of the Japanese for sardonic comments on their political and military immaturity an attitude that is commendable both for its common sense and its humanity. His criticism provoked a florid response from Major Daniel Imboden, chief of the CI&E Press Division, who referred to the Japanese as these strange and mysterious people, and exclaimed, I thank God that General MacArthur established censorship. One of the most consequential censorship policies pertaining to the war involved nothing more than a change of nomenclature, the Japanese were forbidden to refer to their war in Asia as the Great East Asia War, Dai Toa Senso, the name they had given it. Instead, they were required to use the term Pacific War, Taiheiyo Senso. Exactly who dictated this change and when are unclear, although it was routinely required on manuscripts from 1946 on. Certainly the change amounted to an act of semantic imperialism with unexpected ramifications. Whereas the Japanese phrase, for all its jingoism, had clearly centered the war in China and Southeast Asia, the new term recentered it in the Pacific and gave unmistakable primacy to the conflict between Japan and the United States. There was nothing conspiratorial in this renaming of events. It merely reflected the reflexive ethnocentrism of the conquerors, who essentially had excluded Japan's Asian antagonists from any meaningful role in the occupation and now eliminated them from the very language by which the war was to be identified. Quite the opposite of reminding the Japanese of their war guilt, such a maladroit rectification of names facilitated the process of forgetting what they had done to their Asian neighbors. Purifying the Victors 
Where criticism of the occupation and allied powers was concerned, the censor's files contain more than a little bit borders on the ridiculous. A small dog was ordered deleted from a photograph of U.S. forces on parade because it detracted from the dignity of the troops. More commonly, it was the troops themselves and all their emblems, jeeps, English language signs, and the like, that were expunged from the visual record. As if eliminating any sign of the occupation from films and photographs would somehow help the Japanese forget that they had no sovereignty. The public was denied the opportunity to see a cartoon about the remarkable efficiency with which the GIs took over Tokyo, and as a consequence of this little act of suppression, never was introduced to the marvelously captioned observation that the power of chewing gum is awesome. Nor was the public allowed to read such witty senryu, or satirical haiku, as this. Only the jeeps seem to receive the May sunshine. At a different level of suppression, for some years the media were not allowed to refer directly to the huge monetary costs that the government was required to pay for maintenance of the occupation forces, amounting at one point to around one third of the regular annual national budget. In 1946, the press was instructed to refer to occupation costs, if at all, as war termination costs, Shusen Shorihi. The following year, at the censor's command, this was further deflated to a benign other items in discussions of the budget. The stultifying taboo of criticism of occupation forces also meant that the Japanese could not dwell on the contradiction between soaring flights of rhetoric about freedom and democracy on the one hand and gnawing hunger on the other. The censors translated and then marked suppress the following poem scheduled for the February 1948 issue of Kaizo. Whenever the time comes, the meal is ready, grandfather, the meal is ready, grandmother, we say. And a stale meal is carried to grandfather and grandmother, consisting only of haiku rations. When anything is said against it, they're told to keep their mouths shut and eat it. In this way, their existence is just like that of the nation. The nation is feasting on freedom. And is feasting as though it is trying to see how long it can live no matter how it lives. That is haiku. One morning it was still too early to eat. The peaches were blooming in the garden when grandfather and grandmother went down to the garden. They were stretching their bent backs and were yawning toward heaven. This was not exactly immortal literature. But the fact that two and a half years after defeat, writers could still be prohibited from expressing such views says a great deal about the sealed linguistic space of the occupation period, as the critic Eto Jun has called it. Those who raised cynical questions about the swiftness with which yesterday's militaristic ultranationalists became today's peace loving internationalists sometimes, by no means always, felt the censor's hook. Those who observed that politics was gelded under the occupation were often silenced. Three years after surrender, Baba Tsunego, one of the country's best known newspapermen, still was unable to publish an article saying that post war cabinets were mediocre because prime ministers had no choice but to be yes men. One small casualty of such soft dictatorship was incisive political cartooning. The turn of the century had seen the emergence of an urbane cadre of social and political cartoonists, led by a brilliant Western influenced illustrator, Kitazawa Rakuten. Rakuten and his colleagues, who often published their graphics in humor magazines that used the English puck in their titles, offered sharp lampoons of cultural foibles, social inequities, and political corruption and abuse. From the 1930s on, incisive satire of the domestic situation was suppressed, and a new generation of cartoonists came to dominate the scene, led by Kondo Hidezo, a gifted chameleon who rode with the political tides. But never ceased to skewer his targets of the moment in a distinctive manner. Under Kondo's leadership, cartoonists initially claimed to be politically neutral and inspired only by a healthy nihilism. They took pride, they said, in simply producing nonsense cartoons. But before long, they became, virtually without exception, avid propagandists for Japan's war. As also happened in the film industry, cartoonists escaped the post surrender purges virtually unscathed and declared themselves champions of democracy with scarcely a moment's pause. Symbolic of this quick conversion, the monthly magazine Manga, Cartoon, a major vehicle of wartime propaganda, resumed publication in January 1946 with a cover illustration by Kondo depicting a hapless General Tojo behind jailhouse bars. Kondo and others also lent their considerable talents to new left wing publications, such as the tabloid Mimpo, People's Report. 
Yet these cartoonists quickly learned that democracy had its limits. The same maiden post-war image of manga was not permitted to print a kondo graphic depicting a kimono-clad woman dancing with a big G.I. Two months later, in the March issue, the censors suppressed the graphic of another well-known cartoonist, Sugiuro Yoshio, in which a cigarette-smoking G.I.-servicing pan-pan prostitute stood beside a homeless man. The source of the streetwalker's relative prosperity was not exactly disguised. She was wearing a kimono and haori jacket with a stars and stripes design. Get a job, she told the homeless man. On the wall behind her was a left-wing poster reading, Overthrow the Emperor System. Sugiura's witty sally was a triple abomination to CCD. It attacked the emperor, highlighted the economic crisis, and called attention to the fraternization of G.I.s with Japanese women. Nor could the victors tolerate a clever graphic in another magazine, ridiculing the exclusion of the emperor from the impending war crimes trials. Depicting a large MP shepherding Japan's wartime leaders into custody, the cartoon carried the cynical caption, Leaving the Lord behind, everyone has gone. The emperor was not formally off-limits to satire, and for a while a few publications, especially the left-wing monthly Shinso, Truth, did venture to make him a cartoon subject. After 1947, however, even mild satire about the throne largely disappeared. The more significant official restraint on satirizing authority involved the foreigner who actually reigned over the country. General MacArthur was as sacrosanct as the emperor had been before his descent from heaven. A European who worked as a censor for CCD amused himself by privately redesignating the division SPCD as an acronym for Society for the Prevention of Criticism of Douglas. Below him, the occupation forces, from highest officer down to lowest-ranking enlisted man or civilian employee, were similarly insulated from criticism, indeed from anything but laudatory portrayal. As a matter of policy, top occupation officials also were unavailable to the media for interviews. SCAP communicated its policies largely by press conferences and handouts that the media were expected to report dutifully, an ex-cathedra structure of channeled news that foreign journalists recognized as setting a dangerous precedent. To lampoon the prospects for, or the nature of, democracy in MacArthur's Japan was a risky undertaking. The humor magazine Vaughn learned this lesson when several cartoons were ordered deleted from its issue of October 1947. In one, a small MacArthur faced a large but friendly dragon labeled Japan with a rope around its neck and a saddle identified as democracy on its back. MacArthur was murmuring, well, somehow I've tamed it. For any American newspaper or magazine of the time, this would have been a commonplace depiction of the formidable challenges the occupation faced and MacArthur's partial and still uncertain success in meeting them. CCD's censors, however, interpreted the cartoon as criticizing MacArthur by representing him as being unable to get into the saddle, and so, having a difficult time in democratizing Japan. This is not to say that the period of occupation failed to stimulate clever and amusing cartoons. The greatest of post-war comic strips, Hasegawa Machiko's Sazai-san, made its debut in April 1946 and consistently provided an engaging, witty, and female-centered, the artist was a woman, running commentary on the ups and downs of daily family life, dominated by an exceedingly spunky wife, mother, daughter, sister named Sazai. In Anmitsu Hime, Princess Bean Jam, Young girls were treated to an extroverted medieval cartoon princess whose silly name conveyed her passion for a popular suite. Tezuka Osamu, the country's most inventive and venerated cartoonist, made his post-war debut in 1946 by leaving the confines of Japan for an imagined world of androids and humanoids that posed provocative questions about science, human nature, and personal identity, as well as good and evil. As these examples indicate, the best cartooning was to be found outside the realm of politics. Editorial cartoonists such as the Asahi's Shimzu Kon did become well known for their bemused renderings of the antics of easy-to-caricaturize politicians such as Prime Minister Yoshida. As Shimizu observed, though, even he and cartoonists like him did not really produce political cartoons, but rather, cartoons about the political world, Sekai Manga. With but occasional exceptions, they offered no sustained political vision, no biting critique of the misuses of power and authority, no cosmopolitan worldview. The occupation's modus operandi made the public development of such a critical vision next to impossible. 
If we were to rely on just the visual record left by cartoons, this would seem to have been an occupation virtually bereft of occupiers. The same rationale that prohibited fundamental criticism of occupation policies extended to criticism of the Allied powers in general, for to speak badly of the victors would undermine their moral authority. This meant that the outside world too had to be sanitized for Japanese consumption. The left wing monthly Kaizo offers a small case study in the types of statements about the victorious allies and their world that could be deemed to be in violation of the press code. As Professor Furukawa Atsushi has documented, Kaizo was required to delete references to racial prejudices toward peoples of color among the Western allies. Mention of the surrender of Japanese troops to Kuomintang, nationalist, rather than communist forces in China, an allusion to the denial of voting rights to blacks in the United States, descriptions of the Soviet Union as socialistic, the United States and Great Britain as capitalistic, and China as semi colonial, mention of tension between the democratic USSR and reactionary imperialistic United States, an expression of fear that Japan might become subordinated to international capital, a description of fascism as a manifestation of capitalistic contradictions. And criticism of capitalism in general by, for example, well known Marxist scholars such as Hani Goro. Nor was this the end of the journal's transgressions. In mid 1946, Kaizo also was required to delete the following line from the translation of an article about Korea by the American journalist Edgar Snow. A certain high U.S. official privately told me that Korea is now part of the new U.S. front line, and this reflects the thinking of a majority of the high command. The censor marked this untrue. In the occupation's new historiography, general criticism of allies even extended back to medieval and early modern times. Thus, in August 1947, Kaizo was required to remove a passage from an essay entitled Dante and Columbus, which stated that in the historical development of European nations such as Spain, Portugal, Holland, and Britain, there was a predominant tendency to acquire new lands as colonies. In October 1948, the magazine, by now formally identified as ultra leftist on CCD's watch list, was not permitted to state that there were plans afoot to create a committee on un Japanese activities, modeled on the House Un American Activities Committee in the U.S. Congress. Although such a committee did not materialize, it was being considered at the time. Other publications were subjected to comparably close vetting. A famous turn of the century Christian convert, Uchimura Kanzo, was subjected to posthumous censorship in the reprint of an autobiographical work. The offensive text referred to an early period in his life when he was in the United States and mentioned that there were more murders and alcoholics in New York than in Tokyo, to which the CCD censor responded that, although this might well be true, it was too early to let the Japanese know it. Even trivia such as passing reference to the youthful poker playing skill of former U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull were ordered deleted. An autobiographical account of a Japanese former POW interned at Camp McCoy in Wisconsin passed the censor's scrutiny in mid 1946 with only these sentences deleted. The Americans give the impression of being educated, but they're surprisingly ignorant. They actually believe what they read in the papers. As gullible as the Japanese are, there's hardly one of us left who still does that. The Japanese editors of an English language dictionary failed to smuggle in this example of the use of the verb denounce. No imperialism is more denounced today than the imperialism of the United States. These remarkably close and nervous readings extended to passing comments critical of America's allies in the recent war. Censored criticism of China included references to the post surrender use of Japanese troops in the Chinese Civil War, abuse of Japanese repatriates, And characterization of the country as emerging from a semi colonial or colonial situation. Discussion of the Civil War itself was not taboo, but graphic descriptions of China's chaotic upheaval could be regarded as exceeding the limits of propriety. For a while, such repression extended to negative comments about the Soviet Union. The philosopher Tanabe Hajime was censored in January 1946 for expressing apprehension about the Soviet role in the occupation. And the elderly parliamentarian Ozaki Yukio, writing in Kaizo in April 1946, was not permitted to speak in passing of repression in the Soviet Union. An article on Reinhold Niebuhr's book Children of Light, Children of Darkness in the November 1946 issue of Shiso no Kagaku, Science of Ideas, 
was heavily censored for criticizing Stalin's despotism. Even as late as September 1948, when Cold War tensions were unmistakable in occupied Japan, the following passage was deleted from the monthly Sekai for being critical of Russia. The USSR is administering her own country by an absolute autocratic policy, so she takes the same high-handed autocratic attitude toward the smaller nations. This mystique of the Immaculate Allies contributed to the fashioning of a public world that was not merely unreal, but sometimes also surreal. Isolated from the rest of the world, the defeated Japanese were supposed to ignore the collapse of the victorious wartime alliance, the breakup of national unity in China, the renewed struggles against Western imperialism and colonialism in Asia, the decisive emergence of Cold War tensions, and the beginnings of a nuclear arms race. They were placed, as it were, in a small time warp, where the World War II propaganda of the winning side had to be reiterated, even as the erstwhile victors engaged in new struggles and polemics. In this world, the Japanese could not express concern that competition among the victorious powers in regard to atomic energy is not a welcome phenomenon from the standpoint of the establishment of world peace, censored as general criticism of the Allies in May 1946, in which it was impermissible to warn that Above all, Korea today forms the contacting point of America and the Soviet Union, as well as having deep bearing with the international destinies of both countries, censored in January 1947, in which, long after the West had adopted the rhetoric of the Iron Curtain, Japanese writers could be prohibited from reporting that the clash of opinions between America and the Soviets is being widely circulated at present, or from expressing hopes that this would not lead to open conflict in the future censored as disturbing the public tranquility in December 1947. Policing the Cinema In the course of six and a half years of occupation, Japanese movie studios produced around 1,000 feature films. Up to 1949, two copies of every screenplay had to be submitted in English in advance to SCAP's advisors, and on numerous occasions a great deal of give-and-take took place before a script emerged that was satisfactory to the Americans. Some directors, such as Kurosawa Akira, flourished despite these constraints. Others, such as Kamei Fumio, never found a firm post-war footing. To Kurosawa, GHQ's controls were trivial compared with those imposed by wartime censors, whom he regarded as idiots perverted by, among other things, emperor worship, and repressed sexual fantasies. Kurosawa had made his directorial debut during the war, and all four of his wartime films, Sugata Sanjiro, the name of the film's hero, and its sequel, Ichiban Utsukushiku, the most beautiful, and the incomplete Tora no o Fumu Otokotachi, men who tread on the tiger's tail, were included among a total of 236 feudal and militaristic films that Scap ordered destroyed in November 1945. This did not prevent Kurosawa from quickly emerging as the most influential cinematic innovator of the new Japan. Between 1946 and 1952, he produced eight films, beginning with the naively idealistic democracy film Waga Seishun ni Kuinashi, No Regrets for Our Youth, 1946, which was followed by a meandering tale of romance and mishap amid the ruins entitled Tsubarashiki Nichiyobi, One Wonderful Sunday, 1947. As the occupation unfolded, Kurosawa continued to address contemporary themes, but the hope and idealism of these films gave way to a darker vision. His prototypical protagonist became male rather than female, as had been the case in No Regrets for Our Youth as well as The Most Beautiful, a generally humanistic individual who sometimes was cursed by the past and almost always found himself mired in a venal, duplicitous society. In film after film, this protagonist, invariably played by Mifune Toshiro, moved through an increasingly dismal milieu of gangsters, Yoidore Tenshi, Drunken Angel, 1948, ex-soldiers turned criminals, Nora Inu, Stray Dog, 1949, venal journalists, Shubun, Scandal, 1950, and Helpless Deranged Innocents, Hakuchi, based on Dostoevsky's novel The Idiot, 1951. Even his masterful Rashomon, released in 1950 and set in medieval times, held a mirror to the contemporary scene in its portrayal of sexuality, crime, and ambiguity, and the relativity of all stories people tell.
Kamei Fumio's experience was the opposite of Kurosawa's. While Kurosawa shrugged off GHQ's surveillance and moved imaginatively within the boundaries of the permissible, Kamei, more overtly idealistic and ideological, came to personify the forbidden terrain of the new censored democracy. This became clear when Kamei found it impossible to screen a short documentary titled Nihon no Higeki, The Tragedy of Japan, in 1946, and then was forced to make extensive cuts in Senso Tohewa, Between War and Peace, an ambitious feature film he co-directed with Yamamoto Satsuo. The tragedy of Japan drew primarily on wartime footage to present a scathing analysis of the ruling class forces that had led Japan into an aggressive and disastrous war. Kame's crisp montage style, based on skillful editing of the government's own propaganda newsreels, was similar to that of Frank Capra, the premier director of propaganda films for the U.S. military during the war. There was more than a little irony in this. The pièce de résistance of Capra's cut and splice art was the anti-Japanese film entitled Know Your Enemy, Japan, released less than a year before Kamei's tragedy appeared. Although Kamei's 1946 film hewed fairly closely to a line of Marxist analysis endorsed by the Japan Communist Party, the so-called Kozaha line, emphasizing feudal legacies and ruling group militarism and repression under the emperor system, it was not fundamentally at variance with Capra's wartime propaganda. By far the most memorable scene in Kamei's documentary, one the Capra surely would have applauded, was a dissolve in which Emperor Hirohito was transformed before the viewer's eyes from the nation's rigid, uniformed commander into a benign, slightly stooping civilian figure, modestly garbed in necktie, overcoat, and soft felt hat. The major studios Toho, Shochiku, and Nikatsu all refused to show the documentary in their theaters, apparently more for financial than ideological considerations, and Kamei later recalled how at early screenings some viewers hooted and one threw a wooden clog at the screen. This was a marginal film, but one just beginning to attract curious audiences, about 2,500 people a day, when it was abruptly banned by GHQ in mid-August 1946. A leftist but non-communist filmmaker, Kamei had studied documentary techniques in the Soviet Union in the late 1920s. His was a unique experience of having films suppressed by both the Imperial Army and General MacArthur's command. His brooding 1939 documentary of the war in China, Tatakao Heitai, Fighting Soldiers, had been made with the official sponsorship of the military, but was immediately withdrawn for being defeatist. The film's nickname among insiders was Tsukareta Heitai, or Exhausted Soldiers. In a roughly comparable manner, Kamei received strong support from American officials in the Civil Information and Education section in preparing his documentary, only to have General Willoughby personally intervene and order all prints and negatives confiscated some three weeks after its release. Willoughby's intervention came at the request of Prime Minister Yoshida, who regarded Kamei's treatment of the Emperor as Lee's Majesty and succeeded in persuading two of the General's aides to view this sacrilege with him. On its own part, the Willoughby camp was more troubled by the implicit criticism of the occupation's policy of exonerating Hirohito from war responsibility. As Kamei and others later observed, the suppression of the documentary essentially marked the moment when serious debate concerning imperial war responsibility disappeared. The overt rationale for withdrawing the film was that such radical treatment of the emperor, as one of the Americans who viewed the documentary with Yoshida put it, might well provoke riots and disturbances. Suppression of The Tragedy of Japan carried at least three lessons for those trying to gauge what SCAP's democracy meant in practice. It revealed, first of all, not merely the persistence of absolute authority, but also its arbitrariness. What GHQ had censored, after all, was a purely Japanese criticism of militarism and the abuse of authority in pre-surrender Japan, precisely the type of free and critical discussion the occupation claimed it hoped to promote. Kamei and his staff had been encouraged to undertake this project by CI&E officials and had then dutifully moved it through the censorship apparatus and received official approval to release it. Iwasaki Akira, the producer, was thunderstruck when told the film had been ordered withdrawn, and Willoughby himself privately acknowledged that the documentary did not actually violate censorship policy. Kamei's dry response was that he had not changed since his trouble with the Imperial Army seven years previously, and apparently circumstances had not changed much either. 
A second lesson, carefully taken in by media people, was that serious criticism could carry an intolerably heavy price tag. Despite its reliance on already existing footage, the tragedy of Japan proved expensive to produce for Nietzsche, the studio that backed it. The film's suppression pushed the company close to bankruptcy and provided a compelling warning to anyone else who might be contemplating playing with controversy. Individuals working in the print media, where delays as well as outright suppression could be financially devastating, were likewise keenly attuned to the accounting costs of expressing what they truly thought. The third lesson to be gleaned from the film's abrupt suppression was ideological. The purpose of censorship was changing, moving slowly but inexorably from militaristic and ultranationalistic targets to left wing ones. If this changing focus was still blurred in 1946, it had become much clearer by the time Kamei and Yamamoto were completing their ambitious feature film Between War and Peace. CCD's lower level censors revealed their erudition with an early notation on the screenplay to the effect that the film's title was apparently taken from Dostoevsky's famous novel. Although the title came from Tolstoy, the storyline of a soldier long given up for dead who returns home after the war to find that his wife has married his close friend actually came from D.W. Griffith's innovative 1911 movie Enoch Arden. Like tragedy, the 1947 film was initially officially encouraged, in this instance by the government at GHQ's insistence, to commemorate the ideals of the new constitution. The major studios were being urged to produce films exemplifying certain principles in the new national charter, and Kame and Yamamoto were selected by Toho to direct a feature conveying the anti militarist spirit of Article 9. After being shepherded by CI and E, the film was submitted in mid May to the Civil Censorship Division, where it immediately came under intense criticism as a vehicle for several communist propaganda lines. A secret memorandum of mid June characterized these as glorification of demonstrations, identification of the emperor with discreditable groups, overplaying post surrender starvation in Japan, and decadence in morals. The film, this memorandum went on to note, fell into a sensitive category similar to that of the tragedy of Japan. Other memos spelled out these communist propaganda lines more concretely. Scenes of labor strikes and demonstrations, for example, were excised as incitement to unrest and criticism of SCAP. As the censors put it, demonstrators carrying banners and posters such as Freedom of Speech, Let Us Who Work Eat, And watchers cheering and joining the marchers, etc., are suggestive of criticizing SCAP censorship and encouraging labor strife. An episode involving thuggish strike breakers was drastically cut on the grounds that it suggested a link, not in fact implausible, between right wing strike breakers and emperor system ultranationalists. These scenes, it was claimed, also entailed subtly intended criticism of U.S. by showing one of the principal characters being beaten up by the strike breakers in a manner suggestive of American gangster methods. The censors also discerned both criticism of the victors and a communist emphasis on moral decadence in a passing shot of a man with his back to the camera negotiating with a streetwalker, and in a cabaret scene in which the walls were decorated with posters of Hollywood actresses and pictures of Caucasian nudes. Although CIND officials had assured the Japanese that kissing on the silver screen was the open and democratic thing to do, scenes that mingled promiscuous kissing with jitterbugging and other nightlife activities were here deemed criticism of U.S. suggestive that such display of public affection is due to American influence. Although many of the scenes that upset the censors involved unflattering portrayals of social and political conditions under the occupation, Between War and Peace was from start to finish a wrenching anti war melodrama. Repatriated from China years after being declared dead, the protagonist returns to find that his wife has married his former best friend. The friend, traumatized to the point of insanity by his battlefield experience in China, has become de facto father to the protagonist's son. In miserable living conditions, the wife supports her reconstructed family by piecework. The viewer is introduced to many scenes that linger in the mind's eye the terror of combat. The suffering and generosity of the Chinese, the air raids on Tokyo, the squalid living conditions of the post war scene, tough street orphans and youthful prostitutes, the corruption of former military officers, the hedonistic escapism of life on the margins. Where did the responsibility for all this misery and degradation lie? 
The film's answer, which unnerved the censors, was that responsibility lay with greedy people who had taken advantage of the emperor-centered socialization for war. When the shell-shocked ex-soldier plunged into madness after discovering his predicament and exclaimed, Teno he kabanzai, long live the emperor, imagining himself back on the killing fields, the censors identified this as criticism of Scap, on the grounds that Scap has recognized the emperor system, and the scene is an attempt to belittle the system by inferring that only ex-soldiers who have gone insane ever think of their emperor. The flashback survived, but the offending phrase was excised. In the end, CCD backed off on a number of its reviewers' initial criticisms, but required that at least 17 sections totaling around 30 minutes be deleted from the rough cut that had been approved by CI&E in May. Even after these excisions, Between War and Peace still emerged as one of the grittiest post-surrender films about Japan, a rarity in the way it conveyed a visceral sense of the misery, sleaziness, tensions, hopes, and passions of those years. Despite the censor's interventions, the film's left-wing vision, driven by idealism more than ideology, remained unmistakable. Japan's Chinese victims were portrayed with a sympathy rare anywhere in Japan at that time. The film's three protagonists, their fates grotesquely twisted by the war, eventually came to exemplify an almost impossibly high order of forgiveness and love. Eloquently and with quintessential simplicity, the film's closing words, spoken against a background of children playing in a schoolyard, evoked the dream of a new generation that could be educated to cherish peace and democracy. And for all this there was a receptive audience. Critics praised Between War and Peace as one of the finest films of the year, and large crowds flocked to see it. Kame was to have no chance to repeat this accomplishment, however, for thereafter he found it increasingly difficult to get work as a director. In ways that went beyond what had to be left on the cutting-room floor, even Beyond War and Peace, for all its ambition, ultimately failed to convey the political and social milieu of the time. For there were, quite simply, no Americans. There was no occupation. Alien authority was invisible. This was as it had to be. Especially in the early years of the occupation, filmmakers and other photographers and graphic artists had been instructed to turn their eyes away from the American presence. Exceptions to this injunction were tolerated, but only where the image of the conqueror was bland and benign. Soon after the occupation ended, the director Yamamoto Kajiro reminisced about how difficult it had been to film in Tokyo. Directors were supposed to avoid G.I.s, Jeeps, English-language signs, and buildings controlled by the occupation forces, not to speak of terribly burned-out areas. Even a verbal mention of being burned out was excised from one of Yamamoto's scripts, while the sound of an airplane was ordered silenced in one of his soundtracks. Since there were no Japanese planes at this time, such sound effects could only represent U.S. military aircraft, and as such were interpreted as signifying criticism of the occupation. The occupied screen did not merely offer a new imagined world. It also made things disappear. Curbing the Political Left Formally, SCAP censorship gradually tapered off beginning in 1947 and was terminated in October 1949, when CCD was dissolved. Traditional theater was removed from pre-performance censorship in mid-1947, beginning with Bunraku Puppet Theater in May, followed by Kabuki in June and No in September. Chu Shingura, the classic drama of the 47 loyal retainers, returned to the Kabuki stage in November with an all-star cast. It had been feared that such tales of feudal loyalty and revenge might incite violent reprisals against the newly arrived occupation forces. After August 1947, most radio scripts no longer required pre-broadcast approval, and phonograph records were removed from pre-release strictures three months later. In October, all but 14 book publishers were shifted from pre- to post-publication censorship and by September 1948 the remaining companies were also freed of having to clear their manuscripts at the galley-proof stage. All but 28 magazines were placed on post-publication surveillance status by December 1947, with the exceptions remaining subject to pre-publication approval until October 1949. All major newspapers and news services were removed from pre-publication scrutiny by the end of July 1948. 
This easing of formal controls was misleading, however, for censorship assumed new forms after 1947 and did not end in 1949. CCD's sprawling bureaucracy actually peaked numerically in 1948, well after the U.S. State Department had complained that the censorship operation had the effect of continuing the authoritarian tradition in Japan. As liberal officers increasingly left GHQ and were replaced by more conservative technocrats, censorship became more stringent. Arbitrary and unpredictable. More subtle and pernicious in the print media in particular, the shift from pre publication to post publication censorship had a chilling rather than a liberating effect on many publishers, editors, and writers, for it made them more vulnerable to financial disaster should occupation authorities find their published product unacceptable and demand that a newspaper, magazine, or book be recalled. Ambiguity and arbitrariness served SCAP's purposes particularly well in the context of economic instability, for few publishers could take the risk of being censored after putting their product on the market. As a consequence, caution and self censorship became ever more apparent as the occupation progressed. The tactics of intimidation took other forms as well. While pre publication censorship was in effect, Higher GHQ officials sometimes simply held or deliberately misplaced articles that were not technically in violation of the press code, but nonetheless were deemed undesirable, thereby creating havoc with deadlines. This happened to many controversial articles submitted to CCD by Akahata, Red Flag, the official newspaper of the Japan Communist Party, and was known to be a favorite practice of Don Brown, the influential head of CI&E's information division. To whom CCD often referred controversial materials. GHQ officials were also able informally to reward or punish publishers by manipulating the rationing of paper, which remained in short supply for most of the occupation period. Another subtle form of leverage over what could be read was GHQ's control over the licensing of foreign books for translation, which required approval from Brown's office in CI&E. A blunter instrument lay in the ability of American officials to demand that writers or editors who displeased them be summarily fired. SCAP's early purge directives, in December 1945, had included only a small number of high level media executives, and the formal categorical purge of influential media officials associated with militaristic and ultranationalistic propaganda prior to Pearl Harbor did not even begin until late 1947. When this astonishingly belated media purge ended in May 1948, some 2,295 individuals had been screened and 1,066 purged, of whom 857 had already resigned or retired. These public Old War purges had hardly ended before GHQ officials began informally demanding that management fire writers and editors whom the Americans deemed unacceptable for Cold War reasons. In October 1948, for example, Suzuki Toshisada, the publisher of the magazine Nihon Hyoron, Japan Review, was told by Major Daniel Imboden of CI&E to fire his assistant editor, whose offenses included trying to publish articles by the progressive Canadian historian diplomat E. H. Norman on free speech and the well known communist Ito Ritsu on the new fascism. If he failed to do this, Suzuki was told, he might well find himself being tried before a military tribunal and sent to penal service in Okinawa. The assistant editor resigned that month. Shortly afterward, in the so called December incident, four editors at Kaizo were forced to step down in circumstances so similar that they even involved a Nisei official from GHQ visiting Kaizo's offices to invoke the same threat of hard labor in Okinawa. Such crude threats had weight because of yet another dimension of the censorship operation. Okinawa, under the draconian control of the United States, was shrouded in secrecy as the Americans built the strategically situated island into a major Cold War military base. Throughout the occupation, and indeed until 1955, no news reports or commentaries about Okinawa were published in the press, making the image of that virtually invisible prefecture as a penal colony seem perfectly reasonable. The threat of bringing dissident editors before a military tribunal and sentencing them to hard labor was an extreme but not entirely idle one. One of the more egregious abuses of the censorship authority occurred in September 1948 in an altogether absurd incident involving a sports newspaper. The incident began with an article published in the May 27, 1948 issue of Nikan Supotsu, Daily Sports, under the headline Mr. Thompson to Introduce American Nude Show to Big Theater. 
After observing a striptease in the Asakusa Theater District, an official in GHQ's entertainment section was quoted as commenting to Japanese reporters that the strippers were not very impressive, and he would like to introduce them to a real American burlesque show. Although the report was accurate and had been passed by CCD's censors, it was retroactively deemed to impugn SCAP's dignity, and formal prosecution procedures were initiated. On September 1st, a U.S. military tribunal sentenced the editor to one year at hard labor, suspended publication of Nikan Supotsu for six months, and levied a heavy fine of 75,000 yen on the paper. All on the formal grounds that Article 2 of the Press Code, disturbing public tranquility, had been violated. On appeal, the editor's sentence and the newspaper's suspension were overturned, but the steep fine was reaffirmed. In less frivolous proceedings a year later, three communist editors were tried and sentenced to hard labor for publishing inflammatory propaganda. At first glance, the Thompson affair itself might appear a burlesque. To media people trying to gauge the parameters of permissible expression, however, it seemed reasonable to interpret such incidents as reflecting a deliberate, systematic arbitrariness. The outrageous striptease case, after all, went on for months, extending far beyond the foibles or momentary excesses of some GHQ underling, and dramatically revealed the heavy price that could be exacted for even petty and inadvertent transgressions of what the supreme military authorities deemed proper. The Nihon Hyoron and Kaizo cases, on the other hand, were ideologically explicit. They made clear that the major target of censorship now was left-wing rather than right-wing thought. This was no secret in media circles. Indeed, the very process of moving away from the initial procedure of pre-publication censorship had involved the explicit stigmatization of the left as the new enemy of democracy. This became a virtually open policy in December 1947, when of the 28 periodicals left subject to pre-publication censorship, only two were ultra-rightist, with a combined readership of approximately 4,000 readers. The remaining 26 magazines were progressive and left-wing publications with a combined circulation of over 600,000. Among them were some of the best-known journals of opinion in Japan, including Chuo Koron, circulation 80,000, and Kaizo, 50,000, both of which had been suppressed by the imperial government during the war. Sekai no Ugoki, World Trends, 50,000, a weekly published by the Mainichi newspaper. Sekai Keizai Hyoron, World Economic Review, 50,000, which the censors characterized as being directed toward picking out defects in the capitalist system and predicting the eventual triumph of Soviet socialism. And Sekai, 30,000, which was regarded as moderate on domestic issues, but having adopted the usual communist line in its criticism of the United States, Britain, and capitalism. The 26 periodicals represented only a small percentage of existing progressive and left-wing publications. The thrust of CCD policy, however, was to weaken socialist, communist, and Marxist influence by example, through the harassment and vetting of the most influential and prestigious purveyors of such views. Here, for example, is how the censors confidentially explained their decision to include the monthly Choryu, the Tide, circulation 30,000, on the list. Choryu, they wrote, rates as the most important of the leftist publications. Contributors are chiefly leftist scholars who are analytical in their analyses of the world's industrial, agricultural, financial, social, and political problems, but whose conclusions are invariably anti-capitalistic and destructive. Their arguments are for the most part free from the bombastic outbursts peculiar to rabid communist commentators, but are presented in such learned and exhaustive fashion as to be very effective for propaganda purposes. Much the same could have been said about the often prestigious contributors to some of the other targeted journals, whose arguments went far beyond the simplistic recitation of Marxist mantras. Editors at the Iwanami Publishing House, which issued Sekai, found that in general the censors tended to hold them to more stringent anti-Marxist standards than were applied to other publishers, on the grounds that they should be restrained from lending prestige to the political left. Robert Spaulding, who rose to be chief of the press, pictorial, and broadcast division within CCD, later acknowledged that the censors became concerned with anti-democratic criticism of SCAP in the United States from the left as well as the right, virtually simultaneously with the Proclamation of Civil Liberties on October 4, 1945. 
one of the earliest radio programs promoted by CIND, doubly titled The Patriot's Hour and Prisoners Speak Out, was designed to give political prisoners recently released from jail an opportunity to express their views on the evils of the past and the prospects for a new Japan. In December, however, the program was dropped after it became apparent that most of these individuals were Marxists and communists. CCD began to prepare detailed internal surveys of Soviet influence and left-wing and communist trends in the Japanese media before the end of 1946, although it was not until around mid-1947 that leftist propaganda appeared as an explicit category on the key logs. A huge amount of leftist analysis did pass through the net, some incisive, some mind-numbingly formulaic. On the other hand, even lionized, soft Marxist economists and industrial relations specialists, such as Arisawa Hiromi, Ouchi Hyoe, and Okochi Kazuo, who were allowed to reach a large audience, all suffered minor censorship at one point or another. Prominent historians such as Hirano Yoshitaro and Shinobu Seizaburo faced more sweeping suppression in mid-1947, when their long essays, on the history of the bourgeois democratic movement in Japan and revolution and counter-revolution in the Meiji Restoration, respectively, were ordered to be deleted entirely from a volume on Tasks of the Japanese People's Revolution in a series sponsored by Tokyo University. From the American point of view, the tapering off of formal censorship posed a dilemma, for it coincided with adoption of the conservative reverse course in occupation policy and a predictable heightening of left-wing criticism. On April 30, 1948, the Central Press, Pictorial and Broadcast Division within CCD was ordered to conduct 100% surveillance of the communist media, largely for purposes of intelligence rather than direct control. Early in 1949, the conservative government, with SCAP's concurrence, cut the rationed allotment of newsprint to official communist publications from £86,000 to £20,000 per month. The Red Purge that the Yoshida government conducted with GHQ's active cooperation beginning in late 1949 initially did not seriously affect the media, for it was carried out against radicalized employees in the public sector in the name of retrenchment or rationalization, or comparable euphemisms. In the wake of the outbreak of the Korean War on June 25, 1950, however, the Red Purges spilled over into the private sector, and, among many other fields of activity, swept through publishing and filmmaking, as well as public radio. Although the beginning of the Korean War was the trigger for a media purge of ultra-leftists, the gun had been cocked several weeks before the war began. On June 6th, General MacArthur ordered that the entire Central Committee of the Communist Party be purged, and on the following day the purge was extended to 17 top editors of Akahata, the official JCP newspaper. The party itself remained a legal political organization, in justifying the purge of the Central Committee, MacArthur declared that recent inflammatory statements and lawless acts by communists bear striking parallel to those by which the militaristic leaders of the past deceived and misled the Japanese people, and their aims, if achieved, would surely lead Japan to an even worse disaster. To permit this incitation to lawlessness to continue unchecked, however embryonic it may at present appear, would be to risk ultimate suppression of Japan's democratic institutions in direct negation of the purpose and intent of allied policy pronouncements, forfeiture of her chance for political independence, and destruction of the Japanese race. On June 26th, the day after the Korean War began, Akahata was ordered to cease publishing, for 30 days initially, but this was later amended to indefinite suppression. Within three weeks, some 700 communist and left-wing papers had been shut down, and by October 1950, such indefinite suspensions had been extended to 1,387 publications by the official SCAP account, approximately 1,700 by another calculation. Although General MacArthur and the conservative government that carried out his directives justified these purges and suppressions by equating communist leaders with the militarists in pre-war Japan, to many, the more obvious historical counterpart was the pre-war repression of left-wing protest against militarism and oppression. Since the media were immediately placed under immense pressure to follow the official U.S. position regarding the conflict in Korea, the parallel to Imperial Japan's enforcement of a single voice for the hundred million seemed all the more apt. Suspension of the left-wing press was accompanied by expansion of the Red Purge in the public sector and its extension into the private sector. 
The primary thrust of these firings was to undermine left-wing influence in organized labor, but the witch hunts also altered what was read, heard, and seen in the mass media. Over 700 individuals were removed from journalistic circles, between 104 and 119 from broadcasting, the tally sheets vary, and 137 from the film industry. Most of these individuals had been summarily dismissed by September. Whereas the initial GHQ suspensions had targeted ultra-leftist publications, many with small circulations, the red purges struck at the mainstream. The purge of public radio, for example, was carried out in various cities on July 28, 1950, and involved posting the names of individuals who were to be expelled immediately from the broadcasting facilities. In some cities, such as Osaka, it reportedly was stated that this was being done in accordance with General MacArthur's orders, and American MPs participated in the expulsion of designated individuals. The first wave of red purges in the mainstream press took place the same day. Where the private sector was involved, dismissals were handled in various ways. At the Asahi, persons designated to be purged were summoned one by one to the office of a pale and clearly shaken company executive. At the Yomiuri, where bitter conflict between management and staff had prevailed since 1946, the dismissals were announced by an official flanked by plainclothes police and company guards, and were declared to be in accordance with General MacArthur's letter of June 6th. At the Kyodo News Agency, employees who attempted to stay on after their dismissal was announced were forced out by armed police called in by management. In the film industry, the purges were carried out in September, after a high official in GHQ's labor section summoned studio executives and ordered them to expel all communists from their companies, but to take responsibility for doing so themselves. Although GHQ never resorted to the sort of systematic suppression of left-wing expression that the imperial government had carried out under the peace preservation law, its shutdowns, harassments, and witch hunts served their intended purpose. Many progressive and left-wing publications folded. Others took a conservative editorial turn. Beyond this, however, more than a few genuinely idealistic supporters of democracy became disillusioned and moved from early enthusiastic support of the United States to cynicism or outright anti-Americanism. The purges also confirmed the more doctrinaire left in its self-righteous condemnations of bourgeois hypocrisies. Did Scap's regimen of censored democracy really matter when set against the larger developments and accomplishments of the occupation period? The answer is yes. Quantitatively, to be sure, the number of overt cases of blue-pencil censorship was minuscule compared to the overall deluge of words in print. The media undeniably were vastly more lively at the end of the occupation than they had been during the war. At the same time, however, they became less dynamic and diversified as the occupation dragged on. Certainly to liberals and leftists who had chafed under wartime repression and had been surprised and gladdened by the vigor of the early post-surrender reforms, it was disheartening to discover the pleasure Americans took in exercising absolute authority, and disheartingly familiar to observe the reflexive animosity they soon exhibited to those who disagreed with them. Iwasaki Akira, who had been involved in shooting the footage of the atomic destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that the Americans confiscated, and who went on to be producer of Kamei's ill-fated Tragedy of Japan, soon came to refer slyly to occupation authorities as the Gunbatsu, or military clique. I was sickened to be made to realize how tight the undemocratic American Gunbatsu had now drawn Japan into their clutches, he recalled feeling when he discovered that there was no way to protest the pulling of tragedy from the movie houses. Sato Tadao, the incisive, self-educated dean of post-war film critics, looked back on the occupation as a two-stage epoch of encouraged democracy followed by repressed democracy. To Matsuura Sozo, who witnessed GHQ's increasingly frenzied campaigns against the left at first hand as an editor of Kaizo, it was not until the occupation authorities actually left in early 1952 that a renaissance of democratic journalism was possible, an open, spring-like atmosphere comparable indeed with the early stages of the occupation. Among other things, only then was it possible to discuss the occupation itself, frankly. The deeper legacies of this censored democracy transcended ideology. 
Can anyone really believe that no harm was done to post-war political consciousness by a system of secret censorship and thought control that operated under the name of free expression? Indeed, waved this banner from the rooftops, and yet drastically curbed any criticism of General MacArthur, SCAP authorities, the entire huge army of occupation, occupation policy in general, the United States and other victorious allied powers, the prosecution's case as well as the verdicts in the war crimes trials, and the emperor's personal war responsibility once the victors pragmatically decided that he had none? This was not a screen for weeding out threats to democracy, as official justifications claimed, but rather a new chapter in an old book of lessons about acquiescing to overweening power and conforming to a dictated consensus concerning permissible behavior. From this perspective, one legacy of the revolution from above was continued socialization in the acceptance of authority, reinforcement of a collective fatalism vis-à-vis -vis political and social power, and of a sense that ordinary people were really unable to influence the course of events. For all their talk of democracy, the conquerors worked hard to engineer consensus, and on many critical issues they made clear that the better part of political wisdom was silence and conformism. So well did they succeed in reinforcing this consciousness that after they left, as time passed, many non-Japanese, including Americans, came to regard such attitudes as peculiarly Japanese. Part 5. Guilts. Chapter 15. Victor's Justice, Loser's Justice When World War II ended in Asia, the consuming sentiments of the victorious allies were hatred and hope, and the tangle of these emotions was nowhere more apparent than in the war crimes trials the victors conducted. The atrocities Japanese forces had committed in all theaters provoked a fierce desire for vengeance, and it was taken for granted that harsh punishment would be meted out to those found guilty of violating the established rules and conventions governing conduct in war. In formal terms, such conventional atrocities, or crimes against humanity more broadly defined, were identified as Class B war crimes. The planning, ordering, authorization, or failure to prevent such transgressions at higher levels in the command structure were categorized as Class C crimes. In practice, the two were often confused, and it became common to refer to B.C. war crimes. Thousands of Japanese were eventually accused of such crimes and brought before local military tribunals convened by the victorious powers. With two exceptions, the hasty proceedings by U.S. military tribunals in the Philippines against Generals Yamashita Tomoyuki and Homa Masaharu, both executed after being judged responsible for atrocities committed by troops under their commands, these local trials established no precedents, attracted no great attention, and left no lasting mark on popular memory outside Japan. The prosecutions that did significantly influence law and memory involved a small number of leaders accused and found guilty of unprecedented war crimes at the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, better known as the Tokyo War Crimes Trial or the Tokyo Tribunal. Like the Allied trial of Nazi leaders at Nuremberg, the Tokyo Tribunal initially captured the imagination of a war-weary world by expanding the interpretation of crimes against humanity, and, more boldly yet, by introducing a sweeping new formulation of crimes against peace. In the victor's idealistic rhetoric, although the Allied trials at every level would offer a model of fair and impartial justice, the showcase Class A tribunals at Tokyo and Nuremberg represented a momentous development indeed. In the words of BVA Ruling, the Dutch judge at the Tokyo trial, a moment when international law was en route to banning war and rendering it a criminal offense. To Ruling and countless others, holding individual leaders personally responsible for egregious acts of state constituted a milestone in legal development that seemed crucial in the nuclear age. Sir William Webb, the Australian president of the Tokyo Tribunal, had this in mind when he inaugurated proceedings with the observation that there has been no more important criminal trial in all history. In an opening statement that impressed many Japanese, Joseph Keenan, the American chief prosecutor, took care to emphasize that civilization was the ultimate plaintiff, and civilization itself might well be destroyed if these judicial undertakings did not succeed in preventing future wars. In practice, such hopes and ideals inevitably became tainted by the double standards of those who sat in judgment, as some members of the Allied camp privately acknowledged. 
On the Japanese side, the contradictions between judicial idealism and plain victor's justice provided fertile soil for the growth of a post war neo nationalism. Stern Justice It was by no means inevitable that major war crimes trials, let alone precedent breaking ones, would follow the war. Until 1945, many American and British officials envisioned enacting swift and summary justice against the arch criminals in their enemy camp. Secretary of State Cordell Hull once told his British and Soviet counterparts that, if he had his way, he would take Hitler and Mussolini and Tojo and their arch accomplices and bring them before a drumhead court martial. And at sunrise the following day there would occur an historic incident. Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau, thinking primarily of Germany, recommended that the Allies compile a list of top leaders who, on being captured and identified, should be executed immediately. By firing squads made up of soldiers of the United Nations. As late as April 1945, only weeks before Germany's capitulation, the British urged the Americans to approve execution without trial for top German leaders. Years later, some officials remained persuaded that this would have been the proper course in Japan as well. The attack on such advocacy of drumhead justice was led by Secretary of War Henry Stimson. Prompt justice based on fair legal procedures, Stimson argued, was consistent with the advance of civilization and would have all the greater effect upon posterity. Stimson made clear that he had in mind trials before military commissions, which would be empowered to expedite proceedings by making their own bare bones rules to avoid the legal technicalities that might arise in civilian courts or even in ordinary military courts martial. The Secretary of War noted that apart from meeting the judgment of history, Such trials would serve the educational and historical function of establishing a record of the enemy's transgressions. In his memoirs, published shortly after the war, Stimson declared that aggression is an offense so deep and so heinous that we cannot endure its repetition. The Filipino jurist Delphin Jaranilla, who sat on the bench at the Tokyo Tribunal, found these words so apt that he quoted them in concluding his own harsh judgment of the Class A Japanese defendants. When Japan surrendered, the major statement of Allied policy regarding Japanese war crimes remained what had been set forth in the Potsdam Declaration. There must be eliminated for all time the authority and influence of those who have deceived and misled the people of Japan into embarking on world conquest, for we insist that a new order of peace, security, and justice will be impossible until irresponsible militarism is driven from the world. We do not intend that the Japanese shall be enslaved as a race or destroyed as a nation. But stern justice shall be meted out to all war criminals, including those who have visited cruelties upon our prisoners. This was highly generalized, and necessarily so, for the victors were still deliberating about how to handle Japanese war crimes right up to the end of the war. What the Potsdam Declaration conveyed most clearly was the rage in the Allied camp over Japanese maltreatment of prisoners. Long after the war had ended, and notwithstanding the revelation of the enormity of Nazi atrocities, great numbers of Americans, British, and Australians continued to believe that the enemy in Asia had been even more heinous than the German one. A statistic that emerged in the course of the trials reinforced this impression. Whereas 4% of American and British servicemen taken prisoner by the Germans and Italians were calculated to have died in captivity, The incidence of death among American and British Commonwealth prisoners of the Japanese was estimated to have been 27%. Shortly after surrender, there was speculation that as many as 50,000 Japanese might be indicted for committing crimes against prisoners, as well as atrocities against civilians in the areas their forces occupied. A year later, it was estimated that roughly 10,000 such suspects had been identified for possible trial. Eventually, around 50 military tribunals were convened at various Asian locales. 12 by the Dutch, 11 by the British, 10 by the Chinese, 9 by the Australians, 5 by the Americans, and one each by the French and the Filipinos. Other trials were conducted by the Soviet Union and, much later, by the communist regime that came to power in China. Most of the tribunals convened outside the Soviet Union and communist controlled China carried out their tasks between 1945 and 1949. The last concluded in 1951. For many reasons, it is not possible to provide exact data concerning the outcomes of these proceedings. The trials took place in widely scattered locations under numerous national jurisdictions. 
Precise records were not always maintained or made available. Sentences, especially involving capital punishment, were sometimes reviewed and altered. Some accused prisoners died awaiting trial. Prison terms often were not served in full. Still, the overall scale of these local tribunals is clear enough. According to the most authoritative Japanese tabulation, a total of 5,700 individuals were indicted for Class B and Class C war crimes. Of this number, 984 initially were condemned to death, 475 received life sentences, 2,944 were given more limited prison terms, 1,018 were acquitted, and 279 were for one reason or another not sentenced or never brought to trial. Fifty of the death sentences were commuted on appeal, mostly by the French. Country by country, the Soviet Union accepted, the number of death sentences upheld was greatest in the trials conducted by the Dutch, 236 death sentences, and British, 223, followed by the Australians, 153, Chinese, 149, Americans, 140, French, 26, and Filipinos, 17. The generally accepted number of those actually executed is 920. A number of the accused were officers, some of relatively high rank. With the exception of Yamashita and Homa, however, few of them were well known. Most defendants were enlisted men at the lower levels of the chain of command, including conscripted colonial subjects assigned to serve as interrogators or prison guards. The indicted suspects included 173 Taiwanese and 148 Koreans, of whom over 40 were executed. Some local trials involved single individuals, in others, defendants were judged collectively. The largest group trial appears to have been an Australian tribunal involving 93 men. The Americans collectively tried 46 officers and men of the former Imperial Navy, of whom 41 were sentenced to death. Roughly three quarters of the defendants in these B.C. tribunals were accused of crimes against prisoners. Whatever the charge, the alleged crimes were invariably cruel and often gruesome. Although some suspects languished in their captors' hands for several years before being brought to judgment, the trials, once convened, were generally swift. Despite language problems, they averaged around two days each. At the same time, the Soviet Union conducted secret war crimes proceedings against Japanese who had been captured in Manchuria, northern Korea, and Karafuto, southern Sakhalin. The proceedings of one of these trials, convened in Khabarovsk in December 1949 and involving 12 Japanese associated with Unit 731 in Manchuria, which had conducted lethal medical experiments on some 3,000 prisoners, was actually published in English in 1950. Secretly, the Soviets may have executed as many as 3,000 Japanese as war criminals, following summary proceedings. In the case of China, the ten formal Allied military tribunals that sentenced 149 defendants to death were convened by the beleaguered Kuomintang nationalist regime. The Chinese Communists subjected around 1,000 Japanese prisoners to intensive re education during and after the war, and brought 45 to trial for war crimes 11 years after Japan's defeat. Although all received prison sentences, the last of them had been returned to Japan by 1964. Showcase Justice, the Tokyo Tribunal. After a long war that saw the death of several million Japanese servicemen and civilians, the fate of these few thousand accused war criminals in faraway places did not initially attract great attention within Japan. Although the revelation of widespread Japanese atrocities did make an impression on the general populace, Many appear to have regarded these distant exercises in Allied justice as little more than another example of how, in war and in peace, individuals lower in the hierarchy of authority had to pay for the misdeeds of men with real power. When all was said and done, it was obvious that only a small number of high army and navy officers, few high bureaucrats, no captains of the war economy, and virtually none of the civilian ideologues in politics, academe, and the media who helped prime the pump of racial arrogance and fanatical militarism paid for the terrible crimes that men on the front committed. The victors channeled their concern with ultimate responsibility into Japan's Nuremberg, the showcase proceedings against top leaders in Tokyo. Although the Tokyo trial proved but a murky reflection of its German counterpart, in sheer quantitative terms it was an impressive undertaking. 
The Nuremberg trial began on November 20, 1945, and concluded some ten months later. Following months of preparation, the Tokyo Tribunal convened on May 3, 1946, and continued for 31 months. One inevitable consequence of its length was increasing public ennui on the issue of war crimes and war responsibility. To be honest, one Japanese newspaper observed in November 1948, when the judgment was about to be handed down, the general public's interest focused not on the proceedings but on the single point of what the verdicts would be. Eleven justices presided at Tokyo as opposed to four at Nuremberg. At its peak, the prosecution numbered around 100 attorneys supported by a staff of over 100 allied nationals and almost 200 Japanese. In 818 court sessions over 417 days, the tribunal heard testimony from 419 witnesses and accepted depositions and affidavits from an additional 779 individuals, significantly more than at Nuremberg. Thousands of hitherto secret documents were collected under its jurisdiction, providing a record of policy-making that could never have been assembled under other circumstances. This was supplemented by the interrogation of scores of former civilian and military leaders. Some 4,336 exhibits were admitted in evidence, totaling around 30,000 pages. The transcripts of the trial, excluding exhibits and judgments, numbered 48,288 pages. As the Canadian diplomat and historian E. H. Norman observed, the most enduring legacy of the tribunal may have been this treasure trove of documentation. Under its charter, a simple majority judgment was sufficient to convict. In fact, when these immense proceedings finally limped to their close late in 1948, the bench was divided. A lengthy majority judgment endorsed by eight justices was read aloud in court between November 4th and 12th. Submitted but not read were five individual opinions, one by Justice Jaranilla, who had signed the majority judgment but took the occasion to express his view that many of the individual verdicts were too lenient. An opinion by Justice Webb, the president of the tribunal, nominally in concurrence with the majority, severely criticized aspects of the judgment and the trial. Dissenting opinions were submitted by the judges representing France, India, and the Netherlands. That of the Indian justice, Radhabinod Pal, was as long as the 1,200-page majority judgment. By majority decision, seven former Japanese leaders went to the gallows. Sixteen were sentenced to life imprisonment, one to twenty years, and one to seven years. Five of the convicted Class A war criminals died in prison, but none of the others served out their terms. The former foreign minister Shigemitsu Mamoru was released in 1950 and returned to politics the moment the occupation ended. The remaining twelve were paroled between 1954 and 1956. In 1958, the ten men still surviving were granted clemency following consultation with the former victor powers. A private exchange between Justice Ruling and General Willoughby revealed the ambiguous nature of this milestone in legal development. Despite their contrasting personalities, the idealistic Dutch jurist and the vigilantly conservative head of GHQ's intelligence operations had become friends as the trial unfolded and frequently played tennis together. As Ruling was leaving Japan, he paid a farewell visit to Willoughby. Although he had reservations about the conduct of the tribunal and had submitted one of the dissenting opinions, voting to acquit five of the twenty-five defendants, but supporting the death penalty for three defendants who were given life sentences, Ruling never questioned the overarching ideals of Nuremberg and Tokyo. A self-described peace activist to the end of his life, he maintained a favorable opinion about the overall purpose and fairness of the trials. Willoughby did not. This trial, he bluntly told his friend, was the worst hypocrisy in recorded history. Others in the victor's camp shared Willoughby's view, although it was never possible to say so publicly. Even U.S. Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe, who played a major role in deciding which high-ranking Japanese should be arrested as war criminals, privately dismissed the Tokyo Tribunal as mumbo-jumbo. As he explained it years afterward, he had had the job of picking the war criminals to be tried, not the brutes and the physical criminals and murderers, but the political war criminals, those who came under that very disagreeable heading of those who used war as an instrument of national policy. I still don't believe that was the right thing to do. I still believe that it was an ex post facto law. They made up the rules after the game was over, 
So we hanged them because they used war as an instrument of national policy. As Thorpe saw it, the Class A trials were fundamentally an exercise in revenge. We wanted blood, and by God, we had blood. The real reason for opposing these new rules of the game, however, was that they established an alarming rather than admirable precedent, whereby in the future anyone in a position of authority who had supported his country in waging a lost war might well find himself accused of war crimes by the victor. Another U.S. general who served in the occupation force later wrote that he went to the court many times and came away each time with the strong feeling that it was wrong to try a man for doing his duty for his country and government in time of war. I am against it one hundred percent. He believed that these sentiments were widespread among his military colleagues. Professional soldiers were not the only ones who privately had grave reservations about the showcase trials. In March 1948, the State Department's George Kennan visited Japan and included an acid commentary, bordering on the dyspeptic, in his top-secret report to the department's policy planning staff. Kennan observed that the war crimes trials in general have been hailed as the ultimate in international justice. There is no gain saying the fact that the trials have been procedurally thoroughly correct. According to our concepts of justice, and that at no time in history have conquerors conferred upon the vanquished such elaborate opportunities for the public defense and for vindication of their military acts, he then proceeded to castigate the trials in Tokyo as profoundly misconceived from the start. Punishment of enemy leaders had been surrounded with the hocus pocus of a judicial procedure which belies its real nature. Interminable delays, endless and humiliating ordeals. Merely compounded the problem. He dismissed the tribunals as political trials, not law. In later conversations with the British, Kennan found agreement that the trials were ill-conceived, psychologically unsound. By the time the Class A trial in Tokyo ended, the world had changed. The victorious Allied alliance had been shattered by the Cold War. Countries represented on the bench in Tokyo were engaged in civil wars and colonial wars in many parts of Asia, and U.S. occupation policy was in the process of turning away from the initial ideals of demilitarization and democratization. The indicted former Japanese leaders had been denounced for attempting to argue that their incursions abroad had been partly motivated by fear of communism. Yet even as this argument was being stifled, the United States was creating its own national security state dedicated to the global containment of communism. The tribunal was quickly eclipsed by what a member of the prosecution staff referred to as the darkening shadows of current events. By 1948, hardly anyone was left who still believed that Nuremberg and Tokyo could provide the basis for a peaceful world grounded in a new order of international law and justice. This cynicism was conveyed in two symbolic acts of omission. Whereas the entire Nuremberg proceedings had been made available in a 42-volume bilingual English and French publication, no official publication ever emanated from Tokyo. Even the majority judgment, which summarized the prosecution argument in great detail, was not made readily accessible. Transcripts of the entire proceedings were distributed so haphazardly that no Allied government ever obtained a definitive set. Although the Japanese government collected materials produced by the trial, these were not readily available to the public. For all practical purposes, the record of the proceedings was buried. At the same time, led by the Americans, the victors moved swiftly to make clear that there would be no further Allied interest in the issue of ultimate responsibility for the recent war. Far more men had been arrested as Class A suspects and incarcerated in Sagamo Prison than were actually brought to trial. And it was initially stated that they would be indicted once the first showcase trial was concluded. Such indictments never occurred. As time passed, the number of imprisoned subjects declined largely through dismissal of charges. As of June 1947, fifty remained in custody. By the time the Tokyo trial ended, the number had been reduced to nineteen. They included two immensely influential right-wing bosses, Kodama Yoshio and Sasegawa Ryoichi. As well as the brilliant and unscrupulous former bureaucrat and future prime minister Kishi Nobusuke, who had been the economic czar of the puppet state of Manchukuo and was accused, among other things, of being responsible for the enslavement of untold thousands of Chinese as forced laborers. On December twenty-fourth, nineteen forty-eight, the day after the seven defendants were hanged at Sugamo, 
All 19 remaining suspects were released on grounds of insufficient evidence. Ordinary people unversed in the subtleties of international law could be excused for failing to comprehend exactly where justice left off and political whimsy began. Tokyo and Nuremberg Although Japanese leaders understood that they would be held accountable for war crimes, they had no way of anticipating the ambitions of the Allies in this regard. Nothing in the Potsdam Declaration indicated that the victors would put forward new norms of international law. In this regard, the Tokyo trial initially seemed to resemble the reformist occupation as a whole, being cut of new cloth and without historical precedent. Even General MacArthur was taken by surprise by the scope and innovation of this legal project, and deemed it excessive. He privately indicated that he thought justice could have been served by brief military proceedings focusing on the treacherous attack on Pearl Harbor. The Nuremberg precedent made this impossible. Although the victors in Europe hammered out the general parameters of war crimes policy against Germany in June 1945, a month after Germany's capitulation, the Statute of the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal that established the basic principles for the trial of Nazi leaders was not issued until August 8th, the day the Soviet Union declared war on Japan, two days after Hiroshima, one day before Nagasaki. The Japanese had no time to analyze this, and they had no indication in any case that principles explicitly designed to bring Nazi leaders to justice would be transposed with only minimal change to Japan. In fact, it took months for the Allies to clarify their policies regarding the treatment of Japanese war criminals. While multination commissions prepared recommendations on the issue, and interdepartmental American committees refined their internal proposals, while indeed Japanese were being arrested for war crimes, final policy remained uncertain. Early in November, General MacArthur authorized a curt memorandum to Washington complaining that whereas the definition of war criminals had been comparatively simple where the Nazis were concerned, in Japan, no such line of demarcation has been fixed. Only in the closing days of 1945, a month after the appointment of Joseph Keenan as chief prosecutor, did Washington inform its allies that the Tokyo Tribunal would follow the Nuremberg pattern so far as it is appropriate in the Far Eastern Theater. General MacArthur did not announce the jurisdiction and functions of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East until January 19, 1946, at which time he also issued the Tokyo Charter. These guidelines, the counterpart to the Nuremberg Charter, were drafted by the American Prosecution Staff and SCAP's legal section. The other Allied powers were consulted only after it had been issued, and small amendments were made before the trial convened. On April 29th, the prosecution formally lodged its indictment with the Tokyo Tribunal. As stipulated by the rules of the court, it had previously been served on the defendants. It is a measure of both the complexity and the unwieldiness of the trial that although the indictment consisted of 55 counts charging the defendants with crimes against peace, conventional war crimes, and crimes against humanity, and although the proceedings of the trial followed this indictment for over two years, the majority judgment ultimately dismissed 45 of these counts as superfluous, redundant, or simply obscure. In both trials, considerable time and technical argumentation was spent by the prosecution attempting to establish a prior legal basis for crimes against peace and crimes against humanity in existing international laws and treaties. Despite such arguments, no one really denied the precedent-setting nature of the two tribunals. In the Tokyo Charter, the critical definition of the tribunal's jurisdiction was set forth as follows in Article 5. The following acts, or any of them, are crimes coming within the jurisdiction of the tribunal for which there shall be individual responsibility. a. Crimes against peace, namely the planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a declared or undeclared war of aggression, or a war in violation of international law, treaties, agreements, or assurances, or participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the foregoing. b. Conventional war crimes, namely violations of the laws or customs of war. c. Crimes against humanity, namely murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed before or during the war or persecutions on political or racial grounds in execution of or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal, whether or not in violation of the domestic law of the country where perpetrated.
leaders, organizers, instigators, and accomplices participating in the formulation or execution of a common plan or conspiracy to commit any of the foregoing crimes are responsible for all acts performed by any person in execution of such a plan. The decisive formulation of crimes against peace was framed in the first count of the indictment, which accused the defendants of having engaged in a common plan or conspiracy to secure military, naval, political, and economic domination of East Asia and of the Pacific and Indian Ocean, and to this end of having waged wars of aggression against countries opposing these purposes. This seemingly straightforward accusation rested on three bold premises. It assumed that a clear basis existed for distinguishing purely aggressive wars from wars undertaken out of genuine concern, however misguided, for the defense of legitimate national interests, and that Japan's wars all fell into the former category. It postulated a comprehensive and continuous conspiracy to wage such aggressive wars, and central to the ideal of establishing an effective legal and psychological deterrent against future crimes against peace. It affirmed that individual leaders could be held personally responsible under international law for activities previously regarded as acts of state. Although the prosecution, following the rhetoric of the Potsdam Declaration, opened the trial by accusing the defendants of having embarked on a plan of world conquest, the majority judgment at Tokyo explicitly dismissed the notion that the conspirators ever seriously resolved to attempt to secure the domination of North and South America. The majority, however, did endorse the prosecution's sweeping argument that top leaders had engaged in a criminal conspiracy to wage wars of aggression that commenced not in the period immediately prior to Pearl Harbor, as MacArthur would have had it, not in 1937 when Japan launched open war against China, not even in 1931 when the Manchurian incident was used as a pretext for imposing control over Manchuria. The defendants were charged with having participated in a conspiracy that dated back to January 1, 1928, when plans to take over the Asian continent allegedly first began to be hatched. Within this 18 years of turbulence and conflict in Asia, the prosecution ultimately accused the defendants of 756 separate acts constituting crimes against peace. The bulk of the prosecution's time, and hundreds of pages in the majority judgment, Were devoted to spelling out intimate details of policy making between 1928 and 1945, and arguing that virtually all of these did conform to a common plan to wage aggressive war. Although crimes against peace thus received intense scrutiny, crimes against humanity remained less precisely developed as a legal concept. The latter charge had been formulated at Nuremberg primarily to enable the Allies to punish Nazi leaders for the genocidal policies that came to be known as the Holocaust. The Tokyo indictment, by contrast, contained no separate counts of crimes against humanity. In the course of the trial, these tended to be treated as essentially co terminus with conventional war crimes, and indeed with plain murder. The prosecution presented testimony regarding Japanese atrocities against both prisoners of war and civilians in often horrific detail, and contended that these murderous acts were so widespread, continuous, and similar in pattern. That they reflected a common policy and plan emanating from, or at least tolerated by, the top leadership. Here the tribunal pursued a charge that was not part of the Nuremberg Charter, the concept of negative or vicarious responsibility, that is, of criminal liability for acts of omission rather than commission. Among the counts sustained by the tribunal was not only direct participation in the perpetration of war crimes in the form of orders or authorizations, count 54. But also having deliberately and recklessly disregarded their legal duty to take adequate steps to secure the observance and prevent breaches of the conventional laws of war. Count 55. Other differences also distinguished the Tokyo trial from its German counterpart. The four presiding judges in Nuremberg were each backed by an alternate, whereas the eleven justices in Tokyo had no backups. On more than a few occasions, this resulted in absenteeism on the bench. The prosecution was directed by four chief prosecutors at Nuremberg, representing the four victorious countries conducting the trial, with a clear division of labor in the charges for which each was responsible. In Tokyo, there was a single chief prosecutor, Joseph Keenan. Although Keenan was assisted by ten associate prosecutors, one from each of the other ten countries represented on the tribunal, the American control of prosecution policy and strategy bordered on the absolute. Four languages, 
English, German, French, and Russian, were employed simultaneously in the Nuremberg trial. In Tokyo, while the basic languages of the tribunal were English and Japanese, at least six other languages had to be accommodated. Communication was exceedingly complicated. Beyond comparison to the German case, as a Japanese publication put it at the time, involving not only large numbers of translators and interpreters, but also language monitors and arbitrators. Simultaneous interpretation proved impossible in Tokyo, and as a consequence, statements by witnesses or counsel were stopped at the end of each sentence until translations had been made. A member of the prosecution staff estimated that, when witnesses were being examined, the speed of the trial was reduced to one fifth of its normal pace. To many observers, the major difference between the two trials lay in the nature of the defendants and the crimes they were accused of committing. There was no Japanese cabal of leaders comparable to Hitler and his henchmen. Emperor Hirohito was, in fact, the only person in Japan who had been at the center of power during the entire course of the alleged conspiracy. There were no organizational counterparts to the Nazi Party and its affiliated criminal organs, such as the Gestapo and the SS. Which made the charge of conspiracy easier to argue in the German case. Nor, despite the horrendous litany of atrocities exposed in the Tokyo proceedings, including the massacres in Nanking and Manila, was there a real counterpart to the genocide planned and carried out by the Germans? This difference was emphasized by Justice Paul, who declared straightforwardly that the case of the present accused before us cannot in any way be likened to the case of Hitler. Justice Webb agreed that the crimes of the German accused were far more heinous, varied, and extensive than those of the Japanese accused. Despite the grievous crimes of which they were accused, the defendants failed to exude the aura of evil personified that choked the courtroom where their Nazi counterparts were tried. Of the twenty-two defendants in Nuremberg, three were acquitted and twelve were sentenced to death, one in absentia. There were no acquittals in the Tokyo Tribunal, where 23 of the 25 defendants were judged guilty of participating in the overall conspiracy against peace. Count one. Of the seven men sentenced to death, two were also found guilty, among other charges, of authorizing or permitting atrocities. Count 54. As well as of failing to prevent such breaches of the laws of war. Count 55. And three were judged guilty of the first, but not the second of these atrocity charges. One defendant, the former general Matsui Iwane, was given the death penalty solely on negative responsibility grounds for having been derelict in preventing atrocities by troops under his command during the Nanking massacre. To the general public, the most surprising and shocking of the death sentences was that imposed on the former foreign minister and prime minister Hirota Koki, who was found guilty of three charges, including overall conspiracy and having failed to prevent atrocities in China. Hirota was apparently sent to the gallows on the basis of the vote of only six of the eleven judges. The public may have become bored by the trial long before it ended, but when the verdicts were announced on November twelfth, nineteen forty-eight, there was a great deal to talk about, including the entirely unexpected submission of four separate opinions that were, in one way or another, critical of the tribunal's conduct and conclusions. Nuremberg had not provided the faintest precedent for this. Although the separate opinions were not read aloud in court, their essence was noted by the media. Justice Paul had acquitted all defendants, while Justice Ruling had found five, including Hirota, not guilty. Two justices, Webb and Henri Bernard of France, had found the tribunal flawed and compromised by the decision not to bring the emperor to trial. Given the intense campaign to present Hirohito as a champion of peace, this high-level evocation of his war responsibility was startling. For over two years, and with but one momentary lapse, all of the defendants accused of Class A war crimes had meticulously avoided saying anything that might seem to implicate their sovereign. Now, Justices Webb and Bernard revealed that they had not found this vigilant loyalism persuasive. With remarkable bluntness, Webb criticized the fact that the leader of the crime, though available for trial, had been granted immunity. He observed that the emperor's authority was required for war. If he did not want war, he should have withheld his authority. Despite this, Webb supported the majority judgment, although he did suggest, albeit with no great eloquence, that the death sentences might be commuted on review. Justice Bernard found the proceedings so unfair and technically flawed that he deemed it impossible to pass any judgment whatever. 
He deplored the abominable crimes committed by the Japanese and acknowledged that at least some of the defendants bore heavy responsibility for those transgressions. The absence of the emperor, however, struck him as so glaring an inequity that condemning the defendants was impossible. Japan's crimes against peace had a principal author who escaped all prosecution and of whom in any case the present defendants could only be considered as accomplices. Measuring the emperor by a different standard not only prejudiced the case against them, but also undermined the cause of international justice. These were unsettling opinions, and the emperor and his Japanese and American entourages lost little time in diffusing them. The very day the verdicts were announced, the emperor wrote General MacArthur reassuring him that he had no intention of abdicating. Eight days later, Chief Prosecutor Keenan reiterated that there were no grounds for trying the emperor as a war criminal. And on November 25th, the press reported three noteworthy events of the previous day. Despite pleas from representatives of several of the victorious nations that he commute the sentences, MacArthur had approved the majority verdict. Keenan had enjoyed the rare privilege of being invited to a private lunch with the emperor at the imperial palace. And Tojo Hideki, facing death, had delivered what one paper called his last message to the world. Taken together, this was a memorable triptych. Had MacArthur commuted the non-unanimous death sentences, he would have given credence to Webb's argument that, as the leader of the crime, the emperor should have been indicted. And this was inconceivable. That the emperor cordially dined with the chief prosecutor on the day his loyal servants saw their death sentences confirmed did not perhaps seem in the best of taste, but time was short. Keenan was leaving town. The two men spent three hours in private conversation, leaving the press to speculate that the emperor had desired to express his gratitude to Keenan for affirming his innocence. And Tojo? Tojo, no more contrite than his sovereign, did not bend like him. His last message challenged the basic premise of the judgment, that Japan's road to war had been undertaken without provocation or legitimate national security concerns. Peoples of all the nations of the world, Tojo was quoted as saying, absolutely should not abandon the right to initiate wars of self-defense. The death sentences in the Tokyo Judgment were appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, which on December 20th ruled that it had no jurisdiction in the case. Three days later, the seven condemned defendants were hanged, wearing, as a SCAP press release explained, United States Army salvage work clothing completely devoid of insignia of any kind. They died with the solace that they had been a shield to their emperor to the very end, and they left a legacy of lingering controversy. Victor's Justice and Its Critics Like Nuremberg, the Tokyo trial was law, politics, and theater all in one. Unlike Nuremberg, it was very much an American performance, as Justice Ruling put it many years later. It was like a huge-scale theatrical production, the Dutch jurist observed. I didn't see that at the time, and I didn't see that there were more Hollywood-esque things around than there should have been. Others did see this. In its coverage of the opening sessions, Time magazine was impressed by how the stage was set. Much care had gone into fitting the courtroom with dark, walnut-toned paneling, imposing daises, convenient perches for the press and motion picture cameramen. The Klieg lights suggested a Hollywood premiere. The lights dazzled everyone and often were described as almost blinding, not so much perhaps in the manner of a movie premiere as of a film being made. Indeed, much of the time the proceedings of the trial were being filmed. The Japanese, too, spoke of lighting of the level of Hollywood, albeit with more derisive intent than time. The very building in Tokyo's Ichigaya district in which the performance unfolded conveyed a certain sense of dramatic irony. Formerly the auditorium of the elite Imperial Army Officers' School, Japan's counterpart to West Point, by war's end it was serving as temporary headquarters for the Army Ministry and the combined general staff. Following SCAP's orders, the structure was renovated by the Japanese government at a cost of almost 100 million yen, an enormous sum. Both air conditioning and central heating were introduced. Seats were provided for 500 spectators, 300 of them reserved for non-official citizens of the Allied countries and the remainder for Japanese. The spectators' gallery provided sight lines on an enormous bullpen in which the defendants sat as a group on one side, the judges on another, and a small army of functionaries, 
court staff, translators, prosecutors, and the defense attorneys assigned to each defendant, filled the floor in front of them. American military police, usually wearing white helmets, checked people in and stood sentinel. Usually towering over the defendants, they provided an irresistible photo opportunity for depicting the mighty and the fallen. The defendants were quite literally dwarfed by the setting, and the relationship between the diminished elderly men in the dock and the enormity of the crimes they were accused of committing sometimes seemed to border, like so much else in the occupation, on the surreal. The defendants not only had access to Japanese counsel, but were provided, at their own belated request, with American attorneys who assumed their duties in mid-May, shortly before the trial began. Arguing that they had not been given sufficient time to prepare their cases, six of them, including the chief American defense attorney, resigned abruptly one month later in the trial's opening days. Those who stayed the course eventually served their clients reasonably well. When one considers wartime sentiments in favor of summary execution of the arch-criminals, the opportunity given the defendants to respond to the charges against them was impressive. Unlike the Nuremberg precedent, the Tokyo Charter did not prohibit the defense from challenging the tribunal and, led by two prominent Japanese lawyers, Takaya Nagi Kenzo and Kiyosi Ichiro, the defendants took advantage of this to question the very legitimacy of the tribunal and to challenge the validity of the most fundamental charges in the indictment. Although these challenges were predictably dismissed, the defense lawyers laid down arguments that remained fundamental to all subsequent criticisms of victor's justice. Later, after the prosecution spent some seven months presenting its case, the defense was given even more time, including 187 days in court, to respond. The appointment of American counsel reflected one of the controversial aspects of the tribunal, its grounding in Anglo-American trial procedures rather than the European traditions in which most Japanese legal specialists had been trained. The basic language of the trial was English, and seven of the eleven presiding judges, including the president of the tribunal, were trained primarily in Anglo-American law. Japanese attorneys operated at a severe disadvantage in this situation. One strikingly Americanized dimension of the indictment was the concept of conspiracy that lay at the very heart of the prosecution's case. Around the end of 1944, Secretary of War Stimson and his aides had concluded that adding conspiracy to the list of war crimes charges would expedite prosecution of Nazi leaders as well as lower-level members of Nazi organizations, something lawyers and historians have debated ever since. However valid the conspiracy argument may have been in the Nazi case, it was a highly artificial basis for explaining why and how Imperial Japan went to war. Justice Powell pointed out numerous instances in which it was more plausible to see Japan's leaders engaged in ad hoc responses to what they perceived as threats to their nation's security. On this particular point, subsequent scholarship generally has supported his skepticism. Declaring that documentary materials introduced revealed an 18-year-long common plan to wage aggressive war was much closer to propaganda than to serious historical analysis. The more technical criticism of the conspiracy charge was that it did not exist in international law prior to 1945. In his separate opinion, Justice Webb was unambiguous on this particular point. International law, unlike the national laws of many countries, he observed, does not expressly include a crime of naked conspiracy. So, too, the laws and customs of war do not make mere naked conspiracy a crime. Webb acknowledged that it was entirely reasonable to argue that conspiracy to commit grievous international transgressions should be a crime under international law. That argument did not, however, alter the fact that the tribunal in Tokyo has no authority to create a crime of naked conspiracy based on the Anglo-American concept, nor on what it perceives to be a common feature of the crime of conspiracy under the various national laws. To do so was, as he put it, nothing short of judicial legislation. Nevertheless, Webb's court upheld the conspiracy charge as presented in Count One of the indictment. Merely by raising the issue of judicial legislation, Webb implicitly called into question the post-war vision of establishing a new international legal order the ideal of outlawing crimes against peace posed a formidable conundrum. If the trials of Nazi and Japanese leaders were indeed precedent-setting, did this not imply that these leaders were being accused of crimes that had not previously been established in international law? 
How was it legally possible to hold the accused responsible, as Justice Ruling did in the opening words of his separate opinion, for certain events in world history on charges almost unknown before this war? At issue was a sacrosanct principle familiar to all participants in these trials, that without a law there can be no crime, without a law there can be no punishment. Nullum crimen sine lege, nulla poene sine lege. Sometimes the prosecution frankly acknowledged its path-breaking agenda. In his introductory presentation, Joseph Keenan freely conceded that the trials were without precedent in holding individuals responsible under international law for acts of state. More generally, however, as at Nuremberg, the prosecution attempted to present its indictment as but a bold reformulation of concepts and obligations already embedded in existing laws and treaties. The prohibition against wars of aggression, it was argued, had been established in the Kellogg-Bryant Pact of 1928, to which Japan had been a signatory. Furthermore, as Keenan put it in his opening statement, the offenses of these accused resulted in the unlawful or unjustifiable taking of human lives, which constituted murder, the oldest of all crimes, and the punishment that we ask to be inflicted is punishment commensurate with such offense. In its opening challenge, the defense focused on precisely the issue of retroactive or ex post facto crimes. Aggressive war is not per se illegal, the defense contended, and the Pact of Paris of 1928 renouncing war as an instrument of national policy does not enlarge the meaning of war crimes nor constitute war a crime. Predictably, the defense also challenged the legality of holding individual leaders responsible for acts of state. War is the act of a nation, it was argued, for which there is no individual responsibility under international law. It therefore followed that the provisions of the Tokyo Charter were ex post facto legislation and therefore illegal. These were not frivolous arguments. In considerable part, Justice Paul's dissent rested on a strict interpretation of the limitations of existing international law vis-à-vis -vis national sovereignty and national laws. In essence, he concluded that the defense had it right. The defendants were being tried for crimes that did not exist as such under international law prior to the defeat of the Axis powers. The Tokyo trial proved vulnerable to criticism on other grounds as well. A certain political capriciousness had been involved in deciding who would be indicted for Class A war crimes. In the prosecution's opening statement, Joseph Keenan himself frankly and rather surprisingly acknowledged that we have no particular interest in any individual or his punishment. They are representative in a certain sense of a class or group. Even if one went along with the understanding that this was to be a heuristic or showcase trial in which representative leaders were to be held accountable for their war responsibility, the absence of certain groups and crimes was striking. No heads of the dreaded Kempeitai, the military police, were indicted. No leaders of ultranationalistic secret societies, no industrialists who had profited from aggression and had been intimately involved in paving the road to war. The forced mobilization of Korean and Formosan colonial subjects was not pursued as a crime against humanity, nor was the enslavement of several hundred thousand young non-Japanese who were forced to serve as comfort women providing sexual services to the imperial forces. The Americans who controlled the prosecution chose to grant blanket secret immunity to one group of Japanese whose atrocious crimes were beyond question, namely the officers and scientific researchers in Unit 731 in Manchuria who had conducted lethal experiments on thousands of prisoners. They were exempted from prosecution in exchange for sharing the results of their research with the Americans. The prosecution also did not seriously pursue evidence concerning the Japanese use of chemical warfare in China. Whimsy, or at least casualness, was also evident in appointments to the bench, where the most incisive and best-remembered justices were Ruling and Paul, the authors of the two major dissenting judgments. Of the eleven judges in Tokyo, Paul was the only one with significant experience in international law. The original American appointee departed in a funk in July 1946 after learning that his qualifications had been belittled. His replacement left no mark. The Soviet judge, formerly a commissioner of justice under Lenin, had participated in the Stalinist mock trials of the mid-1930s. He spoke neither of the basic languages of the tribunal. 
His only two words of English, it was said, were bottoms up. The French judge had spent the interwar years in colonial service in West Africa, and, according to ruling, also did not speak English. The Chinese justice, educated in the United States, had published books on constitutional law, but had no prior experience as a judge. The Filipino justice was a survivor of the Bataan Death March, which in a normal court would have led to his immediate disqualification. The president of the tribunal had previously been involved in prosecuting Japanese for war crimes in Australian military tribunals in New Guinea. Defense challenges to the latter two appointments were rejected. Two judges, Pal and Jaranila, were appointed at the last moment, and both clearly knew how they intended to vote before being seated. Token Asians, they were mirror opposites. Justices Pal and Webb were noticeably absent from portions of the proceedings. Perhaps the most striking aspect of the conduct on the bench, however, lay in the fact that the eleven justices never collectively met in chamber to seriously discuss and deliberate the final judgment, no less how it should be argued and presented. Instead, as ruling described it, seven justices just decided among themselves to write the judgment. The seven organized the drafting and presented the results to the other four as a fait accompli. Some disagreements concerning whether the trials were fair reflected differing premises concerning the proper procedures of a military tribunal. Even Secretary of War Stimson never imagined that such trials would be conducted with all the procedural regulations and guarantees that prevailed in civilian courts or even in military courts martial. The vehicle of the military tribunal or military commission was chosen precisely because it permitted the prosecution to follow procedures impermissible in other venues, particularly involving the control of admissible and inadmissible evidence. In the context of the times, this seemed entirely reasonable. To begin with, the victors had every reason to expect the enemy to attempt to destroy or falsify evidence, as in fact happened. The victors also feared that the defendants might attempt to use the trials as a propaganda platform to reaffirm the legitimacy of their actions. To prevent this, it was deemed necessary to place restraints on the testimony or evidence they could introduce in the name of self-defense. The Tokyo Charter explicitly declared that The tribunal shall not be bound by technical rules of evidence. It shall adopt and apply to the greatest possible extent expeditious and non-technical procedure, and shall admit any evidence which it deems to have probative value. The war crimes trials were not civilian proceedings, and the arch-criminal defendants obviously were not presumed innocent by those who drafted the charter. The use of loose rules of evidence as defined by the victors proved, however, to be a gateway through which arbitrariness and unfairness entered the trials. The tribunal permitted the prosecution to introduce material that might have been rejected in more rigorous hearings, including hearsay, diary excerpts, unsworn statements, copies of documents where the originals were missing, and affidavits in situations where authors were not available for cross-examination. At one point, Justice Webb offered close to a lampoon of what it meant to be unbound by technical rules of evidence. There was no way of really telling what might be admissible from day to day, he explained, because there was no way of telling who would be present on the bench. Sometimes we have eleven members, sometimes we have had as low as seven, the president of the tribunal observed. And you cannot say that on the question of whether any particular piece of evidence has probative value, you always get the same decision from seven judges as you would get from eleven. You cannot be sure what decision the court is going to come to on any particular piece of evidence. What was sure, however, was that the prosecution commanded vastly greater resources than the defense, and could usually count on being favored by the bench on any given issue. In a trial of Japanese defendants where the basic language was English, for example, access to capable translators was crucial. By one count, when the trial began, the prosecution had 102 translators at its disposal and the defense, three. The prosecution largely controlled the submission of Japanese documents in translation, and it was only on specific request that these translations were examined. Justice Ruling recalled one instance in which a text seemed odd to him and, on being rechecked, proved to have been incorrectly translated. When he asked that a corrected version be introduced into the record, His request was turned down on the grounds that it was too troublesome to reopen the issue. 
Testimony by the defendants reached the bench entirely through interpreters, and the English interpretations tended to be more cryptic than the original statements. No one suggested that translations and interpretations were deliberately skewed or even fundamentally inaccurate, but no one on the victor's side ever dwelled much either on what it meant to be judged, and for seven men condemned to death, in translation ease. As Justices Webb and Bernard emphasized in their opinions, the most flagrant control of evidence involved the prosecution's single-minded campaign to insulate the Emperor. The tribunal was distinguished not only by the physical absence of the Emperor and the careful exclusion of any sustained references to him, but also by the absence of testimony by him. The manipulation of Victor's evidence to save him had no counterpart in Nuremberg, and received no challenge from the defense in Tokyo, even though the Emperor's testimony might have benefited some of the defendants. On the contrary, from the moment of their incarceration, the defendants, who interacted closely in prison, resolved to do everything possible to protect the Emperor. For the future of the Japanese race, as Shigemitsu Mamoru put it. When Keenan announced on June 18, 1946, that the Emperor would not be brought to trial, his loyal servants in Sugamo wept openly. Shigemitsu, the former diplomat, wrote a celebratory poem to the effect that, because his lord was a god, he was untouchable by the enemy. Kido, who had spent much time pleading the emperor's case with Keenan and the prosecution staff, rejoiced that, with this my mission is complete. In fact, the defendant's loyalist mission was not yet complete. Defense and prosecution alike labored to keep the emperor invisible for the next several years. On the part of the defendants, this vigilance faltered only on one occasion, December 31, 1947, when Tojo frankly testified that it was inconceivable for him or any subject to have taken action contrary to the Emperor's wishes. In response to this unintentionally candid and damaging observation, Keenan immediately arranged, through the Imperial Household Ministry, that Kido be contacted in prison and urged to tell his fellow defendant to rectify his potentially incriminating comment as soon as possible. Other intermediaries were used as well. Tojo was happy to comply, and the opportunity to do so arose in the courtroom a week later. On January 6th, in the course of an exchange with Keenan, Tojo retracted his earlier statement. Although the defendants were happy to collude in a tacit pact to protect the emperor, the tribunal adopted other policies on impermissible testimony that ran counter to their wishes. The defense was not allowed to pursue certain lines of reasoning that most defendants believed essential to their case, for in the eyes of the victors, and in the eyes of the court, such arguments were simply propaganda. None of the defendants accepted for a moment the accusation that they had been engaged in an eighteen-year-long conspiracy to wage wars of aggression. On the contrary, they believed to the end with all apparent sincerity that their policies, however disastrous in outcome, had been motivated by legitimate concerns for Japan's essential rights and interests on the Asian continent. As the men in the dock saw it, their country's security had been imperiled by a succession of truly alarming developments. Political chaos and economically crippling anti-Japanese boycotts in China, Soviet-led communist revolts and subversion there and elsewhere, American and European protectionist trade policies, global trends toward anarchic bloc economies, and coercive Western economic policies in the months prior to Pearl Harbor. Such concerns could not be excluded from mention, but the defense was not allowed to develop the case that they had validity, or that, for example, the wartime rhetoric of Pan-Asianism rested on legitimate Japanese and Asian grievances vis-à-vis -vis the white peril of European and American imperialism. Nor, of course, was the defense allowed to introduce testimony or evidence purporting to show that the victors had also engaged in activities comparable to the crimes the defendants were accused of committing, such as breaking treaties or violating the conventional laws of warfare. Curtailing such defense arguments was fully consistent with Stimson's reasonable desire that the punishment of war crimes be stern and that trials not be allowed to degenerate into propaganda platforms for the accused. It was fully in accord with the controls over acceptable evidence granted the tribunal by the Tokyo Charter, following the Nuremberg precedent. It was also the juridical counterpart of the general policy of occupation censorship, with all the absurdities that accompanied it. Before the Tokyo Tribunal convened, Winston Churchill had already denounced the erection of an iron curtain in Europe. 
Before the trial was halfway over, the United States had introduced its anti-communist Marshall Plan. As the proceedings in Tokyo were drawing to a close, the Kuomintang government of China, whose representative sat on the tribunal, was fleeing to Taiwan, and American politicians were in a panic verging on hysteria at the impending loss of China. Yet even amid this growing sense of a global Armageddon between communist and anti-communist forces, the erstwhile allies of World War II were sitting in judgment in Tokyo and refusing to let the defendants pursue the argument that their policies on the Asian continent had been motivated, in great part, by fear of both chaos and communism in China. Ideologically, this was a convoluted business out of which odd bedfellows emerged. Thus, the reactionary General Willoughby found the trial hypocritical, as did Justice Paul, an Indian nationalist. What the two men shared in their scorn for the tribunal, with indeed its Soviet judge serenely seated on the bench, was anti-communism. This was but one of the anomalies of Victor's justice. Race, Power, and Powerlessness Even as men of goodwill spoke of establishing an international order in which aggression would not go unpunished, their own judicial proceedings mirrored a world still skewed by the harsh realities of race, power, and powerlessness. This was apparent in the nature of the international composition of the tribunal. Although the countries Japan had invaded and occupied were all Asian, and although the number of Asians who had died as a consequence of its depredations was enormous, only three of the eleven judges were Asian. Even this exceeded the original intent of the victors. Initially, only nine justices were envisioned, with only one Asian, the representative of China, among them. Justices Paul and Jaranila were added only after agitation from their respective countries. The trial was fundamentally a white man's tribunal. The grudging inclusion of two additional Asian judges reflected specific colonial circumstances. The Philippines, an American colony since 1898, had been promised independence in 1946. India, long the crown jewel of the British Empire, was to become independent in 1947. During the early part of the Tokyo trial, Justice Paul actually represented a still unliberated country. Indonesians were not so favored, although as many as a million or more of them may have died under the brutal regimen of forced labor the Japanese imposed after occupying the Netherlands East Indies. The Dutch presumably represented the Indonesians at the Tokyo trial. Asian peoples who suffered at the hands of the Japanese in Vietnam, Malaya, and Burma also had no representatives of their own. The French nominally spoke for the Indo-Chinese. In theory, the British did likewise for the Burmese, the people of Malaya, and their colonial subjects in Hong Kong. It was especially perverse that no Korean served as judge or prosecutor although hundreds of thousands of colonized Korean men and women had been brutalized by the Japanese war machine. As comfort women, as laborers forced to work in the most onerous sectors of mining and heavy industry in Japan, or as lowly conscripts in the military. Korea was not a bona fide sovereign nation at the time, nor was it clear when it would be. For the duration of the Tokyo trial, Japan's former colonial subjects remained under alien occupation in a land divided between the United States and the Soviet Union. They were not allowed to judge their former overlords and oppressors or to participate in preparing the case against them. The plight of the Koreans was in its way emblematic of the larger anomaly of Victor's justice as practiced in Tokyo. It called attention to the fact that the recent war in Asia had taken place not among free and independent nations, but rather on a map overwhelmingly demarcated by the colors of colonialism. Colonialism, and imperialism more generally, defined the twentieth-century Asian world in which Japan was accused of having conspired to wage aggressive war. Japan's colonial and neo-colonial domain, Formosa, Korea, and Manchuria, existed alongside the Asian overseas possessions of four of the powers that now sat in judgment, Britain, France, the Netherlands, and the United States. China itself, nominally sovereign, had been in congeries of Japanese, European, and American special rights and interests, and was not even formally freed from its unequal treaties with the United States until the war was almost over. The tribunal essentially resolved the contradiction between the world of colonialism and imperialism and the righteous ideals of crimes against peace and humanity by ignoring it. 
Japan's aggression was presented as a criminal act without provocation, without parallel, and almost entirely without context. On occasion, the prosecution seemed literally blind to the Asia most Asians knew. In his opening statement, Chief Prosecutor Keenan actually claimed that the Japanese had determined to destroy democracy and its essential basis, freedom and the respect of human personality. They were determined that the system of government of and by and for the people should be eradicated and what they termed a new order established instead. This was the sort of light-headed American effusiveness that made more sober observers among the victors cringe. It remained for Justice Paul, however, to highlight the double standards that underlay the trial. It would be pertinent to recall to our memory that the majority of the interests claimed by the Western prosecuting powers in the Eastern Hemisphere, including China, he observed in speaking of Japan's takeover of Manchuria, were acquired by such aggressive methods as the Japanese were accused of employing. He also commented with no little sarcasm on the ways in which the positive rhetoric of imperialism and colonialism of the Europeans and Americans became transmogrified when associated with Japan. As a program of aggrandizement of a nation we do not like, we may deny to it the terms like manifest destiny, the protection of vital interests, national honor, or a term coined on the footing of the white man's burden, and may give it the name of aggressive aggrandizement, pure and simple. The Indian justice took palpable pleasure in suggesting the hypocrisy of the victor's case. He quoted England's prestigious Royal Institute of International Affairs at some length, for example, on how the Japanese had followed the precedents of European imperialism, sometimes with almost pedantic exactitude. Similarly, in discussing the Amao Doctrine of 1934, in which Japan had enunciated its special rights and interests in China, Paul observed that this definition of national interest finds obvious precedent in the conduct of the United States in pursuance of the Monroe Doctrine. The prosecution's attempt to condemn the Japanese for conspiring to promote feelings of racial superiority through their educational system did not exactly impress him, as it had the prosecutors, as something for which the Japanese could be uniquely condemned. On this issue, he was more rueful than bitter. He quoted the historian Arnold Toynbee on how race feeling had been fundamental to modern Western society and pointed to the discrimination that Japanese and other Asians had endured in recent times at the hands of the dominant white powers. Ultimately, though, he saw the inculcation of feelings of racial superiority as a dangerous weapon in the hands of designing people from the earliest days of human history. Although Paul's descent did not appear in translation until 1952, after the occupation ended, it resonated with the deeply held feelings of many Japanese. Paul did not condone Japan's actions, nor, with hindsight, did the majority of Japanese. But apart from acknowledging the horror of conventional war crimes and atrocities, and apart from strong sentiment that the war had been stupid, many Japanese, like the Indian jurist, found it difficult to regard their country's actions as having been unique. Unsurprisingly, they were more inclined than the victors to see the war in terms of power politics in an unstable imperialist world. That the powerless remained powerless, or at least the victorious great powers would have had them remain so, was apparent not only in Korea, but also in the southern reaches of Asia so recently occupied by Japan, where the European victors were engaged in violent campaigns to reimpose control over their former colonies. The boggling fatuity of Keenan's opening denunciation of the Japanese for having denied the peoples of Asia, government of and by and for the people, lay not merely in the fact that nothing of the sort had existed under the old European and American imperiums, but in the fact that the French were then fighting their way back into Indochina, the Dutch into Indonesia, and the British into Malaya. No American chief prosecutor was about to argue that these bloody aggressions constituted a crime against peace and humanity, particularly since in each case his government supported these death gasps of the old imperialism. From the Japanese perspective, the Soviet presence on the tribunal constituted a particularly egregious aspect of victor's justice. The Soviet Union, after all, had not exactly been an exemplary model of peace and justice, although many leftists believed otherwise. Closer to the bone, the Soviets were guilty of the crudest sort of hypocrisy. Japan was being accused of having violated sacred treaty obligations, but the USSR had qualified to sit in judgment in Tokyo only by ignoring its bilateral neutrality pact with Japan in the final week of the war. 
And although the most harrowing revelations of the Tokyo trial involved Japanese atrocities against civilians and prisoners, it was known that the Red Army had engaged in widespread abuses of civilians in Manchuria. Throughout the duration of the trial, moreover, hundreds of thousands of Japanese prisoners remained in Soviet hands, their circumstances unknown. As it turned out, the number of Japanese prisoners who would die in Soviet hands was much larger than the number of American and British Commonwealth prisoners who perished so miserably as prisoners of the Japanese. Against the Americans, the most predictable accusation of double standards rested on the argument that the terror bombing of Japanese cities, and the use of the atomic bombs in particular, were also crimes against humanity. Just as Paul made this argument with, even for him, unusual acidity. After bringing up a notorious statement that the German Kaiser Wilhelm II had conveyed to the Habsburg Emperor Franz Joseph in World War I, everything must be put to fire and sword, men, women, and children, and old men must be slaughtered, and not a tree or house be left standing. He introduced this statement into his dissenting opinion. In the Pacific War under our consideration, if there was anything approaching what is indicated in the above letter of the German Emperor, it is the decision coming from the Allied powers to use the atom bomb. Future generations will judge this dire decision. History will say whether any outburst of popular sentiment against usage of such a new weapon is irrational and only sentimental, and whether it has become legitimate by such indiscriminate slaughter to win the victory by breaking the will of the whole nation to continue to fight. It would be sufficient for my present purpose to say that if any indiscriminate destruction of civilian life and property is still illegitimate in warfare, then in the Pacific War this decision to use the atom bomb is the only near approach to the directives of the German Emperor during the First World War and of the Nazi leaders during the Second World War. Nothing like this could be traced to the credit of the present accused. Justice Jaranila took strong exception to this line of argument in his separate opinion. If a means is justified by an end, the use of the atomic bomb was justified, he wrote, for it brought Japan to her knees and ended the horrible war. If the war had gone on longer without the use of the atomic bomb, how many more thousands and thousands of helpless men, women, and children would have needlessly died and suffered, and how much more destruction and devastation, hardly irreparable, sick, would have been wrought? Taken together, Paul's and Jaranila's comments essentially define the parameters of the controversy over the use of the bomb that persisted through the decades that followed. Paul's was an extraordinarily severe accusation, for it amounted to saying that in the war in Asia the only act comparable to Nazi atrocities was perpetrated by the leaders of the United States. No other justice went so far, but justice ruling was also of the opinion that the air raids that culminated in the atomic bombings had violated the laws of war. Many Japanese, ruling concluded, felt similarly. In his contacts with students, he recalled, the first thing they always asked was, are you morally entitled to sit in judgment over the leaders of Japan when the Allies have burned down all of its cities with sometimes, as in Tokyo, in one night, 100,000 deaths, and which culminated in the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Those were war crimes. The hypocrisy of the victors would soon become a major thread in neo-nationalist thinking and Paul's descent a well-thumbed Bible for critics of the Tokyo War Crimes trial view of history. That the American government itself soon embraced many erstwhile war criminals in the common cause of anti-communism, Shigemitsu Mamoru and the right-wing godfather Kodama Yoshio even before the occupation ended, and Kishi Nobusuke while prime minister from 1957 to 1960, to give but three examples gave a perverse binational coloration to this repudiation of the Tokyo Tribunal's verdict. To many Japanese, however, the crimes revealed by the trial, compounded by the perception that this was a world gone mad with violence and that such crimes against peace and humanity were not unique to Japan, reinforced the deep aversion to militarization and war that had come with defeat. The cynicism about the trial of those who took such a position cut differently from that of the neo-nationalists. As one left-wing intellectual wrote shortly after the occupation ended, what had begun as one of the great revolutionary trials of history turned into a caricature of justice. It became little more than a technical trial, an exercise in retaliation against some twenty-odd men, a failure inseparable from the larger failure of the Americans to promote a fully democratic revolution. Small wonder that too few people derived from it something that could become a true standard of behavior— 
However, he added, this did not mean that the ideals of peace and justice were now irrelevant. On the contrary, it was all the more important to cherish them, precisely because the trial had made their fragility so clear. Where these ideals could be cherished, of course, was in the renunciation of war provisions of the new Constitution. Loser's Justice, Naming Names The Japanese themselves were one of the Asian people excluded from participating in the prosecution of war criminals. Allied logic here was clear. The accused should have no right to judge themselves, only to marshal a defense. The assumption, of course, was that virtually all Japanese bore some measure of responsibility for the war, and so none could be trusted to pursue the issue of war responsibility impartially where their compatriots were concerned. Such reasoning was understandable in the emotional heat of the time, particularly given the lack of serious resistance in Japan to the war regime, apart from a small number of communists. Still, excluding Japanese from any formal role in the investigation and prosecution of war criminals may have been short-sighted. We enter here into historically perilous imaginings of what might have been. In this instance, though, we can at least turn to some participants in the events of the time who did give thought to a more active Japanese role in prosecuting war crimes. Formal involvement of this sort, possibly even extending to a presence on the bench, something Justice Ruling at least considered, though only well after the fact, could have removed some of the stigma of victor's justice from the trials. It might also have strengthened popular acceptance of the idea that the Japanese, more than anyone else, had to take responsibility for their crimes. Failure to promote this was congruent with the larger failure of occupation authorities to recognize that their penchant for monopolizing authority could be counterproductive. Early on there was considerable grassroots support for such involvement in uncovering the country's war crimes. As early as mid-September 1945, the shocking revelations of atrocities committed by Japanese troops led newspapers such as the Asahi to recommend that the Japanese should compile their own lists of prospective war criminals, since these would be longer than those the Allies could conceivably come up with, and possibly also conduct their own trials. Many readers strongly agreed. By mid-October, the number of letters attacking those responsible for the war, not only the military cliques, but also bureaucrats, the police, and leaders of big business and finance, had risen sharply. The Asahi's editors expressed surprise at how many people were urging that the Japanese punish their war criminals. Long before Prince Konoe and former Privy Seal Kido were ordered arrested, the paper was editorializing that civilians like them, and not just the so-called military cliques, should be included among the accused. Early in December, when the Allies' public list of prominent accused war criminals had reached 218 individuals, Tensei Jingo, the paper's most admired column, said this was far too few. The confidential reports of the State Department's representative in Tokyo took note of such trends. The general mood of the Japanese people, George Atchison cabled Washington in mid-December, is strongly in the mood of fixing war responsibility on the major suspects. Bitterness on account of Japan's defeat and an apparently growing realization that Japan should not have undertaken aggressive warfare has created a strong resentment against Japanese leaders. Such sentiments were generally endorsed on the political left. Marxists and communists subscribed readily to a critique of Japanese wars of aggression dating back at least to the Manchurian incident of 1931, and their early post-surrender campaigns called on the people to root out war criminals and collaborators at all levels of society. Although advocacy of people's tribunals did not become part of the Communist Party platform, Prominent left-wing intellectuals, such as Hosokawa Karoku, gave early thought to encouraging the trial and punishment by the Japanese people themselves of those responsible for the war. Hosokawa actually envisioned this while in jail for thought crimes, awaiting liberation by the Allied victors. On the eve of the Tokyo Tribunal, some Japanese did succeed in warning against complacently leaving such trials to the Allies, urging that this be done by the hands of the Japanese people as well. Others were less successful in getting this message out. At a public symposium in December 1946, a lawyer criticized the tribunal for excluding from the bench or prosecution staff Japanese who had opposed the war, and found the entire text of his speech suppressed by GHQ's censors when submitted for publication. In 1948, as the tribunal drew toward its conclusion, some progressive intellectuals renewed the call for people's courts and Japanese trials, only to find by this date that they could arouse no public interest whatsoever. 
At the other end of the political spectrum, the government also considered conducting trials. Although there was never the faintest chance that the victors would accept this idea, it nonetheless received attention in high circles before and after the surrender. It first surfaced on August 9th, during an internal cabinet struggle over whether or not to surrender, when the military vainly attempted to make the right to conduct its own trials a condition for accepting the terms of the Potsdam Declaration. When SCAP announced the first arrests of Class A suspects on September 11th, the government immediately revived this idea. On September 12th, shocked by the impending arrests and related to this Tojo's attempt to avoid prosecution by committing suicide, The Higashikuni cabinet voted to investigate possible war crimes and conduct its own trials, regardless of what the Allies might do. Foreign Minister Shigemitsu, afterward arrested and tried for war crimes himself, conveyed the government's intent to GHQ and was informed on the following day that this would not be possible. The cabinet proposal brought to the surface a dilemma that troubled many officials, including the Emperor, who observed, according to Kido's diary, that Those called war criminals by the enemy's standards, especially those in responsible positions, were all performing loyal duties, and to punish them in the name of the emperor would be unbearable. At the emperor's request, the cabinet reconsidered its decision, and reaffirmed it, finally gaining Hirohito's reluctant approval before submitting the proposal to GHQ. Kido himself found utterly implausible the notion of waging war in the emperor's name and then following with trials in the emperor's name. He also worried that this might bring out the communists and result in people's trials, where blood washes blood among ourselves. Even after GHQ turned down its proposal, the cabinet did not let go of the idea. Prime Minister Higashikuni told foreign correspondents on September 18th that the government intended to investigate and punish those who had committed atrocities against POWs and other war crimes, a statement that received major coverage in the Japanese press. Judgment of war criminals begin by our own hand, exclaimed one headline. Between September 1945 and March 1946, the government actually brought eight low ranking individuals to trial for conventional war crimes in four separate trials, before SCAP intervened with a formal edict abolishing such proceedings. The presumption apparently was that once tried and sentenced, such individuals could not be subjected to double jeopardy and retried by the Allies. This hope was ill founded. The eight individuals were all retried in lower level Allied tribunals and given more severe sentences. The relative leniency of sentences imposed in these few Japanese trials may have been a fair sample of what might have been expected if the government had been empowered to pursue war crimes at higher levels. A revealing example of official thinking on such matters can be found in the draft of an urgent imperial decree composed sometime during these early months. This secret order never saw the light of day, but it is as vivid an example as we are likely to find of the lengths to which the ruling groups were willing to go, on their own, on the issue of responsibility, so long as such an inquiry could be coupled with reaffirmation of the Emperor's virtue and innocence. Its full Baroque title was Urgent Imperial Decree to Stabilize the People's Mind and Establish the Independent Popular Morality Necessary to Maintain National Order, and its royalist logic was elemental. The disastrous war constituted a betrayal of the Emperor's trust, a tragic perversion of his abiding commitment to peace. Just as the victor nations assumed that historically and culturally they embodied the civilized ideals of respect for peace and humanity, so these authors depicted the same ideals as lying at the heart of their imperial tradition. What the Western trained jurists laboring at Nuremberg and later Tokyo defined as crimes against peace and crimes against humanity became, in this proposed formulation, The Crime of Treason. The core of the draft decree's indictment was laid out in cumbersome fashion in the first three of its twelve provisions. 1. The aim of this decree is to stabilize the people's mind and establish the independent popular morality which is necessary to the maintenance of national order, and to this end to punish, remove, or dissolve those persons, institutions, or social organizations who or which, by going against the national polity, abusing their assistance to the emperor, And failing to follow his great spirit of peace, did with aggressive militarism lead or assist in leading government policies and popular trends, thus violating the instructions of the Meiji Emperor and inviting military clique politics, with political parties knowingly aiding and abetting this, thereby instigating the Manchurian Incident, China Incident, and Great East Asia War, which destroyed the lives and assets of our people and various other peoples and endangered the national polity. 
2. The following persons shall be sentenced to death or lifetime restraint for the crime of treason. A. Persons who without the Emperor's order moved troops, needlessly initiated military activities, and commanded aggressive activities, making the Manchurian Incident, China Incident, and Great East Asia War unavoidable. B. Persons who violated the Imperial Rescript to soldiers and sailors of Meiji 15, 1882, and invited the situation of military clique politics, going against the Emperor's great spirit of peace by discarding the true essence of the national polity and engaging in despotic behavior or the like, thereby making the Great East Asia War inevitable. 3. The following persons shall receive sentences ranging from under ten years' restraint to life for collaboration in the crime of treason. a. Persons directly involved in plans under Provision 2A above. b. Persons who agreed to the military clique politics of Provision 2B above, conspiring to strengthen or knowingly supporting this. c. Persons who knowingly supported and cooperated with pro-war plots and propaganda by military politicians and others, or created pro-war public opinion contrary to the Emperor's great spirit of peace, thus making the initiation of war inevitable. The draft went on to indicate that in certain cases such punishments might be commuted to what amounted to a purge from public office and loss of the rights ordinarily accruing to subjects. Investigations, indictments, and trials would be handled under the Attorney General's office, which would take up cases against individuals on receipt of petitions containing 100 signatures. At first glance, it would seem difficult to imagine a greater contrast than between this draft, still redolent with the rhetoric of wartime emperor worship, and the ideals set forth in the Tokyo Charter. For all its Japanese coloration, however, the urgent imperial decree does suggest that trials conducted by the Japanese would not have been altogether different from what actually took place under the Tokyo Tribunal. Like the actual Class A war crimes trials, such trials would have been showcased. A small number of once influential individuals would have been indicted, mostly military officers associated with Tojo, but also a few civilian officials such as former Foreign Minister Matsuoka Yosuke, who was indicted by the victors but died while the Tokyo trials were in progress. A documentary record would have been established to make the case that Japanese militarism and aggression, beginning with the Manchurian incident of 1931, reflected military clique politics rather than imperial policy. Vague counterpart concepts to what the Allies called crimes against peace and crimes against humanity would have been employed. Essentially, this draft decree amounted to a rough formulation of loser's justice that would have brought to the dock as scapegoats many of the same individuals who were tried and convicted at the Tokyo Tribunal. This is not mere conjecture, for in preparing its indictment, the prosecution in the Tokyo trial relied greatly on finger-pointers close to the throne who endorsed the sentiments and tactics of the draft decree even if they had not necessarily been directly involved in preparing it. The main purpose of the trials envisioned by the Japanese was identical to a fundamental sub-purpose of the Tokyo trial, to establish the emperor as peace-loving, innocent, and beyond politics. Loser's justice, like victor's justice, ultimately would have entailed arguing that Japan had been led into aggressive militarism by a small cabal of irresponsible militaristic leaders. Indeed, it would have involved a homegrown conspiracy theory. However intriguing to imagine, leaving high-level war crimes trials to the Japanese themselves was inconceivable to the victors. Subsequently, the Americans rejected a more modest proposal that Japanese be included on the prosecution staff of the Tokyo Tribunal. It is easy to imagine the outcry this would have provoked outside Japan about letting the fox into the chicken coop. Nonetheless, this was probably a genuinely promising lost opportunity. Capable and responsible lawyers were available who might have effectively staffed a contingent of assistant prosecutors, and a substantial portion of the populace, bitter about the war and hopeful for a clean start, would have supported such a role. A prosecution contingent of this sort might even have provided the nucleus for ongoing war crimes investigations such as took place in Germany. Lacking any formal role in prosecuting war criminals, the elites undertook informally to influence whom the victors decided to arrest and indict. Contrary, once again, to the wartime propaganda of 100 million hearts beating as one, the Japanese war machine had been racked by internal conflicts. Factionalism was rife not merely between the military and civilian bureaucracies, 
but also within those bureaucracies. And not merely between the Imperial Army and Navy, for example, but also within each service. By early 1945, even before the steady air raids against cities began, fingering the culprits responsible for Japan's impending defeat already had begun in earnest at the highest levels. The conquerors may have imagined themselves setting foot in a land of tight lipped samurai bonded by blood, but what they found was closer to Byzantium, buzzing with whispers, riven with feuds. This milieu of factional intrigue bubbled with conspiracy theories, none more immediately serviceable than the notion of military clique politics, which had received unusually forceful explication in February 1945 in a confidential presentation to the Emperor by former Prime Minister Konoe Fumimaro. Subsequently known as the Konoe Memorial, this apocalyptic presentation essentially placed all blame on Konoe's successor as Prime Minister, General Tojo, and his entourage. As Konoe and his entourage saw it, the country had been brought to the verge of revolution by a diabolical clique of militarists and clandestine communists. Both the militarists and leftists, his argument went, were contemptuous of capitalism and intent on bringing about a social and political revolution within Japan and throughout Asia. Konoe's conspiracy thesis amounted to a participant's rendering of the intense factional struggles that had consumed political and military circles throughout the 1930s and early 1940s. To a considerable degree, his argument followed the line taken by the Kodoha, or Imperial Way faction, which lost power within the military after its complicity in an unsuccessful coup d'etat in 1936. Among other things, Kodoha supporters had been chary of taking on the United States and European powers by attacking their colonial enclaves in Southeast Asia, and were more inclined to prime the country for an advance north against the Soviet Union. The Kodoha's nemesis, and Konoe's too, was the Toseha, or control faction headed by General Tojo. Nothing fails like failure, and in the rubble of defeat, the once powerful Tojo was the most vulnerable man in Japan, almost everyone's favorite target. In the months after surrender, Konoe devoted much time and energy to conveying his perception of military clique politics to the victors. At one point, he essentially gave a repeat performance of his audience with the Emperor for General MacArthur. Following his suicide in December, the Prince's colleagues and Confederates carried on the campaign to focus Allied inquiries primarily on individuals who had been more or less aligned with the control faction. Konoe's private secretary, Ushiba Tomohiko, later ambassador to the United States, immediately turned some 75 notebooks and other papers belonging to the Prince over to the International Prosecution Section, IPS, and urged the victors to go after Tojo and his supporters as well as Matsuoka Yosuke. Who, as foreign minister under Konoe, had been a prime mover behind Japan's alliance with Germany and Italy. Ushiba also recommended that the IPS make use of Iwabuchi Tatsuo as an informant. A prominent journalist who had been involved in the secret drafting of the Konoe Memorial, Iwabuchi worked indefatigably to promote the Kodoha line, both in journalistic essays and briefings with the victors. He also identified the Emperor's intimate advisor Kido Koichi as bearing heavy responsibility for going along with the militarists and tendering bad advice to the sovereign. Yoshida Shigeru, another collaborator in the preparation of the memorial, also happily included Kido among the prime culprits he volunteered to the victors. Other Japanese associated with the Konoe Memorial also collaborated closely with both the IPS and GHQ's counterintelligence staff. Ueda Shunkichi, one of the most hysterical communist conspiracy theorists in the group, eventually submitted a list of 78 names of those he deemed primarily responsible for Japan's folly and disaster. Retired General Mazaki Jinzaburo, a former inspector general of military education and a leading ideologue in the Imperial Way faction, likewise cooperated enthusiastically. After being arrested as a suspect Class A war criminal, Mazaki essentially charmed his interrogators. He was particularly vehement in castigating Kido. Should they meet by chance, he told the Americans, he would spit in Kido's face. Although the Kido Ha firebrand had played a major role in stepping up ultra nationalistic indoctrination in the army in the mid 1930s, the prosecutors who interviewed him, impressed by his pro American and virulently anti communist views, eliminated him from the original list of suspects designated to be tried immediately. 
Numerous others joined the chorus serenading IPS and GHQ investigators. Their refrain was predictable. Exclude the emperor, focus on Tojo and those close to him, and include a few obvious civilian officials such as the volatile, abrasive Matsuoka and the wily Kido. Some of these informants were insiders at the palace itself. In February 1946, Terasaki Hidenari, the emperor's indefatigable liaison with both IPS and GHQ, provided the prosecution staff with a list of 45 names of individuals who, he claimed, bore prime responsibility for the disastrous war, buttressed with specific information concerning many of them. Forty-two were still living. He did not hesitate to intimate that some of his information came directly from the emperor. On one occasion, he informed his American contacts in the IPS that Hirohito had personally expressed disapproval of Matsuoka's proposal to attack the Soviet Union only a few months after the Japan-USSR Neutrality Pact had been signed. The IPS files also contain a notation, apparently based on Terasaki's confidential conversations, to the effect that the emperor had inquired about why a certain former general, Arisue Seizo, had not been arrested. The two Japanese who had the greatest influence on the prosecution were an ex-general and the emperor's former privy seal. The IPS tuned in to former general Tanaka Ryukichi in January 1946 and found him to be a knowledgeable, exceedingly voluble source of inside information about high-level army activity, including transgressions in China and the military's deep involvement in opium trafficking. Years after the trial, in which he appeared as a key witness for the prosecution, Tanaka explained that his rationale for incriminating so many former colleagues was to make the emperor innocent by not having him appear in the trial and thus maintain the national polity. More famous than Tanaka and even more influential in naming names was Kido, the grandson of one of the Meiji founding fathers. As Privy Seal from 1940 to 1945, he had not only been the coordinator of the imperial schedule and the emperor's confidant, but also a conduit of information, a processor of gossip, and a cunning intriguer. His enemies were numerous. Kido's impending arrest as a Class A suspect was announced on December 6th, and he initially intended to shield his sovereign by taking on himself full responsibility for all imperial decisions sanctioning war. On December 10th, however, following a moving farewell audience with the emperor, he was persuaded otherwise. His change in tactics was prompted by a conversation with the well-bred young nominal Marxist Suru Shigeto, later a prominent economist and educator, to whom Kido was related by marriage. Tsuru, who had pursued higher education in the United States and earned a Ph.D. in economics at Harvard in 1940, explained that, given the American way of thinking, Kido's proposed tactic was grievously flawed. If he pleaded guilty, the Americans would take this as an indication that the emperor was guilty as well. To enhance the emperor's aura of innocence, it behooved him to plead innocent himself. Hearing this, Kido recorded in his diary, I felt as if my mind has been settled. Tsuru apparently offered this advice with encouragement from his close acquaintance Paul Baran, a progressive American economist who was then in Japan with the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey. Thus it came about that on December 21st in his first interrogation session with the IPS, with Tsuru interpreting, Kido made known the existence of the detailed diary he had kept since 1930, and agreed to turn it over to the prosecution. He did so between December 24th and January 23rd in three installments, the last being the diary entries for 1941, the period in which American investigators, fixated on Pearl Harbor, were most interested. The Kido diary quickly became known as the prosecution's Bible. It is possible that Kido vetted the diary slightly so as not to inconvenience his sovereign. Certainly the former Privy Seal was confident that his often cryptic daily entries, supplemented by what he told the prosecution by way of explanation, could be used to make the case that the Emperor consistently hoped for peace, and that the responsibility for resorting to war lay entirely with the government and the military. His calculated gamble paid off handsomely. Although the prosecution combed the diary meticulously in preparing its cases against the various defendants, those portions submitted as evidence were carefully screened to avoid any significant references to Hirohito's words or actions. No part of the prosecution's unusually lengthy interrogation of Kido, 30 sessions producing approximately 800 pages of typed transcript, was ever introduced as direct evidence. For even Kido, notwithstanding his vigilance, 
occasionally made statements that could be interpreted as indicating that the emperor was a leader who bore some responsibility for Japan's course of action. In March 1946, as the final list of Class A suspects who would actually be brought to trial was being determined, the IPS decided to include, wherever possible, excerpts from both Tanaka Ryuichi's interrogation and Kido's diary in the file of every prospective defendant. Of the 27 defendants who joined Kido in the tribunal's original indictment, he himself had singled out 15 as bearing prime responsibility for Japan's war. Chapter 16 What Do You Tell the Dead When You Lose? The first formal reactions of the Japanese on learning of defeat were couched in a rhetoric that could have been uttered in ancient Greece or China. Editorialists wrote of the autumn of the hundred million weeping together, poets about a silent wailing throughout the land. Hearts were burned by painful fury, eaten away by tears. A general attached to Yasakuni Shrine, the final resting place of the souls of the war dead, spoke of swords broken and arrows exhausted, a traditional trope for defeat, and indeed emasculation, and described the tears of the deceased falling all about him, their faces pressing on his back. A week before the first occupation forces arrived, the novelist Osaragi Jiro addressed the dead more intimately in an Apology to Departed Heroes in the Daily Asahi, recounting his sleepless night in the wake of the Emperor's broadcast. The faces of acquaintances killed in the war had passed before him, a friend in publishing, an occasional drinking companion, the taciturn chef at a favorite restaurant, a man he saw only at college baseball games, a doctor skilled in writing waka poems. He spoke of them as stars fading away with the whitening sky of dawn, imagined them alongside an endless procession of shadows on the horizon, and asked them a question that would not leave the minds of many Japanese in the years to come. What can we do to ease your souls? The answer seemed clear enough to Osaragi at that moment. All one could do was rely on the Emperor's decision and look forward to the dawn of a day when, shaking off old filth, a new Japan would be built. Only then, when humiliation had been overcome, would it be possible to dedicate a requiem to the spirit of the dead. Only then, perhaps, would it be possible for the dead to smile and rest in peace. A Requiem for Departed Heroes what do you tell the dead when you lose? It was this question, rather than the moral or legal perspectives of the victors, that preoccupied most Japanese as they tried to absorb the issues of war responsibility, guilt, repentance, and atonement. This was only natural, not because of cultural differences, but because the world is different when you lose. Where the victors asked who was responsible for Japanese aggression and the atrocities committed by the imperial forces, the more pressing question on the Japanese side was, who was responsible for defeat? And where the victors focused on Japan's guilt vis-a-vis -vis other countries and peoples, the Japanese were overwhelmed by grief and guilt toward their own dead countrymen. The victors could comfort the souls of their dead and console themselves by reporting that the outcome of the war had been great and good. Just as every fighting man on the winning side became a hero, so no supreme sacrifice in the victorious struggle had been in vain. Triumph gave a measure of closure to grief. Defeat left the meaning of these war deaths, of kin, acquaintances, one's compatriots in general, raw and open. The Japanese, certainly most Japanese men, did not arrive at war's end without some knowledge of the depredations and atrocities of the imperial forces. Millions had served abroad and witnessed or heard about such war crimes, even if they did not necessarily behave atrociously themselves. For those unaware of such brutal behavior, or at least of its scale and enormity, the victors' propaganda machinery soon provided grim, concrete evidence. If this was difficult to listen to, it proved even harder to absorb. As Osaragi observed in his tormented essay, for each ghostly figure in the endless procession of the Japanese dead, there is a father, a sister, a brother. One might come to curse repatriated servicemen or treat them with contempt, but the Japanese dead still cried out for some kind of requiem. The millions of deaths inflicted by the emperor's soldiers and sailors, on the other hand, remain difficult to imagine as humans rather than just abstract numbers. The non-Japanese dead remained faceless, 
there were no familiar figures among them. In the eyes of the victors, Japan had no departed heroes. The Tokyo Tribunal made explicitly clear that this very notion was obscene for a nation whose every military action since 1928 had been an act of aggression and, ipso facto, murder, and whose cruelty toward both prisoners and civilians had been so widespread as to seem almost an expression of national character. One could hold memorial services for the military and civilian war dead after the defeat, but not praise them for their sacrifices. As the censorship of Yoshida Mitsuru's invocation of the last moments of the battleship Yamato indicated, there could be no ringing elegies to the bravery and glory of those who died fighting for their country. Yet it was impossible for Yoshida, or Osaragi, or the angry young ex-sailor Watanabe Kiyoshi, even as he cast off the last vestiges of emperor worship, to regard their dead compatriots as other than fundamentally good men. Millions of ordinary people who similarly comprehended their country's lost war in terms of family, friends, neighbors, and passing acquaintances shared this heartache. As individuals such as Osaragi and Watanabe became more knowledgeable, they did not hesitate to criticize the war or Japanese society more generally. The transparent venality, corruption, and incompetence of the post-surrender elites were sufficient in themselves to undermine respect for authority and, with this, belief in the old holy war myths. Much of the victor's propaganda and re-education, moreover, including testimony at the Tokyo Tribunal, rested on previously suppressed information about systematic Japanese depredations abroad that could not be dismissed. Although many individuals came to acknowledge that the war had been wrong and involved criminal acts, however, this did not dampen a desperate need to accommodate their own dead in a positive manner in any collective acts of repentance and atonement. Osaragi's essay pointed to a common response to this dilemma. The sacrifices of the Japanese dead might be made meaningful by sloughing off old filth and creating a new society and culture. As it turned out, these new paths to and from the house of the dead would prove to be winding and twisted. Nanbara Shigeru, a Christian educator who became president of Tokyo Imperial University shortly after the war ended, was typical of many respected figures in the complex way he evoked his country's war dead. Like most educators, Nambara bore a heavy burden of personal guilt for having encouraged his students to support the wartime mission of Our Glorious Nation, and his transmutation into a leading war critic and apostle for peace involved more than a small leap of logic and faith. It amounted, as was often the case, to a conversion experience. The passion and sincerity of his newfound vision found compelling expression as early as September 1, 1945, in an essay in his university's newspaper. Since the recent conflict had exposed the cruelty and inhumanity of war in unprecedented ways, he began, the great task confronting education was to realize the fundamental ideals of humanity, Ningense no Riso, for which he also gave the German term Humanitatsidel, which essentially corresponded to the universal principles of world religions. This involved a new battle in which the souls of students who had been killed would be present. In due time our colleagues will return from the continent and from the southern islands, and the day is not far off when they will again fill the lecture halls and devote themselves to learning, burning with ideals and passion for the reconstruction of the ancestral land. I feel boundless sadness, however, thinking of the many great talents who will never return. All of them fought and died courageously as warriors. But even while being warriors, to the very last day they maintained their pride as students. They must have believed firmly without any doubts that in the end what upholds the country is truth and justice. Today already their souls have returned and are with us, I believe, and will bless and guide you from now on in your new battle. To the departed souls themselves, Nambara solemnly reported that the university had managed to preserve important scholarly materials through the war. They would, he was confident, be relieved to hear this. In November, Nambara had occasion to address a gathering of returned students. He told them frankly that the real victors in the war were reason and truth, and that the United States and Britain, not Japan, had been the bearers of these great ideals. This was a victory to be celebrated, and both defeat and the supreme sacrifice of those who had died should be seen from this perspective. Out of tragedy a new national life would be born, although not without struggle. Quoting Kierkegaard, he referred to a new war of peace, in which the antagonist would be oneself, 
and the great challenge was to develop in democratic directions and contribute to universal freedom. He concluded dramatically by welcoming back not only those present before him, but also their comrades in battle who had perished. From this time forward, those who had survived the war would be engaged in a new war of truth, together with these departed comrades whose images remained in their hearts. In March 1946, it fell to Nambara to conduct a memorial service for students and staff killed in the war. The text of the service was published by the popular monthly Bunge Shunju under the title A Report to Students Who Fell in Battle. The memorial ceremony, he pointed out, was meant to evoke the memory of dead countrymen and the problems of guilt, repentance, and atonement in an essentially secular, spiritual way. He did speak like the emperor of enduring. And like the Christian he was of bearing a cross. He told the dead bluntly that Japan had been led into war by ignorant, reckless militarists and ultranationalists. That people, including those from the university, had followed along believing that they were fighting for truth and justice. That unfortunately truth and justice had been on the side of the United States and Britain. On all this, the judgment of history and reason was clear. This was not the same as saying, he pointed out, that the victors were necessarily just. The dead, he continued, had been spared from witnessing the day of defeat and the hardship and spiritual pain that had followed. They should know, however, that the grievances the Japanese now felt were not against the wartime enemy, but against themselves. Political, social, and spiritual reforms unprecedented in Japanese history were now taking place, and the construction of a true and just country was a real possibility. Lamenting the many brilliant students who had died, he spoke of them as being. A sacrifice of atonement for the crimes of the people. There were many things Nambara did not address in these early presentations. He did not speak of the victims of Japanese aggression, did not mention other Asians at all, nor did he dwell on his own university's active complicity in promoting the militarism and ultranationalism he now condemned. There was, moreover, a danger of elitism as well as romanticization in such eulogies to brilliant students. As if the war's victims could and should be calibrated on some kind of sliding scale of social worth. Such limitations notwithstanding, Nambara helped show one way in which an unjust war could be condemned while the war dead might still be honored and reassured, or at least those who survived them reassured, that they had not died in vain. This was a great moral and psychological dilemma that the victors did not have to confront, and for which they had little patience or tolerance. In one form or another, Nambara's formula became a secular litany for great numbers of Japanese. Repentance and atonement were possible only for those who devoted themselves to constructing a new Japan devoted to peace and justice. And to pursue such ideals was to honor the dead, for they were what the dead believed they had been fighting for. Irrationality, Science, and Responsibility for Defeat. Nanbara's conversion rested on the belief that he, like the truth seeking students he conjured up and mourned, had been misled by Japan's leaders. In this he was perfectly in tune with popular sentiment, for the most ubiquitous passive verb after the surrender was surely damasareta, to have been deceived. Even the most flagrant wartime propagandists seized upon such slippery language as a detergent to wash away their personal responsibility. Kondo Hidezo, the talented political cartoonist who rode the military horse right up to the gates of doom with gay abandon, and then just as gaily satirized Tojo behind bars, was unexceptional in this regard. Life had been good before the war started, Kondo wrote early in 1946, and whenever he thought of this, he felt, hate for those Class A war criminals. All of us people were deceived and used by them, and cooperated in the war without knowing the true facts. Looking back now, this was because of ignorance and being deceived. The well known writer Kikuchi Khan, who played a leading role in mobilizing the literary world behind the war, similarly tried to cleanse himself of the taint of collaboration by arguing, in an essay aptly titled Waste Basket Talk, that the miserable defeat was brought about by foolhardy leaders who suppressed free expression. From this perspective, the people as a whole, and not just their departed heroes, were war victims. An elaboration of this thesis was already a media sensation before the Tokyo Tribunal convened, in the form of a secret history rushed into print by a team of journalists under the title The Twenty Year Whirlwind, exposing the inside story of the Showa period. 
The first volume of this bestseller, covering the years from 1926 to 1936, appeared on December 15, 1945. Some 100,000 copies were sold in the first week, sparking stories about small mountains of the volume being piled up in bookstores as queues of eager buyers waited outside for the store doors to open. The second volume, which took the war to its conclusion, was published on March 1, 1946, and quickly sold 700,000 to 800,000 copies. A slightly revised, consolidated edition was issued later that year. In one form or another, the 20 year whirlwind remained on the top 10 bestseller list through 1947, providing a nice send off for the Class A War Crimes Tribunal with its own home bred conspiracy thesis. The book was the brainchild of Masunaga Zenkichi, the head of an obscure publishing house in Tokyo, who heard the Emperor's August 15th broadcast while on a trip to the countryside. And was struck by the commercial potential in this tragic turn of events as he rode the train back to the capital that same day. The phenomenally best selling Japanese English conversation manual had been conceived in almost identical circumstances. Masunaga quickly recruited a small group of reporters from the Mainichi newspaper, most of them in the paper's East Asia Bureau, who churned out their inside story, primarily on the basis of the newspaper's files plus their own as well as their colleagues' personal knowledge. Their approach was lively and unimpeded by deep reflection. They were not particularly interested in exposing the nature of Japan's aggression or its victimization of others, the rape of Nanking was not even mentioned, or in exploring broader issues of war responsibility. The fact that the journalists were able to produce an instant expose based primarily on existing files and their personal and previously undisclosed knowledge. Did not prompt them to engage in serious self reflection on the complicity of the media in the war they were now righteously condemning. The Mainichi team was intent only on pointing fingers at those leaders who were primarily responsible for the great crime of bringing about miserable defeat. They rounded up the usual suspects the military clique, mostly associated with the army rather than the navy, and operating in concert with certain right wing thugs and academic ideologues. Plus a few industrialists and politicians. Following the fashion in these months, they singled out Tojo as arch villain. The former army minister and prime minister was virtually irresistible as a scapegoat, for he had not exactly enhanced his reputation by his behavior in the wake of defeat. Ordered arrested on September 11th, he had shot himself in the chest four times, was propped up in a chair by American newsmen who placed the pistol back in his hand, said, Hold it, Tojo, and took his photo. Delivered his final words to a reporter while awaiting an ambulance, and then was saved by American medical personnel thanks to a blood transfusion from some anonymous GI. In the military hospital to which he was rushed, Tojo was so impressed by the solicitude and efficiency of the personnel who treated him that he delivered a small speech in praise of the strength of American democracy to foreign ministry officials who visited him. Shortly after these misadventures, he presented General Robert Eichelberger, commander of the Eighth Army, With a valuable sword, and then, having mended nicely, went on to plead his innocence at the Tokyo Tribunal. It had been widely assumed that Tojo should and would take his own life without delay. After all, it had been under his prime ministerial aegis that in 1941 the army issued its famous field code in which fighting men were admonished to not live to incur the shame of becoming a prisoner. Tojo received letters urging him to commit suicide quickly. And someone reportedly sent him a coffin. When he belatedly summoned the will to die, chose the foreigner's way of the bullet rather than the samurai's way of the sword, and then botched even this, it was more than aggrieved patriots could bear. The writer Takami Jun captured this disgust succinctly in his diary. Cowardly living on and then using a pistol like a foreigner, failing to die. Japanese cannot help but smile bitterly. Why did General Tojo not die right away as Army Minister Anami did? Why did General Tojo not use a Japanese sword as Army Minister Anami did? On the other hand, the French literature scholar Watanabe Kazuo, who had greeted the end of the war with immense relief, found this vaudeville amusing and took pleasure in recording in his diary how the hapless general had now become mixed blood. Whatever one might make of it, Tojo's spectacular transformation from prime minister to prime culprit and scapegoat helped ensure a receptive audience for the 20 year whirlwind. The journalists' conspiracy theory rested less on a portrait of diabolically evil schemers, however, 
than on what amounted to a diagnosis of collective dementia among the nation's leaders. Here in Potboiler Prose was a seductive variation of Nambara's argument that ordinary people had been deceived by ignorant militarists devoid of reason and truth. As the twenty-year whirlwind would have it, an irrational and unreasonable mentality that bordered on illness had permeated every level of the Imperial forces by the mid-1930s, so divorcing them from reality that their planning capability became a joke. Such a rationality revealed itself conspicuously in the extremely unscientific way the Great East Asia War was conducted. The entire military command, it could now be said, probably should have been committed to a mental hospital. Tojo, it turned out, had been the captain of a huge ship of fools. The thesis of collective irrationality carried with it a technological corollary of compelling attraction, namely that the ultimate proof of the leader's incompetence lay in their failure to comprehend Japan's backwardness in science and applied technology. By the time the twenty-year whirlwind arrived in the bookstores, this connection between science and the responsibility for defeat had become an idée fixe, commonly linked in the broadest symbolic manner to the dropping of the atomic bombs. Between August 8th, when the destruction of Hiroshima by a new weapon was first reported, and mid-September, when occupation authorities prohibited almost all mention of nuclear devastation, few days passed when the single-sheet daily newspapers did not include at least passing reference to the mounting horror in both cities. The first detailed survey, summarized for the public before the occupation forces arrived, pronounced Hiroshima and Nagasaki a living hell. The macabre effects of radiation sickness, apparent survivors suddenly perishing, while the estimated death toll doubled in a mere two weeks, were described as an evil spirit possessing Hiroshima. There was a widespread sense of having experienced a forbidding, surreal new dimension of existence which no other people could hope to comprehend. Such consciousness of nuclear destruction became an integral, even if not always evident, part of all subsequent attempts to come to terms with the war's meaning. It reinforced a pervasive sense of powerlessness and lent an eerie kind of specialness to what might otherwise have felt like a pointless defeat. In the final hours of the war, Kiyose Ichiro, who would emerge as a major defense attorney in the Tokyo War Crimes trial, speculated publicly that racist contempt for Japanese monkeys explained why the Americans used the atomic bombs against Japan but not Germany. Despite widespread denunciation of the cruel and inhuman American bombings, however, no abiding strain of virulent anti-American hatred carried over into the post-war period. Even before censorship was imposed, the tone of most commentary about the nuclear devastation had turned philosophical. The weapon itself, rather than those who deployed it, largely absorbed the characteristics of being cruel and inhuman. And from this, what came to be indicted was the cruelty of war in general. Defeat, victimization, an overwhelming sense of powerlessness in the face of undreamed-of weapons of destruction soon coalesced to become the basis of a new kind of anti-military nationalism. The idea that Japan could partially atone for past failures, or crimes, or evils, or sins, by drawing on its atomic bomb experience to become a champion of a non-militarized, non-nuclearized world, would eventually become a cardinal tenet of the peace movement. But such an idea, explicitly expressed in the language of zange, or repentance, emerged even before the occupation began. On August 27th, the head of the central government's information bureau issued instructions to the public on how to respond to foreign occupation. War was a relative matter, he observed, and it was invariably the losers rather than the victors who engaged in serious self-reflection. This was necessary and desirable. The repentance of the hundred million people should be done thoroughly, and perhaps by taking a leading role in prohibiting the future use of nuclear weapons, the Japanese could turn themselves from the losers of war into the winners of peace. The terrible power of nuclear weaponry proved as mesmerizing as it was terrifying, however, for nothing better exemplified America's superior scientific, technological, and organizational capabilities. And so, in its peculiar way, the bomb became simultaneously a warning about future wars and a beacon illuminating a path to future Japanese empowerment. On August 16th, on being named Prime Minister, Prince Higashikuni explained that the biggest shortcoming of the war had been science and technology. The next day, the outgoing Minister of Education thanked schoolchildren for their wartime efforts and told them that henceforth their task was to elevate the nation's 
science power and spiritual power, to the highest level. Two days later, headlines trumpeted that under the new Minister of Education, Maeda Tamon, there would be emphasis on basic science in the post-war school system. We lost to the enemy's science, an article in the Asahi declared bluntly on August 20th. This was made clear by a single atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The article, headlined, Toward a Country Built on Science, took care to emphasize that science had to be understood in its broadest sense as involving reason and rationalization in all spheres of organization and at all levels of society. The very idea that Nanbara Shigeru and countless others would seize on and develop. A few days later, the Asahi re-emphasized how irrationality and non-scientific attitudes had spread throughout the political, economic, and social spheres, and had guaranteed defeat. Science soon became almost everyone's favorite concept for explaining both why the war was lost and where the future lay. Baron Wakatsuki Reijiro, a former prime minister, urged his countrymen to have courage and then proceeded to offer a depressing catalog of why they would need it. Because the former enemy possessed superior wealth, machinery, and industrial skills, besides being more advanced in applied science, as witness the horrifying bombs. Two days after the surrender in Tokyo Bay, the Ministry of Education announced that it was establishing a new Bureau of Scientific Education. In a speech to young people, Education Minister Maeda explained that the cultivation of scientific thinking ability was key to the construction of a Japan of culture. Revised textbooks, it was announced, would emphasize science. The government soon made known that 500 million yen was being diverted from former military funds to promote science in everyday life. General Yamashita Tomoyuki, about to go on trial in the Philippines, reiterated the familiar refrain with no frills. In an article translated from an American publication, the general was asked what he regarded to be the fundamental cause of Japan's defeat and responded with the only English word he used in the entire interview. Science, he said. Beyond doubt, this pragmatic fixation on responsibility for defeat was inherently conservative and self-serving. It was, however, like the loose thread that can unravel a tapestry, in this case the fabric of the imperial state. The primary victimizers of the people were no longer the demonic allied powers, but irresponsible leaders operating out of inherently backward, irrational, and repressive institutional structures. Thus, both the consciousness of having been victimized and the question of responsibility for defeat led inexorably to a commitment by many people to a more pluralistic, egalitarian, democratic, accountable, rational society. Essentially, what the occupation reformers were hoping to put in place. It was in this light that President Truman also found a receptive audience in Japan when he declared that the invention of the atomic bomb reflected what could be accomplished by a free society. Science could flourish only under a spirit of freedom. Japanese scientists, many of them trained in Europe and the United States, applauded this new commitment. One of the first contingents of American scientists to arrive in Japan encountered a wonderful expression of these sentiments in the form of this makeshift notice, handwritten in English on brown wrapping paper and affixed to the front door of a major oceanographic institute outside of Tokyo. This is a marine biological station with her history of over 60 years. If you are from the eastern coast, some of you might know Woods Hole or Mount Desert or Tortugas. If you are from the west coast, you may know Pacific Grove or Puget Sound Biological Station. This place is a place like one of these. Take care of this place and protect the possibility for the continuation of our peaceful research. You can destroy the weapons and the war instruments but save the civil equipments for Japanese students when you are through with your job here. Notify the university and let us come back to our scientific home. The notice was signed, the last one to go. Buddhism as Repentance and Repentance as Nationalism The concept of repentance was placed at the center of public debate on August 28th the day the first advance contingent of Americans arrived at the Atsugi Air Base. Asked by Japanese journalists about the cause of defeat, Prime Minister Higashikuni carefully explained that many factors had contributed, including restrictive laws, errors by military and governmental authorities, and a decline in popular morals as evidenced, for example, in black market activities. Then, borrowing a phrase from the statement by the head of the Information Bureau the previous day, 
He declared that the military, civilian officials, and the people as a whole must thoroughly self-reflect and repent. I believe that the collective repentance of the hundred million, Ichioku Sozange, is the first step in the resurrection of our country, the first step in bringing unity to our country. Since military and civilian officials had spent the previous two weeks destroying incriminating documents, there was a certain perverse truth to the notion that responsibility was, at that very moment, being leveled and collectivized. No one wanted it, no one claimed it. A few years later, the political scientist Maruyama Masao cleverly compared the government's collective repentance campaign to the cloud of black ink a squid squirts out in its desperate attempt to escape a threatening situation. Although some individuals and groups did take the issue of personal responsibility seriously and engage in harsh self-criticism, the official version of collective repentance, the squid's ink as it were, essentially faded away. Few individuals really believed that ordinary people bore responsibility for the war equal to that of the military and civilian groups. This war was begun while we farmers knew nothing about it, one irate rural man exclaimed, and ended in defeat while we believed we were winning. There is no need to do repentance for something we weren't in on. Repentance is necessary for those who betrayed and deceived the people. Another member of the hundred million was even terser. If collective repentance of the hundred million means those in charge of the war are now trying to distribute responsibility among the people, he wrote to a newspaper, then it's sneaky. While the government was promoting its version of collective repentance, Tanabe Hajime, one of the country's most influential philosophers, was completing a book-length manuscript on the same subject. Tanabe's treatise amounted to an intensely personal confession of doubt, spiritual crisis, and conversion by an intellectual whose austerity and aloofness were legendary, and whose aura of certitude had long seemed unbreachable. Despite a convoluted style that reflected his training in German philosophy, his text was an often ecstatic expression of faith in the redemptive wisdom of a 13th-century Japanese thinker, the Buddhist evangelist Shinran, whose prophetic language, resonating with suffering and emptiness, despair and negation, conversion and rebirth, seemed uncannily in tune with the ambiance of the defeated country. One could hardly imagine a sharper contrast than that between Tanabe's densely reasoned disquisition on zange, or repentance, and the government's bromides on the same issue, with the exception of the fact that Tanabe's repentance, too, was intensely nationalistic. His passionate reworking of Shinran's vision emphasized not just self-criticism or criticism of Japan, but criticism of all contemporary nations and cultures. Tanabe accepted defeat, acknowledged wrongdoing and despair, demanded repentance, envisioned rebirth, and did all this in a way that emphasized the unique, even superior, traditional wisdom of Japan. He claimed to be illuminating a singular Japanese path to redemption, a transcendent wisdom greater than anything Western thought had produced. For many thoughtful and tormented patriots, here was a sophisticated philosophy of contrition that snatched a kind of moral victory from the jaws of defeat. In the ruins of the most destructive war the world had ever known, for which Japan admittedly bore great responsibility, the path to redemption, and to global salvation as well, lay in the words of a Japanese prophet. Tanabe did not develop these thoughts in reaction to surrender. His way of repentance grew out of his experiences in the final months of 1944, when he was preparing his valedictory lectures on retiring from the prestigious chair in philosophy at Kyoto Imperial University. Long an ardent nationalist whose non-political philosophical theories neatly buttressed the militarists' racial and state-centered ideology, the rigidly disciplined Tanabe unexpectedly found himself falling to pieces. The country faced ruin and dishonor, and the death of a number of his students caused him to acknowledge his personal responsibility, and indeed his sinfulness. Weak-willed as I was, he confessed years later, I found myself unable to resist wartime thought control and could not but yield to some degree to the prevalent mood, which is a shame deeper than I can bear. The already blind militarism had led so many of our graduates precipitously to the battlefields. Among the fallen were more than ten from philosophy, for which I feel the height of personal responsibility and remorse. 
I can only lower my head and earnestly lament my sin. Tanabe withdrew into almost complete seclusion in February 1945, wrote furiously during the cataclysmic months of collapse, and saw his opus published in April 1946, just before the Tokyo Tribunal convened. Its title was Zangedo Toshite no Tetsugaku, Philosophy as the Way of Repentance, or in more philosophical terms, Philosophy as Metanoetics. In his preface, dated October 1945, Tanabe described his state of mind as the war ended in terms familiar to students of both clinical psychology and religious conversion. He spoke of a deepening anxiety, suffering and torment, of sorrow and pain, indecision and despair, an overwhelming sense of disgrace and failure, of reaching an intellectual impasse and being driven to the point of exhaustion, in the opening pages of the treatise itself, he indulged in a paroxysm of self-denigration, characterizing himself as evil and untruthful by nature, insincere, impure, vain, foolish, perverse, wicked, dishonest, and shameless. The most charismatic exemplar of such self-flagellation in the native tradition was Shinran, a master of self-loathing and ecstatic proselytizing, who had founded the True Pure Land sect. Japan's most popular Buddhist denomination. Tanabe's denunciation of his evil self actually read a bit like a crib from the master, for Shinran had aimed much the same abusive lexicon at himself. What Shinran offered beyond self-hatred was a language of transcendence that seemed to address the crisis of 1944 to 1945 with all the force it had possessed in the prophet's own day. The brilliant medieval evangelist offered the momentarily disoriented contemporary philosopher an embracing vision of negation, transcendence through conversion, also, and affirmative return to the world, Genso, that restored his confidence and brought him surprising joy. Tanabe felt himself reborn and regained his old dogmatic self-assurance. But he now saw the world anew. There could be no repentance without pain, he wrote, but the heart of Zange is the experience of conversion or transformation. Sorrow and lament are turned into joy, shame and disgrace into gratitude. Hence, when I say that our nation has no way to walk but the way of Zange, I do not mean that we should sink into despair and stop there, but that we can hope to be transformed through resurrection and regeneration. For readers in occupied Japan, many of the Buddhist allusions in Tanabe's treatise undoubtedly carried double meanings, whether intended or not. He spoke of self-surrender, of power and powerlessness, of other power, Tariki, as opposed to self-power, Jiriki, all fundamental to Shinran's strain of Buddhism, but also echoing with the idea of America as other power. He spoke of transcending the false teachings and evil institutions of the past, vintage Shinranisms that rang as if they had been forged in the furnace of yesterday's defeat. What made Tanabe's way of repentance even more striking was the knowledge that he had previously been known as a major interpreter of Kantian and Hegelian philosophy. He had studied in Germany with Heidegger, among others, and his reputation had rested primarily on his identification with European thought. Tanabe was reputed never to have smiled, never to have made casual conversation, never to have left his house for frivolous purposes, never to have gone sightseeing in his beautiful native city of Kyoto, never to have deigned to travel even to neighboring Osaka. And, despite his nationalism and some prior engagement with Buddhist thought, never to have rebelled against his European philosophical gods. Now, at the moment of gravest crisis and humiliation in his country's history, he used his newfound theory of repentance to declare the inferiority of the Western philosophical tradition. On this critical issue, Tanabe departed dramatically from intellectuals such as Nambara, who equated repentance with embracing the reason and truth that were to be found in Western thought. Just as Shinran had showed him the way through his personal crisis, he wrote, the great teacher could show Japan the way out of its veil of doubt and tears. For Shinran's wisdom transcended Kant's, Hegel's, or Kierkegaard's, transcended indeed anything Western philosophy or religion had to offer. The evangelists' writings offered a positive principle not readily seen in any of the systems of Western philosophy. They made it possible to develop a social doctrine inaccessible by way of Western philosophy alone. 
Indeed, Shinran showed the way to the final culmination of the Kantian critique of reason. While so many others were extolling science and rationality as the keys to national redemption, Tanabe argued that Western reason had become trapped and shredded in antinomy, implacable contradiction. It had reached a dead end. It was a flower that blooms seven times only to wilt eight. That final wilting or negation, however, could be the last death before a Shinran-esque resurrection into a world beyond the impasse of Western logic. Tanabe took pains to underscore that Shinran's teachings did not offer only the ecstatic negation and transcendence, also, of the conversion experience. They also emphasized a returning to this world, Genso, as a transformed individual capable of showing others the path of wisdom and compassion. Just as the born-again medieval convert to Shinran's true pure land teachings continued to participate in the mundane world, albeit now with an awakened heart and mind, so the Japanese penitent of 1946 likewise could turn to pressing social and political tasks with new vigor and insight. It was Tanabe's fervent hope that, in the current face-off between democracy and Marxist socialism, his own experience and logic could offer a middle way from a standpoint that transcends them both. With this intellectual declaration of independence, Tanabe affirmed that there was a Japanese tradition not only capable of redeeming Japan after its wartime folly, but pregnant with the potential for saving the world. Through the very experience of defeat and repentance, Japan might be in a position to show the victors, already divided into capitalist and socialist camps, a proper middle path to a saner planet. Tanabe frequently strangled words, but he did not mince them, and his criticism of the victors was remarkably frank. There can be no doubt that democracy and liberalism are producing the inequality of today's capitalist societies, he declared. Socialism, meanwhile, sets up equality as its goal, but there is no disputing the fact that the socialist system invariably limits freedom and in that sense negates it. Shinran's return to this world provided the basis for formulating a new social ideal in which people should be bound together by a brotherhood that synthesizes the freedom of capitalistic society and the equality of the socialist state. To show the world some concrete principle that will enable us to overcome the dichotomy of conflicting principles represented by the United States and the Soviet Union was nothing less than the historical mission that fate has accorded our country of Japan. This was an audacious use of old religious teachings for new ideological purposes. Tanabe turned Shinran's unity of freedom and equality into a point of departure for defending the creation of social democracy, a theme he developed in other writings as well. In a similar manner, he turned the Buddhist critique of egoism into a standpoint from which to attack the individualistic hedonism of advanced capitalism, and fused Shinran's vision of trans-individual love with another of the transcendent goals of this moment of defeat, absolute peace. He offered his many readers a way of criticizing their country from within, a way of repentance that escaped the hegemony of Western thought and cast critical light on other countries and peoples. He even managed to smuggle into his treatise disdainful comments about the conqueror's faith in imposing fundamental reform from above, observing that a liberalism imposed from the outside is both nonsensical and contradictory. Despite his previously fawning veneration of the throne, moreover, his new stance led him to a position entirely antithetical to the government's Repentance of the Hundred Million campaign, with its promotion of a sense of collective guilt toward the emperor for defeat. In Tanabe's view, the emperor, above all others, had an obligation to demonstrate repentance and assume responsibility for the war vis-à-vis -vis both other countries and his own people, a position far more critical of his sovereign than that of the occupation authorities, and vastly more critical than the victors, with their rigid notion of the national mindset, ever acknowledged possible for the Japanese. Tanabe even urged that the immense wealth of the imperial household be confiscated and turned over to the poor. Tanabe was regarded by contemporaries to be the most influential Japanese philosopher of the early post-war years, and the source of his appeal is not hard to discern. His tone was confessional yet formal. He preached repentance and rebirth, and resurrected an indigenous culture hero. 
While the victorious allies were denouncing his country as a failed culture and arch-criminal aggressor state, he accepted Japan's wrongdoing and guilt, but denied their uniqueness, rejecting also the idea that traditional culture had nothing to offer. Surely our own misguided nationalism stands in need of metanoesis, he wrote, but at the same time so do the nationalistic perversions that infect democratic and socialist states alike. The defiant closing lines of his 1946 opus made the same point. Obviously we are not the only country that needs Zange. Other nations too should undertake its practice in a spirit of sincerity and humility, each acknowledging its own contradictions and faults, its own evil and sin. Zange is a task that world history imposes on all peoples in our times. The ways of thinking about repentance and atonement that prominent intellectuals like Nanbara and Tanabe offered had enduring legacies. Between late 1947 and 1950, as the Tokyo Tribunal drew to a close, censorship tapered off, and an indigenous peace movement began to coalesce in opposition to Cold War militarization, the elite student war dead whom Nanbara had eulogized and Tanabe had mourned were resurrected through their own poignant wartime letters. December 1947 saw the publication of In Distant Mountains and Rivers, the controversial collection of writings by students from Tokyo Imperial University who were killed in the war. Two years later, Listen, Voices from the Deep appeared, containing wartime letters, poems, and diary entries from 75 student war dead affiliated with Tokyo and other universities. The editors of this best-selling collection acknowledged that they had taken care to exclude more nationalistic writings in favor of intimate words by the doubters and dreamers. The end papers of their volume reproduced sketches from the notebook of a student conscript who had starved to death on a Pacific island, and its emotional preface and postscript addressed fears that these texts might be misused by those who once again plot war. The pessimism of the time lay heavy on this collection, in sharp contrast to the dreams of a bright, peaceful future that had accompanied such evocations of dead students shortly after the defeat. In his brief preface, Professor Watanabe Kazuo of Tokyo University asked readers to imagine a field of white wooden crosses, steeped in blood, and exclaimed that, Such crosses must never be erected again, not even one. The postscript by Odagiri Hideo of Tokyo University painted a bleak picture of a Japan in which genuine democratic revolution had already been thwarted and the acrid smell of war again floated in the air. As the poignant wartime writings in Listen, Voices from the Deep indicated, Odagiri explained, the demands of humanity and reason had to be upheld by defending peace at all costs. The blood that was shed, his appeal concluded, can never be atoned for except by ensuring that such blood is never shed again. By this date there could be little doubt that it was primarily the Americans whom the compilers had in mind when they spoke of those who once again plot war. Essentially, the pure and noble dead were being recruited anew to stand against America. Other writings that appeared around the time the Tokyo trial ended reinforced such reconstructions of the war's meaning. One of the most famous of these was Takeyama Michio's Harp of Burma, Biruma no Tategoto, an enormously popular novel, soon made like Listen, Voices from the Deep into a movie. Takeyama attempted to do through fiction what Tanabe Hajime had ventured through philosophy, to convey the meaning of the war, the themes of suffering, guilt, and atonement in particular, by way of Buddhism. The book's protagonist, a former soldier named Mizushima Yasuhiko, became the great fictive consoler of the souls of the country's war dead. His response to the horrors he witnessed in the final, hopeless stages of the war in Burma was to refuse repatriation and become a priest, wandering the jungles to search out and bury the remains of soldiers who had starved to death or been annihilated in combat. Possessed of a beautiful singing voice with which he had entertained his comrades, the gentle Mizushima often accompanied himself on the handheld stringed instrument of the novel's title, here, in another guise, was the Japanese soldier as near saint. In a letter at the end of the novel, Mizushima explained his actions this way. I want to learn the Buddhist teachings, to think and make them my own. Truly, we, our countrymen, suffered. Many innocent people became meaningless sacrifices. People who were like young trees, pure and clean, parted from home, left their places of work, went out from their schools, 
and ended up leaving their bones in distant foreign lands. The more I think about it, the more unbearably regrettable it is. Tormented by the question so central to Buddhism of why there is so much suffering and misery in the world, Mizushima concludes that humans will never understand perfectly. Still, Japan had brought its recent suffering upon itself. Our country waged war, was defeated, and now suffers. That is because our desires got out of hand. It is because we were conceited and forgot what is most important in being human. Because the civilization we held up was extremely shallow in some respects. These are human problems, not just Japan's alone, Mizushima observes. For himself, he intends to devote his life to studying and thinking carefully about such matters, to serving others and trying to act as one who can bring salvation. Although Harp of Burma was a serious work of literature, it almost immediately was included in a popular series of books for children, which offered phonetic readings alongside the more difficult ideographs. Takeyama appended a brief postscript to this young people's edition, in which he referred to indistant mountains and rivers, and expressed hope that his own book might, like the student letters, make some of the war dead live again. Indistant Mountains and Rivers itself was brought back into print shortly after the appearance of Listen, Voices from the Deep, with Nambada Shigeru's March 1946 report to students who had fallen in battle now included as a preface. In this way, various texts and presentations about war and redemption reinforced each other and survived as minor classics of the popular culture. In time, a distinctive genre of victim literature arose, including the recollections of atomic bomb survivors, and offered not only in the name of anti-militarism and peace, but of repentance and atonement as well. In 1950, the top ten bestseller list included the translation of Norman Mailer's novel The Naked and the Dead. Generally regarded as the finest American literary portrayal of the Pacific War, Mailer's reconstruction of one brutal island campaign confirmed the impression of war in general as an act of senseless and unspeakable cruelty, and of the Americans as capable of their own kinds of atrocities. As the novelist Chi Narinzo observed after the Hollywood version of The Naked and the Dead had been screened in Japan, Mailer's depiction made clear that even Christians could not squarely confront the problem of guilt that arose in connection with killing in war. Several eminent Japanese literary figures drew similarly on their personal military experiences to produce distinguished anti-war novels. Noma Hiroshi's Zone of Emptiness, Shinku Chitai, published in 1952, shocked readers with its portrayal of degradation and brutality in the Imperial Army and was widely praised as an immediate classic. Oka Shohei's brilliant Fires on the Plain, Nobi, about a straggler in the Philippines who encounters cannibalism by fellow Japanese and ultimately descends into madness, appeared the same year. Responding to Atrocity People in all cultures and times have mythologized their own war dead while soon forgetting their victims, if in fact they ever even give much thought to them. Many Japanese were sensitive to the dangers of such a myopic fixation, even as they eulogized their dead compatriots as tragic victims of forces beyond their control. When liberal and left-wing intellectuals began to organize a formal peace movement in 1948, they acknowledged this to be a problem, but nonetheless concluded that victim consciousness was the only foundation on which a more universal peace consciousness could eventually be built. Psychologically and ideologically, the argument went, the surest way to mobilize anti-military sentiment was to keep alive the recollection of intimate loss and suffering. The image was one of gradually expanding concentric circles of anti-war consciousness, from personal to national to international. Transcending national and racial introversion, it was argued, would take time. In fact, victim consciousness never was transcended and the outer ring of these imagined circles never came to be sharply defined. Still, the stance of the innocent bystander that so many individuals adopted came under attack from various directions. Sometimes such criticism became highly theoretical, as in the intense debates among intellectuals concerning the weakness of a subjective consciousness of personal responsibility in Japanese culture. On occasion, the critique was plain-spoken. In mid-1946, the conservative educator Tsuda Tsokichi acknowledged that the people had been deceived by a combination of legal oppression and military propaganda. 
but he went on to call attention to the fact that Japan had had an elected parliament all through this period. The people themselves bore responsibility, he concluded, for the fact that their intellectual ability was so weak as to be deceived, and they lacked the fortitude to repel or fight against oppression. The critic Abe Shinosuke, responding to the conclusion of the Tokyo war crimes trial, similarly observed that the majority of Japanese, having been deceived by the military leaders, must bear responsibility for having been stupid. Most leftists evaded the issue of the responsibility of the people. The more doctrinaire among them were intent on portraying the masses as victims of exploitation by the state and its oppressive ruling elites. Some progressives also argued that dwelling on the criminal complicity of ordinary individuals could too easily be confused with both the self-serving, collective repentance ideology associated with the government and the evolutions of a racial homogeneity that pre-surrender leaders had so assiduously cultivated. More than a few ordinary people, however, spoke with feeling about such matters. In the publication of a local youth association, a young woman in Nagano Prefecture observed that, after the defeat, newspapers wrote in unison that this was the crime of the military. Naturally, the government that deceived us is bad, but are we people who were deceived without crime? That stupidity, I think, is also a kind of crime. As the Tokyo trial drew to a close, a farmer wrote the press that this was an occasion when all Japanese should reflect on their own thoughts and behavior during the war, and not simply look as a third party on the trials. We must be aware that we, who were too weak and blind to authority, also are being judged, he observed. When the seven defendants sentenced to capital punishment were executed, a professor at a teacher's college in Osaka similarly urged his compatriots to recognize that this by no means brought the issue of war responsibility to an end. The leaders alone could not have fought such a large-scale war, he pointed out. We people were manipulated and went along into a wrongful war of aggression and invited miserable defeat. The crime is not that of the leaders alone, but rather all of us must bear responsibility. Henceforth, he went on, the people had to sit in judgment on themselves, and self-reflection on their war responsibility should continue forever. To this end, he proposed making the day of execution a day of national self-reflection. Such commonplace observations were sometimes coupled with an acknowledgment of Japanese atrocities. While a massive and prolonged act of barbarism such as the rape of Nanking had been witnessed by the Japanese press corps and publicized internationally, it was not disclosed in Japan. As the Asahi's daily Tensei Jingo column contritely observed when the massacre came up at the start of the Tokyo trials, it is shameful that not one line of truth was reported in the papers. Other mass murders extending to the rape of Manila in early 1945 were also suppressed. The first detailed reports of atrocities, which focused on the Philippines and China, shocked the Japanese greatly, so greatly that other atrocities paled by comparison, with the possible exception of accounts of cannibalism by Japanese soldiers that emerged in the course of the Tokyo trial. Conventional war crimes against Caucasians were nowhere near as unsettling, no doubt at least partly because the massive presence of victorious white men in occupied Japan made it impossible to visualize them as victims. Crimes against Koreans and Formosans, Japan's former colonial subjects, were of comparatively slight interest to either the victors or the vanquished. The huge number of Indonesian laborers who were worked to death by the imperial forces hardly seems to have registered at all. Between September 1945 and the end of the Tokyo trial, in any case, atrocities were well publicized and more than a few people responded with genuine horror. When the slaughter of civilians in Manila was made known, the mother of a soldier wrote an astonishing letter to the national press declaring that even if such an atrocious soldier were my son, I could not accept him back home. Let him be shot to death there. A young woman infusing the government's self-serving, collective repentance campaign with personal meaning responded to these same revelations with a letter declaring that, I understood the meaning of collective repentance for the first time when I heard about this. Some soldiers repatriated from the Philippines publicly expressed regret for their crimes, even while recalling the hellish deaths of their own comrades there. Feminist reformers such as Hani Setsuko used the revelation of the Manila atrocities to emphasize that this was by no means an aberration. War reflected the cultural level of a nation in every respect, Hani observed, 
and she had been aware of comparable atrocities from the time she ran a school in Peking. As she saw it, these atrocities toward civilians revealed the low position of women in Japanese male psychology, as well as the general disregard Japanese held toward other people's children. Such perceptions carried the issue of war responsibility to the heart of cultural considerations. In an article titled, Is the Morality of the People Low?, the left-wing magazine Taihei suggested that insensitivity to atrocious behavior toward other peoples was rooted in the absence of a morality of common life, grounded in subjectively free and equal individuals. The political scientist Maruyama Masao attributed such behavior to a predictable transfer of oppression in an inequitable, highly stratified society. The Asahi's editorialists and columnists saw a social pathology here that reflected not merely racial arrogance, but also fundamental weaknesses in education and morality, possibly even a lacuna at the core of Japanese religious beliefs, which lacked a strict code of moral behavior. For Marxists such as Nakanishi Ko, the barbaric behavior toward oppressed Asian peoples revealed a feudalistic, capitalistic exclusionism and selfishness rooted at the bottom of our hearts. Others responded less analytically to revelations of atrocity. In a bitter pun based on same-sounding ideographs, a contributor to a petroleum industry publication observed immediately after the Tokyo trials began that the Imperial Army, Kogun, had shown itself to be an army of locusts, Kogun. Responsibility for this war, the writer continued, truly lies with the people as a whole. Another writer, responding to revelations about the rape of Nanking, wrote that, In every bite of food we ate, every piece of clothing we wore, a drop of the Chinese people's blood had seeped in. This is our people's crime, and responsibility must be borne by the people as a whole. Ordinary people unaccustomed to writing for the public, such as housewives and farmers, wrote letters apologizing to the Chinese people and asking how the Japanese could make amends for such terrible behavior. Kame Fumio's sensitive treatment of China's sorrow in the opening minutes of his 1947 film Between War and Peace was the cinematic counterpart to such expressions of guilt. Such sensitivity was exceptional, but no one found it odd or out of place. Some men and women turned to traditional short verse forms to express their feelings upon learning of their countrymen's atrocities. A poetry magazine published after the Tokyo Tribunal ended included this evocation of popular responses. Vividly, the traces of the Japanese army's atrocities are shown. Suddenly, a sharp gasp. A village poetry magazine published this waka in early 1947. The crimes of Japanese soldiers who committed unspeakable atrocities in Nanking and Manila must be atoned for. Saiki Jinzaburo, a poet of some repute, wrote two poems on the subject. One dealt with his immediate response to learning of the atrocities in China. So full of grief is this day that it made me forget the vexation of the day we lost the war. The second went, Seizing married women, raping mothers in front of their children, this is the Imperial Army. As it happened, the Japanese public never saw the first of these verses. The poem was suppressed by GHQ, obviously because the censors remained hypersensitive to any overt expression whatever of Japanese regret at losing the war. This was unfortunate, for Saiki was of course not lamenting defeat here, but rather conveying, honestly and effectively, how his eyes had been opened and his conscience shocked by the revelation of his countrymen's crimes. His was one of the rare voices, and in the years that followed, as the Cold War intensified and the occupiers came to identify newly communist China as the archenemy, it became an integral part of American policy itself to discourage recollection of Japan's atrocities. These sensitive responses to revelation of the hands-on horrors perpetuated by the Emperor's men, fragile and fragmented to begin with, never developed into a truly widespread popular acknowledgement of Japan as victimizer rather than victim. Remembering the Criminals Forgetting Their Crimes In December 1947, almost a full year before the Tokyo Tribunal handed down its judgments, the magazine Vaughn offered a caustic observation about the fickleness of public opinion. When those war advocates now called war criminals first appeared on the stage, we welcomed them with loud applause, the popular monthly lamented. When they fell, we followed along and spat on them. 
and now we have virtually forgotten about them. The magazine condemned this laziness towards war criminals, as did other publications. To the editors of the intellectual journal Sekai, indifference to the trials extended right up to the sentencing, and could only be regarded as one more distressing example of the people's decadence, a fashionable term of cultural criticism at the time. From a somewhat different perspective, the Mainichi newspaper lamented the popular detachment that developed as the tribunal dragged on, but suggested that much the same sort of indifference could also be seen in German responses to the Nuremberg trial. As the Tokyo Tribunal came to a close, the media assessed its meaning in the by now talismanic language of peace and democracy. The Mainichi warned that punishing war leaders did not mean that the people as a whole had been washed and cleansed of responsibility for crimes against peace. Nihon Keizai Shimbun, which catered to the business community, called for self reflection and emphasized the responsibility people now bore to make sure they held their leaders to the principles of peace and democracy. The Asahi expressed regret that the people had not resisted dictatorial control more actively, and personal shame that the paper itself had caved in to the militarists. The task was to learn from such past failures, and on the basis of such self knowledge, resolve to construct a peaceful democratic nation. The Nikkeiren Taimusu, the organ of a leading big business association, editorialized that all Japanese must believe in and uphold democracy. Fully understand the meaning of crimes against peace and live as active, peace loving people. There was no great sense of justice having been truly carried out, however. Although some commentators sincerely welcomed the legal concept of crimes against peace, establishing such a precedent by singling out a representative group of wartime leaders and executing a few of them did not impress many people by this date. Even the Marxist critic Hani Goro responded to the capital punishments as a grave sacrifice that must not be wasted. The ambivalence embedded in such reactions, a strange compound of wishfulness and fatalism, was reflected in some of the waka poems that appeared in small publications in response to the trial's sentences and executions. An occasional verse spoke of the judgment as bringing a sense of relief, even a renewed commitment to creating a new country. A local monthly in Shizuoka, for example, carried this poem in early 1949. Since hearing the news of the execution of the seven war criminals, from deep within comes a power for reconstructing Japan. More representative, however, was a feeling of resignation and uncertainty, nicely captured in a woman's contribution to one of the country's innumerable poetry magazines. Accepting the severity of the judgment for now, Still, there is a small feeling of hesitation. Other poems spoke of hearing the news of the hangings and returning to one's inn in silence, or chewing one's tasteless food, or observing one's wife troubled by the inclusion of former foreign minister and prime minister Hirota among those executed. A waka by a resident of Sapporo, published in May 1949 as GHQ censorship was lapsing, Suggested the sympathy that even the arch villain of the Class A drama, Tojo, was then capable of eliciting. I agree and disagree with my elder brother, who murmurs that Tojo is great after all. Tojo's relative ascension in public esteem could be taken as a small barometer to the mood of the times, registering not nostalgia for the war years, but an implicit critique of Allied double standards. There appears to have been a further dimension to Tojo's little comeback, however. Subterranean and ironic in the extreme. In the captive world of being occupied, he was the most prominent Japanese who openly disagreed with the Americans. Here was another surreal touch in the marathon dance of victor and vanquished. Under the supreme command of the Allied powers, and the Americans particularly, no public figure could openly express disagreement with occupation policy. In this situation, the freest men in the land could be said to be the accused war criminals who pleaded not guilty in the Tokyo trial. They at least were allowed to disagree openly with the victors. Outside the tribunal, every other public figure had to bite his tongue. Everyone else, in essence, played the sycophant. Like the sovereign to whom he was so loyal, Tojo was a barometer in other ways as well. By singling him out as the preeminent symbol of aggression and defeat, American and Japanese alike made the central dimension of the war in Asia the conflict between the United States and Japan. 
Although Tojo came out of the Kwantung army and had played a major role in prosecuting the war in Asia, his identity as the leader of the conspiracy lay primarily in his association with the policies that culminated in war with the United States and the European powers. During the Tokyo trial, GHQ's censors had suppressed criticism that Tojo's role had been overemphasized and that the real heart of the problem of war responsibility lay in aggression against China. Even after the trial ended, this critical observation remained taboo. Thus, an article by the legal scholar Kaino Michitaka that advanced this argument and was to appear in the June 1949 issue of a scholarly journal was suppressed in Toto. By late 1948, when Tojo and others were executed, the Americans and their anti-communist supporters in Japanese ruling circles had new reasons for downplaying China's suffering. China was going communist and replacing Japan in American eyes as the major enemy in Asia. By the fall of 1949, it was reliably reported that some 500 former Japanese pilots were being recruited with SCAP's support by the ousted Chinese nationalist regime in Taiwan for possible assistance in retaking the mainland. As such clandestine recruitment revealed, the obverse side of forgetting China's ravishment was remembering how formidable and disciplined Japanese fighting men had been, how vigorously they had been indoctrinated in anti-communism, indeed how much they knew at first hand about fighting on the Asian continent. General Robert Eichelberger, commander of the Eighth Army, expressed this publicly while the Tokyo trial was still in session when he observed that Japanese were the sort of soldiers whom officers dream of having under their command. An appalling comment. Predictably, Tojo's final written words before he went to the gallows also emphasized anti-communism. He exited an up-to-date man. Some of Tojo's more fortunate, unindicted fellow inmates at Tsugamo Prison had the opportunity to remount the wave of anti-communism almost immediately after the trials ended and war crimes charges against them were dropped. Both Sasagawa Ryoichi and Kodama Yoshio, the right-wing godfathers who were released from prison the day after Tojo and his six convicted colleagues were hanged, gave the impression of having proceeded directly from the prison gate to their literary agents to capitalize on the celebrity status their prison sojourns had conferred. Sasagawa's reminiscences were published in May 1949 under the title Faces of Sugamo, Secret Stories of Imprisoned War Criminals. Sugamo no Hyojo, Senpan Gokuchu Hiwa. Kodama's memoirs, titled Gate of Fate, Unme no Mon, and featuring a photograph of Sugamo on the jacket, followed in October 1950. One Japanese war criminal, former Colonel Tsuji Masanobu, made the transition from notoriety to celebrity status and commercial success without even making an interim stop at Sugamo. A fanatical ideologue and pathologically brutal staff officer, Tsuji bore heavy responsibility for massacres in both Singapore and the Philippines, including the Bataan Death March, and was also implicated in isolated atrocities extending to an act of cannibalism following his execution of an American prisoner. Nominally one of Japan's most notorious fugitive war criminals, he had in fact enjoyed the protection of first the Chinese and then the Americans, before re-emerging in the public eye in 1950. Following the surrender, Tsuji escaped arrest by the British and made his way from Southeast Asia to China, where his knowledge of military intelligence and his virulent anti-communism made him useful to the nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek. In mid-1946, he secretly returned to Japan, disguised as a Chinese professor, and lived in concealment with the full knowledge of General Willoughby and the support of former army colleagues whom Willoughby was gathering under his aegis as the anticipated core of a future anti-communist Japanese military. This clandestine existence came to an end when the United States lifted Tsuji's designation as a wanted war criminal on New Year's Day of 1950. And in that same year, the fruits of his undercover life materialized in the form of not one but two bestsellers, one purportedly recounting his underground escape, the other dealing with the Battle of Guadalcanal. Early in 1952, a third volume on the struggle for Singapore emerged from the old murderer's hand. And that same year, in the immediate wake of the occupation, he was elected to the House of Representatives from Ishikawa, his home prefecture. Tsuji's dark charisma as a flamboyant militarist who had outfoxed the victors, vanished like a ghost, and never spent a day in jail surely accounted for much of the popularity of his books. 
After four years of knuckling under to American rule, with no end to the occupation yet in sight, defiant figures such as Tsuji, Sasegawa, Kodama, and Tojo could exercise a certain crude appeal even to people who did not share their politics. Their politics were actually part of the joke. The former Japanese and American antagonists, war criminals, and their judges were now more or less on the same side. Yet while the lifting of censorship enabled apologists for Japan's holy war such as these to speak openly, theirs were marginal voices. As an ordinary company employee observed on the fourth anniversary of Japan's capitulation, he was aware of almost no one who still truly grieved over the defeat. This was true not merely of what was said in public, but also what he heard in private conversations among close acquaintances. Such a response to a national disaster was truly astonishing, he thought, and reflected a general awareness that war, more than anything else, crushes the dignity of the individual. Virtually no one in Japan still dreamed Suji's old dreams of a greater East Asia co prosperity sphere. But by much the same token, few cared to be reminded any more about what the Imperial Army of Locusts had actually done in that short lived sphere of conquest. In this milieu of willful forgetting, the years that followed witnessed the almost wholesale rehabilitation of B.C. as well as Class A war criminals in popular consciousness. Defendants who had been convicted and sentenced to imprisonment became openly regarded as victims rather than victimizers. Their prison stays within Japan made as pleasant and entertaining as possible. Those who had been executed, often in faraway lands, were resurrected through their own parting words. One remembered the criminals while forgetting their crimes. The treatment of inmates in Sugamo Prison provided the most blatant early example of this. In a total prisoner population of around 4,000, the several hundred convicted war criminals were accorded many amenities. From an early date, they were allowed to publish their own newspaper, the Sugamo Shimbun, and as time passed, they were afforded what can only be described as prime access to live entertainment. A small theater that became known as Sugamo Hall was rehabilitated for their convenience. Beginning with the November 1950 performance by the Asahi Ballet Company, a literal parade of stars crossed its stage. There was a certain aura of the command performance in these presentations, as entertainers from the outside world lined up to perform for what amounted to a celebrity audience. These programs continued for several years after the occupation ended and were neither clandestine nor furtive. Entertainers happily posed for photos, a favorite background setting being Sugamo's distinctive wall and watchtower, and both the number of visitors and variety of their talents was impressive. By one account, at least 114 performances were offered inmates in 1952 alone, involving close to 2,900 entertainers. The well known comedians Entatsu and Kingoro both played Tsugamo Hall. So did the violinist Suwa Nejiko and some of the country's most celebrated popular singers, including the child star Misora Hibari, Kasagi Shizuko, of Boogie Woogie fame, Haida Katsushiko, Akasaka Koume, and Fujiyama Ichiro. The famous Nichigeki dance troupe entertained the convicted war criminals, as did little known groups of geisha. Prefectural folk dancers, and the like. Old fashioned sword fighting dramas were presented. To judge from the photographic record, the inmates also had the pleasure of being entertained by young women who displayed more naked flesh and more bizarre postures than these once dour militarists had permitted in public when they were still the arbiters of imperial way morality. Some prison entertainment took place outside Sugamo Hall. The Yomiuri Giants and the Mainichi Orions, professional baseball teams, helped the inmates celebrate the imminent end of the occupation with an exhibition game on March 28, 1952. The Sugamo playing field was also graced by teams from the Japan Women's Baseball League and by Western style wrestlers. Equestrian teams performed and then lined up like soldiers before the crowd for a commemorative photo. Female gymnasts in shorts smiled for the Sugamo audience and for the camera. In the summer of 1952, the image of convicted war criminals as war victims reached new heights thanks to a maudlin song written by two men who had been sentenced to death for war crimes in the Philippines. Neither Dai de Gintaro, the lyricist, nor Ito Masayusa, who composed the music, was actually executed. 
Daida claimed he had been framed and wrote his tearful lyrics early in 1952 after many of his fellow inmates at the Monten Lupa prison in the Philippines had been executed. The song's title, Ah, the Night is Deep in Monten Lupa, revealed a perfect feel for the hot buttons of Japanese sentimentality, and the tune was said to be so appealing that even Filipino prison guards found themselves singing it. The song was introduced at the prison on April 29th, the first day after Japan had regained its independence, in a performance that also included singing Kimigayo, the national anthem, and bowing as a group in the direction of the Imperial Palace in faraway Tokyo, a homage routinely performed by the Imperial forces during their rampage through Asia. Through their Japanese prison chaplain, Daida and Ito succeeded in having a famous female singer, Watanabe Hamako, introduce the song in Japan, where it became a sensation. The lyrics began by evoking the inconsolable thoughts that beset each prisoner in the depths of night as he recalled his home far away. Looking at the moon, blurred by tears, each dreamed of a gentle mother, saw her agonizing over when her beloved child would return, imagined her heart flying straight toward the southern sky, plaintively crying like a cuckoo seeking its lost offspring. And when morning finally came to Montenlupa, the final stanza of the song exclaimed, the sun also rose in each prisoner's heart, giving all of them the hope and courage to live strong until we step again onto the soil of Japan. There could be no more pristine rendering of rising sun nationalism and nostalgia than this, and soon afterward the desperate hopes of the condemned war criminals in Montenlupa became reality. In July 1953 all of these prisoners were repatriated to Japan, where some went free while others were transferred to Sagamo prison. Around 28,000 people met their ship to welcome them home. No one in the crowd breathed a word, as far as can be told, about all the mothers and children and prisoners of war whom the emperor's soldiers and sailors had murdered in the Philippines. While surviving war criminals were being pampered, projects were also underway to honor the memories of those who had been executed and restore them to a modicum of the individuality that had been stripped away when they were given the blanket label War Criminal. In a remarkably effective conservative publishing endeavor, the last written testaments of these men, their final letters to their families, their death poems and parting words, were collected and made public. Between 1950 and 1954, more than 15 edited books of this nature were published. Their compatriots were giving these men the last word in the most effective manner possible, by letting them speak as if from the grave. The most comprehensive and famous of these publications was a massive collection, 741 triple-column pages, published in December 1953 under the title Testaments of the Century, Seiki no Isho. In it, some 692 executed war criminals were given voice, and the variety of their personalities and opinions was impressive. The appeal of such writings was all the more compelling because, like the writings of student conscripts, the musings of Nagai Takashi and Nagasaki, or even Dazai Osamu's sensational novel The Setting Sun, these words reflected the thoughts and emotions of men looking death in the eye. Famous or notorious men passed judgment on their trials here. Tojo's last words found a permanent place among these testaments, apologizing to the people and the emperor for defeat, while reaffirming his innocence of international crimes. The Tokyo Tribunal had been a political trial, he stated, and the Americans and British had made three grave mistakes. They had destroyed Japan as a bulwark against communism, allowed Manchuria, his old Kwantung army base, to become red, and divided Korea in two, guaranteeing trouble for the future a prophetic observation a year and a half before the Korean War broke out. To end war forever, Tojo observed, much like Takeyama Michio's fictional priest in Harp of Burma, required ending human desire and greed. Unlike that hopeful mendicant, however, Tojo believed changing human nature to be impossible, and so assumed World War III was inevitable. He asked the Americans not to let Japan turn red, and concluded his parting testament by apologizing for mistakes the military may have made, but also asking the United States to reflect on the atomic bombs and their bombing campaign against civilians. The last letters to his family of General Homa Masaharu, who had been found guilty of command responsibility for the Bataan Death March, 
spoke similarly of Victor's justice. To say that the United States is a fair country is a bald lie, he declared, mentioning the hundreds of thousands of Japanese killed in air raids and by the atomic bombs. He morosely observed that there is no such thing as justice in international relations in this universe. Some condemned men accepted responsibility for the acts of which they were accused, but the more common response was that their trials had been essentially an exercise in revenge and double standards, with little care taken to ensure genuinely fair hearings. Several condemned men, Homa among them, quoted a cynical saying from the time of the Meiji Restoration: "Win and you are the official army; lose and you are the rebels." Katepa kangun, makere bazokugun. The final words of these convicted men almost invariably revealed deep concern for the families they were leaving behind, and the need to erase from the minds of loved ones as well as society at large the impression that they were really criminals in any ordinary sense, rather than simply victims of a tragic losing war. It would be difficult to overestimate the weight of this consideration in these final private epistles. Sons had to assure their parents, and husbands their wives, and fathers their children. That they were not murderers, not beasts; that there was an explanation for whatever it was they had been convicted of doing; that their loved ones could still hold up their heads; that a great many of these writings were intensely private communications did not necessarily guarantee their truthfulness, as the compilers of such materials would have had readers believe. But where dissembling began or ended was often impossible to say; sometimes, undoubtedly, for the writers themselves. Of all the familial ties cherished in Japanese culture, the wettest and most sentimental surely is that between son and mother. The syrupy popularity of "Ah, the night is deep in Montenlupa" was testimony to this, and a good number of writings in testaments of the century similarly revealed the deep attachment of these condemned men to their mothers. In this regard, several of the writings quoted a celebrated death poem by Yoshida Shoin. One of the most charismatic of the young samurai who mobilized to overthrow the feudal regime in the name of the emperor in the mid 19th century, Yoshida was executed in 1863 at the age of 27 for having attempted to assassinate an emissary of the shogun, and his poem was written on the day of his beheading. A parent's feelings surpass even our own feelings toward our parents. I wonder how she will hear today's news. The rebel and criminal Yoshida was apotheosized soon afterward as one of the heroes of modern Japan, a perfect symbol of purity and purpose and tragic sacrifice. To these condemned men, less than a century later, about to die as apparent failures, even as monsters, his posthumous vindication could only have been a source of hope and consolation. That Yoshida also had been an outspoken critic of the imperialistic encroachment of the Western barbarians did not exactly lessen his appeal. His farewell poem was cherished, however, primarily because it revealed that even as fate swept him away, his final thoughts and concerns lay with his mother. He became by this intensely humanized. He was made gentle. References to being a sacrifice, Gise, appeared frequently in the writings of the men condemned to death in the lower level trials. Such a man might see himself as a noble sacrifice for the country. Or a sacrifice for the nation paid in blood, or a sacrifice for defeat, or for the reconstruction of Japan, or for the race, or more hopefully yet for world peace. There was no single agreed-on agent of their victimization. To some, it was clearly and plainly the victorious allies. A condemned officer in Singapore characterized himself as simply a victim of British revenge. Many others, however, portrayed themselves as victims of their own superiors, who had forced them to perform acts now judged criminal, and then, in the familiar logic of irresponsibility, denied this afterwards. Others saw themselves as little more than the casual victims of war itself. A Kempe Thai officer executed in Burma in 1946 devoted his last words to a philosophical rumination on duty and individual responsibility, and concluded that he and others like him were simply. Vague sacrifices that accompany war. Like most of the other collections of writings by such men, the vigilant conservatism of Testaments of the Century was reflected in the cryptic biographies that accompanied each entry, which simply mentioned where the writers were executed, but not why. In fact, many men did discuss the crimes they were accused of, 
sometimes in considerable detail. Essentially, however, these publications were designed to humanize men who had died in apparent disgrace and to absolve them, or at least absolve many of them, of war crimes. In a curious way, such forgiveness was a natural, almost mirror-like counterpart to the treatment the emperor had received from the Americans. Just as Hirohito had been absolved of wrongdoing or war responsibility, so now accused war criminals were implicitly forgiven, by those, of course, who had not felt the impact of their acts, for whatever they might have done in the cauldron of war. Their gentle words were quoted, while their actual deeds went all but ignored. They were presented as having lacked any real control over the events in which they participated. The emperor's celebrated declaration of humanness had been a step down. He was descending from manifest deity, whatever exactly that meant, to human status. These men, on the other hand, were in the process of being escorted upwards from demonized realms into the same world of humanity. But whether it was the living God or the executed war criminals who were being humanized, the final impression conveyed was that no one, from the top to the bottom of the old imperium, was truly responsible for the terrible war and the atrocious acts that had accompanied it everywhere. Such refashioning of history and memory, such a restoration of a human face to the entire imperial army and navy, was part of a national process of psychological mending. If even these most miserable of military men could be shown to be complex and sensitive human beings, however flawed, then the stigma of having been little more than a rapacious army of locusts might be lessened if not altogether removed. The reactionary potential of such publications was thus considerable, for these last testaments could easily be read as but another sub-genre in the literature of Japanese victimization. They could also be seen, at least in part, as anti-Caucasian texts, for although these condemned men protested their innocence in every theater where war crimes trials were held, expressions of bitterness were especially keen concerning the harshness and double standards of Dutch, British, and American captors. Only in isolated cases, however, did such testaments serve as reminders of how grievously and casually the Japanese had sacrificed other Asians. Notwithstanding this, the overall impression of collections of posthumous writings such as Testaments of the Century was not so much anger or even apologia, but rather of an overwhelming feeling of waste, regret, and sorrow. The final words of the war criminals were not so different as might be imagined from those of the student conscripts killed in the war that were collected and published by liberal and left-wing academics. Indeed, one of the most moving testaments of the dead that appeared in Listen, Voices from the Deep was written by a student of economics from Kyoto Imperial University named Kimura Hisao, who was executed as a war criminal in Singapore in May 1946 for abuse of prisoners. A biography of Kimura was published in November 1948, and his remarkable last testament, scribbled in the margins of one of Tanabe Hajime's books of philosophy, was reproduced in the student anthology along with poems he had written in jail. Kimura's entry in Testaments of the Century consisted of a final note to his father, together with most of these same poems. One of the two death verses Kimura composed on the day before he was hanged conveyed a sense of having come to terms with dying at the age of twenty-six. The wind has quieted down, the rain has ceased. Fresh in the morning sun I shall depart tomorrow. The other poem would have reminded any Japanese reader of Yoshida Shoin. Without fear or sorrow I shall go to the gallows cherishing my mother's face. With but a few exceptions, the last testaments of the executed war criminals were not written for publication. They were collected and published after exhaustive appeals to family and friends of the deceased, and their public impact was contradictory. For even as they weakened consciousness of war responsibility, they intensified recollection of the terrible human costs of militarism and war. Like the writings of dead students and the memoirs of atomic bomb victims, these last words became part of a public portfolio of intensely personalized portraits of individual Japanese whose lives were destroyed by war. They were usually beautified self-portraits, and in a strange or at least unanticipated way, they helped make up what Osaragi Jiro, years earlier, had spoken of as a requiem to the Japanese war dead. The language of many of these last testaments was elegiac. These men may have been executed as conventional war criminals, but a great many of them wrote uncommonly well. 
The usual style and format of publication, moreover, almost always highlighted the elegiac tone. Testaments of the Century, for example, was prefaced with a photograph of a bronze statue of Kanon, the Bodhisattva of Mercy and Compassion. Entries were grouped according to the places where the Allied war crimes trials had been held, and each section was titled with an evocative phrase taken from one of the personal texts that followed. The Bond Between Japan and China was the subtitle for entries by individuals condemned to death in China. Fate for those tried by the British in Burma. Welcoming Spring for Hong Kong. The section by condemned men held in Sugamo Prism was titled Purple Violet, for the writings of those in Guam simply Humans. Each individual entry also was given a title derived from the text by the editors, and these too conveyed the generally sorrowful, reflective, humanistic tone that those who promoted such literature sought to convey. From the China trials, for example, came such headings as these From the Dark World, Tears of Chinese Soldiers, Beloved Japan, Nothingness and Forgetting, Every Day a Good Day. From the Dutch East Indies, Margins of Life, Friendship Extending to the Other Shore, A Hundred Faces. From Australia, Good and Evil. From Malaya and North Borneo, Notice to Britain, Returning to Mother, the writer's mother was deceased. From Burma, To Haruko, a letter to a young daughter written entirely without ideographs in the cursive syllabary. From Indochina, Various People. From Guam, Thoughts of a Scientist. From Sugamo Prison, Coming Alone, Leaving Alone, Bearing a Cross, the writer had learned Christian hymns, Wailing Wall, White Cloud, External Peace, Farewell. Monstrous criminals to their enemies, they now became philosophers and poets to many of their countryfolk. A short preface to a selection of entries from Testaments of the Century, excerpted in a monthly magazine, spoke of these writings as a great Bible that could inspire the entire Japanese race and help all humankind cleanse itself. The editors exhorted their readers to take heart in remembering that the darkest hour comes before the dawn. Akebono, the name of the magazine itself, meant dawn and to devote themselves to establishing everlasting peace. This was the rhetoric of purity and peace so often heard in the war years. It was a nationalistic plea to forgive the dishonored dead. It was a smokescreen obscuring the horrendous reality of Japanese war crimes and atrocities. But it was also, in this extraordinarily introverted world, an anti-war statement. Many of the writings by the condemned war criminals reinforced this in ways that moved readers deeply. The last letter to his young daughter from an army medical doctor was representative in this regard. He told her to try to make her way through life without ever killing a living thing, not even a dragonfly. He had been executed after being convicted of maltreating Allied prisoners. Part 6. Reconstructions Chapter 17, The Last Chapter Engineering Growth When the occupation began, most Americans, including General MacArthur, assumed that it should and would last no more than three years. Three years, however, turned out to be only its halfway point, and by then a great many Japanese had become transparently weary of foreign control. The Supreme Commander still received his fan mail, the ideal of peace remained precious, Democracy continued to be offered as a touchstone for defining the good society. But the conquerors, although still possessed of extraordinary authority, had begun to be regarded as just one more interest group in a crowded Japanese political landscape. The change was not only in the minds of the occupied. Driven by Cold War considerations, the Americans began to jettison many of the original ideals of demilitarization and democratization, that had seemed so unexpected and inspiring to a defeated populace in 1945. In the process, they aligned themselves more and more openly with the conservative and even right-wing elements in Japanese society, including individuals who had been closely identified with the lost war. Charges were dropped against prominent figures who had been arrested for war crimes. The economy was turned back over to big capitalists and state bureaucrats, Politicians and other wartime leaders who had been prohibited from holding public office were gradually de-purged, 
while on the other side of the coin the radical left was subjected to the red purges. The notion of a genuinely democratic revolution, from above, below, or anywhere else, seemed more and more, as the cliché had it, a dream within a dream. Before the occupation ended, the Japanese media had dubbed this dramatic turn of policy the reverse course. Public opinion polls, those heralded American contributions to grassroots democratization, told the story of popular disillusionment in striking terms. In 1948, a majority of Japanese still responded affirmatively when asked if they believed their country was heading in a good direction. By 1949, the majority response was negative. Beginning in 1949 as well, solid majorities of respondents expressed fear that Japan might again become embroiled in war. The dreams of peace, so carefully cultivated by victor and vanquished alike, suddenly seemed fragile indeed in a world in which the former allied powers appeared to be at each other's and everybody else's throats. Although censorship had often screened the news that reached the public, that only made the awakening to the realities of the Cold War world more shocking when it came resoundingly home. The harsh European attempts to reimpose colonial rule in Southeast Asia, the violence of Soviet repression in Eastern Europe, the stunning communist victory in the Chinese Civil War, the terrifying emergence of a nuclear arms race. All these were not dream, but nightmarish reality. Oh, mistake! On June 25, 1950, war erupted in neighboring Korea, and the United States, only four years after imposing its peace constitution, hastened to impose remilitarization on a reluctant nation, even as its war-related purchases gave a transfusion to the country's anemic economy. Everything was suddenly better, and worse, in unanticipated and unnerving ways. The occupation would still continue for almost two more years, but the occupation, as it had previously been understood by both victors and vanquished, was over. The conflict in Korea ushered in a new world, and for the first time since the surrender, Japan, willing or not, was distinctly part of this world. In this ominously unfolding atmosphere, petty incidents sometimes came to assume outsized symbolic import. In 1948, a student from elite Tokyo University was arrested for burglary. It was not the commission of the crime that drew attention, but rather his cynical defense of his actions. Judgment of what is a crime, he said, as the Tokyo war crimes trials were coming to an end, cannot be made in today's society. To the editors of one of the popular lexicons of new words and expressions, this seemed a perfect example of the confusion and emptiness of the times. Such cynicism would soon have many sophisticated expressions, such as the increasingly dark and ambiguous films of director Kurosawa Akira, which culminated in 1950 in the brilliantly framed Relative Truths of Rashomon. Two years earlier, a reckless and rootless young couple gave the mass media a terser phrase and a more sensational incident to consider when a young man employed as a chauffeur at Nihon University brazenly stole university funds from a co-worker and spent them on a spree with his 18-year-old girlfriend, the daughter of a professor. When apprehended, he responded with what quickly became one of the most famous English phrases of the occupation. Oh, mistake! The thief and his paramour, it turned out, were devotees of Hollywood gangster films, conversed in a curious polyglot of Japanese and broken English, had no apparent interests beyond material consumption and sexual pleasure, and felt no remorse at all for their casual crime. Social commentators hastened to turn the couple into symbols of the amorality of post-war youth, but the unforgettable phrase resonated far more broadly. In a world where everyone seemed to be scrambling to change horses, much of the recent past, war and occupation alike, seemed increasingly easy to dismiss as just a mistake. Weariness with the overweening American presence, coupled with the easing of censorship, gave rise to what amounted to a soft counter-revolution in popular culture. In popular songs, facetious lyrics became trendy, and the blatantly American boogie-woogie style that had been associated with a new sense of joy and vitality gave way to a traditional sort of sentimentality. From 1949 on, the prevailing mood in music and lyrics was one of wandering, loneliness, resignation, and a nostalgia that spilled over into inconsolable longing. The charismatic symbol of this bittersweet emotionalism was the precocious Misora Hibari, 
born in 1937, who rocketed to fame singing Boogie Woogie but became the exemplary voice of a native sentimentalism before the occupation drew to a close. Chanbara, traditional swordplay dramas, returned to theaters around this time, while romanticized samurai stories and novels with medieval themes began to reappear in bookstores, led by a succession of four huge bestsellers by Yoshikawa Eiji beginning in 1948. Even the translations into Japanese that made it to the bestseller list, including Norman Mailer's searing, critical rendering of American combat in the Pacific, The Naked and the Dead, reflected the new conservatism. For two years beginning in 1949, the top ten list included Margaret Mitchell's blockbuster 1936 novel Gone with the Wind. It did not take great imagination to read Japan itself into this portrayal of the defeated Confederacy where romantic evocations of a genteel civilization gone with the wind were counterpoised against the vicissitudes of a war-torn landscape and a post-bellum society plagued by Yankee interlopers and groping for a new identity. Even Mitchell's sharply contrasted heroines could be viewed as figures in a Japanese mirror. The pure, submissive, domestic Melanie and pragmatic, opportunistic, sensual Scarlet. Victimization, struggle for survival, Scarlet's defiant vow that I'm never going to be hungry again, all made Mitchell's saga of the American South seem very familiar indeed. The end of the dream of genuine liberation and grassroots democracy was reflected more directly in the fate of a popular booklet for children. Atarashi Kempo no Hanashi, a chat about our new constitution, written in a burst of enthusiasm and idealism by Asai Kiyoshi, a Keio University professor, had been published in 1947 and widely used as a social studies text for seventh graders. Unlike the Meiji Constitution, the little text stated, the new constitution represented the will of the Japanese people. The essence of the charter was threefold, international pacifism, democracy, and popular sovereignty, all of which were interrelated. Japan's renunciation of war meant that the nation would never maintain an army, navy, or air force. An accompanying full-page illustration showed materiel being melted down in the cauldron of renunciation of war, out of which came the wonderful buildings, trains, merchant ships, fire engines, and communications towers of a peaceful nation. The booklet went on to emphasize the basic rights of freedom and equality, including equality between men and women. A sized little book was downgraded to a supplementary text by the Ministry of Education in 1950 and dropped entirely in 1951, even though the education system remained under close American scrutiny. The book's fate could hardly have been otherwise. By this date, Japan was not only creating a new military under the eagle's wing, but also had embarked at long last on the path of economic recovery and was utterly dependent in this regard on a war boom based on providing special procurements for American forces fighting in Korea. Visible and Invisible Hands The most zealous exponents of the Oh Mistake philosophy were actually to be found in policy-making positions in Washington and Tokyo, for the reversal of priorities in economic policy entailed repudiating one of the most basic instructions issued to General MacArthur, as the occupation began. This order had stipulated that while the General's supreme authority extended to all matters in the economic sphere, SCAP would not assume any responsibility for the economic rehabilitation of Japan or the strengthening of the Japanese economy. The secret planning documents behind this policy made no bones about the punitive thinking involved. The plight of Japan is the direct outcome of its own behavior, observed an early State War Navy Coordinating Committee paper, and the Allies will not undertake the burden of repairing the damage. Until 1948, in accordance with these instructions, the General's economic bureaucrats confined themselves primarily to such punitive and reformist tasks as designating factories for potential reparations, directing the dissolution of Zaibatsu holding companies, compiling purge lists of top business managers, identifying excessive concentrations of economic power that needed to be broken up to ensure economic democracy, and orchestrating land reform and the abolition of tenancy. Although the United States eventually provided around $2 billion in economic aid, the bulk of it took the form of critical foodstuffs and materials deemed essential just to keep the economy afloat and stave off social unrest. 
In occupied Germany, responsibility for labor, finance, and the economy had been dispersed among separate sections within the Allied command. In Japan, these three huge spheres of activity, along with control over the fields of science and technology, were consolidated under a single economic and science section, ESS, that employed some 500 economists, engineers, and former businessmen, and supervised three ministries, finance, labor, and commerce and industry, as well as the enormously influential Bank of Japan and a newly created Economic Stabilization Board. The occupation authorities retained many of the control mechanisms over the economy introduced in the course of Japan's mobilization for total war. On occasion, they even promoted or endorsed controls that exceeded those enforced during the war. Until the closing years of the occupation, ESS also exercised centralized and authoritarian control over Japanese trade. The influential recommendations of top level advisory missions dispatched from Washington only reinforced the institutionalization of such top down policy making. One striking consequence of Japan's long years of war mobilization was a high concentration of capital in the hands of a small number of zaibatsu conglomerates. Occupation authorities singled out ten of these combines for particularly close scrutiny. Four famous old zaibatsu, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, and Yasuda, plus six new Zaibatsu that had risen to positions of dominance by collaborating closely with the military Asano, Furukawa, Nissan, Okura, Nomura, and Nakajima. By war's end, the Big Four had increased the 10% share of investment capital they controlled in 1937 to 25%. In 1945, the ten combines together controlled 49% of capital invested in mining, machinery, shipbuilding, and chemicals. 50% in banking, 60% in insurance, and 61% in shipping. Despite such war induced concentration and growth, the leaders of big business were generally happy to see the war end. Their overseas investments had been lost, a great part of their holdings in the home islands lay in ruins, and that was only the half of it. Most big capitalists had come to see the war as a struggle for survival against internal enemies. That is against militarists and economic bureaucrats of a national socialist persuasion intent on imposing virtually total state control over the private sector. The prospect of being occupied by true believers in capitalism thus seemed, at first blush, a welcome turn of events, particularly to the many executives who had enjoyed pre war personal and business relationships with Americans and British. These sentiments were openly acknowledged in corporate circles. Executives at the Misui Combine, the largest of the Zaibatsu, convened two days after the surrender broadcast in an atmosphere of confidence about the prospects for converting to peaceful production under the Americans. As one of them, Edo Hideo, recounted, there was general agreement that the Americans and British won't treat us badly and everything will go well. After all, they congratulated themselves, had not Mitsui been criticized by militarists and ultra rightists for being pacifistic? liberal and pro-American? Similar views were expressed at a secret meeting of heads of industry held shortly before the occupation forces arrived. Asano Ryozo, a Harvard graduate who was president of a large steel company, went so far as to blurt out in English, Our friend is coming. Japan was fortunate that the United States would lead the occupation, he exclaimed, and this could even provide an opportunity for the country to strive to achieve the American standard of living. Most business leaders shared this naive optimism. We dreamed neither of the Zaibatsu being dissolved, recalled another executive present at this meeting, nor of our business leaders being purged. Although capitalists were more likely than economic bureaucrats to welcome the conquerors, neither group had prepared for impending defeat with concrete plans. In this regard, the Japanese exited from the war in much the same dazed manner in which they entered it. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, its military and civilian leaders had engaged in no serious long term projections concerning the industrial potential of the United States or the probable course of the colossal conflict that lay before them. Sometimes, Prime Minister Tojo stated at the time, referring to a famous hillside temple in Kyoto, one simply has to leap off the terrace of Kiyomizu Dera. As the war ended, the elites revealed themselves to be no less casual when it came to planning ahead. 
Only a few individuals had given serious thought to how to convert from a wartime to a peacetime economy, or what such an economy might look like. Bureaucrats, businessmen, and politicians alike still seemed to be operating under the Kiyomizu Dera delusion. Somehow, like a movie run in reverse, they would just jump back onto the terrace. One way or another, things would work themselves out. Most of the jumping that actually greeted the Emperor's broadcast was frenetic and destructive. Military stockpiles, as well as production materials in the hands of private contractors, were either hidden or moved directly into the black market. Army, Navy, and Munitions Ministry officials immediately began withdrawing enormous sums to pay off contractors or line their own pockets and the pockets of favored associates. The Finance Ministry and the Central Bank of Japan turned to the printing presses and flooded the country with freshly inked currency to provide severance pay to millions of laid off workers and demobilized servicemen. At the same time, to mollify popular anxiety, wartime restrictions on withdrawals from personal savings accounts were relaxed. Serious bookkeeping was abandoned, and records were deliberately destroyed. The result was fiscal and economic chaos and the beginning of the ravenous inflation that ultimately drained the economy. To the leaders of big business, this flailing and thrashing seemed of no great import. The crushing blow to their morale came not with the untidiness of defeat, but from the revelation of the punitive and reformist economic policies the victors had in mind. When executives like Asano spoke confidently of their American friends, they were thinking of the conservative businessmen and clubbish diplomats they had known before the war. The New Deal style reformism and trust busting fervor that so influenced initial occupation policy was simply beyond their imaginations. Mitsui, for example, greeted the arriving occupation authorities with ambitious plans for a Mitsui Reconstruction Company. This new undertaking, they explained, would ensure continued work for their employees and subsidiary firms by engaging, even at a loss if necessary, in projects such as housing construction and land reclamation aimed at increasing farm acreage. They were shocked when SCAP officials dismissed this as a ruse meant to obfuscate the Zaibatsu's war responsibility, and chagrined beyond measure when the first head of ESS, who ordered their holding company dissolved, turned out to be a former department store executive who confessed that he could comprehend neither Japanese psychology nor the country's structure of business. The same aura of wishful thinking permeated a report submitted to the Ministry of Commerce and Industry by leading representatives of the business community in the week following formal surrender. Blithely ignoring the harsh reality of unconditional surrender, the report emphasized the totally voluntary attitude of the Japanese in carrying out the terms of the Potsdam Declaration, and urged the government to negotiate firmly with the victors to ensure Japanese control over economic developments. Among their great miscalculations, the authors of the report assumed that, in order to pay reparations, the country would be encouraged to rehabilitate its heavy and chemical industries and resume trade and overseas business operations throughout Asia. Comparably roseate proposals for converting war related factories to production for the civilian economy continued to be advanced until early December, when the Americans, in a chilling pronouncement by their reparations spokesman Edwin Pauley, made clear that they were more interested in removing such plants as reparations than in converting them for Japan's own internal consumption. On the basis of these initial U.S. recommendations, some 1,100 large enterprises concentrated in the chemical and heavy industry sectors. Were soon designated as possible reparations. Some of these plants were allowed to produce for the civilian economy, but with the understanding that they be physically ready for removal at a moment's notice. Others were forced to stand idle. Most designated facilities remained in this uncertain status until the end of 1950. Where the antitrust agenda was concerned, SCAP moved swiftly to clarify its policy of dissolving Zaibatsu holding companies. And eliminating Zaibatsu family members as dominant shareholders and officeholders. On the other hand, delay in implementing its broader economic deconcentration policy placed major productive facilities in an uncertain status for as long as three to four years. An economic purge of wartime executives was delayed until January 1947, resulting in the resignation or ouster of over 1,500 individuals. The giant Mitsui and Mitsubishi trading companies were broken up the following July. 
and it was only in December that the Diet received and passed a basic deconcentration law. A list of 325 large firms designated for possible breakup under this law was finally made public in February 1948, two and a half years after the surrender. By this time, reverse course economic policies were already gaining ascendance, and in the months that followed, most of these companies were dropped from the list. Deconcentration ended in August 1949 with a mere eleven enterprises ordered to be broken up. As a major survey of post-war management put it, these circumstances unsurprisingly contributed to a drastic decline in the will to produce on the part of big businessmen. In certain unplanned ways, economic chaos did abet reform and encourage initiative. Hyperinflation significantly diminished corporate and personal debts, while enabling SCAP to dispossess rural landlords and dissolve family-held zaibatsu holdings in a manner that amounted to virtual confiscation. At the same time, the pessimism and passivity that settled over big business left the entrepreneurial initiative to small and medium-sized enterprises. More flexible and less vulnerable to being designated for reparations or deconcentration, they were able to respond creatively to the post-war crisis. The majority of small and medium-sized companies that flourished in the ashes of defeat catered to consumer demands, and some of their innovative accomplishments soon acquired a storybook quality. A year after the surrender, the Tokyo Shimbun published an article headlined "Bombs Reborn as Hand Warmers." Itemizing the ways in which former producers of war materials had altered their production lines to meet peacetime demands, the hand warmers in the headline referred to the traditional charcoal burning hibachi, now being made from decapitated bomb casings sitting on their fins. The newspaper's long catalog of similar conversions included rice containers made from large artillery casings and tea containers from smaller caliber shells. A former manufacturer of mirrors used in searchlights. Was now engaged in producing window glass and glass lampshades. A subcontractor who produced pistons for fighter planes had retooled his product to work in irrigation pumps. Similar examples could be multiplied many times over, occasionally with names that became corporate hallmarks of the post-war economy. The president of the Komatsu Company, a maker of tank parts and anchor chains for warships, was inspired by the sight of American bulldozers leveling an airfield. To make the bulldozer his company's literal vehicle for recovery, the successful post-war camera manufacturers Canon and Nikon had been producers of optics for the war effort. In 1946, Honda Katsuichiro, who had been a small wartime subcontractor supplying piston rings to Toyota, began motorizing bicycles with tiny engines the military had used in communications devices. Hugely popular among small shop owners and petty black market operatives. These motorbikes led to the marketing of a motorcycle named Dream in 1949, and marked the beginning of the Honda Motor Company empire. Many successful post-war electronics firms had their genesis in middle-sized companies that had manufactured communications equipment for the military. Within weeks of the surrender, Ibuka Masaru, a former employee of one such company, had collaborated with a few colleagues to produce a popular device that converted shortwave transmissions to normal broadcasting frequencies. Laying the basis for the great Sony Corporation, SCAP stimulated certain areas of entrepreneurship in both deliberate and unplanned ways. Favorable consideration was given to industries that produced textiles, fertilizer, electrical appliances, and the like. GI demand boosted not only the Suntory Whiskey Company, but also the sales and good reputation of Canon and later Nikon cameras. By happenstance, the occupation force also helped revitalize the construction and ceramic industries. Roughly 50 percent of the huge war termination costs that SCAP exacted from the government for its own maintenance went to construction expenses, including toilets, sinks, tile, and the like, providing employment for a host of contractors. With their talent for turning foreign words to native use, the Japanese quickly began to refer to the process of obtaining SCAP building contracts. Which were negotiated at local levels nationwide, as a transaction governed by the three P's: petitions, parties, and presents. Entrepreneurial activity of this sort was hardly sufficient to restore economic vitality, however, and the government soon felt compelled to identify and promote strategic industrial sectors. SCAP's support of this was noteworthy. 
Early in 1947, General MacArthur himself went so far as to tell the Prime Minister that it was essential to pursue an integrated approach across the entire economic front. As interpreted by W. McMahon Ball, the Australian representative on the Allied Council that met in Tokyo, this amounted to an unequivocal statement by SCAP that in the existing situation it was essential that free enterprise should be replaced by a directed economy. By the time the Supreme Commander issued this dictum, the government already had committed itself to an interventionist program known as Priority Production. The brainchild of academic economists of various ideological persuasions, Priority Production received broad bipartisan support. Essentially, it stood on three legs. Allocation of labor and scarce resources to key industrial sectors, direct government subsidies to those sectors, and policy-guided loans through a newly created Reconstruction Finance Bank, RFB. Such industrial targeting aimed at stimulating overall recovery by channeling resources to the most basic energy producers, coal and subsequently electric power, and the most pivotal heavy and chemical industries, iron and steel, and to a lesser degree fertilizer. Shipbuilding and textiles also received favored treatment as crucial to any future export recovery. Until 1949, around one quarter of all outside funding in these six targeted sectors had come from the government through the RFB, with a mere 97 firms receiving 87% of all RFB loans. This proved a system ripe for graft, and businessmen, bureaucrats, and politicians lost no time in abusing it. Bribes led to funds, and portions of those funds in turn went into payoffs and further bribes. Particularly large sums flowed from big coal operators to conservative politicians, but the sewer of illicit payments spilled over in all directions and even stained GHQ itself. This came to public attention in a sensational manner with exposure of the Showa Denko scandal in 1948, which revealed the enormous web of corruption cast by a single fertilizer company in the course of obtaining huge RFB loans. First mentioned in a journalistic expose in April 1948, the scandal caused the collapse of the cabinet headed by Ashida Hitoshi in October, and by the end of the year had resulted in the arrest of 64 prominent individuals, including former Prime Minister Ashida himself, a former finance minister, currently head of the Economic Stabilization Board, high officials in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry as well as the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, leading bankers, well-known politicians in the two dominant conservative parties, and a top figure in the Socialist Party, accused of accepting a bribe to water down the Diet investigation of the case. The scandal was so murky as to defy full exposure. It dragged on in the courts for thirteen years, but it offered all the ingredients that aficionados of dirty dealing could hope for. Competing factions, black market transactions, a geisha-turned mistress, an elegant upper-class woman who moved between company executives and high officers in GHQ, and double bookkeeping that revealed vague expenditures for the entertainment of GHQ officials. In effect, RFB abuses succeeded the end-of-war looting and hoarding as a new stage in wholesale corruption. Corruption, however, was just the fallout from priority production. By 1949, output in targeted sectors had risen fairly substantially, and in this more positive climate, hoarded goods began to move back into the production cycle. Yet the costs of the weighted policy also were obvious. Inflation continued unabated, RFB inflation becoming a dreary new catchphrase as the Bank of Japan became a primary purchaser of RFB bonds and increased its issuance of yen notes accordingly. In the meantime, non-favored industries found themselves starved for funds. Bottlenecks of all sorts cropped up, even in the transportation sector, which was critical for moving coal, iron, and steel about. Small and medium-sized enterprises suffered particular hardships and lost some of the competitive advantages they had enjoyed. Ordinary citizens continued to be caught in a wage-price spiral, and labor militancy rose accordingly. By mid-1948, the very premises of priority production were beginning to be called into question. The scheme to check inflation by means of increasing production, the argument went, should be changed into one for increasing production by means of checking inflation. As the life and death of policy lines go, priority production passed from the scene relatively quickly, 
lasting a little more than two years. Nonetheless, the legacy of this first post-war macroeconomic policy was long-lasting. It focused attention on the critical heavy and chemical industrial sectors, instituted the post-war cult of top-level industrial policymaking, bridged or fused a variety of economic ideologies, and brought the government and big business into an ever closer embrace. The ground had been prepared for the reconsolidation of big capital and a new stage in economic planning. Planning a cutting-edge economy Well before priority production had run its course, Japanese planners were coming to embrace a vision of their future economy that contrasted sharply with that of the victors. The Americans, even when they turned their attention to promoting reconstruction, tended to think in terms of a neutered version of the old Japanese economy, of a trading nation, that is, weaned from massive military production and turning out cheap exports of the five-and-dime store variety, ceramics, glassware, figurines and toys, oriental specialties, silk and tea, or labor-intensive products largely made from imported raw materials, textiles, paper goods, simple electric items and the like. The new Japan, according to this back-to-the-future view, would be similar to the Japan of the 1920s and early 1930s, rather than to the country that had geared up its economy for all-out war. There would be changes, of course. The social dumping of cheap exports that had enabled pre-war Japan to penetrate and disrupt foreign markets would be eliminated. This, in fact, had always been one goal of the occupation's reformist economic policies, including its land and labor reforms. Improving the lives of the working population by promoting higher wages, higher incomes, and a more equitable distribution of wealth, the argument went, would create a larger domestic market and inhibit the dumping of underpriced goods abroad. Still, no matter how strongly American priorities shifted toward rehabilitating Japan economically, even to the point of proclaiming it the country's destiny to become the workshop of non-communist Asia, the image always remained of a fundamentally second-rate economy at best. It was taken for granted that Japan's future markets lay primarily in the less developed countries of Asia, not in the United States or Europe. At a cocktail party in Tokyo only days before the Korean War began, President Truman's special envoy, John Foster Dulles, blithely but typically told a high finance ministry official that the country should consider exporting things like, well, cocktail napkins to the United States. Four years later, with the occupation over and the economy booming thanks to the Korean War, Dulles, then Secretary of State in the Eisenhower administration, was still privately and, frankly, telling Japanese leaders that their country should not expect to find a big U.S. market because the Japanese don't make the things we want. Japan must find markets elsewhere for the goods they export. Although Japan's planners endured years of anxiety, they never really shared this perception of their country as a future producer of technologically inferior products. No one could deny that the war had been a disaster. Unlike the Americans, however, Japanese analysts tended to base their projections not on the pre-war economy, but on the advances of the war years. In their eyes, the most striking legacy of the 15-year war that began with the takeover of Manchuria in 1931 was the revolution in the heavy and chemical industries that occurred under wartime pressures, and the creation of a huge cadre of engineers, middle managers, and skilled workers capable of carrying this revolution forward. The key to a prosperous future lay in the promotion of science, the mastery of advanced technology and managerial techniques, and the production of high-value-added manufacturers. No one on the Japanese side focused on cocktail napkins. Iwasaki Koyata, the powerful head of the Mitsubishi Zaibatsu, captured this outlook in a letter sent to one of his executives the day before the first Americans arrived. It was important, he wrote, to have a great hundred-year plan, a hoary phrase from the canon of ancient Chinese writings, and not be overwhelmed by the problems of the moment. In this regard, his own recent thoughts concerned the notable progress Japan had made in technological fields during the war years. The only way... To compete with other countries in the future would be by emphasizing thoroughness of research, improvement of production techniques, and improvement of managerial efficiency. 
The leaders of the country's largest business associations struck a comparable note when offering advice to the government in early September. The most incisive early formulation of this vision of an economy based on cutting-edge technology appeared in a March 1946 mimeographed draft report produced by a special advisory committee to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and entitled "Basic Problems for Post-War Reconstruction of the Japanese Economy." The committee, comprising about 20 members, including both academic economists and business leaders, met approximately 40 times before producing its draft. And issued a revised book-length version the following September. Although never elevated to the level of official policy, this lengthy study proved as close to a long-term blueprint for subsequent policy making as one can find. While strongly endorsing the anti-feudal and anti-militaristic policies of the occupation, the report staked out a distinctly independent course where basic issues of the political economy were concerned. It acknowledged that post-war democracy would inevitably assume a certain American coloration, but emphasized that Japan's particular circumstances made any mechanical application of foreign models of economic democratization inappropriate. It was necessary to create a new type of democracy appropriate to the country's own situation and to conditions in Asia. In the committee's view, global trends indicated that the era of laissez-faire capitalism had ended. And that the world had at last entered an era of state capitalism or an age of controlled, organized capitalism. The Americans and the British could be expected to continue to emphasize free competition, but even their idealized economic freedoms were in reality restricted by planning. The importance of central planning, in fact, could be readily observed not only in Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States of the New Deal, but also a nice touch. Close at hand in Scap's demands, one after another, for government plans concerning such diverse matters as food, trade, unemployment relief, and public finance. In the wake of defeat, Japan's entire productive structure had come to a standstill, as if a big wheel had stopped turning. The challenge was to get this wheel moving again by mobilizing big capital in optimally rational ways. Although the committee was critical of the zaibatsu and supportive of occupation plans to break up the economic stranglehold of such monopoly capital, it recognized that the zaibatsu had played a critical role in accumulating capital, expanding trade, promoting technological innovation, and fostering the growth of heavy and chemical industry. With their decline, it seemed obvious that a democratized government itself may have to perform this mission. In the post-war international economy, Japan had no alternative. The committee agreed, but to accept the dominant role of the United States. Indeed, Japan had much to gain from this. But once the country was again sovereign, it was essential to avoid becoming economically colonized. In the new world order, it was to be expected that countries such as China and India would emerge as producers and exporters of textiles and other light industrial products, depriving the Japanese of these traditional markets. Japan had no choice then but to seek its export niche elsewhere, namely in the production of high-value-added manufactures that simultaneously required a heavy input of labor. As time passed, Japan's relatively cheap labor advantage, compared with the developed Western countries, would decrease, requiring further technological advances. On this central point, the report was exceedingly clear. Although traditional exports such as tea, raw silk, and textiles would remain important, in the future Japan would have to depend, to a fairly high degree, on the export of machinery and chemical goods, including electrical and communications equipment, mining machines and farm machinery, rolling stock, meters and other precision instruments, scientific and optical apparatus, watches and clocks, bicycles and vehicles, and various chemical products. With an uncharacteristic touch of irony, the report linked such manufactures to the many valuable lessons and souvenirs that the war economy had bequeathed Japan. The responsibility of central planners in making all this possible was strongly emphasized. The new mandarinate would ensure that production served the interests of the whole nation, assume many of the functions hitherto performed by the zaibatsu, provide credit to worthy enterprises. 
Encourage export competitiveness in small and medium-sized businesses. Adopt policies to prevent basic industry from being overwhelmed by foreign capital. And maintain optimum employment stability, especially where jobs might be lost due to global competition. Foreign trade would be planned and guided by the state, while modern scientific management in the civil service would replace the feudalistic practices of the bureaucrats of the Ancien Régime. The educational system would be mobilized to produce students competent in statistics and the gamut of technical skills required for an advanced industrial society. Several of the distinguished members of the committee that produced this report had been purged from university positions during the war for their avowedly leftist sympathies, and all of them were acutely sensitive to the great ideological as well as technocratic and technological trends of the time. Their commitment to domestic welfare, national prosperity, and the creation of a non-militarized economy was strongly stated. Their commitment to capitalism, per se, was another matter. At one point, the report candidly left open the question of whether Japan would adopt a capitalist or a socialist system in the future. Whatever the case, gradual transition to a socialization of the economy seemed not only inevitable but desirable. What remained to be seen was how this would transpire. Unplanned developments and gifts from the gods. In December 1948, Washington announced nine principles of economic stabilization that were to be imposed on Japan, and then two months later dispatched to Tokyo a highly publicized mission aimed at putting the country back on its feet as a viable market economy. The mission was headed by a dictatorial economic czar, Joseph Dodge, whose conservative Dodge line was vigorously imposed until the outbreak of the Korean War. Under Dodge's stern supervision, the Nine Principles quickly became known as the Nine Commandments, and in this near theological atmosphere, the redoubtable Detroit banker essentially joined Douglas MacArthur as another supreme being in occupied Japan. At the very least, the country now found itself with a third sovereign, wryly identified by Theodore Cohen as the Imperial Accountant. Under the Dodge line, the spigot of RFB loans was shut off. Government subsidies were curbed, at least in theory, and the cabinet and parliament were forced to adopt an overbalanced budget that actually showed a surplus. Stabilization, economic recovery, self-sufficiency. These new watchwords all depended, in the imperial accountant's eyes, on curbing inflation and domestic consumption while promoting a vigorous export sector. To this end, in April 1949, Dodge virtually single-handedly established a fixed exchange rate of 360 yen to the dollar, undervaluing the yen somewhat to stimulate exports by making Japanese manufacturers cheaper on the world market. A month later, the Ministry of Commerce and Industry and the Board of Trade were merged to create the unprecedentedly powerful Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI. Anti-monopoly legislation was revised to relax restrictions on intercorporate stockholding, mergers, and multiple directorships. At the same time, over the course of 1949 and 1950, basic laws giving the government strong control over trade, currency, and investment were moved through the Diet. Concurrently, the labor movement was weakened through the Red Purges, watered-down labor laws. And enterprise rationalizations that resulted in the dismissal of scores of thousands of workers. By 1950, the Dodge Line had succeeded in reining in inflation, but at costs that Japanese across the political spectrum found increasingly unpalatable. Public works, welfare, and educational budgets were cut. Unemployment rose. Domestic consumption was suppressed. Bankruptcies increased among smaller enterprises. And the media began devoting attention to suicides among small businessmen. And still, the economy remained moribund, due partly to unfavorable international conditions. Exports did not expand significantly. The production of durable goods, a telltale sign of new investment, actually declined. The stock market dropped, and popular disquiet rose palpably. The government's economic stabilization board. Critical of the austerity program from the outset, 
warned of a vicious spiral of contraction that was eroding the country's industrial base and threatening social stability. Stabilization panic became the new economic catchword. In late April 1950, U.S. News and World Report described Japan as being on the verge of an economic depression and labeled the deflation policy economic suicide. Whether Dodge's policies would have culminated in a bona fide depression is moot, for the outbreak of the Korean War on June 25th ended the stabilization panic and brought in its place a war boom stimulated by U.S. special procurements. The conflict that now ravaged Japan's former colony was, as Prime Minister Yoshida and a great many others like to say, a gift of the gods. An ironic phrase when one considers how only a few years earlier peace and democracy were being described as gifts from heaven. In both instances, at any rate, these gifts arrived by way of the Americans and reached every corner of society. Most industrial sectors were stimulated by these procurements, starting with metal products and extending, in roughly descending order of expenditure, to fossil fuels and machine oils, cloth and finished textile goods, medicines, vehicles, primary metal products, raw materials, excluding food and energy sources, non metallic minerals, electric machines and installation parts, clothing and shoes, building components, including plumbing and heating. Lumber and cork products, non electrical machinery, drink and tobacco, paper and paper products, food, and rubber products. In addition, the Americans turned to Japan for ammunition, light weapons, and napalm bombs, although in theory such manufactures were still prescribed. Special procurements also extended to services provided for the U.S. forces engaged in the war. Of which repair work on tanks, aircraft, and military vehicles was by far the most profitable. Up to this point, of course, Japanese workers had been told in no uncertain terms that they were never again to employ their skills for such direct military purposes. The Japanese also constructed, expanded, and provisioned facilities for a new influx of American military personnel and their families, whose personal and recreational expenditures, which fell outside the formal tally sheets, Also amounted to a small bonanza. All told, special procurements brought an estimated $2.3 billion into Japan between June 1950 and the end of 1953, a sum that exceeded the total amount of aid received from the United States between 1945 and 1951, and was all the more valuable because most payments came in the form of dollars. Even after the Korean War ended in 1953, Military related U.S. purchases continued under the rubric New Special Procurements, bringing in an additional $1.75 billion from 1954 through 1956, a major portion of the country's export income during these years. This prolonged windfall enabled Japan to increase its imports greatly and virtually double its scale of production in key industries. Even this, however, fails to convey the breadth and nature of the war boom. For the Korean War triggered global economic changes that served Japan well. Trade patterns were disrupted, recessions elsewhere came to an end, and both developments stimulated foreign purchases of a variety of Japanese manufactures. At the time, Japan was the only industrialized country with spare engineering capacity, and orders poured in for its machine products. Because Western shipyards were fully extended, the country was presented with a golden opportunity to develop its shipbuilding industry as a leading export sector. Even the end of hostilities had a plus side, for Japan was allowed to participate in and so profit from the U.S. directed reconstruction of South Korea. Various indices conveyed a sense of this heady economic revival. A stagnant stock market rose 80% between the outbreak of war and December 1951. Steel production increased some 38% in the first eight months of the war, while steel exports tripled. The automobile industry was revived by large U.S. purchases of trucks and other vehicles. Toyota, for example, boosted production 40%. These orders were Toyota's salvation, the president of the company later recalled. I felt a mingling of joy for my company and a sense of guilt that I was rejoicing over another country's war. Many companies used this windfall not merely to import more raw and semi finished products, but also to upgrade equipment and acquire advanced foreign technology. 
This was the beginning of Japan's systematic acquisition of rights to American commercial licenses and patents, an immensely beneficial transaction that the U.S. government strongly supported as crucial for the economic well-being of its still fragile Cold War associate. The war boom also facilitated the adoption of the quality control methods espoused by W. Edwards Deming, an American statistician and former World War II advisor to the U.S. government who found himself speaking to a diminishing audience in his native land. In 1949, pessimistic about the effects of the Dodge Line, middle echelon Japanese scientists and engineers, groping for an edge that would enable them to compete in global trade, invited Deming to conduct a seminar in Tokyo. Deming agreed to do so on being assured that the participants would include personnel who might seriously influence corporate policy regarding production procedures. As fate would have it, he made his inaugural presentation to such a group in July 1950, just after the war began. Had there been no war, Deming's gospel of quality control might have had far less impact, for the simple reason that there would have been no foreign demand for Japanese products, and thus no substantial mass production to which to apply his techniques. This almost serendipitous conjunction of desperation and opportunity enabled Deming's Japanese admirers to integrate his ideas about quality into the inaugural stages of new productive cycles and new entrepreneurial ventures in ways that would have lasting consequences over the ensuing decades. These were heady developments after so many years of economic stagnation, but many high-level economic planners nonetheless viewed the war boom as a decidedly mixed blessing. They were appalled by the prospect of again becoming involved in an economy dependent on military demands, and they warned that the boom threatened to exacerbate economic dualism by benefiting primarily larger, more modern enterprises. The 1953 Economic White Paper, published by the new Economic Planning Agency, went so far as to refer to the sin of special procurements. At the same time, the widespread positive effects of the boom were undeniable. Many small and medium-sized enterprises did prosper. Real wages in manufacturing industries increased significantly. By 1952, ordinary people were beginning to experience what the white paper called a consumer boom. Food consumption regained pre-war levels, and inexpensive clothing became widely available. Basic household amenities such as refrigerators and sewing machines were more accessible, as were such luxury items as radios and cameras. Personal savings rose, which in turn increased the funds available for industrial investment. This was a new world indeed. Production prostration and the bamboo shoot existence seemed to belong to a different era. Even the harshness of the Dodge line had almost fallen from memory. Yet Dodge's legacy was considerable, in unintended as well as deliberate ways. Theodore Cohen, who admired Dodge, candidly described the imposition of his austerity policy as a ruthless operation without regard for Japanese views three and a half years and two democratic elections after the war. As the war boom pushed the ruthless operator from center stage, his role as economic czar essentially was collectively inherited by the Japanese bureaucracy. The Ministry of International Trade and Industry was one such institutional beneficiary of this legacy, constituting a greater centralization of economic authority than had been achieved at the peak of Japan's mobilization for war. The Ministry of Finance, through which Dodge imposed most of his directives, was another. Dodge worked particularly closely with Finance Minister Ikeda Hayato, Yoshida's right-hand man and later a prime minister himself and for decades to come the ministry continued to exercise exceptional prerogatives vis-à-vis -vis other ministries and the Diet in controlling budgetary and monetary policy. As Cohen pointed out, Dodge also constituted the first post-war channel between the conservative Japanese big business elements and their bureaucratic and political allies in Japan and the top level of officials in the U.S. government. From then on, the Japanese conservatives were plugged into the top in the United States. It had taken more than three years, but the friends from America whom the leaders of big business had anticipated had finally arrived. The special characteristics of the post-war economy largely took shape during these turbulent years of the Dodge Line and the war boom. Capitalism emerged triumphant, 
resolving the question the Foreign Ministry's Advisory Committee had left open in 1946, a capitalism characterized by high levels of capital concentration, which the planners had worried about, coupled with a high tolerance of bureaucratic intrusion, which they had relished. Central to these developments were a handful of private city banks that had grown enormously during World War II, often as intimate parts of the various zaibatsu. Although the American trustbusters had identified these large banks as posing an unusually grave problem, the financial sector escaped the early years of reformism virtually untouched. When Dodge terminated the financing of strategic industries through the RFB, these commercial banks stepped in as major sources of investment capital and soon found themselves extending more loans than their deposits warranted and covering the gap largely by borrowing from the Bank of Japan. In time, these overloans became standard procedure, buttressed with a variety of monetary measures that strengthened central influence over the banks. At the same time, the overloans accelerated the reconsolidation of intimate ties between industry and finance, sometimes along the kinship lines established in the pre-surrender era, and sometimes in new configurations. Shortly after the war boom tapered off, Martin Bronfenbrenner, an astute economist formerly affiliated with ESS, observed that key city banks had begun to replace the dissolved holding companies as nerve centers of the Zaibatsu. What this development portended was the emergence of a distinctive post-war system dominated by so-called keiretsu, an old word that suddenly acquired specific and potent economic connotations. The keiretsu, the word is written with two ideographs literally signifying lineage Q, were powerful groupings of commercial and industrial enterprises that essentially replaced, without doing away with, the zaibatsu-centered agglomerations of industrial and financial capital that had long dominated the economy. By the early 1950s, six such major concentrations of economic power had emerged, all centering on city banks. Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, Fuji, Daiichi, and Sanwa. All but the Sanwa Keretsu represented reclusterings or reconfigurations of the old Zaibatsu. This was not pre-surrender Japan redo. A major portion of the economy remained outside these concentrations, and the Keretsu groups themselves differed in important ways from the pre-surrender Zaibatsu empires topped by family-dominated holding companies. Whereas the old Zaibatsu were rigidly pyramidal groupings, Keretsu relationships tended to be more horizontal, open, and internally competitive. Hereditary family influence had been largely eliminated, and stockholding was more diversified. Keretsu banks dealt with outsiders, and group affiliates might also deal with outside banks. As a rule, such post-war enterprises were more dependent than in the past on state funds and state directives. In the decades to come, this new capitalism would prove to be more flexible and competitive than the old Zaibatsu-dominated economy had been, and far more capable of responding to global economic and technological challenges than almost anyone had imagined. At the time, however, the combination of defeat, occupation, and the tainted gift from the gods that came from the war next door seemed to have spawned a strange and misshapen creature, what the Economic Planning Agency referred to apprehensively as the abnormalization of Japan's economic structure. This was a creature as unfamiliar as it was familiar, as unplanned as it was planned, as vulnerable as it was formidable. In its parentage, it was as binational as it was national, the offspring, as it were, of an unprecedented encounter at a unique moment in history. In later decades, when alarm concerning the Japanese threat arose in the United States and elsewhere, the binational genesis of this state-led, keretsu-dominated economy was all but forgotten. Early reformist policies such as land reform, encouragement of labor, and the dissolution of Zaibatsu holding companies were given credit, and appropriately so, for contributing to the emergence of a more vigorous and vibrant domestic economy. At the same time, however, flagrant acts of omission, such as the occupation's failure to promote deconcentration of the banking structure, also had enormous long-term consequences. The political and ideological rationale behind the economic reverse course, moreover, 
was to ensure Japan's emergence as a strong anti-communist bastion, and this necessarily entailed support of the most conservative and corporatist elements in Japanese society. And, as it happened, the continued American parenting of this abnormal market economy. The most striking American contribution to this new mercantilist state was largely unwitting. It derived from neither the early reformist policies nor the reverse course per se, but rather from the very operational essence of the occupation regime. While policy objectives changed dramatically from reform to reconstruction, the economy remained closely controlled from above. More than a few erstwhile reformers found bitter irony in this. Leon Hollerman, an economist who served with ESS, ruefully concluded that although the occupation had set itself the task of promoting democracy, in part it actually promoted bureaucratism, and its bureaucratic legacy was mainly economic. This occupation-era structure, Jerry built on the pre-surrender state's own ponderous wartime bureaucracy, was shrewdly perpetuated by the Japanese to protect their new capitalism after 1952. In this manner, as Hollerman put it, in liquidating the occupation by handing back operational control to the Japanese, Scap naively presided not only over the transfer of its own authority, but also over the institutionalization of the most restrictive foreign trade and foreign exchange control system ever devised by a major free nation. Epilogue Legacies, Fantasies, Dreams In the course of the war next door, Japan gained an army and lost a supreme commander. The United States moved swiftly to rearm the erstwhile enemy. Remilitarization was initiated without constitutional revision, without enthusiastic cooperation from the conservative Yoshida government, without great joy in business circles, although rearmament lobbies did arise, and without enough popular support to permit calling an army an army or even a tank a tank. The ground forces, inaugurated in July 1950, were identified only as a National Police Reserve, NPR, and tanks were rolled through their manuals as special vehicles. Colonel Frank Kowalski, who played a major role in training these new forces, described them organizationally and technologically as a little American army. Yoshida's refusal to acknowledge publicly that the country had now embarked on serious remilitarization left Japan, in Kowalski's view, in a kind of twilight zone of rearmament. The Prime Minister had acknowledged that the Constitution would have to be revised before the nation could acquire fighting potentiality, but the NPR in the meantime continued to be equipped with artillery, tanks, and aircraft. In a poll conducted in February 1952, Forty-eight percent of respondents said the Prime Minister was lying when he denied rearming. Forty percent were not sure, and only twelve percent believed him. Yoshida's posture enshrined sophistry concerning remilitarization as official policy, but his position was understandable. His caution actually served as a break on the Americans who in the heat and panic of the Korean War secretly urged Japanese leaders to hasten to create an army of between 300,000 and 350,000 men. This was a reckless, almost insane demand. Such precipitous remilitarization, Yoshida argued, would overwhelm and distort the economy, provoke violent protest throughout the country, and seriously agitate the many peoples of Asia who, unlike the Americans, had not suddenly forgotten the horrors of Japan's recent war. Yoshida also believed, with good reason, that if Japan remilitarized quickly, it would come under immense pressure to fight alongside U.S. forces in Korea. So great was his alarm at the extreme nature of these American importunities that at one point, while John Foster Dulles was visiting Tokyo to tighten the rearmament screws, Yoshida sent clandestine emissaries to two Socialist Party leaders, urging them to hold protest demonstrations outside his office to impress the American emissary. This little exercise in political show-and-tell, he hoped, would help drive home his genuine fear that all-out rearmament would tear the social fabric of the country apart. Under Yoshida, the Japanese held the size of the NPR to 75,000 men for the duration of the occupation. On April 11, 1951, came an announcement that struck the country like a thunderclap. 
President Truman had dismissed Douglas MacArthur as commander of the United Nations forces in Korea on grounds of insubordination. The general was removed from all his commands, including that over occupied Japan, for publicly advocating a more aggressive military policy than the president had adopted vis-a-vis -vis the People's Republic of China, which had endorsed the war on the opposing side the previous December. In a terse radio address, Truman stated that he had acted in order to avoid World War III. In theory, the Supreme Commander's recall was a stunning object lesson in civilian control of the military. In practice, his disgrace was generally perceived to be an astonishing and tragic event. Public expressions of regret were heartfelt and immediate. On the day after the President's announcement, the liberal Asahi newspaper published an editorial Lament for General MacArthur, that struck many familiar chords. We have lived with General MacArthur from the end of the war until today. When the Japanese people faced the unprecedented situation of defeat and fell into the Kyodatsu condition of exhaustion and despair, it was General MacArthur who taught us the merits of democracy and pacifism and guided us with kindness along this bright path. As if pleased with his own children growing up, he took pleasure in the Japanese people, yesterday's enemy, walking step by step toward democracy, and kept encouraging us. MacArthur left Japan for the United States on April 16th and savored a hero's departure. Prime Minister Yoshida visited to thank him for his great contributions and wrote the general privately expressing shock and sorrow beyond words. The emperor himself paid a last heartfelt visit to MacArthur's residence against the advice of high court officials who argued that the general, stripped of official position, should have visited him. It was the eleventh time the two had met, and for the first time MacArthur accompanied the emperor to his limousine when he left. K. Danren, the powerful federation that now served as the resurrected voice of big business, issued a public statement of gratitude. The speakers of both houses of the Diet did likewise, praising the general's righteousness sympathetic understanding and intelligent guidance, and thanking him in particular for making the legislature the highest organ of the state. The Tokyo Municipal Assembly expressed gratitude in the name of 6,300,000 Tokyo residents, while the press reported that legislation would be enacted making it possible to make the general an honorary citizen. It was suggested that a MacArthur Memorial be erected, perhaps even a statue in Tokyo Bay. The General's departure was broadcast live by NHK, the public radio station, with an announcer sorrowfully repeating, Goodbye, General MacArthur, while the melody of Auld Lang Syne played in the background. School children were excused from classes, and by MacArthur's account, two million people lined the streets to bid him adieu, some with tears in their eyes. As the Tokyo police calculated it, the number was closer to a still sizable 200,000, which seems plausible, the general being always inclined to inflate things by roughly an order of ten. Yoshida and other cabinet members came to Haneda Airport to see him off. The emperor was represented by his grand chamberlain, the Diet by leaders of both houses. The general's departure against the white clouds on his personal airplane Bataan moved the Mainichi newspaper to an extraordinary effusion. Oh, General MacArthur! General, General, who saved Japan from confusion and starvation, the paper keened. Did you see from your window the green wheat stirring in the wind? The harvest will be rich this year. That is the fruit of the General's five years and eight months, and the symbol of the Japanese people's gratitude. In the United States, MacArthur also received a hero's homage, albeit a peculiarly partisan American one led by Republican politicians and the Japanese followed his return closely. On April 19th he addressed a joint session of Congress, concluding with a widely quoted line from a military ballad popular when he was a West Point cadet. Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Sentimentalists in Japan found this every bit as moving as patriotic American sentimentalists did. They were less moved, however, or rather differently moved, by his observations before a joint committee in the Senate on May 5th, at the very end of three exhausting days of testimony, during the course of which he had in passing made highly complimentary comments about not only the admirable qualities of the Japanese people and the great social revolution they had undergone, 
but also the superb spirit of their fighting men in World War II. It was MacArthur's intention to argue that the Japanese could be trusted more than the Germans. Here was the way he put it when asked if the Japanese could be counted on to defend the freedoms they had gained under the occupation. Well, the German problem is a completely and entirely different one from the Japanese problem. The German people were a mature race. If the Anglo-Saxon was, say, forty-five years of age in his development, in the sciences, the arts, divinity, culture, the Germans were quite as mature. The Japanese, however, in spite of their antiquity measured by time, were in a very tuitionary condition. Measured by the standards of modern civilization, they would be like a boy of twelve as compared with our development of forty-five years. Like any tuitionary period, they were susceptible to following new models, new ideas. You can implant basic concepts there. They were still close enough to origin to be elastic and acceptable to new concepts. The German was quite as mature as we were. Whatever the German did in dereliction of the standards of modern morality, the international standards, he did deliberately. He didn't do it because of a lack of knowledge of the world. He didn't do it because he stumbled into it to some extent, as the Japanese did. He did it as a considered policy in which he believed in his own military might, in which he believed that its application would be a shortcut to the power and economic domination that he desired. But the Japanese were entirely different. There is no similarity. One of the great mistakes that was made was to try to apply the same policies which were so successful in Japan to Germany, where they were not quite so successful, to say the least. They were working on a different level. The full transcript of the three-day MacArthur hearings came to around 174,000 words, and these remarks attracted almost no comment in the United States. In Japan, a mere five words in this passage drew obsessive attention. Like a boy of twelve. The phrase came like a slap in the face and marked the beginning of the end of the MacArthur mystique. As Sode Rinjiro, MacArthur's biographer, has observed, these words and their starkness awakened people to how they had snuggled up to the conqueror. Suddenly, many felt unaccountably ashamed. From this point on, the former supreme commander began to be purged from memory, much as wartime atrocities had been purged. Plans for a memorial were abandoned. No statue would be built. The designation of honorary citizen never materialized. Several large companies even responded by publishing a joint advertisement headlined, We are not twelve-year-olds, Japanese manufacturers admired by the world. This was more wish than reality, of course, but what these entrepreneurs immediately grasped was that the general's disquisition on the evolutionary backwardness of Japan fit perfectly with the patronizing and dismissive appraisals others were offering of the country's economic immaturity. Although the old soldier himself might fade away in Japanese consciousness, more quickly and gracelessly than he had ever imagined possible, the issue he unwittingly brought so floridly to the fore would not and could not be dispelled. After all, the Japanese had routinely spoken of themselves as MacArthur's children, that, indeed, had been the very essence of the Asahi's emotional April 12th editorial. The entire occupation had been premised on acquiescing in America's overwhelming paternalistic authority. And even as sovereignty drew near, even as the nation was being rehabilitated as a Cold War partner, the Americans never had any real expectation that an equitable relationship would be the result. The new military was a little American army, obviously destined to remain under U.S. control. The new economy was inordinately dependent on American support and indulgence. Much of the rest of the world, on both sides of the Cold War divide, was in fact appalled and alarmed by the haste with which the democratization agenda had been abandoned, the old guard resurrected, and remilitarization promoted. In such circumstances, it was still difficult to imagine a sovereign Japan as anything other than dependent on and subordinate to the United States for the foreseeable future, a client state in all but name. A full year elapsed between MacArthur's dismissal and the formal termination of the occupation. 
In most respects, this proved to be a year devoid of the joy and exhilaration one might have expected with independence almost at hand. Although in the end the peace treaty would involve scores of nations, the Americans controlled the peacemaking process. And the exact price Japan would be called on to pay for incorporation into a Pax Americana became apparent only bit by bit. Rearmament under the American nuclear umbrella was but one part of that price. The continued maintenance of U.S. military bases and facilities throughout the country was another. Okinawa was excluded from the restoration of sovereignty, just as it had been excluded from the occupation reforms, and consigned as a major U.S. nuclear base to indefinite neo-colonial control. Because the Soviet Union was not part of the peace settlement, its disputed but de facto control over islands north of Hokkaido remained unresolved. The peace treaty itself, which was non-restrictive and generous to Japan, was signed by representatives from 48 nations. It was clear from an early date, however, that the communist countries would refuse to participate in a settlement that locked Japan so tightly into U.S. containment policy. In the parlance of the day, Japan had been given the choice of a separate peace or no peace treaty at all. Although Japanese progressives and leftists called with great passion for an overall peace coupled with Japan's disarmed neutrality, this was not a realistic option in the ferociously Cold War atmosphere of the time. It was only after embracing the separate peace and passing through the grand ceremony of a formal peace conference in San Francisco in September 1951, however, that the Yoshida government learned how high the costs of independence would actually be. As it turned out, the U.S. Senate refused to ratify the peace treaty unless Japan agreed to sign a parallel treaty with the nationalist Chinese regime in Taiwan, and beyond this, to adhere to the rigorous American policy of isolating and economically containing the People's Republic of China. This shocked Japanese businessmen and economic planners, who had taken the China market for granted, and became yet another reason to argue for the importance of a state-directed, top-down industrial policy. The U.S.-Japan Security Treaty and a related administrative agreement that accompanied it also turned out to be more inequitable than any other bilateral arrangement the United States entered into in the post-war period. The Americans retained exceptional extraterritorial rights, and the number of military installations they demanded was far in excess of what anyone had anticipated. Hanson Baldwin, the oracular military commentator for the New York Times, accurately pronounced this the inauguration of a period when Japan is free yet not free. To the conservatives, this was a high but unavoidable price to pay for independence and security in a dangerously riven world. To much of the populace, the difference between occupation and the limbo of subordinate independence was hardly discernible and certainly nothing to cheer about. Officially, sovereignty was restored at 10.30 p.m. on April 28, 1952. The streets, everyone reported, were strangely quiet. Perhaps twenty people gathered before the Imperial Palace and shouted, Banzai! A department store in the Ginza sold about one hundred Rising Sun flags. Signs and insignia denoting SCAP and GHQ were removed, but there was no exodus of American military personnel, since almost everyone was staying on. Early the following day, on his 51st birthday, Emperor Hirohito released two celebratory poems. One expressed a wish for peace. In the other, the Emperor rejoiced that Japan had survived bitter defeat and emerged essentially unchanged. The winter wind has gone, and long-awaited spring has arrived with double-petaled cherry blossoms. In a poll conducted shortly afterwards, only 41% of the people asked if Japan had now become an independent nation answered yes. Here was a country divided, literally so where Okinawa was concerned, and at the same time temperamentally torn and uncertain in its feelings about Japan's new place in the world. The most dramatic divide, however, was ideological. Yoshida Shigeru later appropriated an image from the partition of Korea to describe this. The occupation, he said, had left a 38th parallel running through the heart of the Japanese people. The reference was to the emergence of a liberal and left-wing opposition that espoused allegiance to the original occupation ideals of demilitarization and democratization, opposed Japan's incorporation into the Pax Americana, 
and was severely critical of the new constellation of conservative politicians, bureaucrats, and big businessmen that the Americans now patronized. Many prominent intellectuals took this critical stance, as did much of the mass media and a still strong left-wing contingent within organized labor. So did the increasingly militant adherents of the Communist Party, which, harassed and shorn of its leadership, still survived as a legal organization. Three days after the peace treaty came into effect, more than a million people took part in some 330 May Day rallies nationwide. Six years earlier, such observations had been marked by hope bordering on euphoria on the part of many participants. The unprecedented popular demonstration known as Food May Day had taken place in the plaza before the Imperial Palace in the wake of that long ago celebration. May first, nineteen fifty-two, however, entered history as Bloody May Day. Because the Yoshida government had forbidden the use of the Imperial Plaza, and defied a subsequent court order nullifying this ban, the major May Day rally in Tokyo took place under the auspices of the Sohyo Labor Federation on the spacious grounds of the well-known Meiji Shrine. An estimated four hundred thousand individuals gathered there in the morning and vocally endorsed such resolutions as "Oppose rearmament, fight for the independence of the race." Thousands of banners and placards peppered the crowd. Promoting workers' economic demands and opposing remilitarization, war, U.S. military bases, the seizure of Okinawa, and April 28th, the day of national disgrace. A few hand-drawn placards portrayed the faces of Stalin, Mao Zedong, or the purged leaders of the Japan Communist Party. A few displayed "Go Home, Yankee" lettered in English. As the rally was ending, a cry arose to march to the forbidden plaza in front of the palace, to the People's Plaza, as it had been dubbed ever since the demonstrations of 1946. Several groups formed, perhaps 10,000 people in all, led by radical associations of communists, Koreans, and students. White-collar as well as blue-collar workers joined in, women as well as men. They jogged to the palace, chanting anti-government and anti-American slogans. When a contingent of around six thousand demonstrators forced their way through a large police cordon and paused to regroup in front of the famous double bridge over the palace moat, violence erupted. Without warning, the police attacked with tear gas and pistols. A municipal employee and a university student were killed in the melee that followed, and a total of twenty-two demonstrators were struck by bullets. Violence and property damage continued as people fled to the side streets. And the toll of those injured on both sides was shockingly high. More than eight hundred policemen sustained injuries, out of five thousand who eventually became involved, and almost double that number of demonstrators, many of whose injuries came from the back as they attempted to flee. A score or so of American-owned automobiles, most of them parked alongside the moat, were overturned and burned. Three GIs were thrown into the moat and stoned before other Japanese rescued them. A small number of American soldiers were later treated for minor injuries. Bloody May Day branded the image of a divided country on the national consciousness. On May second, Emperor Hirohito and Empress Nagako led a ceremony in memory of the nation's war dead at Shinjuku Park. This was the first time such a public observance had taken place since the occupation began. The government attempted to turn the following day, Constitution Day. Into a dual celebration of the 1947 Constitution and the return of sovereignty. Attendance was relatively sparse. Perhaps 15,000 people gathered at the Imperial Plaza, where the Emperor read a brief message. He recalled accepting the terms of the Potsdam Declaration almost seven years earlier in order to inaugurate peace for our nation for all time, and expressed his deepest sympathies and condolences for the war's innumerable victims. He warned against repeating the mistakes of the past, called for building a new Japan in the democratic spirit of the new constitution, spoke of the Japanese family, and exhorted his subjects to combine the cultures of both East and West. In conclusion, he announced that, heavy though the burden was, he had no intention of abdicating. One month later, Emperor Hirohito journeyed to the Grand Shrine at Ise to report the restoration of sovereignty to Amaterasu, the sun goddess and imperial progenitor.
The emperor and the general had presided as dual sovereigns through the years of defeat and occupation. They shared a great deal in common, but like the poles of a magnetic field, they carried the charges of different roles and missions. And the field itself, the body politic of the defeated land, had been electric with creative tensions. This seems clearer now with the passage of time. It was not so obvious when the occupation ended. For all his positive words about peace and constitutional democracy, Emperor Hirohito remained first and foremost the living manifestation of historical, cultural, and racial continuity, and of the ideal of a hierarchical and patriarchal society. In defeat as in war, the emperor remained the great shaman of symbolic politics, and his poems celebrating Japan's recovery of independence confirmed the deftness of his touch and the traditionalistic thrust of his new symbol monarchy. The occupation had been bleak and bitter. Only now could the true, pure Japan reappear, as timeless as the cherry blossoms that followed winter's chill. When asked by a journalist in 1975 whether Japanese values had changed, the emperor expressed the same sentiment in plainer language. I understand that since the conclusion of the war people have expressed various opinions, he responded. But looking at this from a broad perspective, I do not think there has been any change between pre-war and post-war. And indeed was not his own incredible survival, for he continued to reign until his death in 1989. Proof of this? General MacArthur's genius as a wizard of representation was better known than the emperors among non-Japanese, and his portrayal of the defeated people differed markedly from Hirohito's. True, he was given to grand pronouncements about the Oriental mind, and his boy of twelve emerged from a colonial mentality that commonly dismissed the capacity of non-Western peoples to change fundamentally. That was not his rhetorical intention, however. On the contrary, where the emperor consistently dwelled on continuity, the general never ceased to extol the revolutionary transformation that the Japanese had undergone. In his celebrated Old Soldiers Never Die address, he told the members of Congress that the Japanese people since the war have undergone the greatest reformation recorded in modern history, and went on to embellish this assertion in extravagant terms. These words were not meant for Americans alone. He had said the same thing many times from his pulpit in Tokyo. In emphasizing how much the despised enemy had changed during his interregnum as supreme commander, MacArthur obviously was burnishing his own reputation. As far as one can tell, however, he sincerely believed these claims. Outside Japan, few took such observations seriously. Japan is little changed, read a subhead in a commentary on the restoration of sovereignty that appeared in the New York Times. After all, the explanation went, one does not alter national characteristics in six years. Unlike when the emperor expressed such views, the meaning here was patronizing. In this same spirit, the Times represented the end of the occupation with a cartoon depicting the gigantic, godlike hands of the victors releasing a tiny figure labeled Japan onto the road of independence. He wore a traditional laborer's short coat and wooden clogs, and the path before him meandered erratically before vanishing in darkness. This tottering little figure was, of course, the more common rendering of MacArthur's Boy of Twelve, an old image of innate backwardness and stunted development that was reassuring to many Westerners, being neither militarily nor economically threatening. This childlike maker of knick-knacks and cheap appliances would wander the byways of the American and European imaginations until the late 1960s, when all of a sudden, it seemed, Japanese automobiles and quality electronic goods surged onto Western markets, and the little men were transformed into economic miracle men and supermen, almost overnight. The response then was much as it had been a quarter century earlier, when Imperial Japan went to war and caught the Western powers by surprise. The genie had come out of the bottle again, only this time in a business suit rather than in khaki. For two decades the spectacle of this unexpected economic superpower would fascinate and alarm much of the world, provoking a great deal of high language about a so-called Japanese model. The notion of Japan as number one, the title of a 1979 book by a Harvard professor, simply took people's breath away. 
Part of the shock lay in the intimation that the heyday of Western global domination was over. But equally shocking was the fact that the accolade number one was being attached to a country that only recently had lain in ruins and been dismissed as a fourth-rate nation. Pundits asked how this transformation could be explained, and usually answered that one must look to the country's deep history and traditional values. Critics coined pejorative phrases such as ethno-economics. Eurocentric cultural determinists polished up the old clash of civilizations rhetoric. Newborn had been one of the pet Japanese phrases of the early years of defeat. But actually, to be reborn so spectacularly within a lifetime, in the eyes of one's erstwhile detractors no less, went far beyond what anyone in Japan had dreamed possible. This was redemption with a vengeance, and it provoked a linguistic euphoria on the Japanese side that frequently called to mind the leading race rhetoric of the war years, not to speak of an arrogance reminiscent of the hubris that had accompanied the early years of the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Intoxicated by their country's sudden eminence, academics and cultural critics threw themselves into interminable discussions about what being Japanese really meant. Popular through the 1970s and 1980s, this so-called Nihon Jinron discourse soon became a game of antonyms, with the er Japanese being defined in terms of values or orientations that were the polar opposite of those assigned to the er Westerner. Group harmony versus individualism, particularism versus universalism, subjectivity and intuition versus extreme ratiocination, conciliation versus litigation, vertical as opposed to horizontal social relationships, and so on. There was more than a whiff here of the wartime fixation on a unique Yamato spirit. Such persistent and grandiose fixations on blood and culture demand attention in part because they are already given such inordinate attention in so many contemporary societies. In Japan, as elsewhere, race, culture, and history are the stuff out of which collective identities and ideologies are invented. To understand the Japan that stands at the cusp of the 21st century, however, it is more useful to look not for the longue durée of an inexorably unfolding national experience, but rather at a cycle of recent history that began in the late 1920s and essentially ended in 1989. When this short, violent, innovative epoch is scrutinized, much of what has been characterized as a post-war Japanese model proves to be a hybrid Japanese-American model. Forged in war, intensified through defeat and occupation, and maintained over the ensuing decades out of an abiding fear of national vulnerability and a widespread belief that Japan needed top-level planning and protection to achieve optimum economic growth. This bureaucratic capitalism is incomprehensible without understanding how victor and vanquished embraced Japan's defeat together. To borrow one of the humorous neologisms that floated around during the immediate post-war years, the so-called Japanese model could have been more aptly described as a Scapanese model. The short cycle of Japan's modern experience coincides almost perfectly with Emperor Hirohito's reign. He was the ever-present ideological touchstone of these decades, the symbol of a seamless transition from unbridled militarism to imperial democracy, the most obvious rallying point, in peace as in war, for those who would emphasize the racial and cultural unity of the people. For his subjects, Hirohito's death in 1989 signaled the literal end of an era. The Showa period was over. The calendars had to be changed. What marks this year as the true end of an epoch, however, is the confluence of other momentous events. The Berlin Wall came down, signaling the last days of the Cold War. And Japan's economic bubble burst. This was the moment when it became evident to all that while Japan had attained its single-minded goal of catching up to the West economically and technologically, the vision and flexibility necessary for charting a new course were lacking. The system that had created the superpower was breaking down. With his typical good fortune, the emperor was spared this. He had departed just in time. Over the years, a number of dates were singled out by contemporary chroniclers as marking the end of Japan's post-war era. In 1955, a government economic agency announced with relief that the post-war has ended. 
basing its premature obituary notice on the fact that the overall index of production had finally returned to the pre-war level. 1960, when the government crushed the last great protests by radical labor unionists and Prime Minister Ikeda Hayatu inaugurated his vaunted income doubling program, was another year designated as marking the transition from one era to another. So was 1979, when the number one frenzy took off. Still, when all is said and done, 1989 is the year that will stand as the true end of the long post-war that had started the moment the Emperor's voice was first heard by his subjects. It had lasted 44 years. 1945 was unquestionably a watershed year. As momentous as 1868 when the feudal regime was overthrown and the new Meiji government established. There is always a Japanese audience for books focusing just on 1945, for books indeed that look only at the month of August, or only at the events of August 15th. Yet it is now clear that the structural legacies of wartime Japan to the post-surrender decades were enormous. Imperial Japan had begun mobilizing national resources for possible war after the onset of the Great Depression. The concept of establishing a total war capacity, that is, of having the ability to harness all sectors of the nation in the eventuality of war, was strongly promoted in military and bureaucratic circles from the early 1930s. And such industrial and financial consolidation finally materialized, quite belatedly, in what is sometimes called the 1940 system, this was the bedrock on which the Allied occupation of Japan rested, and it was a system that the Americans who controlled the occupation largely perpetuated. The institutional arrangements that were carried over from the war system were not inherently militaristic. Corporate subcontracting networks were part of this system, for example, along with increasing dependence on a small number of private banks for financing. All this became the heart of the post-war Keiretsu structure. Emphasizing employee security, including lifetime employment, over stockholder dividends in large companies, often singled out as a distinctive feature of the post-war Japanese system, had its real genesis in the war years. So did the government's intimate role in providing administrative guidance to business and industry. In the maw of defeat, confronted by a staggering post-war crisis, it seemed logical to most Japanese to maintain these arrangements and with the good grace of their American overlords, that is essentially what they did. Much of what later became identified as the Japanese model, and was then shrouded in a vapor of rhetoric about Confucian values, was simply a carryover of arrangements that had been spawned by the recent war. And post-war planners maintained and adapted this inheritance, not because they were secret samurai, but because they believed this was a rational way to promote maximum economic growth in an ominous world. The guiding hand in this system was the mandarinate, and it is in this regard that one of the most consequential acts of the occupation period was an act of omission, the failure to curb the bureaucracy's influence, particularly where economic affairs were concerned. The American reformers did change the political economy of Japan in significant ways, most notably through land reform, the dissolution of family-controlled Zaibatsu holding companies, and the promotion of legislation that gave unprecedented rights to organized labor. They also imposed certain specific bureaucratic reforms of lasting importance, eliminating the military establishment and breaking up the powerful home ministry that had exercised control over the police and local governments. But they did preserve the rest of the bureaucracy, and the 1940 system more generally, as a matter of convenience. To work through existing channels made implementing occupation policies easier. To fundamentally change the system would have created turmoil in an already confusing situation. This was only the half of it, however, for the victors also were responsible for strengthening the already powerful bureaucratic authoritarianism they encountered. And it is here that the essentially hybrid nature of the post-surrender model is to be seen. From the moment of their arrival, the Americans bolstered the role and prestige of the bureaucracy by their patronage. When Cold War considerations took over and the reverse course in occupation policy was launched, it was the Americans who promoted the administrative rationalization that resulted in an even greater concentration of bureaucratic authority. The creation of the powerful Ministry of International Trade and Industry three years before the occupation ended was the most visible example of this. 
Standing above and beyond all this, moreover, was the bureaucratic model that Scap's own modus operandi provided. The Americans did arrive as an army of liberation, as even the communists acknowledged for a while. They did initiate an impressive agenda of reform, but they ruled as mandarins themselves. General MacArthur's authority was supreme. The directives issued through his general headquarters could not be challenged. Suggestions from even low-ranking GHQ minions carried the force of informal commands. The entire governing structure ensconced in Tokyo's Little America was rigidly hierarchic. There was no transparency in this supergovernment, no accountability to anyone in Japan itself. The journalist who attempted to write that his country's prime ministers were weak because they could only be yes men found that he could not do so thanks to the blue pencils of GHQ's censors. As it turned out, one did not have to be the bearer of a Confucian cultural heritage to promote autocracy, hierarchy, harmony, consensus, and self-censorship. The anomaly of Scap's neo-colonial revolution from above was thus that it cut both ways, toward genuinely progressive change and toward a reaffirmation of authoritarian structures of governance. To speak of the war system being buckled to the post-war system is to be reminded that Scap itself was the buckle. The conquerors gave new authority to the Diet, but chose to draft and present legislation bureaucratically. They promoted the creation of a responsible civilian cabinet, and then by their own practices gelded it. While it is commonplace and accurate to speak of Japan being under the control of fundamentally authoritarian and militaristic governments from the early 1930s until 1945, the fact is that it remained under military control until 1952. This was democracy in a box, and General MacArthur's extraordinarily solicitous treatment of Emperor Hirohito compounded the problem by retarding rather than advancing the cause of genuine pluralism, participation, and accountability. And yet despite all this, the binational bureaucratic cult, the old-style corporatism that survived the passage from war to peace, the mystique of non-accountability symbolized by the sovereign, the stunted aspects of the new imperial democracy, MacArthur was quite accurate when he spoke of a society that had undergone significant change. Post-war Japan was a vastly freer and more egalitarian nation than imperial Japan had been. Its people had become chary of militarism and war to a degree matched by few other societies in our world. A healthy sense of the absurd pervaded popular culture, although foreigners rarely appreciated this. While centrists and conservatives maintained firm hold on the levers of power, the spectrum of public debate continued to embrace socialists and communists in a manner unthinkable in the United States. This, too, was a hybrid legacy full of contradictions and mixed messages, and nothing better exemplified these tensions and complexities than the debates that continued to swirl around the remarkable new constitution. There would have been no such national charter without the conquerors, and there was nothing to prevent the Diet from amending it once the occupation ended. Indeed, the Americans themselves soon came to desire and lobby for such revision. Article 9, which made remilitarization so problematical, naturally made them rue the week when GHQ had conducted its secret little constitutional convention. When the 50th anniversary of the new charters coming into effect was observed in 1997, however, not a word had been changed. Conservatives could never marshal the two-thirds vote necessary for revision, or face up to the public outcry that would have ensued. The Constitution may well be revised in the near future, but the issues involved still tell a great deal about popular political consciousness in contemporary Japan. Although Article 9 has been battered and bent to permit an increasingly expansive interpretation of what is permissible in the name of maintaining a self-defense capacity, it has survived, together with the strong anti-war language of the preamble, as a still compelling statement of the ideal of non-belligerency. The no-war vision touched the hearts of people all over the world in the wake of World War II, but it was never encoded in another nation's constitution or laws. Every contretemps about rearmament has necessarily entailed re-engagement with basic issues of war and peace, and law and constitutional guarantees in general, in a way inconceivable elsewhere. In such unplanned ways, the early occupation ideals of demilitarization and democratization have remained a living part of popular consciousness for over a half-century.
Japan's dreams of peace have not been consoling, for they have rested primarily on indelible memories of the horrors of World War II, of how several million Japanese gave their lives in vain, how the war came home first in the form of massive air raids and then, of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, how for years after the defeat it was often unclear where the next meal would come from, and how impossible it has been to publicly mourn the war dead. Fathers, husbands, brothers, whom the world still reviles as murderers. This deep sense of suffering and victimization has been intensified by a growing and not altogether unreasonable belief that Japan is being judged by standards that other nations do not apply to themselves. The sense of double standards and victor's justice that tarnished the Tokyo war crimes trial has only become stronger with the passage of time. Abetted by revelations of the atrocities, denials, and false memories of other countries. Even Japanese peace activists who endorsed the ideals of the Nuremberg and Tokyo charters, and who have labored to document and publicize Japanese atrocities, cannot defend the way the war crimes trials were carried out, nor can they defend the American decision to exonerate the emperor of war responsibility and then, in the chill of the Cold War, Release and soon afterwards openly embrace accused right wing war criminals like the later Prime Minister Kishi Nobusuke. Throughout the long post war, the elites who engineered Japan's impressive recovery came almost entirely from the several generations who experienced war and defeat firsthand. They looked back on the war as stupid, given their country's relative backwardness in science, technology, and material resources. They were obsessed with avoiding the repetition of such a disaster, and acutely sensitive to the global protest that would arise if Japan undertook to become a bona fide military power, bristling with the nuclear weapons it could so easily produce. Some of them shared the self critical sentiments of the progressive and left wing academics who emerged as a community of remorse in the wake of defeat. Some comprised a community of regret at having been defeated. More than a few held the Great East Asia War in memory as one waged against communists and warlords in China, and against European and American imperialists in Southeast Asia. Many, where the most horrendous Japanese atrocities are concerned, remained in denial. Virtually all recalled, with genuine grief, friends and acquaintances who had died serving the country. They also remembered the bemusement with which the white victors tended to look down on them as little men for years following their defeat. This cadre of leaders has all but departed the scene now, leaving behind a miserable record when it came to offering a clear and unequivocal acknowledgement of and apology for the depredations committed during the first two decades of Hirohito's reign. To do so in their minds would have involved swallowing the Tokyo War Crimes Trial view of history. Which seemed inconceivable to them. Their patriotism has drawn the scorn and mistrust of much of the outside world upon their country. At the same time, these elites also bequeath to their successors the unresolved question of whether Japan can ever be taken seriously by other nations and peoples without possessing its own independent capacity to wreak horrible destruction on others. This is the Article 9 legacy, the Separate Peace legacy, the U.S. Japan Security Treaty legacy. It is the legacy of subordinate independence under which the occupation was terminated and Japan regained its nominal sovereignty. Professing fidelity to the spirit of Article 9 invites international ridicule, as was made painfully apparent to the Japanese during the Gulf War in 1991, when Japan was derided for offering money but not troops for the attack on Iraq. Abandoning Article 9 will, beyond any doubt, provoke intense outcries of Japanese revanchism. For no one, except the Japanese conservatives, has forgotten the rape of Nanking. Japan's peculiar dreams of peace have come to involve a gnawing sense of entrapment. These tangled legacies of defeat and occupation played out in a circular fashion. Consigned to military and therefore diplomatic subservience to Washington's dictates, the only real avenue of post war nationalism left to the Japanese leadership was economic. National pride, Acute, wounded, wedded to a profound sense of vulnerability, lay behind the single minded pursuit of economic growth that created a momentary superpower a mere quarter century after humiliating defeat. That this quest was characterized by a mercantilist mentality and an almost pathological network of protectionist defenses does not seem all that surprising. 
Who, in the end, could one really trust but oneself? All this is in the air now. No one is certain where Japan will land, and no one is murmuring number one anymore. The uncertainty is disquieting, but the lowering of expectations is surely healthy, and yet in other ways sad. Why? Because what has become discredited along with the Japanese, or Scapanese, model are also certain dreams that reflected the idealism of the early occupation agenda of demilitarization and democratization. The Japanese economists and bureaucrats who drafted the informal 1946 blueprint for a planned economy were admirably clear on these objectives. They sought rapid recovery and maximum economic growth, of course, but they were just as concerned with achieving economic demilitarization and economic democracy. And to a considerable degree, the guided capitalism they promoted succeeded in realizing these objectives. Japan became wealthy. The standard of living rose impressively at every level of society. Income distribution was far more equitable than in the United States. Job security was assured. Growth was achieved without inordinate dependence on a military industrial complex or a thriving trade in armaments. These are hardly trivial ideals, but they are now being discarded along with all the deservedly bankrupt aspects of the post war system. The lessons and legacies of defeat have been many and varied indeed, and their end is not yet in sight. This concludes the reading of Embracing Defeat by John W. Dower. This book was read by Edward Lewis. Copyright 1999 by John W. Dower. This unabridged recording of the reading of Embracing Defeat was published by arrangement with John W. Dower and George Borchardt Incorporated and was produced in 1999 by Blackstone Audiobooks Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audiobooks. If you would like to obtain a mail order catalog or additional information about our growing line of audiobooks, call 1 800 Say Book. That's 1 800 729 2665. Thank you.